Rescued by a Lady's Love, Lords of Honor, No. 3, by Christy Caldwell. Prologue. London, England. November 16, 1813. Miss Liliana Bennett was terrified. She was also hungry. Not, necessarily in that order. Her stomach rumbled loudly in the nighttime quiet, muffled a moment later by a passing carriage. Standing on the darkened, cobbled streets across from the lavish Mayfair townhouse awash in candlelight, huddling in her cloak, Lily really thought she preferred hunger to the terror that had gripped her the whole cramped mail coach ride from Carlisle. For the pain of a nearly empty belly prevented her from thinking of the terror being turned out by her parents, the two people who were supposed to love her above anything. On her sixteenth birthday, no less. Tara licked at her senses, ultimately defeating the gnawing need for food. Just as it had twisted at her insides since she'd made the long ride by mail coach, alone, for the first time in her life. It had been with her through the leers and improper glances cast her way by the male passenger seated on the opposite bench. And standing here, outside the London home of George Winters, the Duke of Blackthorne, it was even stronger now, fear. To calm the rapid pounding of her heart, she pressed her eyes closed a moment and drew forth the memory of his easy smile and gentle teasing. I will marry you, Lily Bennett. His pledge had not come after they'd been discovered by the parish busybody, Mrs. Rutgers, but before. Fury surged through her veins. That nasty gossip. Foolishly, Lily had clung to the hope that the woman would say nothing, if for no other reason than the Duke of Blackthorne's identity. He'd been gone not even a day, on his way to London for business, when Mrs. Rutgers proceeded to share every sort of detail with Lily's parents, and any villager who would listen. Lily hugged her valise closer. When they were married, none of it would matter. If he intended to do right by you, why has he been gone more than two months? As soon as the poisonous thought slid in, she thrust aside the faithless misgivings. It was not his fault. Just as her parents had been powerless when the ruthless Duchess of Blackthorne had swept into their modest cottage, brandishing Lily's notes to the young duke, and threatened Papa's livelihood if he did not deal with his daughter. Mayhap Papa would have braved the whispers of the villagers, but he'd never brave the wrath of the venerable, revered Duchess of Blackthorne. Lily curled her fingers around the handle of her bright floral valise. The wood handle bit into her hand and she welcomed the slight sting of discomfort. It prevented her from thinking of the haste with which Papa tossed her upon a mail coach and scuttled her off, like yesterday's refuse. Wind held mournfully through the darkened streets and she huddled deeper into her cloak. Stop it. It was wrong to doubt George's faithfulness because of the seeds of misgivings planted by their families. She steadied her trembling jaw. A man with the face of an angel, who'd given her gentle words of love, could never be guilty of treachery. No, she'd not allow them to cast doubt on what they shared. Just as Lily would be damned if she allowed his cold-hearted mother to keep them apart. Dukes do not with the daughters of vicars, and they certainly do not marry whores who spread their legs without the benefit of marriage. Her mind echoed with the force of her father's booming voice. The muscles of her stomach nodded all the harder. He would marry her. For he'd promised it, along with his heart. He just did not know the day she'd given herself to him on the edge of the forest, they'd been observed in the most humiliating of ways. Squaring her shoulders, Lily took a deep breath. And then it began to rain. She blinked several times, slowly, and then drawing her gaze away from George's home, she looked up at the overcast London sky. Another drop, like a tear from heaven hit her eye, momentarily blurring her vision. Thunder rumbled, in an ominous display from the heavens above. He loves me, she whispered, as the wind whipped her modest, brown cloak about her ankles. For the threats of his mother, the regal Duchess of Blackthorne, and her own parents' volatile fury and seething disapproval, Lily knew he would not betray her. She'd given him her virtue and heart, and he'd pledged his name and love in return. Some of the fear that had held her breathless for the nearly week-long journey abetted. He would marry her. Because he loved her and because that is what he'd pledged. And when a gentleman gave his word, he honored it. As Lily stepped out into the street, the skies opened in a deluge, momentarily holding her feet frozen there. Rain pelted her cheeks. Another gust of wind blew her bonnet back and yanked her curls free of her braid. 
water soaked the strands and ran in rivulets down her cheeks. Just then, lightning cracked across the night sky in an impressive display of nature's fury and snapped her into movement. The lease in hand, Lily sprinted across the cobbled roads. Her booted feet churned up water and the deep puddles soaked her leathered soles. Her teeth chattering loud enough to be heard over the roar of the storm, she dashed up the steps and, dropping the sack bearing her only possessions in the world, she knocked on the door. Another rumble of thunder drowned out all hint of sound and wind continued to whip the wet fabric of her cloak. A chill ran through her. He will marry me. She pounded hard on the blackwood panel. And her mother and father, and his mother with all their vile, ugly beliefs about love and rank above that beautiful emotion would be proven wrong. She raised her hand to again knock, when the door was suddenly thrown open. A wave of warmth spilled out of the brightly lit foyer, momentarily blinding her with the glow cast by the candles. She grabbed her valise, and then registered the flash of loathing in the old butler's eyes. Bakers around back, the man said in frosty tones and made to close the door in her face, Lily shot a hand out with such force, the wood panel knocked backwards. I I am no bee beggar. The blend of fear and cold caused her teeth to knock with such ferocity, her jaw ached, the elegantly attired butler raked a stare over her rain-dampened frame. His lip peeled back in a sneer. I don't care who you are. Your kind is not wanted here. My kind. Fury rattled around, dulling the now distant hunger and fear. Anticipating his movements, she jammed her hip in the doorway, just as he made to close it in her face again. She winced as pain radiated from the point of contact and shot down her leg. I, I am here to see the Duke. She prided herself on that near steady deliverance. After all, it was nigh impossible to maintain one's pride and dignity when soaked like the kitchen cat tossed in the bathwater. The butler gave another shove. Go. Lily pushed back. I must ask see him. She'd faced the condemnation of George's mother, her mother, and father. She would be damned ten times on Sunday if she let the stranger turn her out. I said leave. He pushed once more. With a burst of determined energy, she heaved her shoulder into the door with such vigor the old, reed thin man stumbled back and landed on his bottom. Propelled forward by the force of her own movement, she reeled forward, stumbling hard onto her knees. She grunted as her valise sailed forward, skidding across the smooth, Italian marble floor. Dazed by the force of her fall and the blinding perfection of the white floor, Lily blinked. Belatedly, she registered the old servant climbing to his feet. The determined glint in his hard eyes sent her scrambling to a stand and she rushed to put several steps between them. I must see his grace. For George would make all the ugly right. The pompous man looked over her shoulder and she followed his gaze to the footman at her back. Her heart clamored into her throat. They'd turn her out without granting her that audience. She retreated sideways, putting distance between herself and the men eyeing her like she was a thief come to make off with their employer's finest jewels. The Duke will see me, she said, her voice rising to a near frantic pitch. He had to. Because in all her wonderings of how this exchange would play out. For all the fears her parents had planted in her mind and the Duchess of Blackthorne's promise of retribution, she'd known the moment she came to him, all would be well. For that was what love did, it made you stronger. It gave you hope and faith, it also gave you courage. With a skill that came from too many games of tag with her younger siblings, she darted past the aged butler and around the footman who reached for her. Heart racing, Lily darted past the men and down the crimson carpet while the blood raced in her veins and fueled her steps. Her breath came hard and fast, and then, she collided with a wall. Nay, a person. Oomph. Lily sailed backwards and landed hard on her buttocks. Pain shot up her tailbone and climbed up her spine. With stars dancing before her eyes, she blinked several times bringing the beloved visage of George Winters, the Duke of Blackthorne, into focus. Hands folded at his chest, he stood, a tall beacon of strength and power. What in blazes is this about? The fury in his deep baritone marked him the champion who'd earned her love. Her heart tugged as that familiar voice washed over her. She'd lain in his arms, but once and known only a handful of his kisses, 
but it was a voice that had sustained her through the horror of the scandal. Lying on the floor, she craned her neck back and stared at him. Immaculate. Impeccable. Coolly elegant and wholly perfect. Attired in a sapphire jacket with a snow-white cravat, he was the model of male beauty. As though an absolute mockery of his perfection, a wet curl fell over her eye and she brushed it back to better gaze at, his scowl. Unease churned in her belly. Why is he scowling, at me? He peered down at her and his blue-eyed stare ran through her, a man who saw, but did not see. That was, at least, see rain-soaked urchins on the floor with their skirts rucked up above their ankles. She gasped and quickly shoved them down. George looked again to his butler. What in blazes is the meaning of this, Sutton, he bit out, ignoring Lily's prone form at his feet. Your grace, I am sorry, the butler said, rushing forward. This, Creighton, entered through the front entrance. A healthy rage filled her. How dare he speak of her with those tones of icy derision. She was no lady born, but she was a vicar's daughter, and a woman who even for that had earned the heart of this powerful lord. How dare you! A man who, in the moment, simply could not see past her ragged garments and bedraggled appearance. I pay you good wages to see that these persons, these persons? Do not. George, she whispered, cutting across shameful words she believed this man incapable of. She may as well have fired a pistol into the quiet. A charge of shock ricocheted about the portrait-lined corridor. Using that distraction, Lily scrambled to her feet and stretched a hand out. George, it is me, she said softly. She continued forward and then stopped before him. But an inch or so taller than her own five feet seven inches, their eyes nearly met. In an eternal moment that stretched on forever, he stared at her. He narrowed his eyes. Who are you to enter this home and use my Christian name? She froze, her body immobile and eyes unblinking, she braced for his teasing laughter, for him to fold her in his arms and hold her close, in a moment, that did not come. Unease skittered along her spine. He did not recognize her. That was all. There was nothing else to account for this icy disdain seeping from his cold eyes. She turned her palms up. George, it is I, she tried again. How could eyes that had twinkled with warmth now ice her worse than the late autumn cold raging outside? Lily Bennett, she said, pleadingly. She turned her palms up, praying he played an unfunny jest, one that she would take him to task for the remainder of their days when he did right by her. He frowned and peered at her through blonde lashes. He took in her now limp curls, and as his stare lingered on her painfully modest cloak, shame spiraled through her. Deal with this, Sutton, he ordered and turned on his heel. Surely you remember me. Her cry echoed about the hall, freezing him and earning gasps from the butler and footman. I, I wrote you letters, she said, her voice catching, as he turned around. Mayhap with his mother's interception of those missives he'd believed Lily a faithless, fickle girl who'd forgotten him. Why your mother came to my parents' cottage with them. He opened his mouth and closed it several times. What manner of jest is this, he asked, so coolly detached that a sliver of her heart broke. Oh, God. He does not remember me. She reeled. How could she have given her virtue to a man who did not even recognize her from Eve? Her fingers scrabbled at her throat and she searched for words. Any words. A sound. A plea. A cry. Something to prove that she was still breathing. Lily managed words. I am, George, a curt voice sounded from down the corridor. A hated voice. A hateful voice. The one to have issued warnings, that in being inside this hallowed home, Lily ignored. Wherever are you? Sir Henry is to arrive shortly with the gift for tonight's bee, the Duchess of Blackthorn gasped. What is the meaning of this, she hissed. Lily looked blankly past George's shoulder as the elegant, silver-haired Duchess of Blackthorn swept over in a flurry of silk skirts. I am handling this, mother, he bit out. Are you? With a pointed look for the hovering footman, she snapped. The same way you handled her in Carlisle? Then the Duchess returned her attention to Lily. 
You, she seethed. You were warned. By you, she bit out. Where did she find the courage to toss those words at this unfeeling duchess? The woman flared her eyes, and then as swift as it had come, all hint of emotion was gone. This is the girl who is writing you notes. This time, when George looked to Lily there was a bored curiosity. Ah. Ah. That was what he would say? Nothing more than a single, affirmative utterance that was not even a word? She's your vicar's daughter, his mother snapped, impatience adding a frosty bite to the revelation. Hope stirred in her breast. Hope he would remember. That he would see past her downtrodden appearance and his mother's disapproval to the woman who had given her virtue on the pledge of his love. He flicked a detached gaze over her and brushed an imagined speck off his sleeve. I thought you said you would deal with her. I am that dust. I am that insignificant to him. She struggled to hear past the blood rushing in her ears. His mother's words came as if down a long, empty hall. Do you see why you do not make village girls your whores? They get ideas beyond their station. Her heart cracked and with her throat working, she looked from mother to son. George, she pleaded again, taking a step closer. He looked to her again with disdain seeping from his eyes. What in blazes are you doing here? Her breath caught. Her lower lip trembled and she hated it. Hated it because it was a telltale sign of her weakness and despair. But more, she hated herself for having been so foolishly naive. Regardless of his lofty title as Duke, he'd taken her virginity and she expected, nay demanded, more. Lily searched for words. His face remained a smooth, unaffected mask. She searched for a hint of warmth. How could she have been so deceived? How? I gave myself to you. Her voice cracked and she buried that sound in her trembling fingertips. But once, in a moment of madness, she was swayed by the skillful words on his lips. The duchess' shocked gasp split the quiet. Ignoring the exclamation, Lily continued. I love, loved you, and you promised me. Her voice broke and a drat sheen of tears filled her eyes. For her reservations, that day in the Carlisle countryside, he'd promised to give her his name in love. This is your lesson on what happens when you bed the village girls, his mother snapped. After you are wed, then you may bed whomever you wish, but by God behave with some discretion until then. She spared a lethal glance for the two stone-faced servants. If a word is said about any of this, I'll turn you out without a reference and ruin you, so that employment will not even exist for you within Newgate itself. Feeling a player in a farcical drama, Lily looked blankly to the white-faced footman. He gulped and hastily dropped his eyes to the floor. Surely you did not believe I would marry you. At the ugly laugh that spilled past George's lips, nausea churned in her belly. She stared, stricken, his words blasting through the foolish love she'd carried. Yes, she whispered. I did. I am going to be vomit. Lily gagged and the Duke stumbled away from her. Egads, do not go casting your evening meal at my feet. If she could muster the proper ability to formulate a sentence, she'd point out that she'd not eaten a meal in more than a day. With the precious coin handed her by her father, she'd preserved those coins with greater care than she'd guarded her own virginity. You cannot simply turn me away. A denial screamed around her mind, even as panic threatened to cut off her airflow. His mother threw her hands up. By God, give her coins and be done with her. You have your meeting with Holtworth and then the betrothal ball. Imagine the scandal if a single guest arrives to find your whore here? She seethed and the sneer on her lips transformed the regal woman into a harsh, ugly figure that matched her soul. Lady Barbara's father will never allow the match under such dubious beginnings. Lady Barbara? Through the peculiar humming in her ears, Lily struggled to make sense of the odd jumble of words and names. The betrothal ball? Dutifully, the duke fished a small purse from his pocket and held it out. Lily stared blankly at mother and son. Money. He would pay her like a whore in a tavern who'd served but one purpose. Cold iced over her heart. He shook his hand and the coins within jangled. She cocked her head. 
he gave his fingers another shake. Off you go. As her hand curled tightly, reflexively over the pouch, she went hot and then cold, sick, with a dangerous blend of shame, agony, and fury. He was to be married. To a proper lady, and you are nothing but a whore. After all, whores took payment for the gift of their virtue. She choked. How could she have ever believed herself in love with one such as him? See her out, Sutton, the duke instructed. Without a backward glance, he wheeled around, and left. Before Lily could move, the footman wrapped powerful hands about her forearms hard enough to raise bruises. She cried out, as he hauled her physically through the hall and to the foyer. Pulling against his punishing grip, the man only tightened his hold. With Lily kicking her legs and flailing, the butler rushed forward and pulled the door open. Biting rain stung her face and sucked the breath from her lungs. Miss Bennet, the Duchess called out, staying the butler. For a moment, hope kindled that there was a sliver of good in this woman and she would insist George do right by her. She glanced back. Do not return to this household or I will see your family ruined. The Duchess peered past Lily. Get her out, now. A gasp exploded from her as the footman hurled her down the steps and into the street. Lily crashed hard on her hip, landing in a deep puddle. Tears smarted behind her eyes as the autumn rain soaked her modest cloak and her dress all the more. Her valise followed behind her. It sailed through the air and fell open. The meager contents of her existence spilled into a thick puddle at her feet. She stared at the small wooden box made by her brother, Sheldon, two years earlier. It would be ruined. It would be spoiled by the rain if she did not have a care. The door rattled from the force of Sutton slamming it and Lily continued to stare, dazed. An empty numbness dulled the agony of betrayal, leaving in its place the renewed terror, lightning lit the skies. What will I do? Her breath came hard and fast. Her father's warnings came rushing back, slapping her with the truth of her own naivete and foolishness. Hello, miss. She blinked. Miss? Are you all right? All right? Her world had been ripped asunder. She'd been cast out of her family, betrayed by the man she'd given her virtue to and now had nothing but a handful of coins given her by her father and the duke. She would never be all right again. Miss, he repeated. Lily looked up at the kindly gentleman with thick, white whiskers and concern in his eyes. She shook her head, dazed. What did he want? And more, why was this stranger outside George's home speaking to her even now? My name is Sir Henry. He knelt beside her and made quick work of stuffing her entire life's possessions into her satchel. With the valise in one hand, he held his other out. Let me show you to my carriage. He gestured behind him and she followed the slight movement to an elegant, black carriage. It is too cold for you to remain in the street. By the cut of his elegant, black cloak and hat and by his very presence here alone, he was a member of the lofty ranks the Duke of Blackthorn kept. It marked his soul as black and evil, and yet. Come, the older gentleman urged. Let me help you. Help her? He wanted to help her? She peeled back her lip in a sneer. What did any of these powerful peers know of kindness? I do not want your help. Lightning cracked overhead, aching to make a liar of her. Still, he remained, staring with gentle concern. What other choice do you have, miss? She stilled and her gaze crept back to the front door, through which she'd been summarily tossed. Fear curled inside her belly, once more. Miss, the man repeated, as rain fell about them. With nearly frozen fingers, she took his hand, and allowed him to help her upright. Wordlessly, she let him guide her to his carriage, help her inside, and climb in behind her. The man doffed his hat and beat it against his leg. What is your name? Her words emerged faint and breathless. A Lilia, Lily, she quickly substituted. She'd not give him more of her identity than that. After all, it was as much folly being in this stranger's carriage than in giving herself to George. Then, desperation made people do desperate things. I, I must go, she said, 
forcing a thread of strength into her words. It is not pee proper to be here. Thunder rumbled and shook the carriage, as though mocking those words from a woman who'd shown up on a duke's doorstep expecting marriage. The old gentleman continued to smile at her in that benevolent manner. I've a brief meeting inside with the duke. I've no intention of hurting you, but given your exit from Blackthorne's home, you are just another one subject to his ruthlessness. The frown on the man's lips met his eyes and hinted at a person who'd also been somehow victim to that powerful peer. If you choose to remain, I'll help you. She eyed him through narrowed eyes. Hadn't George proven gentlemen were only driven by their own motives? Why would you do that? Because you need help, he said, simply. The stranger motioned to the door. You are free to go. I will not stop you. He paused. But neither is it safe for you to be out on these streets, alone. The decision is yours. Lily remained silent, glaring at him through mistrustful eyes until he opened the door and strode back across the street and, eventually, disappeared inside George's home, she reached for the handle and froze. Where will I go? Home was no longer an option. Shivering from cold and fear, Lily pulled her fingers back and balled them on her lap. She huddled deeper into the thick squabs of the comfortable carriage. After all, as he'd said, what other choice did she have? Chapter 1 London, England Late Winter 1821 Derek Winters, the 8th Duke of Blackthorne, sat cloaked in the darkness of his office. Curtains drawn, the room silent and empty, but for the eerie shadows that played off the walls, he'd come to crave the deathly still of the room like a demon craved the fires of hell. From the corner of his soul eye he glared at the crumpled copy of the Times that lay on the table beside him, as it had for months. A growl worked its way up his throat and he swiped the damned sheet up. He squinted and reread those familiar words, once more. The Marquis of St. Cyr nearly killed underneath the deadened branches of a Hyde Park elm. At one time, that piece would have devastated him. He fisted the page, further wrinkling the old copy. Now, this new man he'd become found an unholy glee in the other man's misery. He gripped the arms of his chair. With his back presented to the room, he stared into the dancing flames of the blazing hearth. Only, he'd ceased to be human long ago, because of that very happy man, nearly killed by a blasted branch. Then, wasn't that life? Some men had families and love and good fortune, and then others? A muscle ticked at the corner of his eye. And others have nothing, he whispered. Yes, others were cursed, like the other Winter's family members who'd only known death and despair. Such a truth had once ripped him apart with a vicious pain. Somewhere along the way, he built himself into a man who didn't feel or care. And he was all the stronger for it. Derek hurled the paper into the hearth and the scorching flames quickly devoured them. The hungry fire's glow burned all the brighter. A hard, mirthless grin turned his lips. How singularly interesting the fire should provide warmth for some and, yet, for him it held nothing but the frigid cold of his past. He absently fingered the head of his serpent-headed cane, the gold medal cool against his right palm. If you play with fire, you get burned. If you play with flames, you'll be smote. If you avoid the heat, the better off you be. So do not ever play with fire, or gone forevermore, for all eternity. The children's proverb echoed around the chambers of his mind, words given him by a stern tutor, who'd tired of Derek's dangerous pursuits. A log snapped in the hearth in an explosion of crimson embers. He leaned his cane against the edge of his chair and tugged the glove off of his left hand. Turning his hand over, he examined the ragged, puckered, white flesh. How very wrong Mr. Johnson had been. Fire did not kill, it merely destroyed. Death would often be preferable. A knock sounded at the door. Derek whipped his head to the right and glowered at the wood panel. With a growl of annoyance, he yanked his glove back on. His servants did not disturb him. And the lords he'd once called friends assuredly did not disturb him. No one did. People knew better. He returned his attention to the fiery blaze once more. The infernal rapping continued. He winced. 
Alas, this bloody fool still had yet to realize he was a different duke than the one who'd preceded him to the grave. Then the knocking ceased. He eased back into the folds of the worn leather chair. Perhaps the man wasn't a total lackwit. The press of a handle sounded like a shot as the creak of the door filled the room. Derek stiffened. Surely the man had gleaned, in the time he'd served his master, one, essential fact, one did not enter the devil's lair. Why your grace? The butler cleared his throat. Apparently, he'd not gleaned that essential fact. I. He cleared his throat once more. I, Derek angled his head at the very slightest angle. Harris bore another damned silver tray with another damned folded note bearing the Earl of Maxwell's seal. From the corner of his eye, he saw the man jump. Have I not told you, I'm not to be disturbed? Especially not with notes from boyhood friends. Yes, why your grace? The silver tray trembled in his hands. I would not disturb you unless. Have I not instructed you to direct all matters of business to my man of affairs? He jerked his chin at the tray. And not to bother me with those damned notes? The butler looked down at the ivory velum in his care and blinked several times. Uh, why yes, your grace. He hastily set the note on a veneered wood side table, as he always did, and pulled the tray against his chest. As he also always did. But you see, drawing a deep breath, the man let his words out on a swift exhale. Mr. Davies has arrived, he finished on a rush. His man of affairs. Rather, his dead brother's man of affairs. He can go to the devil and you can join him, Harrison, he hissed. Now, get out. Harris's cheeks went ashen. He hesitated and his Adam's apple bobbed up and down. The servant looked over his shoulder and then back to Derek. He narrowed his eye. You showed him here anyway, did you, Harrison? The remaining color fled his butler's cheeks. I, I. I should sack you, he seated, climbing slowly to his feet. And he would toss the insolent servant on his bloody arse if he were in a mind to have Davy search out another who'd brave the beast of Blackthorn's lair. Why, yes. Then, with a remarkable show of courage, the young servant asked, So I may show him in, then? And if Derek hadn't ceased laughing a lifetime ago, he'd have at least managed a smile, born of mirth, at the man's temerity. Then, he didn't think the muscles of his scarred and burned face could manage the appropriate movement anymore. Show him in he said on a steely whisper. Mr. Davies, a white-haired man of indiscriminate years, stepped around Harris, his arms laden with folios. Your G. Grace. He dropped a bow, but not before revulsion flashed in his eyes. Derek peeled his lip back in a sneer. When he'd returned to England from the Battle of Toulouse, the left side of his face ravaged by burns, those appalled looks and horrified whispers had gutted him. Somewhere along the way, he'd become mercifully deadened to that revulsion. Harris took his leave and pulled the door closed with a soft click. Derek grabbed his serpent-headed cane and, with the aid of that mortifying crutch, he awkwardly lurched across the room. What the hell do you want? He infused a deathly edge to that whisper. He cast a glance at Davies. The books tumbled from his arms and hit the hardwood floor with a loud thump. It is about your sister, Lady Stonehaven, why your grace. Derek's useless left leg dragged and he stumbled. He righted himself with the use of his cane. My sister? His words came as though down a long corridor. Why yes, your grace. The sounds of rustling papers filled the room while Davies tidied his documents. Derek stood frozen, his gaze fixed on the garish, crimson wallpaper, the color of blood. His heart thundered loudly, and he longed to spin on his heel and shake some bloody urgency from the other man. As he, who'd given up on hope long ago, felt it flicker to life from a place deep inside he'd believed long dead. His sister, Edeline. And has she been located? At the stretch of silence, he shot a look over his shoulder. The floorboards creaked as Davies climbed to his feet. Found. Thick befuddlement coated that word. Uh, no, your G-Grace. That matter-of-fact deliverance spoke volumes, 
quashed all fledgling hope and promptly restored Derek to the coolly logical beast who didn't believe in fairy tales of hope and happiness. Then what the hell do you want? They met precisely the same time each week. There were no additional meetings. I'd specifically told you I wouldn't give a bloody damn if the world was ending on Sunday, I don't expect your presence here that day. Why yes. Very well, your grace. Indeed, I know that. Davy shifted back and forth on his feet with an ease and grace Derek despised. What sorry days, indeed, when he should envy a man that slight pathetic movement with unbroken legs. With a growl, he lurched the remainder of the way to his sideboard and slammed down his cane. It is Lady Flora. He paused, his hand poised over the crystal decanters. Flora? Derek furrowed his brow and tried to make sense of the name and, more importantly, why it should mean something. People didn't matter to him. They saw him as the scarred, horrific beast he was and he preferred life that way. Though, not everyone saw you as only a beast. An unexpected pain ripped through him. Derek thrust aside that unwanted emotion and searched his mind for the familiarity of that name. He'd not had a woman since he'd been back from his heroic pursuits upon the continent. Since his return, not even a heavily paid whore had braved his touch. Shame pricked his neck at the memory. Lady Flora, the man repeated. I'm not in the mood for your guessing games, Davies. He snapped up a bottle of brandy. With quick, jerky movements, he yanked out the stopper and tossed it down where it clattered noisily upon the sideboard. Derek poured himself a tall snifter of fine French brandy. The bloody French. When Davy still did not speak, he turned. Who the hell is Lady Flora? At that lethal whisper, his man of affairs dropped his books once more. He fell to his knees and scurried about collecting his papers and folios, like a mouse who'd found crumbs in the kitchen. Derek grabbed his cane and stalked over to the still silent man. Davies craned his neck back. Your grace, she is your niece, he croaked. Lady Stonehaven's daughter. Edeline's daughter. He gripped hard the top of his cane. That child born to his sister, a stranger whom he'd not met. The child he'd not wanted to meet, despite his sister's occasional attempts to invade his sanctuary, with her daughter in tow. What of her? The man, who loyally served the previous two dukes before, stared wide-eyed at him. You were named Guardian, Your Grace. She has two guardians. But her other guardian, Davies yanked at his collar and then the folios drooped in his arms. He hurried to catch them. Your mother would never have approved of Lord Landon, Your Grace. A mocking grin tugged the unscarred corner of his mouth. But my mother is dead now, isn't she? He raised his glass in salute. For his devoted mother, the same one who'd taken one look at him upon his return from Toulouse and ordered him to hide his face from polite society, had been so devastated by her other children's passing, that she'd willed herself to death. Proving more loyal than smart, Davies frowned. I have served your family for nearly two decades, your grace. Your mother was honorable and good and put the Blackthorn title first. As such, she'd not cared to see her granddaughter living in Lord Landon's household. That devoted, devastated mama had mourned her dead son, and then with Edeline's disappearance aboard her sunken ship six months earlier, had abandoned all aspect of living. You dare presume to tell me what manner of woman my mother was? Proud and boastful of Derek when he'd been a young man in the second regiment, and disgusted and horrified when he'd returned a monster. The man gulped loudly. And no, your grace. He fixed a black glower on the loyal servant. That loyalty, no doubt, accounted for his willingness to bear Derek's company, weakly. Derek returned to the sideboard to retrieve his brandy and limped toward his seat at the hearth. A mirthless half-smile formed on his lips. Loyal mother, indeed. The flames danced and twisted and froze him mid-movement. Ah, God. Mother of God. Make it stop. Davies cleared his throat. Your grace? That hesitant inquiry propelled him into movement and Derek reclaimed his chair. He settled his cane alongside his comfortable leather seat. With the muscles of his thigh aching from his exertions, 
Derek rubbed the throbbing tendons. His man of affairs followed his efforts and he stilled. Tired of the servant's presence here this day, Derek spoke in emotionless tones. The girl can be Lord Landon's responsibility. He expected Davies to take his leave. Instead, he set the burden in his arms on the side table and tightened his mouth. She is your sister's daughter. Surely that means something? It does not. Derek took a long, slow sip of his drink and then stared at the amber drops that clung to the other side of the glass. At one time, when he'd been human, such a thing as his sister's child would have mattered. Then, he'd been a man who loved his sister and cared for her happiness. He didn't care about anyone or anything, anymore. Not even himself. He looked up and frowned. Why are you still here? The other man snapped out a kerchief, removed his wire-rimmed spectacles and brushed off the lenses. Lord Landon is a rake. He has. A mottled flush stained the other man's cheeks. It mattered not what Lord Landon had or did not have. And yet. He has what, he snapped. Parties. Davies jammed his spectacles on his nose and then wrestled with his cravat once again. Improper parties, he said on a whisper. With ladies and gentlemen who are not at all respectable. Shocking parties. Scandalous. Back in his youth, just before he'd gone off to war, his brother had hosted one of those shocking events. Attired in his resplendent uniform, women had clamored for a place in Derek's bed, and he'd reveled in the fleeting role of rogue. The agony of remembrance struck as fresh as the day he'd returned, facing horror and disdain. A potent hatred unfurled inside him toward Davies, who dredged forth all the ugliest, darkest memories of his past, memories he'd thought himself immune to. Derek gripped the arms of his chair and forced his attention back to the old servant who eyed him with a rightful degree of terror. My sister's husband named Lord Landon as the child's second guardian. That should suffice in terms of your unease. Derek swirled the contents of his glass. He'd but glimpsed his niece from the corner of a window when his sister had paid her foolishly devoted visits to his townhouse. Mother and daughter would arrive, knock, be greeted by his butler, and then turned away. He didn't want Lady Flora to matter, because frankly, she did not matter. Ultimately, she was doomed by the very nature of her birth to their cursed family, and he'd little desire letting her in his life, in any way. Davies took a hesitant step closer. Prior to your mother's passing, she asked that you see to her ladyship's care. Of course, because the repulsed mother hadn't been able to manage a letter, let alone a visit. She never said a word of it to me, he taunted. The ancient man of affairs pursed his lips. Her grace was too grief-stricken to deal with the matter of the girl. Yes, because for as little as she loved Derek, she'd much loved her incomparable daughter, Adeline, and her pompous, now dead, ducal son. It is unnatural for a mother to look upon her son with a face such as yours. He sneered. You expect me to care about what she wished? Davies winced. He opened his mouth. Footsteps sounded in the hall, cutting into whatever the man was about to say. The girl has been living alone with only her governess. The footfalls grew closer and Davies spoke louder, as though trying to blot out the sound of it. Her governess has refused to care for the child as long as she resides in Lord Landon's home, and... A rap sounded at the door. And... Who is next, the bloody, goddamn king? Derek thundered. Enter. His butler opened the door, slowly and white-cheeked, stuck his head inside the room. Why your grace? A small child, with dark brown hair, stepped around the butler. With her tight curls and cornflower blue eyes, she may as well have been a tiny replica of Adeline, years and years earlier. The girl searched the room, her gaze teeming with curiosity, landed on Derek. The air lodged in his chest. What in blazes? Fear and horror sprang to life inside her eyes, and he welcomed that familiar, comforting response to the beast he was, for that was the only thing he understood in this goddamn moment. Except, with the same boldness and strength demonstrated by his sister when she'd been living, the girl came forward. Uninvited. Unasked. Unafraid? Surely not. 
she stopped before him. Then, she looked him up and down in an assessing manner. You are my uncle Derek. She stuck her tiny palm out. And I am here to live with you. She wrinkled her nose. Mostly because I have nowhere else to go. Derek cocked his head and stared down at the girl. Ignoring her outstretched fingers, he whipped his gaze to the fool Davies. The man swallowed audibly. As I was saying, your grace. The lady's governess would not care for Lady Flora in Lord Landon's home. As such, I took the liberty of having her delivered here. He narrowed his eye. Bloody hell. Chapter 2 Just Outside of London One month later. It was raining. Standing at the edge of the floor-length window, draped in black bombazine, Miss Lily Benedict fiddled with the midnight curtains. Her gaze remained fixed on the black carriage that had arrived a long while ago. Raindrops pinged off the lead window pane with a grating staccato that increased the rapid beat of her heart. Lily forced herself to take a deep breath. Except, long ago, she'd come to find those crystal drops portended disaster. Nor could it be a coincidence that after weeks of uninterrupted sunshine, the skies should open now, of all days. A slow-building dread settled in her belly and found out. And she waited. Waited as she had since she'd received word of Sir Henry's death a fortnight ago. Just as she'd been waiting ever since. But, when powerful gentlemen went on to the hereafter, the fate of six-year-long mistresses hardly took precedence. In fact, it took no precedence at all. Her fingers shook, and to give the trembling digits purpose, Lily tossed the black velvet drape wide. Before being summoned by Sir Henry's son just yesterday, she'd been tucked away in a cottage amidst abundant gardens and trees, a place that might as well have been a fairy's meadow and not a place fit for a whore. Now she awaited word of her future. In a perfectly menacing show of nature's fury, rain slanted a downward path from the skies. Lightning cracked, illuminating the sky in an ominous display of blue and white, and she jumped as the rumble shook the foundation of the cottage. The ping of raindrops continued to hit the window pane. Her pale visage reflected back and she touched one of the fat raindrops streaking down the lead panel like a crystal tear. It means the sky is crying, doesn't it, Papa? Don't be silly, girl, the sky does not cry. Your whimsical nonsense will find you in trouble someday, Liliana. Mr. Holdsworth will see you now. Even expecting that summons as she'd been, from her spot at the edge of the parlor, Lily released the curtain with alacrity and it snapped noisily into place. She spun to face the butler. A man of indeterminate years, he eyed her down his long nose. Tipping her chin up, Lily started for the doorway. She'd long grown accustomed to that disdain. However, she'd been a desperate, cowering child years earlier. She was no longer that girl. Lily forced her legs into motion, then moved at a sedate pace, keeping a sizable distance between her and the head of the household. The man shot a disgusted stare back in her direction. It would seem even servants had standards where whores were concerned. She turned down the hall and the butler drew them to a halt. Without so much as a knock, he pushed the door open and motioned her inside. She took a step, but not before he leveled her with an ugly sneer. Another splash of heat burned up her neck and set her cheeks ablaze. Setting her jaw at a mutinous angle, she strode past him and into the quiet office. The servant pulled the door closed behind her with an ominous click. Lily froze at the entrance of the parlor. Black bombazine lined the walls and covered the curtains giving the room a look of a life-size spider's web of black thread. The mahogany Chippendale furniture with the angry lions lent that angry air of rapaciousness, reminding her how she had always detested her protector's choice of furnishings in her own cottage. And at the center of that web was a tall, too slender gentleman. With his wild mane of crimson brutus curls and long sideburns, the man had the menacing look of one of those predatory creatures. By the amusement in Mr. Lucas Holtzworth's eyes, he'd noted her scrutiny. Miss Benedict, he greeted, stretching out those long, nasally syllables. Sir, she said through tight lips. With a casualness that set her teeth on edge, he propped his hip on the sideboard and studied her over the rim of his glass. You are, indeed, 
as lovely in person as my father described, he said without preamble. Did he expect her gratitude for such compliments? Lily remained stonily silent. The ghost of a smile played on his hard lips. Shall I get to the heart of it? She inclined her head. If you would. For all the vile things she'd done, for the depraved life she'd lived warming Sir Henry's bed, at last she would have her freedom. A giddy lightness filled her chest, muting the self-loathing, and fear, and contempt. Oh, those sentiments would always be there. She'd never be free of them, but she had survived, and there was something to be said for living. You have nothing. And just like that, a gentleman had cut the legs out from under her somewhat steady world once more. Lily went still and attempted to pick her way through her confounded thoughts. Mr. Holdsworth? She managed to force that inquiry out. Nothing, he said, the slow grin forming on his lips, hinted at his twisted enjoyment. You have nothing. Lily gave a slight shake of her head. What could he be saying? Sir Henry settled funds upon me, she said, her voice hollow. He promised her through the years, promised to see her cared for after he passed. No, he said, inclining his head. Perhaps he intended to settle funds upon you at some point. He did not, however, settle anything upon his death. The man's son took another sip. You see, there is nothing to settle. There is nothing left of the estates and certainly nothing to give my father's horror. No. Just another man's lies. Lily fisted her hands hard enough that her nails drew blood on her palms to keep from indulging in the scream stuck in her throat. The room swayed and she shot out a hand. She found purchase at the edge of the leather button sofa she was standing near. There is nothing. There is nothing. His mocking words echoed around her protesting mind. Lily pressed her eyes closed. She could not have sold her body and soul for freedom only to have nothing. What was it for then? Surviving? Is that what this has been these past six years? Tisk, tisk. He made a clucking noise like a chicken that had pecked around her family's home. I see I've upset you. I am and not upset, she said hating the break in her voice. She was livid. Enraged. Broken. Shattered. No, the dark swirl of emotions threatening to drag her under moved far beyond a mere upset. Holdsworth took yet another sip. There is something I would have you to do for me. She blinked slowly. Of course. Her skin went hot then cold with the inevitable insult that vile proposition she'd not accept. The man could go to the devil and she'd send him there with a kick to his pompous arse. She'd not spread her legs again. Not for him. And not for any other. I understand you are familiar with the Duke of Blackthorne's family. Had he pulled the opposite carpet out from under her feet and appended her, she could not have been more off balance. She shook her head. She'd spent years hating everything and anything connected with that name. She'd spent the other years hating herself for having humbled herself before that vile family. Lily had vowed to never think of them again and only in the darkest corner of her mind, when the clock ticked in the dead of night, while the nightmares kept her awake, did she allow herself to think of any of them. You've gone quiet, Miss Benedict. I did not know you required a response. Her tart response roused a booming laugh. Ah, if you were this feisty before a man in discourse, how spirited you must be in his bed. Bile burned at the back of her throat. Odd, she'd not grown accustomed to crude talk and leering stares. Say what it is you'd say and be done with it, she said with a practiced cool that drew a frown. Good, he did not care for her aloof dismissal. A thrill of satisfaction went through her. It occurs to me you detest the Duke of Blackthorne's family nearly as much as I do. He would be wrong. How do you? She snapped her mouth closed, already having said too much. Even as she longed to know just what he knew of her connection to that loathsome lot, she'd not allow him to toy with her like a cat with a mouse between its paws. He winged a red eyebrow upward. How do I know that part of your past, Miss Benedict? He paused meaningfully. Or should I say Miss Bennett? 
Holdsworth gave her a sardonic grin. I know more than you would like. A chill stole through her. Lily schooled her features into an inscrutable mask, refusing to give him a hint of shock and confusion currently running through her. She believed she'd carved out a relatively obscure identity as Sir Henry's lover. With his two daughters near of age to Lily herself, she'd foolishly believed he'd keep Lily away as his dirty secret. Who else knew of the shameful life she'd lived these years? The memory of her family flitted around the chambers of her mind and an unexpected agony lanced her heart. What would her parents, her siblings, say of Lily's deeper descent into depravity? Odd, she thought each memory of each member of her family was properly buried and forever forgotten. How awful to have that erroneous truth shattered before this heartless bastard, no less. As this icy stranger continued speaking, she forcibly thrust back the images of her brothers and sister. My father was quite forthcoming. Lily jerked erect. Was he? She could not keep the bitterness from creeping into that two-word question. Men had proven themselves remarkably boorish and detestable where she was concerned, and she'd proven herself foolish time and time again for trusting a word out of their treacherous mouths. He was. Should it come as any surprise he'd violated that portion of her trust with his son? The world was controlled by these men, called gentlemen, when there really was nothing gentle in them. They were ruthless, grasping, and self-serving. What value would a single one of them ever place on her desire for some hint of privacy in her own past, Holdsworth set his glass down. With a taunting gleam lighting his eyes, he folded his arms at his chest. It is no secret my family disapproved of the whore who kept him company all these years. Hardly coin to be had for my sister's come-outs, and yet you lived this comfortable life in the country. 6. She bit out. That was how long it had been since Sir Henry had insisted Lily go from his mate to his mistress. That was also the day she'd abandoned her name of Liliana Bennett. He furrowed his brow. It was six years. A lady did not forget a moment of her life she spent in a hell of her own making. She tightened her jaw. Or in this case, a hell of hers and a now dead duke's making. Six years a whore, the man mused, more to himself. She curled her hands into tight balls at her side, not giving him the satisfaction in knowing his words, even for their truth, nay especially for their truth, cut sharper than a dull-edged blade being thrust into her belly. Yes, she said with a stoic calm. Six years a horror. To a man who'd taken her to his bed, shared his home, and shared her secrets with his son. Regardless, he said with a flick of his hand. It matters not how long you've warmed my father's bed, but rather what brought you into his life. He made a tsking noise. Blackthorn, that lover of all things beautiful. Things. That was how these pompous, arrogant nobles saw women and objects alike, as mere things for their pleasures. If only her fifteen-year-old self had known the ugliness in their souls. My father asked that I care for you. Dread pebbled in her belly. That tiny, anxious pit born of the treachery she'd experienced through the years. How very kind of him, she responded stiffly. Her eyes must have reflected the thousand panicked questions racing through her mind. He scoffed. Surely you'd not expect my father to name his lover in his will? Not when he left his children facing financial ruin. Oh, God. Was it a wonder that a gentleman who'd promised her freedom all those years ago had also betrayed her? How could she be so foolishly naive, again? Once again, the floor dropped out from under her and she shot her hands out to steady herself with the support of the leather button sofa. In a maddeningly nonchalant manner, Holdsworth shoved away from the sideboard and like a predator stalking its prey, closed the distance between them. The triumphant glimmer in his eyes indicated he relished her shock. He came to a stop beside her. He was clear what was to happen to you were he ever to pass. She braced for the sickening, vile proposition he put to her. Nadja turned in her stomach at the idea of spreading her legs for another. Was he? And I quite assured him that I would. After all, what kind of son would I be if I did not see to his dying request? A cold, taunting smile formed on his lips. Bile burned like acid in her throat and she remained frozen, incapable of words. 
By your reaction, you expect an offer of protectorship from me, don't you? Hmm, he prodded when she still said nothing. Heat blazed over her body, and she damned the cream white of her skin that surely revealed that telling color. Do you not? She prided herself on the steady deliverance of those words. Holtzworth ran his knuckles down her cheek and she stilled so as to not give him an indication as to how repulsed she was by his touch. Would you like that, Miss Benedict? His sickly, sweet breath fanned her cheek. Would you like me to find a place for you in my bed? To stay in this cottage as my mistress? Never again. She curled her hands tight. She'd pledged to never take another man to her bed and, with Sir Henry's promise of a home in the country, she'd foolishly believed her future secure, at last. I assure you not, she said, coldly. Even I, a whore, have too much honor to take a married man to my bed. A whore with honor, he chuckled. Imagine that. Her fingers twitched with the urge to slap him. Nor was an offer of protectorship what your father pledged when he spoke of my security. He'd promised a country cottage in Northumberland, far away from Carlisle, far away from London, far away from anyone and everyone who might know her. Ah uh, yes. Northumberland, wasn't it, I believe, he asked, dropping his hand to his side. And you, my dear, may rest assured that even I have better taste than to rut between the legs of my father's favored and well-used whore. Her heartbeat kicked up at his knowledge of the future she'd hoped for herself. She took a step back, putting distance between her and this volatile stranger. No one was to have shared in that unchartered, unjourneyed part of her life. Sir Henry had promised as much. Tired of being the unwitting player in a game she did not know the rules for, she snapped. Why do you not say what it is you want, instead of speaking in veiled terms of my past? And my future? A now rather uncertain, bleak future. All, because of another broken promise. Another swell of bitterness churned through her. As I was saying earlier, about the Duke of Blackthorne. He stared expectantly at her. Did he search for a hint of pain at the mere mention of George's title? What he could not know is that she'd long ago found she'd never truly loved the Duke of Blackthorne. What of him? It is my understanding the Duke is dead, she said. Not even a free zone of warmth stirred for the late Duke. She'd loved the idea of being so very loved by him. She'd loved his whispered words of affection, those falsely whispered words. But she'd been nothing more than an infatuated girl, taken by his charm and looks. She winced. God, what a bloody fool she'd been. The laugh he'd had over her. Not a hint of warmth for the man you gave your heart and virginity to, he observed. For his obvious cruelness, there was an astuteness to him. I have little warmth for men who use me and deceive me, she said pointedly. A sharp bark of laughter escaped Holtzworth. So that, lack of warmth as you refer to it, I take, extends to the members who share the blood of those men, he asked when his shoulders no longer shook with his mirth. Lily shook her head. You are speaking in riddles. Holtzworth spread his arms wide before him. Let me be more clear then, Miss Benedict. Would you share an equal apathy for the Duke of Blackthorne's kin? No one could abhor that vile family more than Lily. They'd turned her away when she was most desperate and sent her into the world without a hint of compassion. God wrought their souls. Ah, uh, I see by the hatred snapping in your eyes, Miss Benedict, we are of like opinion for that family. There was no shortage of enemies for the winter's kin. Was it a wonder? Something was taken from me, something very valuable and special, and I would have you return it to me. So embroiled in her own tumultuous thoughts of hate, it took a moment for the man's words to register. Taken? She blinked several times, knowing she must appear a lack wit, but too absorbed in her own pained remembrances that she couldn't put to right Holtzworth's words. What matter was it to her what this man had lost? Whatever it was of the material variety could never, ever come close to the loss she'd suffered at that family's hands. Lily squared her jaw. I do not see how this pertains to me, she said impatiently. Ah, but it very much pertains to you. He returned to the sideboard and retrieved a glass. The gentleman appeared to consider his selection, 
passing over several decanters, before settling on a bottle of brandy. He held the bottle aloft and made a show of studying the amber brew. Would you care for a drink? I do not drink spirits, she said stiffly. His lips quirked in a sardonic grin that set her teeth on edge. My, you are the very proper mistress, aren't you? Lily bit back the sharp retort on her lips. She could ill afford to become insolent to a man who with one curt word could see her tossed out on his recently inherited doorstep. The French have a great taste for fine things and beauty. He stared expectantly back at her as though they were to deliver lines in a play and she was absent a verse. But she was remarkably empty in terms of talk on fine things. She'd been born to a vicar and became a maid and then a gentleman's plaything. I do not know much of fine things, she settled for at last. Come, never tell me my father did not see you properly fitted in diamonds and fine baubles. He'd given her food, shelter, and not a thing more. She allowed her silence to serve as her answer. Oh, that is rich. Holdsworth tossed his head back on a thunderous laugh and she curled her hands tight as he dashed back tears of mirth. Was there something you wished to speak with me on? she asked, unable to quell her impatience. What a horrid world in which women were born. To be subject to the whims and fancies of men and so very dependent upon them for one's everything. There was, he said, withdrawing an embroidered kerchief from his pocket. He brushed aside the remaining evidence of amusement on his cheeks. There is a diamond. A very sizable diamond, worth far more value than the cottage in my possession. Her heartbeat sped up with the fragile hope. Mayhap, there had been some honor in Sir Henry, and he'd see her cared for. A diamond? Do not be silly, Miss Benedict, it is nothing left by my father to you. It is a cherished heirloom. Hope's dashed once more, she said, I still do not see what this bauble has to do with me. Bauble? He winged an eyebrow up. The diamond I am speaking of is over sixty-eight carats. She choked on her swallow. He took a sip of his drink. I see you are suitably impressed, he said over the rim of his glass. My family descended from a man of French origins. Jean Tavenier. He stared back at her, as though that name should mean something to her. After King Louis and Marie Antoinette were killed, my ancestors secreted that stone out of France. Lily lifted her shoulders in a slight shrug. I do not see how your familial lesson on history has any bearings on my future or your father's promise. His broken one. Unless his information could ensure her security and spare her from spreading her legs ever again, then it interested her not at all. Annoyance lit the man's eyes. You should care. You see, it is what happened after that exchange you should care very much about. It was in our possession until a powerful, obscenely wealthy duke took it from my father. She stared blankly at him as the words began to make slow sense. George, she caught herself. The Duke of Blackthorn, she amended. A lover of all things beautiful, he said with a slight inclination of his head. A sneer pulled at his lips as he looked her up and down. The late duke sought to purchase the stone from my father as a gift for his then-betrothed. A memory slid forth of a long-ago night inside the duke's hallowed halls, but trickled out, as Holtworth continued. Refusing to sell that heirloom, my father was convinced to allow the future duchess to wear the piece at their betrothal ball and on her wedding day. Blackthorne paid a fee for that honor. He tightened his mouth. It was never returned. Of course. Isn't that what George had done? He'd taken beautiful gems for his own pleasures and the consequences be damned? Resentment slapped her with a power that drove back all warmth. That was who these gentlemen were. Bored men, each driven by greed and opulence. Then, perhaps Sir Henry should not have turned the bauble over to the Duke. Holdsworth rolled his glass between his fingers. You do not like me much, do you, he said, unexpectedly shifting the direction of the conversation. Lily curled her hands into tight balls. I barely know you, she settled for the most basic form of the truth, she knew him, but a handful of moments and despised him with every fiber of her being. A chuckle escaped him, and he continued closer. Why do you not tell me your true thoughts? He spoke on a jeering whisper. 
Tell me how you'd send me to the devil for breaking my father's oath to you. Slap my face for stealing what you consider yours? Lily bit the inside of her cheek. For the truth was, spewing all the vitriolic words on her tongue would likely be the ultimate ruin of her. And that is why it was not a, what did you call it? He arched another crimson eyebrow. A legitimate exchange. I am a mere gentleman. Now, imagine we're at the Duke of Blackthorn making such a request. With his ruthless threats to see my father's business as ruined, did he have any choice but to capitulate? Hmm, he pressed, as she fell silent. Holdsworth ran a condescending gaze over her. I expected one despoiled by that Duke would have learnt that family's ruthlessness. She stilled, hating that his blasted words made any kind of sense. What do you want? she asked quietly. He downed the contents of his drink. I want you to retrieve it for me, my dear. She snorted. If you think my familial connection is anything worth mentioning that will result in the current duke turning over that great gift, then you are mistaken. He opened his mouth to speak, but a sharp rap at the door interrupted his words. Holdsworth looked to the door. Enter. An older servant shuffled into the room bearing a copy of a newspaper. He handed the London Times over to his new employer and then took his leave. Holdsworth held it out. Read the front page. She wanted to slap the paper away and throw his more order than request back in his face. Curiosity, however, pulled at her. Accepting the paper with stiff fingers, she proceeded to scan the wrinkled, slightly aged sheet. One name leaped out. Her heart stuttered a beat. After his disfigurement and near death at war, his grace, the Duke of B has proven himself cursed once again. The early, tragic death of his eldest brother, George, the seventh Duke of B is now followed by the loss of his mother, and only sister and brother-in-law at sea. For too many years she'd attended that family, feeding and fanning her hatred. At some point, she'd only absently skimmed the on dits about the Winter's family. Angry this man would force her to delve back into a world she despised, Lily tossed the newspaper on a nearby rosin-laid table where it landed with a soft thump. Do you have anything to say? No. Nothing that she cared to share with this man. She had read that handful of details on the new duke in the scandal sheets, but did not need to personally know the gentleman to understand very well that he'd been cursed. Then, as one who'd been cursed herself, it was easy enough to recognize it in another. And there was no doubt, someone in Winter's line must have made a deal with the devil and the time of payment was due. Humph, he said after the protracted silence. The Duke's sister, Lady Stonehaven, left a girl. Regret tugged at her heart as it invariably did when thoughts or words of babes and children crept in. Did she, she managed to get out past the emotion clogging her throat. For in one reckless moment, she'd thrown away all hope or dreams of her own family, a child to love, an honorable husband. He eyed her a long while and, for one horrifying moment, she thought he somehow knew that deepest, darkest longing that would leave her exposed in ways she'd not have him see. But then the look was gone. Guardianship was recently given over to the Beast of Blackthorn. She looked at him askance. He motioned to his face. The whole disfigurement business. How ruthless they all were, these men who ruled the world. As you can imagine, the man cannot maintain a proper staff and, subsequently, he cannot maintain a proper governess for the girl. Winter's blood and all, sadness filled Lily, for that child. She knew the agony of losing one's mother and father and being thrust alone into the world. Granted, the girl's fate as a young lady, ward to a duke, was far more certain than Lily's own miserable fate as a vicar's daughter. Holdsworth fished around the front of his jacket and withdrew a stack of papers. He handed them over to her. Go on. Take them. Lily eyed them a moment and then took them from his long, gloved fingers. They are references, he said as she began to read. She raised her perplexed gaze to his. You will have your property in Northumberland, as promised. Once I have the diamond, my circumstances improve greatly and that cottage you crave, is a mere pittance I can easily be rid of. Her heart tripped several erratic beats, with giddy elation. But on the heel of that momentary trace of hope, came the cold crash of reality. 
no gentleman did anything unless it served him. And her security did not offer anything of worth to this man. What do you want? she asked, hating the tremble to that question. Why, you are going to retrieve my diamond. His lips turned up in a triumphant grin. And you are going to do it by wheedling your way into the Duke's employ. He was mad. Mad or desperate, and because of it, he would try and send her back into that vile home she'd been thrown from years earlier. She fisted the pages in her hands. You are asking me to steal the diamond? Incredulity crept into her tone. Retrieve it, he corrected. And, yes. She angled her chin up. For your low opinion of me, I am no thief. A whore, yes. A thief, never. Lily made to turn the false references over to him. Wordlessly, Holdsworth fished out another note. What is this, she asked, not taking her gaze from his. Take it, he urged, pressing it toward her. Lily took the sheet with unsteady fingers. She ran her gaze over it and her stomach dipped. I don't understand. Her words trembled. It is a contract, my dear. I'm not fool enough to incriminate either of us. Seeming unaffected by her turmoil, he stalked over to the sideboard and proceeded to pour himself another brandy. It merely states that when you've successfully completed your tenure as governess to the Duke of Blackthorn, the property will pass to you. He paused, stretching out the moment so only her guilty thoughts and churning desires marched on with a vicious potency. Why, it is your freedom. Lily clenched and unclenched the paper in her hands. This damning sheet that would make her a thief and send her along a new path of shame and ugliness, all for the vices of powerful men. Freedom. That word he dangled before her, floated on the air, tangible and real. Freedom from spreading her legs. Freedom from hunger. Freedom from men such as George and this ruthless gentleman before her. Well, Miss Benedict? She folded her arms close to herself, crunching the damning page. How she hated this selfish desire to do just as Holtworth asked. Why should you not? Why, after everything you've endured, should you not have this small revenge against that hateful family? There are too many uncertainties. How would I even go about finding this diamond? How can you orchestrate my placement within his household? The questions flew from her lips, all the more damning for the lack of a simple, no, I will not help you, there. By the ghost of a smile, he detected her weakening. You will have access to that household and a resourceful woman, such as you can likely ingratiate herself with the beast through that pretty smile. Or... He dropped his gaze to her décolletage. Other ways. Another chill raked her spine. He expected her to whore herself as she must. Again. Only now, this act, this was the level of duplicity that would land a person in Newgate. He must have sensed her waning for he pressed ahead with his defense. Your actions within that household will be largely unobserved. The man is a monster who cannot even keep a staff beyond a butler and a handful of servants who bow to his bidding. Guilt ward with the rational age-old yearning to survive. She searched for proper thoughts. And how will I correspond with you? You are not to contact me, he said brusquely. Ah, of course. He'd have no link to the woman committing a theft in his name. You needn't know the details. A black grin formed on his cruel lips. I will find you when I need you. Numbed by the proof of her own vileness, Lily turned away and strolled to the window. She peered out as the rain drove down in torrents, hearkening back to a long ago, but never forgotten, black night. That night represented the death of dreams and respectability and happiness. It also marked the death knell of happiness. Her blank expression reflected back at her in the lead panel. Well, Miss Benedict? Words hovered on the tip of her tongue a desire to send him to the devil with his ugly request. She slid her eyes closed, warring with herself. This was the family who'd ruined her. Destroyed her. They had made her what she was. Lily drew in a slow breath and then opened her eyes. I will do it, she said, stiffly. Holdsworth raised his glass in salute. 
His exultant laugh echoed around the room as with her silence as confirmation, she sold the remaining sliver of her soul that it seemed she was a whore with less honor than she believed, after all. Chapter 3 Rap 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 It would stop. Rap 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 Because his goddamn butler could not be so blasted stupid. Rap Rap Rap. So damned foolish, as to. Your grace? His butler's voice sounded from the other side of that wood panel. He cursed roundly. So the man was a blasted lackwit to gainsay Derek's wishes. Rap. 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 Again. What the hell do you want? Which, by the creak of his office door, constituted an enter to the man. Derek whipped fully around, exposing his black satin patch. Even with but one eye and the dark of the room, he detected the muscles of the young butler's throat work with the force of his nervous swallow. It is the child, the butler said on a rush. He didn't make any attempt at pretending to not know of whom the other man spoke. The child. As in his sister's sole living offspring, a girl of seven or eight years. A girl who'd not been born yet when he'd gone off to fight and who now resided in his home. Your Grace, the butler, prodded with a hesitancy in his tone. What of her, he seethed. The butler cleared his throat yet again. Air, yes. Right. It is just that Flora, Derek would have to be deaf to fail to hear the slight, reproachful emphasis placed on that name. The girl is sliding down th the banister. Then tell her damned governess, he snapped. I am not her nursemaid. He rubbed the knotted muscles of his leg. No, he was just the man his fool of a sister had named guardian. He tensed his jaw. Damn Edeline for thrusting this on him. The young servant took another tentative step closer. Yes, well, that is what I'm here about, your grace. Lady Flora has been hanging over the edge of the stairwell. Hanging over the edge of the stairwell? A memory trickled in. Oh, Derek. You mustn't. You'll fall. Ah, but how do you not know, Adeline, I am quite invincible. His mind echoed with remembered laughter. He started. Where in blazes had those thoughts come from? He violently thrust the memory aside. What would you have me do? He wrapped his words in silk and steel. Fetch her myself. At the man's hesitation, he narrowed his eye all the further. By God, the man was cracked in the head. Harris cleared his throat. Be but she, those words ended abruptly as Derek shoved to his feet with a black curse. A mottled flush marred the man's pale cheeks. Derek limped across the room. At the abruptness of his quick strides, the muscles of his legs tightened. He forcibly tapped the bottom of his cane into the floor as he walked, fixing on the grating staccato rhythm instead of the pain of moving the blasted leg. Speak to the girl's bloody nursemaid and leave me, he growled as he stopped before the sideboard. He leaned his cane against the rosewood surface and then reached for the nearest decanter. Once more, the servant cleared his throat and Derek glanced back. Ruddy color continued to mar the man's cheeks. S.H. She left, Your Grace. Harris shot a desperate look over his shoulder at the door. Is something the matter with your throat? With bottle in hand, he spun about, his movements less polished and elegant than his unfaltering steps years earlier. Back when he'd been a whole man not reviled as the beast he was. His butler cocked his head. My th throat? Clearing his throat yet again, he said, Air, and no, Your Grace. Thank you for your concern. I wasn't concerned, Harrison, he bit out. The other man blinked rapidly. Air, right. Of course. He paused, his brow furrowed as though he were pained. And it is Harris, your grace. Derek didn't give a damn if the man before him was the good lord himself on the day of reckoning. He yanked the stopper from the decanter and tossed it to the sideboard. Stop clearing your throat in that manner. It is bloody grating. The color leached from Harris's cheeks. 
At one time he'd have felt compunction for talking so to any person. Back then, in the ballrooms upon the continent, Derek had not only been favored by widows and ladies alike, but his company had been desired by all. Brilliant soldier. Charming gentleman. An ugly chuckle rumbled from deep in his chest. If only those same people could see what he'd become. He grabbed a glass from the otherwise immaculate surface and poured himself a measure of brandy. Now, he was rightfully feared. Glass in hand, he grabbed his cane and limped back over to his leather seat, considering the matter of the girl at an end. Harrison or Harris, or whatever in blazes he called himself, was of an entirely different mindset. The tenacious man raised his hand and cleared his throat, but then seemed to remember what he did, for he let his hand fall to his side. With a courage, or perhaps idiocy Derek would have at one time admired, the butler put his shoulders back and yanked on his lapels. Lady Flora had a governess. She has not since. He flushed. Again. Since. What? Derek snapped. Since, he gulped. Ah, uh, yes, the lovely young woman who'd had the misfortune of stepping into the same hall he'd been. She'd taken one glimpse at his scarred face and, with horror stamped on her face, had turned on her heel and fled. Apparently she'd fled the damned townhouse, altogether. Smart girl. The girl is leading the servants a ch. He downed a long sip. Davy sees to the girl's care, does he not? After all, the man saw to all his business. And no, or why yes. Uh. In the absence of a suitably proper reply, Harris clamped his lips tight and rocked on his heels. So. He wasn't altogether a total lackwit. With the rapidity of servants and staff fleeing, Davy should have his salary tripled for the unenviable task he had of finding servants and nursemaids or governesses or whoever it was that attended smallish children. Derek turned, deliberately presenting the other man with his scarred profile. I am not to be bothered with matters pertaining to the girl, he said with icy disdain. Is that clear? The man gulped audibly and, for an instant, Derek thought he intended to issue a rebuke for his dismissive handling of Edeline's daughter. Indeed, your grace. He might be missing an eye, but his hearing was, at the very least, intact and he'd have to be deaf to not hear the frosty disapproval there. The butler's clipped tones were the impressive type his austere, now dead, parents would have applauded. Harris lingered, shifting forward on the balls of his feet. Why are you still here? Derek demanded on a seething whisper. The remaining color leached out of the man's cheeks and he turned to go. Harrison, he said, deliberately using the wrong name. Yes, your grace? I do not care if the dead Queen Charlotte rises from the grave and comes to call. I am not to be bothered again. Is that clear? The butler gave a jerky nod and tripped over himself in his haste to back out of the room. The door closed behind him with a soft click. Bothersome servant now gone, Derek settled into the folds of his familiar chair and let fly a long, colorful curse and massaged the aching muscles of his left thigh. Determined to set aside the reasons for Harris's interruptions, he took a long swallow of brandy. His lips pulled back in an involuntary grimace at the fiery trail, it blazed down his throat. With a sigh, he set his glass down with a hard thunk on the side table. His efforts proved futile. With Harris's reminder of the girl's presence, he'd merely served to remind Derek that his sister, Adeline, the last good soul in the world, had been dealt a watery grave for that goodness. His lips quirked up in a rusty, pained grin. That goodness had been what had driven his sister to visit, regardless of being turned away at the front door. For all the betrayals he had known at the hands of his mother and the whole of society, Adeline had loved him with a devotion he'd never deserved. Fate had realized as much and repaid that folly with death. The loud, whining creak of the door filled the office and he spun. Who is there, he thundered. Silence served as his only answer. He forced himself to his feet, damning the slow awkwardness of his movements. I said I am not to be bothered, Harrison, Derek boomed. He yanked the door fully open. Empty. Furrowing his brow, he stuck his head out of the room and peered into the hall. From the corner of his only eye, 
the flash of white skirts caught his notice and he swung his head about. White skirts fluttered at the end of the hall as a small creature disappeared around the corner. Derek frowned. With a deliberate show for the girl who, no doubt, lingered at the edge of the corridor, he slammed the door with such force, it rattled in its foundation. This had not been the first time she'd crept into his sanctuary. Eventually, she always fled, which was good. He didn't have use or need of the child his sister had saddled him with. Then, what manner of girl was she that she did not have a suitable fear and horror? He lurched across the room but paused to swipe another note left by Harris. This from Saint Seer. The familiar inked scrawl stared back at him. Good God, why did the man persist? Had Derek not suitably severed that lifelong friendship recently? With uneven movements, he limped over to the hearth. He stood, transfixed by the crimson and orange fire. It possessed that same, powerful hold upon him that it always did. Do not turn yourself over to that fear. Do not. Do not. As the heat touched his skin, his mouth went dry. A rapidly growing disquiet stirred within him, ushering in a familiar panic. He drew in slow, rhythmic breaths and concentrated on those ragged airflows to keep from descending into the pit of madness that had followed him since that day. Derek pressed his eyes shut to keep the memories at bay. But to lose would always be there. Just as the scars and the eye patch and the useless leg would always be there. The screams of men blended in a hideous symphony with the explosion of cannon fire and filled his senses, deafening. Derek thrust the note into the fire and the flames eagerly licked at the ivory velum until the note was no more. He spun on his heel so quickly, his left leg nearly buckled with the suddenness of his movement. Relishing the pain that radiated up his thigh and momentarily distracted him from the memories of battle, he limped across the room, escaping the fire. Escaping when he'd been unable to on the field of battle. Derek drew to a jerky stop beside the window and, in a reflexive movement, pulled the curtain back. Light streamed through the crystal window pane, momentarily blinding him. He jammed the heel of his palm into his remaining eye. White orbs danced within his vision and he blinked frantically. Derek made to release the curtain and then stopped. The London streets below bustled with activity as lords and ladies went about their daily business. Carriages rumbled by. Phaetons being driven by dandies rattled along. Life was, the same and yet, not. For those satin-sprigged ladies and perfumed dandies in the streets below, the world carried on as it always had and would continue to do so. The hideous visage he went out of his way to avoid reflected back at him in the window pane. Only this time, he did not look away but stared boldly at the stranger, burned for his efforts on the fields of Toulouse, forever transformed into a person not even a mother could love. Nausea twisted in his belly, a deep sickness that had nothing to do with the memories and everything to do with the beast before him. You are the same bloody, weak fool you always were, he whispered into the quiet. Thrusting aside the maudlin thoughts, he let the curtain go, just as a hackney came to a quick halt directly outside his townhouse. Derek adjusted the band of his eye patch that bit painfully into his temple. A hired hack? No one had business here. He opened the curtains once again and cursed as the sunlight streamed inside, temporarily blinding his eye once again. His vision cleared just as the driver opened the door. A flash of blue penetrated the opening of that carriage, that color so vibrant and powerful, it conjured memories of summer in the country, traipsing through the hillside, while he'd hidden from his tutors. The driver reached inside the carriage and handed down the owner of that flash of color. All the breath sucked from his chest and he pressed his brow to the warm window pane. The young woman, a stranger in a wool cloak took several tentative steps toward the front of his townhouse and then, as though she felt his beastly gaze upon her, paused. Tilting her head toward the sun, she raised a hand to her eyes and stared at the front facade of his townhouse. Only, what would one such as she have business with here? Derek quickly ran his gaze over her. A powerful surge of desire slammed into him, at the sight of her lean, lithe frame and generous décolletage pressing against the fabric of her cloak. The man he'd been had appreciated beauty. He'd relished the satiny perfection of a woman's skin, celebrated the silken tresses of a woman's hair as it had fanned about them upon satin sheets. 
the man he was now still appreciated beauty, even knowing he would never again experience the taste of passion he'd sampled through the years. And this woman, frozen outside his townhouse, evinced the heart-stopping beauty that drove men to sonnets. The silly straw bonnet atop her head did little to conceal the raven color of her curls. Several strands hung haphazardly over her shoulder. Taller than most women, she had the look of a Spartan warrioress. Just then, the captivating stranger inched her gaze up higher and found his window. Derek cursed and let go the curtain with such alacrity it snapped noisily in the quiet. Tightening his jaw, he thrust aside his fleeting appreciation for the stranger outside his home. There was no business she could have here. After all, polite society and impolite society all knew, you never stirred the beast of Blackthorn. After her most recent shameful fall from grace, Lily had become attuned to gaping stares, none of those looks were kind and all condemning. That acuity was how she'd known someone had been staring at her. She raised her gaze up the white facade of the Duke of Blackthorne's townhouse. The faint flutter of velvet curtains in the top window lent proof to her earlier feeling of being watched. A slight shiver of unease raced along her spine. The first real stirring of anxiety, since she'd rented a hack and left the shameful life she'd lived these past years, ran through her. Granted, it would be the height of foolishness to not be attacked by doubt. After all, what powerful duke known as the Beast would turn the care of his ward over to a woman ruined by his dead brother? This is lunacy, she whispered to herself. Foolishly, she'd not allowed herself to think of, once again, setting foot inside these halls. Despite the warmth of the spring day, her teeth chattered. Her fingers curled hard around the handle of her valise. She stared dumbly at the door as her past converged with her future, whirring and twisting, so she could not sort out that long-ago night from the now. A pressure weighted her chest, restricting airflow as she recalled climbing those same steps, pleading, begging, hoping. I cannot do this. A heavy wind slapped at her skirts, as if nature concurred. She wheeled around to flee. Holdsworth's leering face flashed to mind. The glimmer in his brown eyes, the feral grin on his lips, a ruthless smile that spoke to her future if she failed to do this deed. To not climb the Duke of Blackthorn's steps and demand this post would result in her becoming whore to some other. Or worse. Failure to comply would destroy what remained of Lily's living spirit and she'd not be destroyed again at another man's hands. Squaring her shoulders, she turned back and started forward. Unlike that proverb uttered so many times by her father during her youth, she'd rather face the devil she did not know. Lily stopped beside the Blackwood door. Or in this case, the beast she did not know. She lifted a hand and knocked. Surely you did not believe I would marry you. The door opened almost instantly cutting into the memory of George's mocking laughter. A younger butler with warm eyes stared back. His chestnut hair, tousled and his cheeks flushed, the flustered man appeared to be near his thirtieth year. May I help you? Out of breath, as though he'd run a great distance, he spoke with far more kindness than owed a stranger. Particularly one who'd shown up by hired hackney, no less. She drew in a breath. I. Please come down, a young woman cajoled, momentarily distracting Lily. She tipped her head and the evil deeds that brought her here this day forgotten, she leaned curiously around. The butler promptly pulled the door in her face, just as it had been shut years earlier. Lily shot a hand out to stay that movement, but he merely closed it enough to block her view of the unfolding tableau at his back. She braced for icy contempt. Instead, the servant shot another quick glance over his shoulder and then returned his focus to Lily. Miss, he asked. After her years with Sir Henry's nasty servants, she'd come to expect they were all as condescending and cold as the gentlemen and ladies they worked for. She opened her mouth, when shouts went up behind the man. The color leached from his cheeks and he looked back. Lily followed his stare and caught the trace of a small girl before she then dashed down the hall. Miss, he prodded. My name is me, Mrs. Benedict, she swiftly amended. After all, there was a certain respectability afforded those women with a proper form of address, before their names. Lily set her valise down. I am here, regarding the position of governess. The servant cocked his head. 
according to Holdsworth, and now also by the chaos unfolding on the other side of that wooden panel, the position of nursery governess was open to applicants. I am here to speak with the Duke of Blackthorn about the post, she said on a rush. Once more, she stuck her hand out, braced for the door to shut in her face. Except, the Duke's butler scratched his puzzled brow and then motioned her inside. Lily stood unblinking, with the curious stares trained on her back by passers-by, and then, before the servant realized the folly in his hasty admittance, swept her valise up and sailed inside. The eerie familiarity of it all chilled her. Her insides twisted with a rush of a long-buried terror as the sense of stepping back in time sucked away all logic and thought. Wordlessly, she set the worn cloth bag that had traveled from Carlisle to London on her hellish road to ruin down next to her which merely served to draw the butler's attention to her feet. And her bag. And the obvious fact that no woman simply interviewing for a post would arrive with the entire contents of her life contained within a worn valise. Lily mustered a long-practiced smile and loosened her bonnet strings. She tucked it free and several stubborn curls popped loose of her artful chignon. Her actions served the necessary purpose. The butler stared transfixed, his attention shifted away from the downable sack, between them. The Duke, she said again on a soft whisper. I am here to see his grace. Guilt needled at her conscience, for this underhanded scheme Sir Henry's son would embroil her in. I am just as guilty. He jerked his gaze to her face. Were you sent by the Duke's man of affairs? With all the sins she'd added to her list in life. Lying had not been one of them, until now. Unable to utter more lies to the mountain she'd build in this household, she allowed her smile to serve as an answer that wasn't an answer. Of course, of course, he said and inclined his head. He motioned with a hand and a young footman seemed to materialize out of the shadows. The liveried servant came forward and collected her bonnet. Holdsworth, the man complicit with her in this crime, had indicated the Duke did not have a large staff and, yet, here in this opulent foyer, she'd already met two members of his household. She steadied her trembling fingers. What had she expected, a duke, to have no maids and footmen? No, there would likely be plenty of eyes about to take in people lurking within the household to steal from under his ducal nose. The young footman looked between Lily and the butler. Her cheeks warming, Lily gave her head a clearing shake and shrugged out of her cloak. She turned the garment over to the man's hands. The young man rescued her valise and a protest formed on her lips. That piece served as the last link to her innocence and childhood, and more, her family. She'd not been parted from it in nearly eight years. There was something poignant and painful in entrusting it to these strangers. Mrs. Benedict, if you'll allow me to accompany you to your rooms? He motioned her to follow. Her mind raced. She'd allowed him his erroneous conclusion that she'd been sent here by the Duke's employer. And yet, in order to set up a temporary place in this household, she at least required a position granted by the new Duke of Blackthorn. Mrs. Benedict, the butler asked, a question in those two words. I dare say I would appreciate an audience with his grace beforehand. After all, there was the whole matter of requesting a position on a small staff. She'd have to be blind to fail to see the look that passed between the footman and butler. A slight frown formed on the butler's lips. I am afraid his grace is not receiving visitors. Hmm. Not receiving visitors. You will find that his grace welcomes his privacy and does not care to be disturbed. Well, I am not really a visitor, though, am I? She raised an eyebrow. Mr. He gulped. Harris. His voice emerged as a high croak. Harris, she murmured. Lily sidled closer to him. Surely his grace will not begrudge me an introduction. She smiled at the wide-eyed footman, then turned back to Harris as she toyed with one curl. The butler dipped his gaze downward and the column of his throat worked as he stared, transfixed. Then, he cleared his throat. I am afraid he is not receiving guests or visitors, including members of his staff, he said evenly. He inclined his head. If you will allow me to lead you to your rooms? Oh, well blast and double blast. 
He'd rush her above stairs, where she'd wait in her rooms, until the Duke discovered she'd wheedled her way into his home. Then she'd have no hope of being granted any position. Lily tugged free her gloves and dusted them together. I am eager to begin in my role of caring for the Duke's ward. The sooner I can, find that blasted gem and be done here, ascertain what is expected of me and review my responsibilities, the sooner I can begin caring for Lady Flora. The man shifted back and forth on his feet and looked to the hovering footman as though in support of some decision. Unspoken words passed between those two and then the head of his grace's household capitulated. P. Perhaps, a very brief meeting. She smiled. Splendid. And the sooner she could acquaint herself with the beast of Blackthorn, the sooner he would become more man than monster, and as such, a person not to be feared. Lily turned her gloves over to the footman with murmured thanks and then quickly fell into step behind Harris. As they made their way through the Duke's townhouse, her satin slippers padded quietly over the white marble floor. With the cold penetrating the soles of her delicate shoes, she kept her gaze forward. For with each step down the same corridor she'd stolen down as a girl, her cries echoed off these walls. To keep from giving in to the horror of the night, she looked to the details that had previously escaped her about this home, the lavish wealth reflected in the fripperies adorning the walls. Her previous two residences could have both fit comfortably within the palatial home of the Duke of Blackthorn. Gold sconces lined the corridors. Gilt frames of country landscapes and ducal ancestors hung upon walls done in satin wallpaper. Still, for all their wealth, they'd turned a young woman out, without a care for her safety or survival into the streets. That old, healthy hatred drove back the indecision in being here. With each step she took, bitterness burned her throat as if she'd downed a glass of acid. They turned right at the end of the hall and continued on. A long at Chippendale table flush against the wall with an immense, gold urn filled with white flowers slowed her steps. As they moved on past it, she shot a glance over her shoulder at the stark white lilies filling that piece, the irony not lost upon her. This was the home of the man who'd ruined her. What was the sin of wishing the late Duke of Blackthorn to wither in hell for his crimes, considering all the others to come before it? While he'd lived, his life had been filled with urns of flowers and crystal chandeliers and carpeted floors, and hers had been one of uncertainty until Sir Henry saved her from certain death. Saved her from maid to mistress in but two years in the man's employ. How many days had she thought the latter alternative would have been preferable? The butler drew to a slow halt at the end of the corridor and she froze, looking questioningly up at him. He eyed her with a somber expression and when he spoke, she strained to hear his whispered words. Mrs. Benedict, he said in hushed tones. It is my fear once you, meet his grace, that you will turn and lead just as the previous governesses have. She'd likely wish that, but desperation drove people to recklessness. She could no sooner leave this household than she could support herself without two coins on a cold winter's day in London. The look Harris gave her indicated he expected some form of response. I assure you, Harris, I am not weak-hearted and I do not frighten easily. That was, at the very least, true. She was a woman who'd survived on her own since sixteen, with no skills to recommend her. And in a world where women either perished or sold their souls to survive, she'd not perished. He gave an approving nod. I hope for Lady Flora that is the case. Doubt reflected in his eyes. For you see, he is. She wanted to shout for him to conclude that sentence. He is what, she gently prodded needing to know as much as she could to prepare her for the beast she'd call employer. The man she'd steal from to avenge the wrongs committed by his kin. And at last, she'd have that freedom she'd hungered for from the moment she'd been turned away from this very townhouse. Harris went stone-faced. You shall see for yourself, Mrs. Benedict. The cryptic edge to his tone raised the goose flesh along her arms. The young butler motioned her forward and she silently followed. Her palms damp in dreaded anticipation of the meeting, she discreetly dusted them along the side of her skirts. Then, in the manner taught by her mama years and years earlier, she folded her hands demurely before her and prepared to face the beast. Harris raised a hand to knock and froze, his fingers poised a hair's breadth from the door. 
his pronounced Adam's apple bobbed as he stared at the door. Unsettled nerves, temporarily forgotten, she cast a glance up at the tall, slender servant. With his lips moving as if in silent prayer, he rapped once on the wood panel. An unexpected silence met his knock. Lily furrowed her brow. Perhaps the man was not here. She unclasped her hands and drummed the tips of her fingers together. If he was anything like George, he was even now out at his clubs, taking his pleasures where he would. The butler rapped again. Bloody hell, Harrison, you have orders not to disturb me. At that thunderous boom, Lily jumped. Heart pounding, she swung her gaze from the pale butler to the door and then once more to Harris. What manner of man was the new duke to yell at his servants so? This man who could not be bothered to know or use their correct names. The column of Harris's throat moved with the force of his swallow. With the pallor of a man who'd downed a plate of spoiled oysters, he gave her an effortful grin that was more grimace than anything else. I it is Harris, your grace, and there is a visitor. I don't give a bloody hell if it is the damn Queen of England for tea and biscuits. Do not darken my door. She stared unblinking at that door. This was George's brother? This foul-mouthed, mannerless brute? A more rational, sensible woman would be fearful of the beast that dwelled on the other side. The woman who'd given her virtue over to a shameless cad, who'd pledged marriage and then, instead, found herself a permanent position in an old man's bed, however, was long past fearing a snarling, petulant duke. The muscles of his face contorting as though in physical pain, Harris looked at her. He held his palms up and gave a dismayed shake of his head. He tried once more with his employer. I it is about the G. If you say it is about the girl, I'll have you hung by your ballocks. Oh, that was really enough. Following her fall from grace, she'd been demeaned by all, including this man's abhorrent family. She'd not tolerate such treatment in another. Lily reached past the butler and, ignoring his shocked gasp, she pressed the handle. Locked. She wrinkled her brow. Humph. Well, she'd not anticipated that. Lily tried again. Harrison, if you jiggle my goddamn handle once more, I'll remove your hand from your body, myself. A small giggle cut into the end of the Duke's vile speech and Lily whipped her head to the right. A little girl in white skirts stood at the end of the hall. The widening of her cornflower blue eyes held shock at being discovered. Then the giggling imp ducked back behind the wall and disappeared. Lily gave her head a shake. What manner of place is this? Angry, shouting men. Giggling, unattended children, and those same unattended children giggling at the shouting, angry men? Poor Harris. The man appeared one more outburst from the Duke away from casting up his morning's accounts. Alas, she should have learned long ago from her own experience that ordinary people were capable of extraordinary courage. It is about the girl. The butler's words emerged as a high squeak. A flurry of black curses, the scrape of a chair, and then an odd thump 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 met Harris's pronouncement. And this time, Lily did no fear. Belated fear, but tangible and very real, akin to the terror that plagued her all those years ago. An ugly dread turned within her and she dug around inside for the strength and courage she'd cloaked herself in after she'd been hurled into the rain-soaked streets. The lock turned and position of governess aside, she opened her mouth to give the foul-tempered lout the dressing down he deserved for terrifying his servants. You should. The words ended a whispery death as the door opened. A chill stole through her. The beast on the other side drew the door back all the way and with that action, momentarily presented the whole of his scarred visage. I instructed you to not darken my goddamn door, the duke snarled. Lily swallowed hard, as all the blood drained from her face, seeped down her immobile frame, and then jerked out her toes. The beast. This is why they called the new duke a beast. More than half a foot taller than her own five feet seven inches, his broad and powerfully muscular form would inspire fear in most for his sheer size and strength alone. His grace shifted and that slight movement obscured half of his face. 
this was the new Duke of Blackthorn? The boy and then young man she'd caught glimpses of during his infrequent summer visits to Carlisle bore no resemblance to this menacing beast. All reason for being here fled when presented with the terrifying more monster than man before her. He flicked a frosty, ducal glance up and down her form and then his gaze grew shuddered. And Lily proved she was more coward than courageous, for she sank back as his grace turned his fury on the poor, quaking servant at her side. Did I not indicate I was not to be bothered? His words may as well have been wrapped in icy steel, for the coldness of them. Why yes, your grace. Harris gave a jerky nod. But. And did I not say to leave my bloody door alone? Why yes. The servant slid his gaze over to Lily and then returned his focus to the duke. But it is about the G, the man swallowed audibly, and flushed red. That is, Mrs. Benedict is here regarding the post of governess to Lady Flora, he amended. Through their exchange, Lily took in the coolly disdainful man she intended to commit theft against and ice thickened her veins. This was the devil's lair and in being here, she played with fire. Were she to be discovered in this dark act, he'd destroy her. Then, haven't I already been destroyed in all the ways that matter? The duke took a step toward Harris and Lily involuntarily retreated. His black, palpable rage, however, was reserved solely for the poor servant who'd roused his fury. Well, technically she had roused his fury. But. Get. The. Hell. Away. From. My. Door. Again, he passed his hard stare over Lily. She detested her slight audible intake of breath, that ever so slight indication of her fear. By God, she'd not be so disdained by a winter's again. Not allowing him the luxury of unsettling her, at least openly anyway, Lily tipped her chin up. The Duke's thick, black lashes swept down, but not before she caught the faint flash of surprise. But then his wintry fury was promptly back in place so that she wondered if she'd merely imagined any other hint of emotion there. Have Mr. Davies deal with her, Harrison. The unscarred portion of his mouth turned up in a snarl. That patent disdain showered on her for too many years. His grace made to close the door and she thrust her foot out and forced it open. How dare you, she seethed as the good sense to fear him fled. The duke swung a hard, one-eyed stare at her. At the fierce glint trained on her by this bellowing beast, her heart hammered wildly. How dare I? The jeering note to his words roused greater terror than his earlier bellowing. Fear danced in her belly, and yet. Do not say another word, Lily. Do not say another word. She dampened her lips. His name is Harris. She'd never been one to go silent in the face of a challenge. The Duke gave no outward reaction to her insolent correction, which only further stirred irritation with him. My name is Lily Benedict and I am here to meet with you. Then, with the years of politeness ground into her years ago, she remembered to add, Your Grace. She forced her chin up another notch. She'd wager her meager bag of possessions that the beast who snarled and hissed at his servants was unaccustomed to shows of rebellion. The Duke of Blackthorn continued to study her with a darkly cool, inscrutable expression. She curled her toes into the soles of her slippers, prepared for the jeering laugh of his dead brother. At long last, he said, meet with me, you say? A flare of respect shone on the butler's face and he quickly averted his gaze. The young duke stepped aside, daring her with that slight movement to enter his lair. What he could never realize is she'd spent the past years in a hell of her own making, so what was one more foray into the devil's den? In a desperate bid for control, with her chin held high, she yanked her skirts and swept past him. The door closed with a soft, ominous click and she jumped, wheeling back around. The Duke of Blackthorn stood with his face in profile. Did he seek to deliberately shield that marred half of his once perfect, chiseled features? Another mocking grin formed on his partially scarred lips. Unnerved by his icy blue stare, she dropped her gaze, to the gold-headed serpent under his gloved hand. 
Lily took in the cane for a long moment. If she required the assistance of a cane, she'd not find that support from a slithering serpent. You are suddenly shy, Miss Bennett? Miss Bennett? Her mind stalled. Hadn't she used the false name she'd adopted all these years? Surely she'd not been so careless. Oh, God. A loud buzzing filled her ears. He knew. Her thoughts spiraled out of control, like a too fast moving carriage careening out of control. Except, as the moments ticked on, she peered at him, searching for any hint of recognition from this man whose brother had ruined her life through one lie and that one shameful, forbidden act. But there was none. Is there something wrong with your vision? That taunting whisper jerked her head up and she blinked back her earlier fear. A giddy relief slammed into her. He didn't know who she, in fact, was. Just as he saw Harris as Harrison, he'd commandeered ownership of her name. There is nothing wrong with my vision, she said, her voice faintly breathless, from the force of her relief. He stood but a handful of feet away. For one of his size and strength, and... She looked to his cane once more, and of his condition, he moved with a remarkable grace. And I am not shy, she blurted, warming at those inane, useless words. Still, she was three and twenty, a woman past the prime of her first youth. Seasoned by his late brother's betrayal. He presented his back. I do not care what you are or what you aren't, he said with a chilling aloofness that set her teeth on edge. No, one cut of the same proverbial cloth as George would not care about her or others, in any way. With that reminder slipping to the forefront, she drew on the purpose that had driven her into this dark, miserable home. Back still presented to her, the arrogant duke could not even deign to look at her. Then, she'd always been invisible to his vile family. If only that had been the case for his blighter of a brother. God wrought his soul. At the protracted silence, she snapped. My name is Lily Benedict, she said firmly. Liliana Bennett had died long, long ago. At that, he turned his face and met her gaze squarely. She swallowed hard. With the barrier of the door from their first meeting now gone and no effort made by him to obscure his face from scrutiny, she stared with something akin to horror, wonder, and regret. Half his face was the chiseled beauty of that famed David. The other appeared a horrified masterpiece thrown hastily together by the artist, Michelangelo. On one side, the olive hue of his rugged features hinted at his Roman routes. The other side, a collection of angry scars, the skin whitened and yellow from those burns. A black patch over his left eye lent him the look of a menacing pirate. She swallowed. Yet, for his scars, there was a splendorous power to him. Her heart quickened to a dangerous rhythm that had nothing to do with fear of him, but rather an awareness of this broad, powerful man who, with his unassailable strength, hearkened back to warriors of old. In that strength, he was so unlike any she'd known before, and all the more terrifying for it. He leaned down, sticking his face so close, their noses brushed, and she who'd long believed herself past blushing, went warm under his scrutiny. Did you have a good look? He jeered. In her haste to get away from the great, hulking stranger, Lily took a hurried step backward and stumbled against a mahogany side table. She shot her hands out and found purchase on the top of the leather sofa. I dare say your foul temper is merely a means of protecting yourself, but all the same, you don't have to be so rude. Protecting myself? He stalked over and for a moment she contemplated retreat. Instead, she rooted her feet to the floor and met his challenging stare. He leaned close, forcing the vicious scars into her direct line of vision. A twinge pulled at her heart. The man was odious to his servants. He was kin to the man who'd ruined her. And yet, she still would never wish the kind of horror and pain forever memorialized upon the duke's face. He snapped black eyebrows together in a flat, angry line. Do you think I need protecting from a slip of a lady such as yourself? It was on the tip of her tongue to point out that she was under no one's terms or standards, a lady, but that would be as extraneous as mentioning the whole I'm not shy business, 
particularly when one was seeking the post of governess to his ward. She bit her lower lip. He sent one black eyebrow up in a devilish arc that roused terror in her breast. Is something wrong with your hearing as well as your mind, Miss Benedict? The brute made it nigh impossible to feel sympathy or pity or anything less than mild disdain for him. Is something wrong with your manners? She demanded, the question exploding from her lips. His grace went still and her heart climbed into her throat as she braced to be tossed bodily from his office. What will you do now, you stupid chit? But the duke limped past her. The thump-thump-thump of his cane marked his progress over to his desk chair. He slid his powerful frame within the folds and after he'd rested his cane against the mahogany and brass side table, he spread his arms wide. You stormed my home and my office, get on with whatever is of such importance to you. Lily sidled over to the desk, all the while keeping a close eye on the volatile duke, as she took the seat opposite him. She fished around her reticule and withdrew her false references. I am here seeking employ. I didn't give you leave to sit. He wrapped those words in a lethal edge. Arm frozen mid-movement with the documents clenched between her fingers, she lowered the pages to her lap. Her mind ran. Hadn't he? She wrinkled her brow. Well, no. She rather supposed he hadn't. She searched his face for any hint of warmth, some slight penetrable crack that indicated he was not solely the harsh monster who'd scared the butler into a near run. Of their own volition, her eyes lingered on the planes of his cheeks. Regret struck her. He'd truly been a remarkable man, the manner of man a vicar's young daughter would toss her virtue away for. The duke rested his elbows on the desktop and leaned closer. Do I meet with your approval, madam? He peeled his lip back in a sneer. Then, an unexpected twinge of compassion pulled at her heart. For a moment, she forgot the subterfuge that brought her into his home. This man's surly bid to terrify was merely a means of protecting himself from cruelties he'd, no doubt, encountered. As one who'd sought to protect herself from hurt through the years, she recognized that attempt in another. A hard, knowing glint lit his eye and he sat swiftly back in his chair. I do not need your pity. She snorted. Just then, it was hard to feel anything but annoyance at a foul fiend like the Duke. Well, that is all well and fine. You don't have it. Terror, however, was an altogether different matter. That she knew plenty of around the Duke of Blackthorn. He sat forward in his seat once again. For even scarred as I am, Miss Benedict, I'd still not put my company. A shocked gasp escaped her and ate into the remainder of his crude words. Lily flew from her seat and slapped him into silence. The echo of her vicious blow blared like the firing of a pistol in the quiet. No doubt he sought to be rid of her with his vile innuendos and crude words. Even in her role as gentleman's plaything, she'd not been spoken to in such a manner. His grace froze. Then, as if he delighted in that crack in her veneer, a jeering grin marred his lips. Her chest heaved and she shook, partly from fear of crossing such a black-hearted soul, partly with shame for having put her hands to his face, partly with embarrassment for the vile words she'd cut short with her well-timed slap. Still, she'd not look away and give him the satisfaction of knowing he'd shaken her. She tossed her tresses and made a show of studying him. You do like what you see, then, he said on a jeering whisper. She narrowed her eyes. Hardly. The great lummox was a beast, but such had nothing to do with the marks upon his skin and everything to do with the words on his lips. He stiffened and then came slowly to his feet. Lily swallowed hard and inched her gaze up his towering frame. Goodness, the man was a veritable mountain. Weren't there rules on the frame and form of these pompous dukes? Weren't they supposed to sport monocles and stuff their garments with padding the way Sir Henry had? Or douse themselves in fragrant cologne and oil their hair like George? The hint of sandalwood that clung to this duke was potent and masculine and muddled her senses. Oh, he whispered. Do not say anything. There was the whole matter of the diamond and her future. 
focus on that. Anything but on how this man set her teeth on edge and roused this peculiar stirring in her belly, all at the same time. Alas, she'd never been known for her self-control. You're about four inches too tall and a stone too wide. The Duke of Blackthorn took a step around the desk. Are you calling me fat, Miss Bennet? Mrs. Benedict. She took a hasty step back. No, she said, hurriedly. There was not an ounce of fat to his muscle-hewn frame. Your nose is crooked. As though it had been broken, and not just once. No doubt deserved. He snapped black eyebrows together. Are you finished? Do not say anything. Do not say anything. She shook her head. And your hair is too long. In an untamed, primitive way that gave him the look of a warrior of old. A shameful urge gripped her, a need to run her fingers through those midnight strands. Is it now? He sounded so thoroughly bored she wished she had another charge to level against his miserable countenance, but came up remarkably empty. D did I mention your crooked nose? You did. Did she imagine the ghost of a smile on his lips? Surely she didn't. Men such as this one did not smile or laugh or express any cheer. Well, it bore repeating. Twice. For the evidence of multiple breaks indicated he'd made a bother of himself on more than one occasion, which was not in the very least surprising. Except his inscrutable expression said her attempt at needling had little effect on the uncouth stranger who'd shout at his servants and curse and speak coarse words in front of young women. The towering duke folded his arms at his chest. Is that all, Miss Benedict? No, there was still the matter of the post she now sought. Then, this hardly seemed the appropriate time to bring up as much. She wet her lips. Goodness, he was imposing. There should be fear and yet, her heart fluttered wildly, instead. Would you care to see my teeth? To still the tremble racking her frame, she folded her arms in a like manner and eyed him contemplatively. I believe I would. He peeled back his lips to display two perfect rows of even, white teeth. Glorious. He was a glorious model of masculinity, harshly beautiful, for the imperfections he bore. She'd die before even so much as hinting at that unfathomable truth. Hmm, she said noncommittally. It was a sin he should hide himself from the world. You approve, then? All but the bottom front right. She tipped her index finger at a slight angle. It was a blatant lie. It is crooked. But she'd be damned if she allowed him the final word in their duel of words. With a glower, the stranger snapped his mouth closed. At that dark, menacing look, a shiver stole through her. For her brashness moments ago, logic settled around her brain. This was not a man to be trifled with. Perhaps she'd gone just a tad bit too far in taunting this hulking stranger, a stranger whose aid she now sought. His silver-flecked gaze followed her subtle movement and lingered upon her breasts. She swallowed, registering too late she'd drawn attention to the deep décolletage of her sapphire-blue gown. She folded her arms about her chest, hiding herself from his intense gaze. Do you approve then? She shot back, not knowing where she found the courage to toss those bold words at his smug face. All but the right. She jabbed her finger at him. Don't you dare. She'd not be made light of. Not by this insolent stranger. Not by anyone. It was entirely awful enough she'd been found lacking on more scores than she cared to admit. She'd not be mocked by this scowling beast. Are you issuing me a threat, Mrs. Benedict? Again, Mrs. Benedict. Not Miss Bennet. And she suspected that substituted name was, in some way, a slight show of respect from this man. No. And as she'd never been one to prevaricate, she chose to get to the heart of it. I am here to discuss my responsibilities for your ward. Chapter 4 Occasionally, at the oddest, most unexpected times, Derek's ear would ring with the old echo of gunfire and cannon charge. 
At those moments, sounds, a person's voice, the tick of a clock, the rattle of a carriage, would come as though down a long corridor. With that bold demand from the insolent chit who'd invaded his sanctuary, this was one of those muffled moments. Derek passed his gaze over the young woman, the tempting siren in the street who'd stolen into his office and proved herself a harpy more than anything else. The midnight black of her tresses, so dark, it bore the trace of blue, the green blue of her eyes. She could rob a lesser man of his logic. But he'd cease to be that man who could or would be swayed by a woman's charms. You as a governess, he asked, and for the pain radiating up his thigh, propped his hip on the edge of the desk. You are here for the post of governess? One with a captivating beauty such as hers belonged in ballrooms, attired in fine satins, not in a nursery with a motherless child. By the narrowing of Mrs. Benedict's eyes, she took exception with his mocking tone. Still, she said nothing. He shoved off the desk and limped over to his cane. His skin pricked with the feel of her stare on his awkward movements. His mouth tightened. I do not have any role in the care of, that child. With the aid of his cane, he crossed to the front of the room and pulled the door open. The lady's mouth fell open and she looked between him and the hall outside his office. Be but you are her guardian, she sputtered. Go, Mrs. Benedict. She did not, however, make a move to leave. Now, he thundered. She jumped, but she did not flee, as the handful of servants was wont to do when presented with the mere visage of him alone. The color leached from her cheeks, she fisted the sides of her skirts. The tremble to her fingers hinted at her unease. Good, the lady should fear him. People did not bait him and challenge him. Nay, they steered clear of him altogether. Except this one, it would seem. I am here to care for Lady Flora. Releasing her skirts, she drew in a breath. I do not intend to be scuttled off. Brava. There was a strength to her that was hard not to admire. Mrs. Benedict and her bold challenge roused something he'd ceased to feel these past years since he'd returned, interest. Oh. He winged an eyebrow up. Be but I will take any post in your household. That faint tremor was the first sign of weakness from this woman who'd not gaped and cowered in horror at the sight of him. He fisted his cane, despising that he should care that such a creature existed. I, I understand you are short of staff. By her rapid prattling, the young woman was inclined to fill voids of silence. You are desperate then, he jeered. Any woman who would brave his presence came, no doubt, out of desperation. Her slight hesitation hinted at the truth to his supposition. For years, Derek hadn't given a bloody rot about anything, his family, his solitary state, his former friends. Each day of his life turned over the next with a nauseating tedium where nothing interested him. Yet, this bold stranger's sudden appearance at his doorstep and her entreaty for employment stirred his curiosity. Why? If she lied, he'd toss her out on her arse. If she gave him the truth, he'd at least let her tell her tale, and then toss her out on her arse. The lady fisted her skirts so tight, the color drained from her knuckles. She would have made a lousy hazard player. A sea of unease, fear, and desperation flooded her eyes, those now familiar, expected emotions he saw in all. I no longer wish to work at my previous post. And with those words, she said nothing and everything all at the same time. Derek turned his lip up in a mocking grin. The handsy employer who would force his intentions upon you, Mrs. Benedict. A becoming blush stained the lady's cheeks. Where before, her eyes had served as a window into her every emotion, she now schooled her features into an expressionless mask. I have references, she said stiffly and rescued said documents. From the same employer she'd fled? He searched her with his soul eye for a hint of an answer but again, she had metal that would have unnerved lesser men not as such, she weighed her papers. Unnerved by his fascination with this mysterious stranger who would show up, uncowed by his hideous visage or crude manners, he pulled the door wider. Your presence grows tedious. I want you gone. 
I do not have staff, because I do not wish it. The young woman scoffed. I do not believe that. Derek snapped his eyebrows into a flat line and took a step toward her. Mrs. Benedict retreated and placed the leather sofa between them. By her furrowed brow and pale cheeks, she feared he'd inflict bodily harm. It was the first sensible action shown by this stranger. Derek peered down his nose at the beautiful stranger. I'll not ask you again. Tell me what it is that has you so eager to be in my employ. Why, when only the desperate or idiotic would choose such a fate? Her chest moved with the force of her breathing. He took in the creamy swell of her generous décolletage, the flare of her hips. An unexpected lust slammed into him. When he returned his attention to her face, fire flashed in her eyes. Ah, uh, the young woman had noted his scrutiny. She squared her shoulders. I need employment and you need a governess who will stay, your grace. I would say, that makes us a rather perfect pair. Brava, once more. The fiery temptress who'd stormed his home with more temerity and courage than he'd witnessed from his fellow soldiers on the battlefield, returned. He drummed his fingertips on the edge of the door and she followed that movement. Mrs. Benedict pursed her lips, but remained silent. He'd be wise to turn this one away. With her temerity and willingness to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, she represented chaos to his ordered, if largely empty, household. And yet. He cast a glance over his shoulder into the corridor, a hall that had been nearly silent until his sister's daughter had been forced upon him. And a bloody butler who worried about that same meddlesome child. Never breaking eye contact with the young woman, Derek pushed the door closed. He turned the lock and the muscles of her long, graceful neck moved. So, she did fear him. Derek squared his jaw. Of course, she did. All did. Who wouldn't fear a beast? The muscles of his leg throbbed in protest to his stillness. Reflexively, he grabbed his thigh and rubbed. Mrs. Benedict dropped her gaze to that subtle movement. He stopped, mid-motion. Gritting his teeth, he marched to his desk, his leg dragging uselessly with the pace he'd set. With his back presented to her, Derek stopped. A spasm of pain racked his frame and froze the breath in his lungs. God, he'd never become accustomed to the agony of simple movements. No matter how much he stretched or exercised his limbs, the pain remained. Your grace, she called out hesitantly. He quickly schooled his features and turned. Affecting an air of nonchalance, he rested his cane alongside the desk and propped his hip on the edge of the massive, French rosewood piece. Sit, he commanded. A rebellious glimmer danced in her eyes. Once again, curiosity stirred for the undaunted figure before him, interest, when he'd felt nothing in so very long. Who was Mrs. Lily Benedict? Lily wanted to ignore that austere, ducal command. She wanted to turn, spit in his arrogant face and lash out at him for previously hurling his vile words. How was it possible to hate a man she'd met but a quarter of an hour ago? Her chest heaving, she stared at the wood panel. But more than hating him, she hated, herself. Hated herself for having no other choice but to enter this household that haunted her. With stiff movements, she let her hand fall to her side and turned around. In her short time with George, he'd said little about his family. Those important details he'd kept from her, likely because a woman he'd no honorable intentions for had little need knowing about his kin. He'd mentioned his brother in the King's army, but that only in passing. The Duke sat on the edge of his desk with his arms folded at his chest. His serpent-headed cane dangled from his fingertips. For any other man, that gold cane would have merely been an accessory affected by a bored nobleman. Not this frosty, one-eyed stranger. Those scars upon a once glorious face indicated that his cane was no mere affectation, but a product of life. You desire the post of governess. His words came out more statement than question. Lily gave a terse nod, anyway. I am here, am I not? 
George had demonstrated through the power of his title that dukes could destroy lives. This duke's harshly cool tone indicated he needn't have answers from another person but would supply them himself. Blackthorn drummed his fingertips upon his sleeve and studied her with an inscrutable expression. She stiffened as he stopped that incessant tapping and crossed over to her. He proceeded to walk in a small circle about her, a tiger toying with its prey. His interest, however, was not the lust-filled kind she'd seen in Holtworth's eyes. His was a detached curiosity from a man incapable of feeling or emotion. He drew to a halt. Even with your age, she narrowed her eyes. A woman of your beauty would surely prefer a life wedded and bedded by some good, honorable gentleman. His gravelly voice came out with words spoken as matter-of-factness. Is there such a man? she muttered before she could call the words back. The Duke of Blackthorn winged his eyebrows upward and she cleared her throat. Her blasted mouth would be the ultimate ruin of her. I am but three and twenty, she said instead. Hardly in my dotage. A hard, cynical smile hovered on his beautiful lips. Nor do I wish to be married. Her heart wrenched at the lie. For at one time, she had. At one time, she dreamed of a simple life wedded and loved. Now that dream was never to be. I merely want the post of nursery governess. And from there, my freedom. Intelligence sparked in his eyes. Did he detect her lie? A man such as he would shred a person who wronged him without compunction. Her mouth went dry. You are finely dressed. He paused and raked his gaze up and down her frame for a servant. Her mind stalled and then resumed spinning at a maddening speed. Of course, the satins and silks Sir Henry draped her in these many years were hardly befitting attire of a servant. But I am not applying for the post of servant, she said calmly. The duke narrowed his eyes. I am applying for the post of governess, which is more a member of the household. An ugly, humorless smile marred his lips. Is that what you believe? That you'd be part of my household, different than my staff? She'd rather hoped it had, but not because of a lofty or exalted thought of the post. Rather, it had represented her means to move freely in his home, so she might find that bloody diamond. Well? She jumped at his booming question. So that is the way it was? She stiffened at the condescension there. The way what was, she forced out through tight lips. She'd have to be a fool to not know in which way he mocked her. Nonetheless, she'd not allow him to toy with her. Not any more. She'd been toyed with enough by these lofty lords and gentlemen. You were your previous employer's plaything, then? Dread slithered around her belly like a vicious serpent prepared to unleash its venom. How had he deduced? Perhaps his brother had marked her a whore in every way. She told herself to shake her head and manage that brusque movement. Did you tire of his advances? Did his wife turn you out? Her legs twitched from the urge to flee under his relentless line of questioning. Then, as all bullies inevitably did with the lack of reaction, he backed off. What knowledge would one such as you have in caring for a child? He did not stand and wait for his answer, but rather crossed the room. Lily jumped at the rhythmic click of his cane. The duke limped over to the sideboard and set his cane down. His hand hovered over the neat row of crystal decanters. Arg, I am the pirate, come to steal you precious children. The haunting laughter of her brothers and sister and their childhood games echoed around the chambers of her memory. She thrust aside their unaging faces. I had younger siblings, she said, damning the faint tremble to her words. For the crime she'd committed, Lily was dead to them. He paused, his fingers atop one of those bottles. She braced for questions on the fate of those siblings just mentioned. Having been an elder sister, you think that makes you able to care for a child? Technically, she was still a sister. She'd not debate that particular point of her history with him. What? Nothing to say, he taunted. 
Of course, she should have gleaned a cold-hearted, emotionless figure such as he wouldn't waste inquiries into her personal past. Not even as it might pertain to his niece's circumstances. In having siblings I learned. I can read. Does that qualify me to instruct students at Oxford because of it? Odd, she'd taken a course, unfeeling beast such as him as incapable of caring for the child. She fixed on that revelation and not the aching remembrance of the brothers and sister she'd never again see. Lily cleared her throat. As a duke, you'd surely be granted any post at Oxford, should you? He looked over his shoulder and withered her with a look. Are you making light of me, Mrs. Benedict? The edge to his words, sharper than any blade, hinted at his barely contained fury. No. The denial exploded from her. Ever since she'd been a small girl, she'd always made a muck of explaining herself. Unknowing where she found the courage to continue, she turned her palms up. I am not. In the hope of putting her thoughts to order, she drew in a calming breath. It is admirable you are concerned for the child as you are. Lily would have traded her left hand and perhaps her leg, too, for a family who was unflinchingly devoted to her. Bottle in his hand, he turned suddenly about. Do not make more of my inquiry, he ordered, stealing his jaw. She lifted her head. And yet with his determined inquiries, he'd already revealed that, despite his protestations, he cared a good deal more than he let on, even to himself. I would not dare presume. No, you'd merely presume in invading my home and demanding a meeting with me. Yes, well he had her there. Silence stretched on, punctuated by the snap and hiss of the raging fire in the hearth and a steady dread built inside. She'd not allowed herself to consider what would happen if she proved unsuccessful in entering the duke's home. Lily curled her fingers into balls and her nails pierced the soft skin of her palms. What happened to a whore with nothing? A whore, she remained. If I grant you the post, you will have no fine garments, he warned. He flicked the slight puffed sleeve of her satin gown and she stiffened. Then his words registered and hope blossomed in her breast. Despite his taunting words and warnings, a giddy sensation ran through her. He would grant her the post. There will be no lavish jewels and balls to attend with a mere girl. Even as a mistress, she'd not attended balls. Her protector had given her food, a place to dwell, but there had been no funds for baubles. You will be a mere servant in this household. He'd erroneously assumed she was a lady whose family was in dire straits. I know that, she said calmly. If she let on a trace of the elation filling her, he'd toss her out without a backward glance. The duke stared hard at her and for one terrifying, agonizing moment, it was as though he could see all the sins stamped on her skin. Then he said, You are to be invisible. You are not to darken my door. I do not even want you in these corridors. You are to keep the child away from this hall and in her schoolrooms or nursery or... He waved the bottle in his hand about. Wherever it is children go. Can you do that? Emotion pounded at her breast, numbing her to the sentiment she'd thought long dead, hope. He would allow her to remain. I can. A woman who'd done everything Lily had in order to survive could certainly handle a seven- or eight-year-old child. Failure would not be an option in this regard. His grace set the decanter down hard. Very well, he said in his aloof, ducal tones. Yet for his shocking capitulation, she'd become suspect of any hints of uncharacteristic weakness in people. Those individuals, usually males, expected more in return. As he limped back to his desk, she called out. Why would you do this? With the same regality of the prince regent claiming his throne, the duke sat in his leather-winged back chair. Between his large, gloved hands, he cradled his drink. Would you talk me for my decision? She was struck by how unwittingly close to the mark his rejoinder, in fact, was. For deep down, the part of her that was still good and decent chafed with the act of theft she intended to commit against this man, kin of George or no. Unable to form words past the guilt clogging her throat, 
she gave her head a shake. There is the matter of your payment. My payment. Lily stiffened and, reflexively, her fingers tightened along the arms of the chair. And what form of payment do you expect? She managed to squeeze out past tight lips. Ultimately, all these powerful men wanted but one thing of her. Expect, he drawled. Lily folded her arms protectively at her chest and glared. Invariably, they all asked for more and that more, inevitably, entailed the use of her body. His grace sipped from his brandy, all the while keeping that soul, ice blue eye on her. He ran his gaze up and down her person. I am uncertain of the other employers you've had before this post, but I assure you, I do not have designs upon your person, Miss Bennett. Those jeering words were, no doubt, intended as an insult. They had the opposite effect. The tension left her. My name is Mrs. Benedict, and, she promptly closed her mouth. Coward as she was, she slid her gaze away from the contemptuous sneer on his lips. How much greater that contempt would be if he knew she'd lain with his brother and then hoard herself in the time since. Self-loathing unfurled in her belly. Unnerved by his presence, she shifted in her seat. Have we concluded this meeting, Your Grace? I am eager to. Escape. Begin in my post. He stared at her through thick, impossibly long, black lashes. A little fluttering danced in her belly. His was the beauty of darkly fallen angels who'd tempt a lady out of her good name and virtue. Both of which she'd long been without. That satin black patch covering the remnants of his other eye gave him a sinister, dangerous quality. Then, he inclined his head. She drew in a steadying breath, stood up, and started for the door. She made it no further than the leather sofa. Mrs. Benedict? Lily froze and remained with her gaze trained on the doorway. He knows. He knows I am the whore who gave her innocence to his brother and came here even now on a plan to fleece him of his diamond. She turned slowly back. Your grace? The young duke leaned back. How very peculiar you do not wish to discuss the terms of your employment. Actually, she hadn't. Since she'd entered the Duke of Blackthorne's home, she'd not truly allowed herself to think to this moment. She'd grown so accustomed to the world saying no, she'd forgotten the universe still had an occasional yes for her. She cursed her misstep. For all the ways in which life and time had aged her, she'd never developed the skill of prevarication. If she weren't more careful, it would land her in Newgate. He winged a menacing black eyebrow upward. Lily's mind turned quickly. What did a woman require, in terms of funds, in order to live secure and safe for the remainder of her years? Forty pounds per year of service, she blurted. That ridiculous sum was nearly triple the funds given to a woman in the respective position. Yet, those monies could be, nay would be, set aside for her future. Guilt needled at her, for ultimately when she made off with his coin, she'd also be gone with Holtworth's heirloom. Forty pounds per year? His harsh, gravelly question caused her to jump. Her future wasn't something she'd allowed herself to think on or about, for the absolute grimness of such a prospect. In failing to acknowledge or confront that inevitable problem, with Sir Henry's passing, she found herself humbled before another stranger, and now this man. What a cruel world women dwelled in. After living a life in chains of society's constraints and her own making, the tantalizing glimpse of freedom hovered just within her grasp. She squared her shoulders. And a pension of five hundred pounds when I've completed my terms of service to her ladyship. She braced for his blunt rejection of her outlandish requests, which mattered not. In the end, she'd be gone long before that pension was ever granted. The Duke downed the remaining contents of his glass. He set it down hard before him. Very well. He rose effortlessly from his chair. He'd agreed? She followed his movements as he crossed over, serpent cane in hand, and rang the servant's bell. Very well, she repeated back dumbly. He'd agreed to those terms. All of them? 
with no questions asked and from the woman who'd made demands upon him, no less. And with the respectable position he offered, for a foolish instant, she imagined abandoning Holtzworth's plans and living here, with the devil and all. A hard glint lit his eye. It was a solace, dark eye Satan would have begged the duke for. Unless there is something more you'd ask for? As soon as the thought slid in, she abandoned it. If she failed to aid Holtworth, he would see her in Newgate before he'd ever allow her a life of decency in this house. Not for the first time since she'd agreed to this madcap scheme for survival, warning bells went off and blared loud in her ears. And no, there is nothing. A rap sounded at the door and she sent a silent thank you skyward at the interruption. Enter. His thunderous voice kicked her heartbeat up into that frenzied rhythm he somehow managed to elicit with each command and utterance. The butler entered the room. The poor man seemed to be a perpetual shade of grey. Or perhaps that was the effect of working in this particular household. He cast a commiserative glance in Lily's direction and then swiftly turned his focus to his employer. You rang, your grace? This very important meeting is concluded. She frowned at the mocking emphasis placed on that one word. Without waiting for any potential questions from the young servant, the duke walked slowly back to his desk. If you'll show Mrs. Benedict to her rooms, he called out, not breaking his stride. Lily hesitated. There was something she should say to him. She cast a glance back at Harris, who patiently waited with a pained glimmer in his eyes. He wanted out of the devil's lair. And yet. She looked to the duke once again, now seated upon the leather-winged back chair that may as well have been a king's throne for the power he evinced in the leather folds. Mrs. Benedict? There was a faint entreaty in Harris's tone, which called her to the moment. Giving her head a clearing shake, she started after him. Mrs. Benedict? At that steely-edged whisper, Lily stilled and wheeled slowly back to face the duke. You sold yourself short. If you'd asked for triple that sum, I would have paid it to be free of the burden of the responsibilities that go with that child. Those callous words about the small girl drew a frown from her. She bit her tongue to keep from telling his grace precisely what she thought of one who saw his ward, a motherless, fatherless child, as nothing more than an inconvenience he'd like to rid himself of. The child might be the niece of the man who ruined her, but she was still a defenseless girl, dependent on others for her security. I am not greedy, your grace. No, I'm a whore, liar, and a thief. But never greedy. No, you are naive and trusting, which is far more dangerous to you. How eerily accurate he was with that throwaway comment. She'd been naively trusting twice before in her life. Both times it had destroyed her. Do you intend to gape at me all day? He jerked his chin. Get out. His sharp order snapped her into motion and she took her leave of the beast, grateful as Harris closed the door behind them. Only with that damning click thundering in the quiet, she started. She'd not even so much looked about his office for the revered artifact that had brought her into his home under false pretenses. Lily cast a glance back at the closed door and then followed Harris in silence as he led her through the labyrinth of the Duke's lair up the servants' stairs and down corridor after corridor. With each step, her skin pricked with the eerie sense of being watched. She stopped abruptly and spun about, scanning the hall. The empty hall. Her heart pounded wildly as she sought the ghosts of the Duke's home. Mrs. Benedict, are you all right? Harris's concerned question brought her around. Fine, she murmured. A dull heat slapped her cheeks at being a fearful, silly lackwit who saw ghosts in the shadows. I'm fine, she repeated when he continued to study her with that dubious stare. Anyway, hadn't she well learned that real men were far more threatening and ominous than those who'd gone? Would you have me show you to the nursery first to meet her ladyship? No. The denial burst from her, earning a befuddled look. Following her meeting with the darkly dangerous duke, she needed a stolen moment of calm, one that did not involve the child whose care had been erroneously turned over to her. She steadied her tones. 
I thought to refresh following my travels, she said softly. Of course, ma'am, he said, inclining his head. They resumed their path along the blood-red carpeted hall, a perfect color for the duke who called this his home. Harris stopped beside the last door at the end of the hall. He pressed the handle. Here you are, Mrs. Benedict. I had your belongings brought to your room. Is there anything else you require? Courage, strength, a calm imagination. She managed a smile. No, that will be all. He bowed and took his leave. Lily stared after him until he'd gone. With his leaving, she was now truly alone in this cold, empty townhouse. She made to enter the room, when again, the prickle of awareness sent shivers racing along her spine. Hello? She skimmed her gaze over the corridor. Perhaps the ghosts of the dead Duchess of Blackthorn hovered about, protesting Lily's presence here, still. Who is there? The sharp echo of her words on the empty walls served as her only answer. You are going mad, she muttered to herself and took a step inside her rooms. Hello? A shriek burst from Lily's lips and she spun around and nearly collided with a young girl. Oh. So this was the ghost. No ghost really. Just a lonely child. Her charge. Heart racing, she managed a smile. The child with tight brown curls stared at her with wide, curious eyes. Familiar eyes. Her uncle's eyes. Such a detail should cause a pang of regret and yet there was nothing left but anger for the man she'd gifted her virtue to. Lily dropped slowly to her knee. Hello. The girl's cornflower blue eyes reflected suspicion and interest. You are afraid. Terror had gripped her from the moment she stepped inside this home. I'm not, she lied. Not fear she'd admit to, anyway. The child drifted closer and peered at Lily. Did she sense the lie there? The last one was and she left. Never to return. Icy tendrils of fear snaked about her heart. At a girl's words? She gave her head a shake. Well, I do not intend to go. Lily couldn't very well admit to the truth of having no other options but to remain. What is your N? You are scared. She leaned forward and spoke in hushed, entirely too mature tones. I was scared, too, when I first arrived, but then sometimes, when he thinks he is alone, I hear him crying. Oh, God. Lily's chest tightened. They say he is a beast. Do not be scared. Be brave. She must be all manner of fool for she remained frozen, transfixed by the words of a young child. The girl touched the left portion of her face. He is ugly here. She touched her opposite cheek. But not here. The Duke. And you will find he really isn't that scary. All the time. With that, the girl danced away and sprinted down the hall. Lily surged to her feet. Wait, she called out. Except the child disappeared around the corridor, vanishing like the morning mist. She stood there long after the small waif-like girl had gone the child who'd been nothing more than the pawn that had brought Lily into this home in order to commit a theft upon the Duke. The girl unwittingly represented Lily's eventual salvation. Yet, with one whispered hello and an urging to be brave, the child had become more than the means to an end of Lily's years as a whore. The brown-haired girl was a stranger no more, but instead a person whose care she'd been charged with and, suddenly, the anger and hatred she'd carried for all who bore the winter's blood, dimmed. Lily forced her legs to move and wandered inside her new rooms. With a deep sigh, she closed the door and leaned back against the wooden panel. She closed her eyes. She'd spent so many years only caring for and about herself that until this meeting outside her new rooms a handful of moments ago, she'd neglected the obvious truth. What had brought her into the beast's lair was not revenge or Holtworth's diamond. It was a child. Chapter 5 Following Lily's corridor meeting with her charge, the girl had remained as elusive as a ghost. 
The next morning, Lily woke, determined to begin her responsibilities as governess. The sooner she could locate that blasted diamond, the sooner she could be free of this cold, eerie home. Standing at the bevel mirror in her chambers, she pinched color into her cheeks and then, taking a deep steadying breath, left the safety of her rooms and ventured out in search of the Duke's ward. She glanced first left and then right, down the long, quiet halls. The hum of silence served as her only company. Now, how to go about finding a girl who does not wish to be found? She nibbled her lower lip. Her experience as an older sibling had proven one certain fact, a child who did not wish to be found could hide like the very cleverest pygmy shrew. With a sigh, Lily took the right hallway. In the years she'd been away from her younger siblings, she'd not allowed herself to think on them. The agony of missing them had eased with the passage of time. In the moments, she allowed them to slip into her thoughts, the agony of losing them from her life had ravaged her with the same vicious pain as when her father had tossed her aboard a mail coach and sent her off to London. As such, she'd not allowed herself to think about all that made a child, well, a child. To think of those innocent, loving beings only roused thoughts of another babe who'd never be. Whores did not become mothers. Not mothers who were, in any way, respectable. Longing tightened painfully about her heart and she forcibly thrust aside foolish yearnings for what would never be. Lily stopped beside a closed door. She pressed the handle and shoved it open. Flora? Skimming her gaze about the darkened room, she sighed and pulled the panel closed behind her. Since arriving in the Duke's household yesterday, she'd quickly learned that Flora was a spirited miss who reveled in her ability to hide in the shadows of this home. She walked, her footsteps silent on the carpet-lined corridors, as she made her way through the maze-like home. Occasionally, she glanced at the paintings adorning the walls of the Duke's noble family who, by their dress and bewigged heads, were long-gone ancestors. With the great gulf between them, she and the Duke may as well have belonged to two different universes. He and his kind donned satins and silks and the finest fabrics. Hers had always been a respectable family, cut of religious cloth. Had her fifteen-year-old self seen this opulent home, surely even that naive child would still not have been so foolish as to believe George's intentions were honorable. She continued walking, when out of the corner of her eye, she spied a particular portrait that brought her to a staggering halt. George, the late Duke of Blackthorne, with his condescending glint, did not command her notice, but rather the delicate woman at his side. Attired in a Grecian gown of white satin, the regal blonde woman evinced everything a duchess should be. Drawn forward, she stopped at the base of the painting. Lily's gaze fixed on the obscenely large diamond about the woman's delicate neck. Her stomach muscles nodded reflexively. So this was the piece that a man would have at all costs and that she would sell her soul for? Mrs. Benedict? Lily shrieked and spun about. Harris, she greeted, a hand at her racing heart. The butler, flushed. Forgive me, he said as he came forward. I did not mean to startle you. I merely sought you out to see whether I might be of assistance. She pulled her attention away from the portrait. Yes. I am looking for Lady Flora. I had hoped to begin our lessons. Approval lit his brown eyes if you will? He did not wait to see if she complied, but merely turned on his heel and started down the opposite corridor. Lily hurried to catch up. She fell into step alongside him. They moved silently through the maze of halls. Their footfalls fell in a matched pattern, eerily quiet on the plush carpeted halls. What is she like? Lily asked at last. At his silence, Lily cast a look up. Harris slowed his steps, his expression contemplative. She is, adventurous, bold, curious, he said by way of explanation. Her life has not been an easy one with the passing of her parents, and his, he snapped his mouth closed. The servant did not need to finish the thought for his meaning, to be clear. The girl's life could not be a pleasurable one stuck in these dark, lonely walls of the current Duke of Blackthorne's townhouse. 
Ah, uh, so that is where the young lady, motherless and absent of any governess these weeks, spent her days, with members of the staff. The Duke's angry words about his ward and the burden he'd presented her were surely known by the girl. Sadness tugged at Lily's heart. What a lonely life Lady Flora lived. The poor child. Harris stole a sideways glance down at her. He gave a slow, approving nod. I like you a good deal, Mrs. Benedict. She stumbled and the butler shot a hand out to steady her. Lily dropped her gaze to the carpet and murmured her thanks. People did not like her. They avoided her. Spoke ill of her, but never held any favorable opinion of the fallen woman she was. You do not even know me, she said, guilt pebbling in her belly once more. If he did, he'd have saved the Duke the trouble by packing her off himself. I know enough about you, Mrs. Benedict. They turned right at the end of the hall and then continued on to the staircase leading below stairs. I know you were courageous enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with his grace. You make more of it than it is, she said, while the pebble grew to the size of a boulder. Nothing but her own selfish motives had brought her here. Perhaps, he acknowledged. But I also know you'd not abandon the girl because of how the master looks and behaves. How ready this servant was to welcome someone into the household, and for what purpose? To slay the demons that lived here and to save the cherished inhabitant of these walls? Unfortunately for them, Lily was not, nor would she ever be, that person. They reached the main living quarters. Do you wish to know the truth? she asked Harris, not wanting the faultily placed praises he'd put upon her shoulders. I am here because I have no other choice. We always have a choice, Mrs. Benedict. She shifted her gaze away, unable to meet his kind-eyed, understanding stare. You will have a home. Security. Your freedom. Holdsworth's coaxing promise slammed into her, and she blinked back a sheen of useless tears at the unwitting recollection of the day she'd sold her soul for stability. Lily was never more grateful than when he stopped beside a closed door. She enjoys the library immensely, Mrs. Benedict. He pressed the handle and admitted her to another lavish space. Sunlight streamed through the floor-length windows along the side of the room and drawn to the unexpected cheer and warmth, she stepped inside. She searched the room, dimly registering the closing door as Harris took his leave. A high-pitched shriek split the quiet and heart-racing, Lily did a quick search of the room. Her gaze landed on Lady Flora, seated upon a leather-buttoned sofa with her skirts rucked about her knees. Hello, she said gently. Ignoring the greeting, the girl touched a hand to her chest. You frightened me. She dropped her voice to a low whisper. I thought it was my uncle. No child should live with fear. That sentiment shouldn't come until much later. Lily advanced deeper into the room. Do you come to this room often? This space, so very close to the guardian she clearly feared. I like to come here and read. Flora swung her legs over the edge and pumped them vigorously back and forth. The sunshine, she gestured to the long row of floor-length windows, where glowing rays shone brightly through the crystal panes. I would so greatly love to take my lessons outdoors, she said in a wistful manner that tugged at Lily. It was a tug that opened up all the conflicted thoughts that continuously ran through Lily's mind. She is not your concern. Your freedom. Your safety. Your security. Lily needed all those things. But whose concern should the little girl be? When the weather permits, we will take your lessons in Hyde Park, she said, unable to call the words back and as tangible joy lit the girl's eyes, she found she didn't want to. Truly? Lily nodded. Truly? She walked over and slid into the vacant mahogany caned library chair nearest the girl. She'd been gone so long from her own younger siblings, she forgot the absolute lack of artifice. Not yet jaded by life, a child of this age did not have the ability to distinguish sarcasm. She took in the pile of books littered at the girl's feet and strewn about the sofa. I thought you were unafraid of the Duke, she asked gently. 
Flora grabbed the book at the top of the pile. It is hard not to be afraid of him. She fanned the pages, all the while directing her words to the leather volume. He does yell. His thunderous roar as he'd ordered her from his office echoed around her mind. Yes, he does yell a lot. Lily studied the top of the girl's brown curls. As stern as her father had been, wholly devoted to rising to that esteemed position of vicar, her childhood had been filled with laughter. What was this girl's life to be like? Pain stabbed at her in thinking of the sad, solitary existence Flora would know. Flora stopped her distracted movements and picked her head up. But you aren't afraid of his yelling? You'll not leave simply because you are afraid. Emotion filled her breast at the trusting look shot her way. She drew in a ragged breath. No, she would leave after she'd committed the greatest theft against the Duke. A painful vice squeezed tight about her heart. And now, this child. She turned a question on Flora. When I first met with the Duke, were you not laughing while he yelled? Oh, yes. Flora nodded. But I laugh when I'm scared. She stared intently at the gold lettering of the book's title. I didn't always. Not when my mama and papa were alive. Then they. Lily took in the girl's white-knuckled grip. The. Died. They died. When presented with this innocent girl's suffering, all the unholy glee she had found in George's family's suffering faded, leaving her with a humbled shame for not considering that not all of George's kin were vile, heartless fiends. Flora raised grief-filled eyes to hers. So you see, sometimes I laugh when I am not supposed to. Yes, sorrow and fear elicited all manner of peculiar reactions in a person. When I was cast out of my family, came to London, she settled for. I missed my family very much. Flora scrambled forward to the edge of her seat. Did your mama and papa die, too? It was Lily's turn to hesitate. She dusted her palms together and studied her gloved fingers. From the moment she'd been discovered by the town gossip, wrapped in the young duke's arms, her fate had been sealed. They are lost, she said firmly. They are not dead. Flora slid her fingers over Lily's and gave a gentle squeeze. At that innocent, tender gesture of support, emotion balled in Lily's throat and she cleared it. When I came to London I began talking to myself. The girl's little lips twitched. Talking to yourself? It is quite bothersome, I assure you. Fortunately, for the lonely mistress of a bored nobleman, there'd been few around to hear Lily's mutterings. The room filled with Flora's giggles. That is bothersome. Oh, undoubtedly. Lily waggled her eyebrows. Particularly when you are attending Sunday sermons. As soon as her paltry attempt at a jest left her mouth, she registered what she'd said. She'd not stepped foot in a church since she'd left Carlisle. Flora spoke, bringing them round to their previous subject matter. Are you afraid of him? Something in that halting question said that Lily's answer was very important for reasons that went beyond the mere topic of a yelling, angry duke. When I was a girl, younger than you are now, my brother found a pup wandering the countryside. The memory pulled at her and, with her telling, sucked her back to Carlisle, to the place she'd called home. Ever the duke's niece, Flora sat in patience waiting, all the while her eyes urged Lily to continue in her telling. His name was Pup. Flora furrowed her small brow. That isn't a very clever name for a dog. I quite agree. Lily smiled in fond remembrance of the unoriginal name settled upon him by her siblings. He had three legs. The girl's eyes went round. Three legs? Then she narrowed them suspiciously. Are you making light of me? Lily shook her head. Not at all. When Shell, she coughed into her hand. She'd not allowed herself to speak aloud the names of her parents or siblings since she'd left. When my brother discovered him, Pup was hungry and scared. 
Her arms ached to hold that mongrel pup with the same hungering she did to hold her siblings once more. He'd been a faltering, deaf, white-whiskered dog the day she'd left. He'd be long gone now. Odd, the loss of that loving canine should elicit the same gut-wrenching pain as being cut off from her family. Flora squeezed her hand, bringing her back to the moment. What happened to him? The villager who set Pup free into the wild did not want him because he was injured. The duke's scarred, chiseled cheeks flashed to her mind. He might be an odious, snarling beast, but her heart twisted anyway with the pain he'd known. He barked and growled, not unlike the duke's thunderous roars, quite ferociously at my brother and anyone who came near him. Did he bite you? Lily shook her head. He did not. A brown curl tumbled over Flora's brow and Lily brushed it behind the girl's ear. It did not mean I didn't fear him every time he barked and snarled. Flora wrinkled her mouth contemplatively as she seemed to consider her words. I don't understand. She gave Flora a gentle smile. Well, you see, your uncle is like Pup. The little girl's mouth fell agape. The duke is like Pup. Another giggle burst from her lips. She slapped a hand to her mouth, but laughter escaped. You are saying my uncle is like a dog? And dogs go outside. Uncle does not leave this house. She paused. Ever. He never left this dark, miserable house? Thinking of the duke shut away from the world, living in shadows, and never knowing the feel of the sun on his skin, sadness stabbed at her heart. Aware of Flora, eyeing her curiously, Lily continued. Air, well, the duke is not like a dog. But the dog. Altogether different. Story now told, she admitted that anyone who heard such a comparison would have been scandalized with the analogy between the duke and an injured pup. She lowered her voice. And yes, your uncle is like pup, she clarified. It was fortunate the duke did not leave his office and wander down these halls. For if he happened upon this conversation where she likened him to a dog, she'd be sacked for sure. In the sprawling townhouse he now called home, Derek sought out but three rooms, his chambers, his office, and his library. The sole halls he used were the ones that led to one of the respective spaces. He'd embraced the solitude of his office and was quite content to bury himself away in the privacy of his own company. Derek drummed his fingers on the smooth surface of his rosewood desk. So how was he to explain this restless energy running through him to abandon the sanctuary of this very room? He slid his gaze over to the closed door. It is her. He ceased his tapping. Do not be preposterous, he said under his breath. After all, what reason could he truly have to want to see Mrs. Lily Benedict? The lady was a mouthy spitfire with fury in her eyes, when he'd always preferred his women with soft eyes and an enticing smile. The muscles of his belly clenched and unclenched with the unnecessary reminder that the days of being viewed as anything other than an oddity at a Piccadilly circus were over. The burns and scars on the left portion of his face marked him a monster for all. Except, the young lady who'd stormed his fortress and demanded an audience, and then a position in his household, had not stared upon him with horror. Derek sat back and drummed his fingertips along the arms of his chair. Oh, there had been, of course, the inevitable shock, but that had faded so that, for their entire exchange, he might as well have been, once again, human. With a growl, Derek grabbed the cane resting against his chair and surged to his feet. His need to exit these rooms had nothing to do with the memory of her spirited display in this very room. Nothing. Abandoning his ledgers, he now shuffled down the halls, onto the library, which had come to represent his one escape from hell and loneliness. He continued limping through the halls, when a muffled giggle brought him to a bumbling stop outside his library. A frown formed on his lips. With the burden his sister had thrust upon him, and through that burden, another burden in the form of Mrs. Lily Benedict, not even his library belonged to him anymore. Derek turned to go. The Duke is like Pup? The muted words belonging to the girl jerked him to a stop. 
Ignoring the ache in his thigh, caused by those quick movements, he fixed a glower on the door. What in blazes? Surely the damned governess or nursemaid or whatever the hell she was would not compare him to. Yes, your uncle is like pup. Bloody hell, she had. His ward's hilarity spilled past the wooden panel. A low rumble of fury built in his chest and climbed his throat. He tossed the door open so hard it bounced off the back of the wall. Derek cursed and thrust his cane out to keep the panel from closing in his face. Two startled shrieks met his undignified entrance. With lurching steps, he stumbled further into the room. All the while his furious gaze remained fixed on the woman who was more bothersome than the rodents seeking out their survival on the battlefields of France. What are you doing here? His sister's daughter slid behind her governess. Fury raced through him. Her goddamned temporary governess. The woman gave no hint of that same fear. She stood unrepentant with her head tossed back and fire in her eyes. Your grace, she greeted and then dipped a, by his way of thinking, insolent curtsy. Despite himself, a grudging respect filled him. We were speaking, and, she motioned with one hand to the stack of books littered about his sofa. Reading is part of our studies. Derek dipped his focus and his gaze caught on Lily's fingers tucked behind her back, locked with the girls. Did she seek to comfort the child? Or did she seek courage for herself? Or was it really a combination of the both? He narrowed his eyes, hating that he should care, either way. Speaking, you say? He dipped his voice to a low, deliberate whisper. She gave a stiff nod. You were instructed to not enter these halls. The lady motioned with her other hand toward the hall. No, I was instructed to not wander down those corridors. She paused. Which I did not. The vexing Lily Benedict would drive a vicar to drink during Sunday sermons. He jammed the heel of his palm into his eye. The child's need for a governess be damned, Lily Benedict brought with her more trouble than a bloody hurricane. Derek dropped his arm back to his side. He took another step toward the quaking pair. Their feet in harmony, they backed away from him. Those corridors run down this hall, madam. Oh. Lily drew out that questioning syllable and then stopped. She chewed her lower lip, drawing his gaze to that subtle movement and that plump flesh. Since his disfigurement, he'd not known the pleasure of a woman's body. He'd been foolish enough to try just once in the early days of his return. Visiting a seedy club in the dials, not even the desperate horrors there would lie with him. Do a? Eh? His years of celibacy no doubt accounted for the lust raging through him. Over a goddamned lip dot he forced himself to recall her earlier question. Do they what? He snapped. Does that hall run down this hall? She gestured with her hand. I would say that as there is another intersecting corridor, this one qualifies as an altogether different hall. By God in heaven, she'd so blatantly challenge him? A growl worked its way up his chest, an animalistic sound that stuck in his throat. The girl at Lily Benedict's back buried her face into the woman's skirts, momentarily calling his attention downward. He lifted his gaze back to the fiery-eyed governess who glowered in return. Not taking her eyes from Derek, she leaned down and whispered something to the child. Those hushed words penetrated some of the girl's terror for she nodded in response. Curtsy to his grace, Lily murmured. The girl snapped her eyes open. She managed a rusty curtsy and then with a look from her governess, her very temporary governess, the governess who led her to the doorway where the girl then raced down the hall. Derek stared after her a moment. Hmm, how very odd. This spirited governess had captivated the girl, as well. The child had formed an attachment with this woman so quickly? It spoke volumes to the child's loneliness. A sensation feeling very like pain needled at his chest, and on the heel of that was a comforting fury with this interloper, with the child, with himself for feeling anything when he was content to live a numbed, solitary life. 
Between yesterday's disregard for the privacy he craved and today's continued explorations, this woman could not stay. He wheeled around, prepared to send Lily Benedict, packing. The feisty beauty planted her hands upon her hips and glared. How dare you! Derek froze and looked about for the particular who in question but found the hall remarkably empty. Are you speaking to me? he whispered, returning his focus to the woman. This odd figure who at the same time, quaked in his presence and boldly challenged him. I am. With your snarling and snapping, you terrify the ch child. Her words trailed off as she stumbled away from his advancing form. I terrify the child? Or I terrify you both? He hated that her answer mattered and yet, it did. The rapid rise and fall of her chest supplied the woman's answer. She continued backing up until she collided with the end of the corridor wall. Lily splayed her hands out behind her and pressed her palms to the surface. You terrify us both. Her honesty jerked him to a halt. The only manner of sincerity he'd come to expect from people had been in their fearful gazes and repulsed glances. Then, he continued walking. You should be terrified. The graceful column of her neck worked with the force of her swallow. S.H. should I? Oh, yes, he whispered, coming to a stop, before her so a mere hair's breadth separated them. You see, I warned you to stay away. F.R. from the other corridor. From this one, he said on a lethal whisper. I warned you what would happen were you to invade my sanctuary and you have defied my orders. She wetted her lips, that slight, seductive gesture alluding to her nervousness. Except a wave of potent lust slammed into him, a desire to claim her mouth under his and explore the hot, wet cavern until she was begging for his caress. What madness was this? He thrust aside those musings that surely came from being without a woman for too long, and when he had been possessed of a full face and charm, he'd certainly never gone about seducing members of his then father's staff. For a woman who so desires the post, you've not demonstrated as much with your actions. It was why she had to go. Defiant, disobedient figures in his household would not do. He dipped his head close to her, shrinking the already infinitesimal space. A strand of black hair tumbled over her forehead and, in a reflexive moment, Derek captured it between his fingers. Softer than satin. The lady's breath caught audibly and she looked to him with some indefinable emotion in her eyes. Did she feel this hunger inside, as well? He froze, numbed by his body's awareness of her, this dangerous need for another person. He'd spent years shutting himself away and building up defenses where words could not hurt and glances were expected, and he wanted and desired no one. For who could ever feel anything for a grotesque figure who belonged more in a nightmare than amongst the living? Yet, in less than two days, Lily Benedict had roused a hungering from within that reminded him he was very much alive, and he did not like it one fragmented bit. He suddenly released her curl and took a step back. Mrs. Benedict? Yes. Her word emerged as a breathy whisper. Get out, he rasped. She held her palms up as though in supplication. You cannot. I can do anything I bloody well please. Go about scaring Flora, she continued over him. Flora? He rocked back on his heels and stumbled for his shock. The lady had not intended to argue for her post? Your ward, she snapped, misunderstanding the reason for his befuddlement. Gone were all traces of her earlier trepidation. Your sister's child. Once again, her dedication to a child she'd but just met took him aback. His mother had shown little affection for her children, beyond the purpose they served. The governesses who'd come into his household before had fled, without a backward thought for the girl. He furrowed his brow, trying to make sense of her staunch defense. Lily's devotion to Floor, the girl, could only be explained by her desire for the post of governess. Ah, again, that touching devotion to that child you've only just met. A flicker of pain lit her eyes, but then as soon as it came, it was gone. 
had he merely imagined that faint gleam in their aquamarine depths. The lady set her shoulders back. She does matter, she said quietly. It is not Flora's fault she finds herself here with you. She paused and looked pointedly at the scarred portion of his face. Neither is she responsible for the marks you bear. He went stiff, unaccustomed to any bold statements about his disfigurement. The audacity of her words stunned him silent. Furthermore, it would be wrong to send her through life holding her guilty for the crimes of others. Derek searched about his black soul for a jeering response, but came up empty. He eyed her with a sudden wariness. This woman with her bold scoldings and her unerringly accurate pronouncements terrified him worse than the damned French on the battlefield ever had. He needed her gone. Get out, he repeated quietly. Please? Part of him that had come to expect her spirited rebuttals braced for her bold defiance of those orders, just as she'd done from the moment she'd entered his home. Except, as she dropped a polite curtsy, and then walked stiffly down the hall, an unexpected disappointment swirled through him wishing that this time she'd stayed. Chapter 6 After his exchange with the spirited beauty yesterday morn, Derek attempted to thrust the thought of Mrs. Lily Benedict into the darkened recesses of his mind where other memories went to die. Except, the memory of her too full lower lip and her lean, lithe frame proved how ineffectual his efforts truly were. I wanted to kiss her. And for a moment of madness, in her eyes, he believed she wanted that kiss, too. As such, he decided to torture himself in other ways by seeing to the routine his bloody fool of a doctor had tasked him with. How could massaging the muscles and walking on the blasted leg ever help heal the old wound? After languishing in bed for two years, nearly dead of his burns, he'd struggled out of bed and attempted to wrestle use and movement into the useless limbs. The daily exercises gave him a daily purpose, even if just a small one. Now, however, his body would not allow him to wallow in the truth of his failings. Instead, Mrs. Benedict with her black hair and aquamarine eyes commanded his whole body's interest. Or it had. After too many minutes of painful movements, Derek gritted his teeth and walked the length of the corridor outside of his office. With each agonizing step, Lustful musings of the bold woman were replaced with the throbbing pain that radiated up his entire leg. He trained his eye on the portrait of a young man at the far end of the hall. Why did it never become easier? Why would the pain never go away? And more, why did he persist? Because I hope. I still hold on to the tantalizing dream that, through my efforts, I'll somehow become unbroken. Fool. To believe anyone could love him? Even his mother hadn't had that warm emotion in her heart. Your grace, there is no need to walk so briskly, his doctor called out from the opposite end of the hall. That is not the purpose of the. Shut your goddamn mouth. Derek did not break his stride. Instead, he continued to glare down the uniform-clad soldier in the painting. A handsome youth. Unscarred his face gloriously perfect. Unmarred by life and war. A fool who'd believed in the gloriousness of the cause and the grandiosity of adventure. What had his efforts brought him other than scorn and pain? It is more a matter of practicing the movements. The stretches. The. I practice the bloody movements daily, he shouted. And I told you, the man put in gently, you no longer need to see me weakly. He'd been working with Carlson after more than two years of languishing in his bed, forgotten by the world. And now, of course, even he was eager to be done with Derek. Why should he remain? You're a bastard to the only man to show you kindness. You do not even need to exercise weekly, the doctor reminded him once more. Derek tripped, but quickly caught himself. Are you telling me this is the best I'll ever achieve? He thundered. If you insist on remaining locked inside your townhouse, then yes, Dr. Carlson said matter-of-factly. Perspiration beaded on his brow and self-hatred twisted inside. Gone was the man who'd expertly fenced and waltzed ladies about the dance floors of Europe. After years of retraining his muscles, 
he still couldn't even walk the length of his damned hall. Derek squeezed his eye tight a moment as shame scorched his belly. What is the point of it? he asked, tiredly. What was the point of any of it? It is about properly exercising your muscles, your grace. The doctor spoke with a casualness that should have grated. Until you leave this townhouse and partake in actual. I am not leaving, he cut him brusquely. Occasionally, the determined doctor would get it into his mind to debate Derek on his self-imposed exile, as he termed it, with a sigh, the fool doctor removed his spectacles and dusted the lenses with his crisp, white handkerchief. You are too harsh on yourself. You have made immeasurable progress. Damn lackwit. The only reason Derek even tolerated his bespectacled, ever-optimistic presence was because he'd been the only damned doctor in the whole of the kingdom called in by him who'd said he would walk again. The man had, at least, been correct in that regard. He tightened his mouth. What the man had failed to mention was that even with his efforts, Derek would never be anything more than a cripple, a weak, pathetic fool who struggled to climb stairs and who couldn't move through a day without knowing pain. As if the fates were mocking him, Derek stumbled. He cursed and caught himself before he pitched forward and made a total arse of himself. The doctor raced over with smooth, effortless strides. He reached a hand out. Your grace, please let me. Get the hell away from me, Carlson. Derek snarled. I am bloody fine. The man pursed his lips, likely one utterance away from calling him a liar. And then he'd be forced to sack the one person who'd not given up on him when his own mother and brother had. Edeline did not. She was loyal and loving, and you turned your own sister away. You are done here for the day. So go, he hissed. Carlson also happened to be the only person unaffected by Derek's shows of black temper. Though that isn't true. There is a raven haired, spirited beauty there is still a good deal of time left, your grace. Then, the other man had tended him from those early days, when Derek crawled out of bed, limping and crying through those excruciating exercises. It was surely hard to fear a man who'd sobbed and screamed in his presence. Carlson, he growled. Very well. The doctor consulted his timepiece. Perhaps we will conclude for the day. Perhaps? Did Carlson truly think he'd be the one to determine the start and end of this session? I advise you to rest for the afternoon, your grace. Derek made a crude gesture to show him exactly what he thought of his high-handed orders. I said go, Carlson. As you wish, your grace, he said with a cheerful smile that grated on Derek's every last nerve. With Carlson gone, he focused on the same canvas that pulled at him every day since he'd made this hell his residence. Derek continued his march over to the portrait at the end of the hall and then stopped, he ran a hateful gaze over the last image ever captured of himself as human. The grinning youth in his crimson uniform with gold epaulets stared back, foolishly optimistic and bloody arrogant in his seeming infallibility. Derek bent and fished a knife out of his boot. With loathing coursing through his veins, he drew his arm back with gleeful relish to slash the happy visage of that boy. The silver tip of the blade kissed the canvas. He closed his eye a moment and then, with a curse, he awkwardly bent, thrust the blade back into his boot and started his familiar walk back down the hall. The moment that memory was destroyed, all that remained was the monster and coward as he was. That, he could not bear. With Dr. Carlson's urging to quit for the day echoing around his mind, Derek hardened his mouth and increased his stride. The muscles of his thigh screamed in agonized protest and he dragged his left heel along the carpeted floor. The sudden, jarring movement sent him pitching forward. Bloody hell, he muttered as he came down hard on the heels of his hands. He welcomed the pain that shot from his palms and up his arms, for it spared him from focusing on the burning agony of his useless leg and hideously scarred face. His breath came hard and fast as he stared at the red carpet. Where the crimson shade usually put him in mind of battlefields slicked with blood, now the hue conjured a pair of soft, eager lips. Lips that hadn't demanded his kiss or attention, but rather a post in his employ. 
With the throbbing ache in his damp thigh, instead of fighting back the lady's image, he let the thoughts of a determined Mrs. Benedict slip in. This hunger for her temporarily distracted him from the physical pain made worse by his exertions this day, and he welcomed that diversion. Tall, with generously curved hips and ample breasts, the woman was a mighty Aphrodite. Her mouth roused the memories of all the wicked ways in which he'd enjoyed a lady's full lips upon his person. But Mrs. Benedict had an altogether different mouth. Lush, with her bottom flesh fuller than her upper, narrower lip, her mouth fairly begged to be kissed. A mouth that, if he were still the damned youth in the portrait, he would have kissed, and she would have pleaded for more. She'd look upon him as though he were a man to be desired. Derek struggled into a standing position. It didn't matter a bloody damn from now to Sunday what Mrs. Bennett or Mrs. Benedict or whatever the hell her blasted name was, thought of him. He cursed roundly and poured himself back into his efforts. Bloody walking, he spat. His pathetic efforts. As though it mattered if he ever had proper use of his leg. He would still be the monster whispered about and feared. Hell, he could not even stomach the sight of his own hideous visage. He increased the speed of his stride. The heel of his boot dragged along the carpet and he stumbled. He sprawled face first into the corridor with his austere ancestors, looking on in mocking disapproval. Derek cursed again and shoved himself up. He sat sprawled in the corridor and rubbed his aching muscles, muscles which hadn't been, nor would ever be fully healed and restored to rights after the French bayonet that had slashed repeatedly through his ligaments when he'd laid on the battlefield his face burning from one fool's misfired volley. His younger self grinned on with that roguish charm he'd been noted for. Would you still be grinning, you bloody lackwit, if you could see yourself now? He shot over to the unaging version of himself. Derek made to stand and his leg crumpled from underneath him. Raining down a string of vile words that would have shocked a street thief in the dials, he sank back upon the floor. Not unlike the moment he'd received that wound, with slow, clumsy movements, he dragged himself to the wall and borrowed support from the plaster surface. His chest rose and fell in a heavy rhythm, a combination of his exertions and the tortured remembrances of Toulouse. The bloody French city that had stolen all from him. He gritted his teeth. Nay, it hadn't been a city, but rather a man. A former friend, at that. For back before he'd been turned into a beast, Derek had friends closer than brothers. Christian, the Marquis of St. Cyr and Tristan, the Earl of Maxwell. The bond between them had been so strong that he'd allowed St. Cyr to convince him of the glory and adventure to be had in battle. He swiveled his head and stared down the hall at the canvas. In the end, it hadn't been some French soldier who'd seen Derek laid low in battle, but St. Cyr, who'd misfired and set him afire. Bile burned Derek's throat and he sucked in slow, steadying breaths. The acrid taste of burning flesh permeated his senses until he wanted to cast the contents of his stomach up. He fed his hatred for the man responsible for this beast he'd become. Christian, the Marquis of St. Cyr, a failure of a soldier had proven an even greater failure as a friend. He pressed his eyes shut. A sweaty lock of hair tumbled over his brow. He dabbed at the moisture. What fools they'd all been. Then, up until that bloody day of fighting when his life had been irrevocably altered, Derek, too, had been that heroic fool believing in a war, in his own self-worth and capabilities. Derek opened his eye and stared blankly at the cheerful robin's egg blue satin wallpaper of the opposite wall. Sweat dripped into his eye and blurred his vision. I should be dead, he whispered. For really, what was the purpose of this? This empty house that had belonged to his father, and then brother. A ducal obligation that should have never been his. A child to care for when he didn't want to care for anyone or anything. Yet, the fates in a cruel twist had spared him, and killed his brother, and taken his sister. Then, perhaps the devil had exacted his due on both him and George for the indolent, self-serving lives they'd both lived. But there was no explaining how the only good person he knew in the world, his sister, had also been taken. He yanked out his handkerchief and mopped his brow. The memory of Mrs. Lily Benedict flitted in once more. 
not the sultry quality of her contralto speaking voice or her smoky black lashes, but rather the bold tilt to her chin as she challenged him. In fact, if he'd called her Miss Bennett once more, Derek suspected the lady would have choked him with his own expertly folded cravat for the deliberate insult. He'd grown so accustomed to women who fled him in horror that he didn't know what to make of this undaunted stranger. He stuffed the wrinkled kerchief back into his front pocket. Derek shoved himself to his feet. A groan escaped him when he put his full weight upon his weak leg. He shot a hand out and caught the wall. The woman's presence served one purpose here, to care for his sister's child so he could be free of the responsibility of her. He wouldn't have to be bothered with speaking to his family's ancient man of affairs about a suitable replacement. Any day he was spared a visit from Davies, the better off his life was, quiet, empty, just as he preferred it. He reached for his cane and, with the words of his doctor burned into his thoughts, proceeded to stretch the muscles of his leg by walking the long, length of the hall. Chapter 7 a woman who'd spread her legs for an old gentleman and a caddish duke should have a harder heart for thieving. Instead, seated at the vanity in her borrowed chambers, Lily stared into the bevel mirror. Her worried visage stared back. As guilt and self-loathing assailed her, she gave her head a hard shake. Do not be silly. You've no other choice. And you've assuredly done worse than S. She caught herself and then cast a quick glance over at the doorway. It would hardly do to be caught whispering about her plans to rob the beast of Blackthorn. She slapped her palm gently against her cheek. Clear your head, girl. With all the time she'd had to consider Holtworth's demands, she'd not given a thought to finding such a cherished heirloom. A task made inestimably more difficult by a man who'd quite deliberately ordered her away from an entire wing of his townhouse. The Duke's disinterest in her and Flora would allow her to search out that famed heirloom, locate it, and then be off, like the thief in the night she was. She propped her elbows onto the smooth surface of the vanity. So, why was she not relieved? And grateful, and all things happy that she would escape his notice and attention? Because for some inexplicable reason, she could not rid herself of the thought of him, the Duke of Blackthorn. Lily sighed and dropped her chin into her palm. She'd have made a dreadful London pickpocket. For, she didn't have her focus on obtaining that family heirloom and restoring it to Holtsworth. Nor were her thoughts on the ghost of the cad who'd ruined her life with his pretty lies. Rather, it was the man with his half-beautiful, half-ravaged face. A chill stole through her. Through his crude words and snapping commands, he'd shown himself to be the manner of beast a wise person took care to avoid. She nibbled at her lip. Only that same beast had also granted her a post in his household. He'd done so when any other nobleman would have tossed her out on her backside or made her an indecent offer. Yes, any other gentleman would have wanted the use of her body and nothing more. The momentary spark of desire in the duke's eye indicted he wanted her but instead, he had offered her respectability. That selfless offering made him more than a duke or monster, it made him a man of honor. A man capable of good and that was more heady than any kiss or touch. A groan escaped her. You are a fool, she whispered into the quiet. How many times would she make mountains out of the mist with her romantic spirit? That spirit she'd believed long since dead. She'd do well to avoid the duke and his dangerous pull, not because of his surly attitude or wounds, but because she was no longer that sort of woman. Though his clear orders for her to avoid his office at all costs indicated he wanted nothing to do with her, he stirred feelings inside her that she could not sort out, she should be equal parts grateful and relieved over his icy indifference. There was a coldness to the Duke of Blackthorn's soul that could freeze the Thames. So why was she not fearful or relieved? Instead, a greater unease came from this enigmatic hold he had which made him far more dangerous than any of the Holtworths of the world. As such, she'd closeted herself in her borrowed rooms and given no thought to the diamond or her future. Yet, sitting as she'd been with nothing but her own contemplative self for company, guilt had crept in. For years, she'd not given consideration to anything but her own survival and what little semblance of happiness she could eke out of her lonely existence. 
even the task that had driven her into this dark household had been fueled by that selfishness. Now, she thought of him. Filled with restlessness, she pushed up from the narrow vanity seat and walked the length of these new quarters. White draperies hung over the floor-length windows, a white satin coverlet adorned the bed, and a white obison carpet muted the fall of her footsteps. Lily stopped beside the hearth and ran her fingers over the cold marble. By all intents and purposes, the brightly decorated room should have been nauseatingly cheerful. Instead, it possessed an eerie, haunting quality of a place that had known loss and of which no cheer lived, nor would ever dwell. She recalled Flora's words about the Duke being shut away. Had he truly made himself a prisoner in these dark walls, content to live alone, in the shadows? What a tragic way to be. Then, having been tucked away as she'd been, was she truly any less alone and dead inside than the Duke? Enough, she gritted out, and dug her fingers into her temples, to blot out his visage. Forcibly shoving aside all fascination with the brooding duke, she instead fixed on something far safer, his disregard for Flora, a child entrusted to his care. In failing to enumerate his expectations and responsibilities for the girl, the new Duke of Blackthorne had demonstrated the same disregard held by all gentlemen toward those women, young and old, whose care they should see to. Annoyance spiraled through her and Lily chose to feed that far safer sentiment. That made him not this brokenly beautiful figure who'd invaded her thoughts, but a man, just like all the others. Tired of selfish noblemen, Lily spun on her heel. Determination fueling her steps, she marched to the door and wrenched it open. Gaze trained forward, she stomped down the corridor, made her way downstairs, and came to a stop. The butler, Harris, stood at the foot of the stairs. His cheeks were their familiar ashen hue. Perhaps that was the man's perpetual color. And may I be of a assistance, Mrs. Benedict? He stammered as she descended the sweeping staircase. She inclined her head. I'd like to speak with his grace regarding my responsibilities. Lily stepped around him and continued on the path to the Duke's office. His grace? Harris called after her and she turned around. The butler collided against her back and then shot his hands out. He swiftly steadied her. Beg pardon. He cleared his throat. His grace? As in the Duke. He continued as though he'd not missed a proverbial beat. In a bit for humor, she arched an eyebrow. Is there another? She made to step around him. Harris matched her movements, effectively blocking her path. There is not. What? You asked if there was another duke and there is not. The man spoke with such seriousness she peered at him for a trace of humor. And found none. I know, Harris. She paused and then said gently, I was merely jesting. Jesting? He repeated. For the man's shock, she may as well have announced her intentions to avail herself of the Duke's silver. Heavens, what would Harris say if he were to discover her actual intentions to abscond with the family's jewels? He'd likely expire at her feet, in that case. Yes, jesting. Never tell me, she said dryly. The Duke does not permit expressions of amusement and mirth? The butler's shoulders sagged. He does not. He wrinkled his brow. His grace prefers his home be silent. She stilled and stared unblinkingly back. The duke preferred his home silent? What? Harris gave a vigorous nod. Nor does he welcome visitors. He gave her a pointed, return above stairs this instant look. Which she pointedly ignored. Well, I am not a visitor. At his furrowed brow, she smiled. I am a servant in his employ, charged with caring for his niece. Lily took a step left, but undeterred by her flirtatious grin, the resolute butler placed himself in her path once more. And he specifically does not welcome visitors in the corridor outside his office, at this hour. Curiosity stirred, the first welcome emotion outside the fear and uncertainty to dog her these seven years. She opened her mouth, but the butler frowned that question into silence. 
No, she'd expect Harris wouldn't lock him, accept, or answer any questions about his new employer. The hard set to his jaw indicated that for his ashen pallor and stammering words, there was a good deal of courage to him. Though she suspected that courage was born of fear in angering his master. Alas, Harris, his grace, and the devil still did not know the level of her courage. I dare say my hiring merits a meeting to go over my obli. No. Or. No. Mr. Davies, the Duke's man of affairs, sees to all of that. Well. She sighed. Very well. As if she'd given him a stay of execution, his eyes slid, closed. When he opened them, relief seeped from their brown depths. You are to wait for your summons from Mr. Davies. That pronouncement should not shock her. After all, lords and ladies had little to do with servants, and a governess was really just another member of the household staff. The fact the Duke of Blackthorne ceded all control to his man of business made him more like than unlike all those other slothful lords. If that was the care he showed for his niece, then the girl would be ruined for her likely fat dowry and ducal connection before she'd even made her come out. Very well, Harris. Lily inclined her head in acknowledgement. Do you require any further assistance? She bit the inside of her cheek to keep from pointing out he'd been very little help thus far. Lily gave another slight toss of her curls and smiled softly up at him. No, that is all, Harris. Thank you, she purred. The space filled with his audible swallow. Harris dipped his gaze lower to the loose black curls draped over her shoulder. Bloody inconvenient stubborn tresses. Who knew they'd have served a purpose? Not any purpose that was good. But still, a purpose nonetheless. She dipped her head. I'll return to my rooms and then seek out Lady Flora. And yet, another lie. Harris gave a jerky nod. Oh of course, Mrs. Benedict. A lie he believed as easily as if she'd held out the apple in the Garden of Eden. With a murmured goodbye, Lily started up the stairs. She stole a glance over her shoulder and scanned the bold, marble space. Finding Harris gone, she readjusted her direction and started down the stairs, taking them two at a time, and then darted down the forbidden corridor. Does he think he is a dragon and this is his lair? she muttered. The faintest, muffled laughter echoed her words. Heart hammering, Lily stopped mid-stride. She skimmed her gaze over the darkened halls in search of her charge. Only the shadows dancing upon the walls served as her company. Before Harris returned and found she disobeyed his orders, she quickened her steps. To kill the unease rolling through her, she struggled to drag forth the face of the blackguard who'd ruined her with the promise of more. Instead, it blurred and melded so all she could see was a strikingly beautiful, scarred visage of another. She reached the end of the corridor and came to a jerky stop. Unease roiling in her belly, Lily concentrated on her own breathing. The pale blue silk wallpaper. Anything but on the rash decision she'd made once upon a lifetime ago as the foolish vicar's daughter with stars in her eyes and dreams of love in her heart that had forever marred her future. She trailed a palm over the wallpaper, and then raised her gaze upward to the gold sconce directly above. Following that elaborate gilt piece, she then looked back down the hall, to the intermittent matching sconces. With wooden steps, she continued down the next hall. In her connection to George, this place had been destined to be her home. Just not in the way she'd imagined. Through the dreams she'd carried of life with the late Duke, Never had it been about the fine porcelain vases and the army of servants. Rather, it had been about the need to love and be loved in return. How quick she was, a naive girl, to believe a rake's lies. Her mouth twisted up in a sad smile. You goddamn, weak fool. The thunderous shout bounced off the plaster and Lily started. The honorable intentions that had set her in search of the Duke receded. She swallowed audibly as Harris's warning danced around her head. Perhaps she'd wait for the Duke's man of business, after all. Coward, she silently mouthed, and turned to go. For cowardice oftentimes promised survival. 
You are a useless, pathetic excuse of a man. The Duke's gravelly voice emerged from around the corridor in a harsh whisper that was more powerful than any of his previous bellowing. It brought her to a slow halt. She could be the coward and ignore those degrading words hurled at some other poor, fearful soul. She could continue on, unseen by the Duke and the man he berated, and none would be the wiser. The butler would be pleased in thinking she dutifully attended his orders. And all would be well. Rather, all would be well for her. Not, however, for that poor servant and stranger being so brutally admonished by the Duke. Feelings of commiseration for the man demeaned with words kept her here when fear said flee. Just leave. I have my post. What he does now matters not. You've no purpose in life. That vile charge snapped her into movement. She'd been so disdained by his family, even her own. She could not stand as silent witness to another person's shame. Fueled by a healthy fury, Lily raced around the corner. Who do you think you are to speak? Her words trailed off and she came to an abrupt stop. She scanned the hall for the poor servant whose rescue she'd come to. Empty. There is no one here, she said to herself. Then her gaze lit on the Duke of Blackthorn lying prone on the floor. Under her scrutiny, his unscarred cheek flushed red. And then shock slammed into her, sucking the air from her lungs. You were speaking to yourself, she breathed. All the earlier annoyance and fury that had sent her charging down here, without regard for Holtworth's plans and her future, faded. As one who'd spent years despising herself, she recognized the glimmer of self-loathing in his grace's eye. Pity pulled at her heart as, in this frozen instant, a kindred connection between them was born. The duke swept his black eyelashes lower in a menacing manner. Only an austere duke of this man's powerful frame could manage to both look and be in complete control, even sprawled upon the floor as he was. What do you think you are doing here? he demanded in clipped tones, slightly breathless. From his exertions? Or the shock of her presence? Staring down at him, sympathy continued to fill her breast. I am so sorry, she said softly when her heart resumed a normal beat. For more than her mere intrusion. Rage flashed in his eyes, a man who heard her words of pity and would burn her with his glare if he could, because of it. Unnerved by the extended silence, she shifted back and forth on her feet. Suddenly wishing she'd thought better of disobeying his orders, she cleared her throat. I did not see you, her lips pulled in a grimace as she realized, belatedly what she said. Did not see me, he bit out. Perhaps you are the one who is blind, madam. He rose to his feet. She took in his slow, awkward movements. The slight whitening at the corners of his lips and a faint grimace hinted at the pain he was in. Her heart softened at the sign of his suffering. Lily took a step toward him but he fixed a black scowl on her that pinned her to the floor. The duke took another step and his jerky movement sprung her into action. She retreated until her back knocked against the opposite wall. Her throat worked with a nervous dread as he limped over to his serpent-headed cane and took slow, threatening steps over to her. You were ordered to stay away, Miss Benedict. Thump thump thump. The heel of his walking stick beat a staccato rhythm upon the carpet. Lily pressed her palms against the wall and walked sideways, away from him. Mrs. Benedict. Come, he scoffed. You're no more a missus than I am a dashing, charming gentleman. But once he had been. Something in his tone and the flash of regret in his I spoke volumes. Whereas, she'd never been anything but a vicar's daughter turned whore. Surely you'll not maintain the pretense of a married widow, for my benefit? Shame slapped her. For his aloofness, the duke had accurately surmised her worth. He possessed a keen intelligence she'd not thought a titled lord capable of. Nothing to say, he taunted. Her fingers twitched with the desire to slap him in his condescending face. As surely you'll not maintain the role of nasty beast all to kick keep people out. The faint quiver to her words ruined all attempt at false bravado. 
his body went taut. I warned you to stay away, he said on a lethal whisper that fueled the rapidly rising nervousness in her belly. Do not stir the beast. Why yes. She wet her lips. But. There is no but or questions or words required on your part, Miss Benedict. Were my demands not clear? Lily wanted to be brave and equally impressive in her fury. Th they were, your grace. Instead, she proved herself the weak, fearful creature she'd been since her father had cast her out. She didn't want to be that woman. Not anymore. That was the whole reason for her being here in this man's household in the first place. Weak-willed women never found freedom. Rather, they were owned, possessed, and destroyed by powerful lords. She gave a toss of her curls and he narrowed his eye into a thin slit of hidden emotion. Do not be afraid. I am here about the child. He stuck his face close to hers and she saw the snapping flecks of silver in his blue eye. The child, you say? Lily recoiled, but did not run as he surely wished her to. What brought you here was a desire to abandon your post as a nobleman's plaything. At the unerringly accurate charge, heat singed her cheeks. Hadn't her own father said she'd been born with the mark of horror upon her person? She curled her fingers into tight balls when he pushed his scarred visage ever closer. But after a couple of days you are so very devoted to that same child, a girl you've just met, that you'd defy my orders? Fear sucked the words from her and all she managed was a weak, shaky nod. Still, there was a primitive rawness to him that roused terror. The fine layer of civility and politeness carried by one of his station had been stripped back to reveal the most primitive level of a human being. The triumphant gleam in the depths of the duke's eye indicated he'd followed the precise path her terrified thoughts had wandered and that he delighted in it. Just as I do not care about the child, Miss Benedict, nor do I care to have my orders gainsaid by anyone. With that cold decree, he was every inch a winter's and she despised him for it. He limped off. The new duke might be a scarred, hurting shell of a person but there were levels of depravity and wrongness that could not be pardoned. You are a vile, cold-hearted monster. As soon as the insolent words slipped past her lips, she bit the inside of her cheek hard enough to draw blood as he turned back. The harsh, angular planes of his partly beautiful, partly horrific face settled into an inscrutable mask. A monster? At those flat, emotionless words, fear spiraled through her. Her mouth went dry. I merely wished to discuss what expectations you have for her learning. She angled her chin up a notch. And a proper introduction. You're here seeking an introduction? He sneered. You spoke of wanting security, but that is not altogether true, is it? Even with the slight space between them, she strained to hear those lethally whispered words. A woman who truly desired security and the post you foolishly fought for would not have defied the orders given by her master. My master? His high-handed words sent her back up. My goodness, would you liken me to a dog? He continued over her as though she'd not spoken. She would not have wandered halls she was expressly ordered to avoid. Her fury slipped. He spoke in the past tense. His grace paused and lowered his gravelly voice all the more. He drew back and then pointed a long, commanding finger to the opposite end of the hall. I want you gone. Surely she'd heard him wrong? And yet, by the hard set to his face, and the icy glint in his eye, her ears had not proven faulty. Oh, God. Gee gone? Fear continued to grow, spreading through her person and crushing her chest with the weight of her folly. But this was not dread brought by his snapping, snarling ways or the marks upon his face. This was the kind of dread that came from losing all the security and safety she'd found in the world. The duke eyed her dispassionately for a long moment and then turned on his heel once more. With the aid of his walking stick, he limped down the corridor and each step that carried him away heightened the panic cloying at her. 
The same terror to grip her as a just 16-year-old girl put aboard a mail coach and sent to London came rushing back. The memory of that day laughed at her mind. Where would she go? Home. The promise of Carlyle whispered around her memory. The lush greenery. The rising mountains. Only the intoxicating promise of a place she'd given up hope of ever being welcomed back was quashed by the harsh, curt words that her father sent her off with. Her eyes slid, closed at the rising swell of helplessness. What have I done? She might detest the Duke of Blackthorn. She might despise his treatment of her, his servants, the young girl who was his ward, but he was still her employer. Or he had been her employer. Tears clogged her throat and she damned the fine crystalline sheen that blurred his tall figure at the door. Your passionate nature is a sin before God. Her father's words rang as clear if they'd only just been uttered. Only, that had been when she'd striven for daughterly obedience, when nothing but being approved by one's parent mattered most. Life had taught her there was more than that. He turned and took several steps toward the opposite corridor, no doubt seeking his office. You would send me away, she called out, proud of herself for standing up to him. Then, anger made one stronger. Wasn't the cold-hearted duke, after all, proof of that? His grace stopped. She drew a slow breath and then walked briskly toward him. You'd send me away because I inquire about my responsibilities? And she proved herself a coward, stopping with several paces between them. Because I care about the ch. He spun around so swiftly and with such effortless movement, she gasped. You care about the child? She winced at the slight, mocking emphasis. You are a stranger and know even less about that child than I myself. He peeled his lip in a mocking sneer. No, you are quite clear, Miss Benedict. You came for employment. You would have taken anything, he continued his relentless barrage upon her conscience. The child was always a mere afterthought to you. Oh, God. He was correct. She pressed her eyes, closed a moment. She hated him for being accurate and, more, hated herself for having been reduced to someone who'd put her own thoughts, security, and future before that of an innocent child. She'd fallen lower than Eve in this land of Eden. She managed to move her thickened tongue. You are wrong, she said, her tone hollow. For was he truly? Over the satin fabric of his black patch, he arced his eyebrow upward. Am I? he asked echoing her own silent question. Had his inquiry been delivered as taunting, with that icy edge she'd come to expect, it would be easier than this matter of factness. You come here making charges on the manner of guardian and person I am. He stalked over with surprising agility. Rage made people do powerful things. The duke stopped before her. I spare the child from having to see a living monster. She winced at the cruel words she'd leveled at him a short while ago. For just that, he said more than he had since their first meeting. But you, he went on. You would come into this household and place your own desires, he wrapped that word in a silken tone that caused an odd fluttering in her belly, before what is best for that child you so care about. A cold, mirthless smile played on his lips. Now tell me, which of us is truly thinking of the child's best interests? She froze and stared unblinking at him. His charge ran through her, shocking her with the accuracy of it. Guilt unfurled in her belly. Lily slid her eyes, closed a moment. You are, indeed, correct, she whispered. This great, hulking bear of a man who yelled at his servants and hid away in his office, in this was far more honorable, far more decent than her. He came closer and then stopped so a hair's breadth of space separated them. His towering, broad-muscled frame sucked the breath from her lungs. At his body's nearness, a slow heat spread through her body and befuddled her mind. So that she wanted to know more of this warmth and not the cold chill to have filled her since she'd entered his dark halls. I should send you away, he said with a gravelly roughness to his tone better suited to a cutthroat in the dials than a man who could command entrance into any ballroom, a man just shy of royalty. 
I expressly forbade you from entering my halls. Power emanated from his well-muscled frame. They are all your halls. Her gaze dipped to the whirl of black hair matting his chest and her mouth went dry. Should I not fear him? If she were wise, surely she would. But I do not. Not in this moment of charged energy between them. Of its own volition, her hand came up, and she braced her palm on his chest. The duke went still. She blinked and then swiftly dropped her arm to her side. I... He'd quite muddled her thoughts. Forgive me. With his broad, well-muscled chest and powerful form, he was nothing like Sir Henry, who'd grown increasingly heavier through the years. Nor was the duke shaped in any way like his lean, late brother. This man was a broad bear of a figure who conjured knights of old brandishing their broadswords and eternally braced for battle, easily vanquishing all memory of others. Lily wanted to once again brush her hands over him, to steal the heat that penetrated the fabric of his shirt. And will you do it again? She would gladly do it again if. Lily blinked rapidly. Do what again, she blurted. In a move surely meant to intimidate, he leaned down and stuck his face close to hers. Is there something wrong with your mind or your hearing? She rather thought there was something wrong with both in this instance, for how else to explain the maddening control this man now possessed of her senses? Miss Benedict, he barked, startling her from the haze of desire he'd cast over her. So she was to be Miss Benedict again. Like a bucket of Thames water dropped upon her head, he doused the thick haze of passion cloaking her senses. She angled her neck back to meet his gaze squarely. There is nothing wrong with, either. Only my mind. With her height, she'd been able to meet the eyes of most men she'd ever conversed with. With his broad, towering frame, the duke was more bare than man. He somehow managed to make her feel like one of those diminutive young women always clamored for by the men in her father's parish. She struggled to draw forth the question he'd put to her. They stood so close she detected the flecks dancing in his blue eye. If I allow you to remain, will. You. Enter. My. Halls. Again? She wet her lips, wanting to give him the answer that would secure her future. Being born a vicar's daughter, the lesson on not sinning with lies on her lips had been ingrained into her with her father's birch rod. All of those lessons had been shoved aside for the sake of survival. I... She slid her gaze away from his, thinking about the carved box that contained all links to her previous life, upon the vanity. Tell him what he wishes to hear. Lily closed her eyes a moment. She was a whore. A woman without a family. And now, a would-be thief. Liar. For in this moment, it was not about the diamond. You are thinking of nothing now but him. She looked to him once more. You have hired me in the post of nursery governess, she began, faintly breathless. He stared at her with a remote expression, silently daring her to continue. If I am to serve in that capacity, it will at the very least, be my responsibility to speak to you if there are matters of concern pertaining to Lady Flora. Who? Your niece, Lady Flora. What was it that prevented him from speaking the girl's name? That aversion to a person's name, hers, Harris, Flora's. Did he fear a connection to people? The hint of that possibility softened the shrewish words on her tongue and fueled her resolve. She angled her chin up a notch. I should also be clear, your grace. I will continue to visit the library and other parts of your household, for this is also Lady Flora's household and, as such, she should not be a prisoner in her home. Without the faintest hint of shame at failing to note so much as the name of the girl whose care he'd been tasked with, the duke continued on. I should sack you now then. He spoke more to himself, with his words laced with bewilderment and frustration. She placed her palms on his chest. Do not send me away. Her words emerged as a breathless whisper that would feed any person's lowest opinion of her as a harlot. And yet, her body responded to him of its own accord. In a way, that defied logic and common sense. 
He stiffened and, for an instant, she thought he'd pull away. Instead, he remained rooted to the floor as though the same madness that had besieged her mind had overtaken him. His gaze moved once more to her lips. A flare of desire sparked in his eye. That flicker of emotion she recognized. She'd cursed all signs of it from her last protector, which had indicated he intended a visit to her bed. Hadn't known what to make of it with the cad who deceived her. Now she did. And this man, this hard stranger with an inexplicable power, warmed her from the inside out. How could she account for the maddening heat he roused inside her? In a world where she'd made nothing but mistakes, he represented folly. So why did she not flee? Why could she not draw forth his treacherous brother's face? The duke dipped his head and her lashes fluttered. She tipped her head back to receive his kiss, despising herself for her weakness. Are you attempting to seduce me into maintaining your post, Lily? His gruffly spoken question brought her eyes open. Why your grace? She hated that his words should sting like dull needles being stuck into her skin. Only, she had no right to this hurt or resentment. By her actions in the past, she'd proven herself a whore. Derek, he commanded. Yes, in this they'd moved past the formality of titles and proper forms of address. His name evoked power and strength and was perfectly suited to one of his strength. What would you say if I told you I was not? Her voice emerged hoarse with her awareness of him. Passion darkened his gaze. I would call you a bloody liar, he whispered and then claimed her lips under his. At the heated burn of his mouth upon hers, she went still. This man who kissed her now with such hunger was the brother of the man who'd tricked her out of her virtue, and for that truth, there was surely a sin in this act. And yet George had brushed his wet lips over hers, but twice, and never had she felt this eddy of desire that threatened to consume her. It drove back all memory of those insignificant, fleeting embraces. For all of society's opinions of her as a whore, she'd been with, but two men. Neither of them had truly taken the time to kiss her lips. Through the importance they'd placed on their own self-gratification, she'd been deemed unworthy of that intimate caress. This dark, angry stranger kissed her mouth as though he were memorizing the shape of her lips. In all of the clumsy gropings and painful exchanges she'd known, not once in all these years had either of those men ever liquefied her the way the stranger's touch did. The duke slanted his mouth over hers, laying siege to her mouth, possessing her in a way she'd never been possessed, and she shut out all others, and turned herself over to him. Lily twined her fingers in the luxuriant silken tresses of his unfashionably long hair and angled him closer, wanting to further know what this pleasure was. He slid his tongue into her mouth and then found hers. A soft, keening moan escaped her. Say my name, Lily, he demanded, commanding with that gravelly tone, roughened by passion. Derek, she rasped. As though that utterance drove him to a frenzy, he increased the thrust and parry of his tongue. Lily boldly met those strokes. In a bid to be closer to the blazing heat pouring from his frame, she pressed herself against the hard wall of his chest. How is it possible for a man dripping ice to possess such fiery warmth within? Derek drew back and she cried out in protest, but he moved his attention to the sensitive skin of her neck. Lily's legs buckled and she gripped his hard forearms to keep from falling. In that moment, with her body afire for him, she proved all those harsh, ugly words true, she was nothing more than a wanton harlot. And yet, she could not care. All she was capable of was feeling. Derek dragged his mouth down the column of her throat and then he trailed kisses over her décolletage. A broken gasp escaped her, and she slid her fingers into his hair, anchoring him close to her chest. She slid her eyes closed and gave herself over to the sensation of his caress and the hot sensation fanning out in her belly. She wanted to uncover all his secrets and know the man he was. To peel back his snarl and see his smile. And his touch. She wanted it to go on forever. Your body does not lie in your desire for me, he rasped out, those words directed more to himself. And no, it does not. 
Derek ran his palm over her flat belly and she bit her lip hard wanting his touch at her aching core, wanting him to tuck her gown up and slide his fingers inside to the wicked heat he'd created. What was this need for him? What power do you have? It was as though he'd looked within her mind and plucked out her turbulent thoughts. Derek palmed her breast and caressed the stiff peak of her nipple through the thin fabric of her gown. She arched into his hand, as a wet heat settled heavy between her thighs, filling her with an aching need to know the feel of him between her legs. He stiffened and made to pull away. She tangled her hands about his neck. Do not stop, she pleaded against his mouth. He broke the kiss so suddenly that she silently mourned the loss of him, this feeling of closeness and desire. Her heart pounded wildly. His kiss, their embrace, had been the singularly most erotic, beautiful moment of her life. Never had she known even a hint of the passion she'd known in his arms. Lily? Her lashes fluttered. Kiss me again. Kiss me so that I know there is more than ugly shame and pain in the joining with a man's body. She forced her eyes open. Why yes? Forgive me, he said, his tone gruff, but otherwise devoid of emotion. I am not a man to go abusing servants in my employ. His chest moved hard and fast, belying the calmness in his words. And you, madam, are a servant in my employ, he said in clipped tones that chilled. He didn't sack me? He alluded to it, but even now, his words promised her the post and his respect. That should have never happened. Oh, of course. Horror slapped her and her throat went thick with shame. And my apologies, why your grace? Those words emerged garbled. Dimly, she registered the sound of footsteps. The rhythmic bootsteps cut across the tense, quiet. Derek looked beyond her shoulder and his gaze narrowed imperceptibly. Lily followed his stare and blanched. Down the opposite hall, the butler ushered an older man with a shock of white hair into the duke's office, but not before he leveled her with a look of loathing. Get out, Derek said quietly. Embarrassment brought her eyes closed with the muted horror of not only being in Derek's arms, but being spied acting the wanton harlot she was. Servants would talk. They would all correctly assume she was, indeed, a whore. I said go. That three-word utterance emerged on a long, harsh whisper that promptly sent her into flight. Lily tore down corridors, her skin burning with the feel of Derek's gaze on her. Chapter 8 Derek stared down the now-empty corridor and, dragging a hand through his hair, he unleashed a string of black curses. What in blazes had he done? For the young rogue he'd once been, he'd never been a manner of man such as his father and brother, who'd taken their pleasures with maids on their staffs. In Lily's arms, however, he'd felt more alive than he had all these years since his return. She'd made him forget honor and anger and pain, so all he had wanted was to lose himself inside her. Running a shaky hand through his hair, he thrust aside the tumult of emotion whirring inside and looked to the door his man of affairs had disappeared behind. He tried and failed to regain a semblance of control over his thoughts. Desire continued to course through him, with the remembered feel and touch of Lily. And this hungering had little to do with the lack of warm bodies he'd had to bed these past years and everything to do with the lush contours of her generously curved figure. He scrubbed a hand over his face and willed his thoughts to rights. Women did not desire him. Not any longer. The teasing, charming rogue with his cocksure grin had died on the fields of Toulouse, and in his place remained a scarred, burned, seething beast. Yes, Lily, no doubt, had used her wiles as a ploy to retain her post as he charged. And yet. He slid his gaze down the corridor which she'd fled. Her whispery moans and passion-glazed eyes spoke an altogether different truth. How could that be? How, when he could not even stomach the sight of his own visage, should she tremble in his arms? Dragging his attention away, Derek retrieved his cane and strode toward his office for his meeting with Davies. Lily Benedict was either mad, foolish, or both. As he made his way along the length of the hall to his office door, a room that had proven his sanctuary over the years, he grimaced. 
The muscles of his legs strained from his exertions, but he pushed ahead, creating the privacy behind that wooden panel the way a drunk thirsted for French spirits. Except, now that sanctuary had been shattered, by a beauty with a mouth, to tempt a saint into sinning. People did not put demands to him and they certainly did not gainsay his wishes. Yet this insolent fool had done both. Derek stopped beside the door and reached for the handle. I should sack her. He paused with his fingers outstretched and a contemplative frown on his lips. The fact that, in her short time in his household, she'd entered these forbidden halls indicated she was not a woman to do as bid, even if she was a servant on his staff. But to turn her out would be a manner of beastliness that even he was incapable of. Only a true fiend would kiss her and then sack her. That callous act would mark him the kind of dark villain George had been when in the living. He grinned wryly. Perhaps there was a sliver of good left in Derek's rotted soul, after all. That wasn't very nice of you. No, he hadn't been kind to Lily. Except, he hadn't been kind to anyone in so long he didn't think he could recall those simple gestures, smiling, laughing, and bowing, if he needed to save his other eye. He, Derek froze. He stared unblinkingly at the door. Did the conscience he'd thought long dead, in fact, live and still speak? His frown deepened. And yet, if those guilty remnants of his past belonged to him, why did they whisper about him in a soft, lyrical, sing-song children's tone? Did you hear me? He turned slowly around and scanned the corridor. Who in blazes? Small fingers tugged at his coat. I am right here. Derek jerked his gaze lower and then widened his eye. A stern, angry, little girl frowned up at him. For a moment he was transported back to the nursery above stairs, to another girl with those thick, brown ringlets. I am a dragon. A fiery monster. I never knew a dragon could speak. Oh, yes. The air trembled with the memory of his sister's laughter. Can you not see me because of your eye? The rapidly curious inquiry made by the girl pulled him to the moment. I can see you, he barked. I, swiftly he closed his mouth as he realized he was a handful of words away from answering to a child. When he said nothing else on it, the girl tugged his fabric once more. You what? I want you gone. That menacing whisper turned the girl's cheeks white. She released his coat and stepped away. Grateful that this tiny little person would take herself off, Derek turned around. And that wasn't nice, either. Perhaps Lily's madness had proven contagious and infected his sister's damned daughter. For he'd occupied the same home as the child for weeks and, in that time she'd engaged, but a handful of words with him, in meetings he'd abruptly ended. Oh, he was aware of her lurking in the shadows, stealing peeks the way all people inevitably had of the grotesque Duke of Blackthorn gawking like he was an oddity. He'd studiously avoided her. It was a perfect arrangement for a man who craved nothing more than a solitary existence and a child who feared monsters. Or it had been the perfect arrangement. Until now. He flexed his jaw. The child tapped his arm. Well? Aren't you going to say something? His sister's child had been a good deal easier when she had fewer words. Were all children this boldly stupid? His mind spun as he tried to recall the youth he'd been. Fearless. Unrepentant. Yes, stupid indeed. Annoyance flashed in the girl's blue eyes, with silver flecks. Derek started. He knew those eyes. Or at least had known them at one time. They had been nearly the same shade of blue to meet him in a mirror every morning. The winter's eyes. He, George, and Edeline had possessed eyes, the same shade of blue that it had been remarked upon by all who knew them. Now his sibling's eyes had been forever closed. The other only had one left to show for his efforts fighting Boney's forces. He tightened his jaw. A brown curl fell over the child's brow. Don't you know it is rude to stare? She blew at the strand. The stubborn curl promptly fell back into place. 
If he remembered how to laugh, this would have been one of those moments when he would have tossed his head back and roared with the hilarity of this child handing out lessons on proper behavior. A girl such as her didn't require a nursemaid. She could be one. His ward scrubbed her hand over her nose. You don't say very much, do you? Her question, teeming with curiosity, jerked him back to the present. I did say something, he hissed. I want you gone and I have a meeting with. Mean Mr. Davies? At the very moniker he and his siblings had given Davies years earlier, another unexpected smile pulled at his lips. You are smiling again. She ran the back of her hand over her nose. Again. And you don't seem to be a monster when you smile. I am very much a monster, he whispered. By this child and her damned nursemaid's blatant rejection of his commands, he was a wholly ineffective monster. What was the benefit of being a hideous beast if you couldn't even manage to run a child off? She angled her head to better study his burned cheek. As a flash of fear lit her eyes, his mouth went dry with the familiar shame and dread of being studied like a circus oddity. No, people did not love him. He was reviled, pitted, and feared, but never one to be loved. After all, if his own mother hadn't been able to love him transformed as he'd been, what other person could? He thrust aside those weakening emotions. It was far better for the girl to be fearful. Terror would keep her away and, more importantly, keep him sane and solitary. The girl took a step, toward him. Toward him? You weren't always a monster, I suspect, she murmured. My mama spoke of you often and said she loved you very much. Oh, God. Agony burned him with the same vicious ferocity of that misfire years ago. Derek rubbed a hand over his chest. He thought himself incapable of feeling, anymore. Apparently, there was still something left of his heart, even if it was just raw with the loss of his sister. His ward pointed a finger at him. You never came to visit when you returned. Monster that he was, he'd still not point out to this child the reason he'd not come was because his wounds had found him languishing in a hospital, on the cusp of death. And then, when he'd managed to survive and awakened, he'd found the monster he'd become. I was otherwise busy, he bit out and made to step around her. Who would believe that he'd so desire a visit with Davies? Anything to end this torturous questioning. The child stepped in his path, blocking his forward escape. My mama wanted to see you. There was an accusatory note in her words that wrenched at a heart he believed incapable of feeling. Ah, God. With her goodness and innocence, Adeline had been the only light in the whole Winters family. He and George had merely been worthless rakes and rogues who lived for themselves. She had possessed a pure soul. He flexed his jaw. In the end, they'd proven cursed, every last one of them. The little girl tapped him on the hand. Did you hear me? I did. This was to be his hell. Then. Not the marks upon his face or his crippled leg, but rather a lifetime saddled with a child who'd not allow him to wallow in the misery of his own existence. Derek cursed roundly. Oh, you should not say hell. That is not at all polite. She wrinkled her little brow. Or bloody. But sometimes using the word bloody is acceptable. If you have scraped your knees and are bleeding, then you may use it or if you lose a tooth. She opened her mouth wide and jammed a finger somewhere in the vicinity of her front teeth. I lost that one and it bled. So I could use the word, and. Derek's fingers twitched with the need to clamp his hands over his ears to blot out the child's incessant prattling. This meeting officially concluded with his obstinate ward, he stalked the remaining distance to his office, pressed the handle of the door, and stepped inside. God damn it. And that word is never. Derek slammed the door so hard it shook on its frame. Appropriate. The muffled response carried through the panel. He shot a hand out and turned the lock, just as the eight year old tormentor rattled the handle. Now, go, he boomed. Davy stood at the edge of his desk, 
his face a ghastly shade of white. Ignoring the other man, Derek strode across the room in his uneven, jerky manner and made his way over to the sideboard. He rested his cane against the edge and grabbed the nearest bottle and glass. Abandoning his walking stick for the liquid fortitude in hands, he limped back to his desk and sat. We met this week, Davies, he snapped. I do not like unexpected meetings. Why yes, your grace. He liked it a good deal less when he was in the midst of kissing Mrs. Lily Benedict until she was moaning for more of his touch. The door handle jiggled again. You need to apologize to the lady. Oh, blast. She'd still not gone away. Derek dug his fingertips into his temple, ignoring the frowning Davies. He'd certainly not take lessons on proper and improper language from a blasted child. My mama always said gentlemen should be kind to ladies. The gentleman he had been, died on the battlefield. Ignoring the chastisement being delivered on the other side of his door by a too old for her year's child, he poured himself a healthy snifter of brandy. Did you say something? The child, who would not quit, pressed the door handle once more. I cannot hear you. Derek took a long swallow and welcomed the fiery path the brandy blazed down his throat. Yes, despite the logic in sending away Mrs. Lily Benedict, it made far more sense to allow her to stay on, insolence and all. Let that one deal with the child. And then he could be free to wallow in the misery of his and his former friends making. His man of affairs alternated his disapproving stare between the doorway and Derek. Tiring of his silence, Derek waved him to his seat. Bloody hell, Davies, get on with it already, will you? The old servant jumped. Of course, your grace, he said rushing to claim his seat. He settled his ledgers and folios on the edge of Derek's desk and drew forth one black book. I am here to discuss the status of Lady Flora's governess. That nasally, monotone deliverance could have proven Wellington's most effective weapon against the bloody French. All Davies would have needed to do was speak and Boney's forces would have slumbered to death from the sheer, excruciating pain of his drawn-out sentences. For how many of this man's visits, and the doctor's, been the only deviation from Derek's otherwise solitary existence? There were no visitors come to call. No balls or soirees. No breathtaking beauties. Until her. As such, there is the matter of hiring a new governess for her ladyship. The dauntless Lily Benedict flashed to mind as she'd been with her thick, black lashes fluttering and her lips kissed crimson. Derek tapped his pen back and forth in a rhythmic movement meant to grate. Davies paused mid-sentence. He dropped his gaze to Derek's glove-encased fingers. The hint of a frown marred his thin lips. I, I understand the latest H has, fled? He winged a brow up. Coughing into his hand, the servant continued. Found a post elsewhere. Is that what Davies would call running off after catching a glimpse of her employer? Then the man was corked in the brain. Horror, revulsion, and terror had blended in the young woman's eyes as she'd taken hasty flight. I have already put out inquiries for a replacement for Miss Calpepper. Unlike Lily, who'd not only stormed into his household and stolen an interview with him, but also stood bold and unrepentant before him twice. And kissed me. She put her mouth against his and not shuddered and whimpered in fear, but rather moaned with desire. Ultimately, he'd succeeded in running her out of his private corridors. Yet, on both occasions, it hadn't been his hideous flesh to send the lady into flight. In fact, by the whitening at the corners of her mouth and her rapidly drawn breaths, the threat to sack her had roused greater terror in the lady. The woman to replace her will of course be proper and. Davies's words ran in and out of focus. Derek stopped tapping the pen and raised it close to his eye. He studied the black tip, turning it left and right. The midnight shade put him in mind of the brave, but wholly stupid, woman. For the shock and fear he could all but smell emanating from her slender frame, she'd spoken with him and to him as though the better portion of his face hadn't been licked by flame. 
You needn't worry after the suitability of the young woman. I will see, too. He narrowed his gaze upon that black tip. Such a woman would not run off the way the previous nursemaids and governesses had prior to her, nor the way they would continue to flee after she left. The solitary life he hungered for would be continually interrupted by a parade of young ladies who could not dwell within the beast's den. You do not say very much, do you? And the bolder his sister's child would become, invading his sanctuary, and on and on this process would go with his blasted man of affairs. Life would be a constant search for the next governess until either the girl became a woman and made her blasted come out or her other damned rake of a guardian reformed his ways and took mercy on Derek's black soul. He tossed the pen down. I have found the girl a governess. A tempting woman who entices me with every exchange and who posed the greatest risk for it Davies removed his wired spectacles from the bridge of his nose. Your grace? Did the man believe the removal of those glasses should aid his hearing? Derek laid his forearms upon the surface of the desk and steepled his gloved fingers. A governess. The lady has been hired. You are to deal with her. You are to enumerate her responsibilities. I merely wanted an introduction to the child. An introduction that you as her guardian should, at the very least, provide. He cleared his throat. See her properly introduced to the girl. The white-haired servant withdrew a handkerchief. He dusted his perfectly unblemished lenses with the crisp, white fabric. And the lady's name, Your Grace? The husky contralto of the young woman's speaking voice wrapped around his memory, seductive and soothing all at once. He'd long ago given up hope of ever knowing that passion and ease with a woman. Mrs. Lily Benedict, he said gruffly. The servant puzzled his brow. Well. Yes, well. After all, what could the man say to his reclusive, half-mad employer taking on the responsibility of selecting a proper governess? Then the older man flared his eyes and a flush mottled his cheeks. Ah, uh, so the astute servant even now pieced together that the woman Derek had been embracing in the corridor a short while ago was, in fact, one and the same. He took a perverse pleasure in the stiffly proper man's shock. Regardless, the same way he did not answer to impudent children or insolent ladies was the way in which he'd not answer to this man. I have worked out the terms of the young woman's wages. He proceeded to enumerate the details he'd promised Lily. As he listened, the solicitor's brown eyes went huge at the ridiculous sum he'd settled upon her. Flummoxed, the usually unflappable Davies sprawled in his seat. But, your grace? Unless you have specific reasons Mrs. Benedict is unsuitable, the matter is concluded. Even then, it still wouldn't matter. The lady was fearless and bold, and the perfect governess for his miserable household. And I desire her. Do not forget that crucial part. Annoyance thrumming through him, Derek shoved back his chair and the leg scraped along the wooden surface. This meeting is concluded. The fire flashing in the lady's crystalline aquamarine eyes danced around his memory, the way her eyes blazed with passion under the force of his kiss. An unexpected hunger slammed into him, shocking with the staggering power of it. Once upon his youth, he would have laid claim to such a lady and she would have delighted in his touch. No more. That ease with ladies had burned up with the skin upon his face. Self-hatred consumed him, women such as her did not belong in his solitary, dark world. Disgust, loathing, and rage ate away at Derek leading him instead, with a familiar, welcome-numbed fury. Davies made to go, but he stayed him. I do not want any dealings with Mrs. Benedict. You are to handle anything and everything pertaining to the lady. She is to meet weekly with you and you are to ascertain if she sing to her responsibilities. Then he could be safely protected from hungering for things that could never be for one such as him. Davies opened his mouth to speak. Now, this meeting is concluded. Get the hell out of my sight. The servant dropped his gaze to the spectacles in his hands, but not before Derek caught the heavy dose of antipathy spilling from his eyes. Very well, your grace, he said between tense lips. 
As he stood, he placed his meticulous wire-rimmed frames on the bridge of his nose and then, with his rescued folios, took his leave. Derek stared after him a moment. His faithful man of affairs was no different than any other servant or peer who looked upon him with derision. His loyalty to the late dukes was to be commended and, he wagered, the reason he braved employment in his new master's employ. The only certainty was that Davies cared about the whole damned ducal title and what went with it more than Derek did, or ever would. He'd never wanted it. He wanted it even less now, as it required him to deal, in some way, with the living. He strode over to the corner of the room where the curtains were tightly drawn. Involuntarily, he gripped the fabric and pulled it back. Sunlight streamed into the room and with a curse, he dropped the material. In an attempt to blot out the white dots dancing in his vision, he pressed a hand to his eye. For all the time in which he'd inhabited his brother's townhouse, he'd left the dark walls but once. That one time to carry out an act of evil retribution. Memories flitted in of St. Cyr's agonized expression. Derek violently thrust back all thought of that day. No, he no longer cared to venture out into the living. What was there for him outside these halls? Nothing. And yet, neither was there anything within them. Chapter 9 With her employer's raspy breathing echoing around her mind, Lily raced through the halls of his townhouse and finally reached her chambers. Gasping for breath, she flung the door open and rushed inside. Yet, no amount of running could drive back what she'd done. Nay, what they had done. She collapsed against the door and borrowed strength from it. Her chest rose and fell under the force of her rapidly indrawn breaths. Oh, God, she'd kissed Derek, the Duke of Blackthorn. She slid her eyes closed. And more, she'd wanted him to continue kissing her and exploring her skin and stirring that warm heat in her belly she'd not believed herself capable of. You shameful harlot. Lily opened her eyes. Knots twisted in her belly and she moved on stiff legs to her bed and sat on the edge. All those vile, ugly, hurtful, and, ultimately, true accusations leveled by her father long ago had never proven truer than they did in this moment. She did not think of her future security dangled by Holtzworth, or the fact that she'd expressly gainsaid her employer's orders. No. She thought of him. Not the Duke. Not his grace. Not even George's brother. Rather, Derek. Now, knowing his name, nay having the right to use it, made him real in ways he'd not been prior to this moment. With fingers that trembled, Lily touched her swollen lips. Instead of worrying for her future and security, she sat here, dreaming of his kiss. Do you believe he is even now thinking of you? She whispered into the silent room. Lily let her quavering hand fall to her side. She'd seen the hard glint in his eye and knew the moment he'd ordered her from the hall that the inevitable, ultimate dismissal awaited. Her thoughts really should be trained on the very fact. The twisting and turning in her belly foretold disaster. There would be no leniency from Holtzworth. He did not care about her beyond his own dire financial circumstances and the security represented by that diamond. Now, her impulsivity had led to her ruin. Again. Lily flopped back on the bed and tossed her arms wide upon the white satin coverlet. She stared up the white plaster ceiling and willed her pounding heart to calm. Her efforts proved futile. For, with one rash decision to enter the forbidden halls of a man aptly called the Beast, she thrust herself back into that same uncertain world of seven years ago. She was that same, scared, panicked girl boarding a mail coach to London. Where would she go now? The options were once again, the same, starve on the streets of London and play whore in the street. Or become some wealthy nobleman's fancy piece. I will not be that woman, she whispered into the quiet. Not again. I should have thought of that before I put demands to a duke. A fine mist blurred her eyes and she blinked, trying to clear vision. How did she account for those useless, salty mementos? The last tears she'd shed had been the day her father had called her a whore and sent her from her family. 
A soft rap on the door filled the quiet and, thankfully, cut across the tidal wave of panic threatening to pull her under. She shoved herself to a seated position and dangled her legs over the bed. Perhaps she'd merely imagined the knock-knock-knock. Lily dashed a hand over her face. Who was seeking her out? As soon as the thought slid in, cold, hard reality crashed down. She was being turned out. She cast a frantic glance around the room. Whoever was charged with the firing of His Grace's insufficient staff didn't necessarily know that Lily was even now in her chambers. In this labyrinth of a home, she could quite easily hide herself in the empty rooms and hallways until. Knock knock knock. She swallowed down the ball of fear threatening to choke her. There was no hiding. A person, no matter how obscure they wished to make themselves, was ultimately found. Lily rose slowly and walked on stiff legs to the door. Knock knock knock. Before her courage deserted her, she pulled the door quickly open and in it spilled a tiny, white skirt-wearing child. She shot her hands out and immediately caught the girl. I did not believe you would ever open the door, the child said with a disapproving frown on her lips. Grateful for the innocent diversion presented by her charge, or rather the girl who was to have been her charge if she'd been able to follow simple commands, Lily closed the door behind her. My lady, she greeted, mustering a proper smile for Flora's benefit. The little girl giggled, as all her earlier displeasure faded. I am just Flora. And what a beautiful name it is, she returned, oddly calmed by this small child. The girl, perceptive for her tender years, became more serious. Flora folded her arms and eyed her. Are you still my governess? Ah, uh, so the clever child knew the precariousness of Lily's place in this household. Yes. For in this instant, she still was, and would remain so until she was tossed on her ear for being caught kissing the duke. I say. She took a step closer and peered up at Lily. I like you more than all the others. Warmth burst in Lily's heart at those simple, but powerful, words from this child's lips. Do you know that you are older than my other nursemaids? Much older than the others before you. She felt older than her three and twenty years. How many nursemaids have you had? Nursemaids and governesses, the girl rejoined. Uh, yes. One nursemaid. She ticked off on her hand. And three nursery governesses. Flora sniffed several times as if she'd picked up a foul scent. Cowards, all of them. Ah, uh, so in their weakness, they'd failed to see anything beyond the scarred surface of the Duke of Blackthorn. Three you say? For if you include the nursemaid, Flora reminded her. Flora was better off, without all those shallow creatures who'd be cowed by their fear of Derek's grumblings. A sigh escaped Lily. There had been four before her? And with her dismissal, there would now be a fifth. In a month's time. No child should know such instability. She stared at Flora a moment, allowing the distant dream she'd once carried to slip to the surface. And how old are you, Flora? Seven, but I'm nearly eight. Very nearly, the girl said with a nod, as though in saying it twice made it true. As she stared at the pure girl without a hint of artifice to her, emotion clogged Lily's throat. In all she'd lost with her rash decision those seven years ago, she'd mourned the loss of her family and her own bright-eyed optimism in the world. But she'd lost so much more. Dreams that would never belong to her. A child of her own. A person to love who in turn loved with unconditional abandon. Grief threatened to pull her into a vortex of long-buried regret. You wanted to talk about me with Uncle Derek. Lily tried desperately to follow along the conversation trail this girl now guided her down. It is why you went to his forbidden halls when he expressly forbade you to enter them, the girl clarified. Guilt ate away at her. That precious diamond is what had brought her into his halls. Yes, but... Her words trailed off under the horrifying possibility. Oh, God, did she see me kissing Derek? Heat suffused her cheeks. How did you know as much? 
Of course, a child who'd urged her to be brave would steal down whatever corridor she desired, whenever she desired. The girl wandered over to the vanity and inspected Lily's box. Her skin heated at the personal contents contained within, those damning pages and trinkets that served as her only link to her parents and siblings. Flora stole a sideways glance at Lily, surely ascertaining whether her governess would note her ruffling through her personal belongings. She jerked her guilty gaze away from the wooden box. I heard you speaking to him. No, the Duke in all his seething, dragon-like fury stood little chance in keeping this inquisitive young girl out of those halls he sought to protect. In fact, by the curiosity in her blue eyes, the forbidden corners of this dark and lonely household were all the more enticing. She did not pretend to misunderstand. Did you? He was not at all nice. No, she agreed. With his cruel words and harsh tone, one might believe the Duke of Blackthorn didn't know the meaning of the word. He was not. Yet, he'd granted her an honorable post when no other nobleman would have. And there was emotion in his impenetrable gaze that drew at her, burned her with the need to know more of him. She recalled Derek as he'd been sprawled on the floor, hurling hateful, angry epithets at himself. He couldn't spare a hint of civility for even himself. Belatedly realizing she'd inadvertently offended the girl's uncle, she cleared her throat. I was not where I should have been. He'd expressly forbid me to disturb him. Flora slid into the vanity seat and inched closer to that box. At the girl's less than covert attempt, Lily's lips twitched with her first real humor in longer than she could remember. And yet you went there anyway. Flora's words were more a statement than anything else. And yet, I went there, anyway. For me. Flora ran her palms over the roses etched along the top of that wood box. No one really thinks of me, she murmured. Guilt pulled at Lily and she turned hot with shame. For she'd not truly thought of the girl beyond the means of her own security and safety, and with Derek's kiss, she thought of nothing but him. How was it possible to both fear and hunger for a man, who was more stranger than anything? Flora tilted her head back and Lily quickly schooled her features to conceal that nagging shame. Harris thinks of me. And Alcott. Lily looked at her in confusion. Cook, Flora went on to clarify. Her smile dipped and with a beleaguered sigh, she propped her elbows on the surface of the vanity but only because they feel badly for me. The weight of her growing remorse pressed on her chest and made it difficult to form words. It is better to have people care for you in any way, than not at all, she said at last. After all, whom did Lily have? She'd learned to embrace kindness where she could find it. Perhaps. Flora lifted her shoulders in a little shrug. But I do not want people, her uncle, to care because they pity me. I want them to care because they care for me. Admiration for the girl swirled through her. Older than her seven, almost eight years, the girl recognized the sentiment of pity and wanted nothing to do with it for herself. I care about you, she said, shocked by the truth of that. The child looked at her skeptically. You have only just met me. Yes, Lily conceded, stroking her hand over the top of the girl's head. We may have only just recently met, but I can tell you are brave and proud and strong, she said softly, and it is hard not to care about such a person. That revelation came with a heavy dose of shock. She had spent the better part of seven years hating all those connected by blood to the late Duke of Blackthorn. Yet in being with Flora, she saw none of the late Duke's vileness but rather the innocent goodness that still existed on this earth. Flora's beaming smile reached her eyes. A kindred connection with this little person filled her and she'd not felt any true bond to anyone since her younger siblings and mother. They had both known loss. Two vastly different types of it, but losses, nonetheless. Then the girl's unfettered grin dipped. You will leave, she said on an eerie whisper. They always leave. I will not. The lie left her lips so easily because, for a fragment of a moment, she'd forgotten what brought her here and what would take her away. 
her blasted impulsivity and her wanton reaction to Derek. Mayhap he'd not send her away. Hope stirred in her breast. Mayhap he'd not sack her. Mayhap she could stay and be one constant for this little girl. Revenge had brought her into this household and yet, perhaps there was something good she could do, something she could provide for the limited time she was here, companionship for the lonely little girl. That hopeful glint in the girl's eyes turned the blade of guilt all the deeper. For how could she pretend his embrace had never happened? How could Lily go through her daily responsibilities to Flora not remembering the singularly most passionate moment of her life? Well, someday I shall have to leave, she altered. Likely within the next hour, for her earlier transgression. But only when I must. That was the closest to the truth she could come. In the vanity mirror, Flora caught Lily's gaze. Everyone leaves because they are afraid of him, but you are not. The Duke of Blackthorn roused an unholy fear inside Lily that even now, closeted away in a distant corner of the vast townhouse, still maintained a manacle-like hold upon her rational thoughts. What would such a powerful, commanding figure do to the woman who'd entered his home under false pretenses and committed a theft against him? He would see her kiss as nothing but a lie. A spasm racked her heart. For that kiss was the single, truest thing between them. Flora hopped to her feet. I am not afraid, she said as she wandered past Lily. The slight hesitancy in those handful of words hinted at the lie there. I was, she conceded. She looked up and held Lily's gaze. When am I? Her lower lip trembled and she sucked in a broken breath. With a strength and resilience not shown by most grown men, the girl squared her shoulders. When my parents left, she finished. Left. The child still clung to the hope that her parents lost at sea would, in fact, return. That truth was there in her telling words. I was horribly sad. Her blue eyes reflected pools of unhappiness that wrenched at Lily's heart. And very lonely. I'd heard the whispers about the Duke. It didn't escape her notice, the girl didn't refer to him with that familial title. When Papa was still alive, he and my grandma would speak of him. Hatred gripped her for that vile, now dead, duchess. Her ugly cruelty had extended beyond Lily, to include her son. Lily closed her mouth tightly to keep from pressing the child for all the thousand questions on the edge of her tongue. My papa said he was a monster. Did he, she forced emotion from that question. What a hateful man her father had been. Then, should she truly be surprised by the cruelty of any of those pompous, powerful lords? My mama told papa he should not say those things, because my uncle was a hero. A hero. She'd relegated Derek to the role of monster by rank of his birth. It had never had anything to do with the marks upon his person. Yet, for the veneer of cold upon him, he was a man who could have easily sent Flora from his home, but allowed her to remain. And he was a man who did not see her, a servant in his employ, there for his pleasures, but who'd instead spoken of the wrongness of their embrace. Even as she herself had wanted it, and wanted it still. She would have given herself to him, but he had stopped. Stopped when any other man would have taken his own pleasures. Your mama would be right she said softly. This child's words forced Lily to confront the honorable things the new Duke of Blackthorn had done. That unwelcome revelation only caused the pit of guilt in her belly to grow. I hear Alcott and Harris whisper about him. All who knew the Duke of Blackthorn surely did. How could a commanding, dominating figure such as him not earn looks and whispers? His man of affairs, Mr. Davies, too. She wrinkled her nose. He speaks ill of Uncle Derek. He says he should have died and that my other uncle should have lived instead. Shock ran through her. Why ever would he say such a thing? Before a child, no less. Flora shrugged. He comes and speaks to my governesses and the staff. And how did those vile words fit into any discourse, proper or improper? 
he always says, she cleared her throat and then, in a high nasally voice that Lily suspected was a rendition of the man, said, monster or beast, the man is still a duke with coin to pay. He should have died, but he did not, so take his bloody coin and keep your post. Lily gasped. Surely not. Oh, surely. Flora said with an emphatic nod. Harris and Alcott speak of it quite frequently, repeating it back. She frowned. In what context did they speak of Mr. Davies's vile words? The part of her that had met and liked Harris hoped he, too, was not so very cruel to disparage a man so. Am I truly any better than Mr. Davies? Have I not entered his home and spoken ill of him and his family behind his back? That is altogether different. The words burst from her. She slapped a hand over her mouth, praying the girl would not notice. Flora furrowed her brow. What is altogether different? Of course her own younger siblings, even all those years ago, had shown her that children missed very little. I am sure what Harris and Alcott say is not cruel and impolite like Mr. Davies. The girl nodded. No, I do believe you are right. But Mr. Davies and the footman, Thomas, are horrid. You shall see. Uncle has all the governesses deal with Mr. Davies. If she kept her post after shamelessly nearly spreading her legs for the Duke, she'd have to deal with such an odious, reprehensible man. A faithless man, no less, who'd speak ill of his employer. The irony of her own disgust was not lost on her. Flora dropped her voice to a low, haunting whisper. Everyone fears him. With her expressive eyes, the girl urged Lily to ask the question. Why did she cease fearing the Duke? How could a person not become more and more drawn into the terror of this labyrinth with each passing day? Such questions, however, were not fit for a child, any child, but particularly not the ward of a man known as the Beast of Blackthorn. When Lily said nothing, Flora's crestfallen expression marked her disappointment. She walked over to the door and then stopped at the threshold. I think we will get on well, Mrs. Benedict. Warmth filled her heart, and with it, that old, never-buried ache for a family of her own. A knock sounded at the door and, together, they looked to the entrance of the room. Lily's heart pounded. E-enter, she called out. A white-faced Harris pushed open the heavy panel. Why you have been summoned by Mr. Davies. His throat bobbed. He is waiting for you in the white parlor. Of course. It was the summons she'd been expecting. Even so it left her motionless, incapable of words. The servant continued to stare and it was Flora who broke the silence. What does he want? Harris's cheeks flamed red. Snapped to the moment, Lily cleared her throat. Flora, why do you not go with Harris? I expect he'll entertain you until I return to see to your lessons if she wasn't thrown out with her valise, just as she'd been years earlier. She looked to Harris, who held his hand out, motioning the girl forward. Very well, Flora said, skipping with the ease of an innocent child. He nodded and then rushed from the room. Lily waited until he'd closed the door and then ran wary hands down her face. For the bond shared between her and Flora, there were vast differences between them. Flora still believed herself indomitable. She'd not yet learned the sorry truth life had taught Lily. Oft times a person, no matter how much control they sought over their life, was powerless in all the ways that mattered. And now Lily was truly powerless, about to be sacked for kissing the Duke of Blackthorn with wild abandon. Chapter 10 Blessed Quiet With his ever proper man of affairs now gone, Derek limped over to his sideboard. Resting his cane on the edge of the wide mahogany piece, he set to work making himself a brandy. The only sound was the soothing splash of liquid hitting crystal. He grabbed his cane and made his way to his leather chair. Shrugging out of his jacket, Derek slid into the seat and sank into the comfortable leather. He closed his eyes. Quiet. There was no monotone Davies, with his thinly veiled disgust, running through his reports. 
there was no small girl determined to make a nuisance of herself. And more importantly, there was no tartmouth Lily Benedict challenging him one moment and enticing him the next. At bloody L. A knock sounded at the door. Your grace? There was a strident note to Harris's usually hesitant tone. He forced his eye open. Of course. First Lily Benedict, he mumbled under his breath. Then the girl, and now. Your grace, there is a matter I'd speak with you on. It is of some urgency. Now you, Harris, bloody, invading my hall again. Lily Benedict was a witch. There was no other accounting for how a woman could turn his entire household on its ear so quickly and bring bloody confusion to his thoughts with a mere kiss. What was next, his brave butler entering Derek's office, without permission? As if on cue, the man jiggled the handle. Bloody hell. Perhaps, he'd be better off sacking her after all. This goddamn house better be ablaze, he thundered. His cane was resting against the side of a nearby side table. Derek grabbed it and used it as leverage to heave himself up. He limped across the room just as Harris tried the handle once more. The man tumbled unceremoniously into the room. Thank goodness, he breathed. Harris picked up the tray and note and then climbed quickly to his feet, with agility Derek himself had once possessed in abundance. Regret coursed through him with a powerful force. What do you want, Harris? He snapped, annoyance churning through him. The servant opened his mouth. And then closed it. And then opened it again. He spoke with the wonder of the man who discovered the new world. You called me Harris. Derek started. Well, Christ, he had. He'd studiously avoided knowing people by name and referring to them in any context. To do so only created a bond, even if a small one, that he no longer wanted with anyone. That isn't true, a voice jeered at the back of his mind. You used Lily's name and commanded her to use yours. Then there had been that searing kiss. He glowered at the butler. Is that what was so important you'd knock my door down, Harris? That exhale emerged as a slow, lethal hiss. To discuss my. It is Mrs. Benedict. Mrs. Benedict? He frowned. What of her? Before the brave, but foolish, man could reply, he gave his head a shake. He'd already turned over all responsibilities of the lady to Davies. Let the stiff, proper solicitor see to her and her blasted responsibilities so he could get on with trying to forget how perfect she'd felt in his arms. Never mind, he snapped out when Harris made to speak again. All questions or inquiries about the lady, you should be nice to the lady, are to be directed to Davies. Dismissing the man, Derek started to turn. But it is about Mr. Davies. The butler's agitated words froze him. He shot a look at Harris, who stood wringing his hands together. I just escorted Mrs. Benedict to her meeting with him. And, he prodded impatiently. The two are going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and I believe he intends to dismiss the lady. He stilled. Dismiss her? Yes, your grace. Dismiss her. Derek frowned, unaware he'd spoken aloud. Sack her. Send her packing, Anne. He straightened. I bloody well know what the word means. Yes, of course. The servant eyed him with a dubious expression that called into question Derek's previous claims. Or mayhap he called into question his caring over the young woman's banishment in the first place. The ruthless, unfeeling person he'd become proved Harris correct in his opinion. Derek wouldn't give a jot about a woman, a stranger, who'd only recently entered his household. He opened his mouth to tell the butler to get the hell out, but something called the words back. If he uttered that dismissal, Harris would go and, ultimately, Lily Benedict would also go, but permanently from his household. A muscle ticked at the corner of his eyelid. What manner of weak fool had he become that a kiss from a young woman should so utterly captivate him? The memory of that embrace seared his memory. 
Apparently, even monsters still felt something. Desire. Passion. Hunger. He let loose a string of curses that turned Harris's cheeks crimson. Wherein blazes are they? They've been closeted in one of the parlors for the past ten minutes or so, your grace. He dropped his voice to a furious whisper. And there is yelling, because... His butler blushed. Ah, yes, because even this man had witnessed that forbidden moment in Derek's halls. Caught kissing a woman in my bloody employ. A dull flush heated Derek's neck, proving him annoyingly human once more. Yelling, Harris finished lamely. And in a household where none except Derek was guilty of that incivility, such a truth would prove shocking. He cursed. After their meeting in his office, Davy's first order of business had apparently been to sack Lily Benedict. No doubt because he'd seen the lady in question in Derek's arms and had deemed her unsuitable. I gave him leave to see to her as he sees fit. If he dismisses her, I'll never be again tempted by all I'll never have. And yet. A growl worked its way up his chest. He limped across the room, all the while cursing the wound that slowed his steps. He gritted his teeth, wanting nothing to do with guilt and remorse or any other weakening sentiment that meant he, in any way, cared about people. His actions. Life. A curse exploded from his lungs. By God, he could not let Davies send her away. For all his fury in her invading his halls, she'd been the one person to boldly challenge him. To see not a duke. Not a beast. Not even a hero. But a man. Why did you not immediately seek me out? Pressing through the ache of his old injury, he lengthened his stride. Harris fell into step alongside him. You said you were not to be bothered, your grace, he reminded with an obvious admonishment to his words. Interrupting his solitude, trying his door handle, and now being chastised by not only a bloody child, but also his damned butler. Yes, I did, he said under his breath. I'm a damned duke. And if he wanted to put blame on someone else for his own order, by God, he would. He quickened his pace, adjusting the weight being put upon his injured leg. Davies would dare send away the one person who did not quake in his presence? Harris cleared his throat. I believe I heard the word harlot or strumpet being bandied about. A red curtain of rage descended over his vision. With each step, outrage spiraled through him. It was the kind of heated fury that roused memories of a burning fire and just like the one that licked a path over his person, so, too, did this conflagration spread. That bloody, pompous bastard. From the corner of his eye, he detected the hint of a smile on Harris's lips that spoke to his approval. Not that he gave a jot for whether anyone approved of his actions or decisions, this man or any other. Do you not have a bloody door to answer, Harris, he groused. I do not, your grace. I. Apparently lacking in the good common sense to not darken Derek's doorway, Harris also lacked the ability to discern a facetious response from his employer. I do not need a damned escort to the bloody parlor. The butler fell back. Of course. Derek reached the top of the stairs and paused. He glanced at the three possible corridors and scowled. Well, blast and damn, it appeared he did need a damned escort. He thumped the heel of his cane and looked back and forth between the hallway entrances. Mayhap he should walk in the light a bit more. At least in his own damned halls. If I may, your grace? Harris gave a discreet cough. They are in the white parlor, the butler called after him. Did he detect the faint trace of amusement in the usually anxious servant's tone? Shoving aside thoughts of Harris, Derek increased his stride. So, Lily Benedict would force him back to the living, whether he wished it or not. Chapter 11 After composing herself, Lily found her way to the white parlor. With the grating tick of the Omelu clock atop the fireplace mantel, she now stood before the Duke's man of affairs. Hands folded primly before her, she felt the same reviled creature she'd been when meeting with Holtworth. 
and she despised this man for making her feel as though she was a person of little worth, and hated herself more for having come to believe it. Arms clasped behind his back, he studied her down the bridge of a long, hawk-like nose. Mrs. Benedict. He spoke to her with the same loftiness as a vicar lecturing the patrons of his parish, rousing all the darkest, most unpleasant reminders of the father who'd cast her out. As this cold-eyed stranger condemned her with his stare, her patience snapped. She threw back her shoulders. I am afraid you have me at a disadvantage, sir. You know my name and yet I do not. I am the Duke's man of affairs. How had a man of Derek's strength hired this person? You do not speak unless you are spoken to. With this one's high-handedness, this pompous lout and a commanding duke hardly made a perfect pairing. She snapped her eyebrows together into an angry line. I am not a child, she bit out. I. With the solicitor's devotion to the late Duke of Blackthorn, he'd likely been abreast of all pieces of his reprobate life, including the lovers he'd taken. Did the man know of the girl who'd been robbed of her innocence and made empty promises, by that dastard? I know what you are. It does not take much to deduce just why you're here. He peeled his lip back in a sneer and her body went hot and then cold with shame. He'd taken one look at her in her employer's arms whimpering and pleading, and gathered she was nothing more than a whore. Humiliation slapped at her and she balled her hands into tight fists. He continued, relentless. You come here into this household under the pretense of caring for the girl. Flora, she corrected, underscoring that reply with ice. At her bold interruption, the solicitor shot his eyebrows to his hairline. Then, he quickly schooled his features. You are, no doubt, here is the Duke's whore and I'd ask you to pack your things and be gone. Granted, she'd played as a gentleman's fancy piece for the past six years, but rage filled her anyway at this pompous lout's supposition. She looked at the Duke's man of affairs through narrowed eyes. She'd gone through life these past seven years, treated as less than human for decisions she'd made in order to survive. While the Sir Henrys and the late Duke of Blackthorns of the world would be forgiven those salacious relationships for no other reasons than the station of their births and because they were men. Theirs were no crimes, but rather commonalities expected for gentlemen. How dare! How dare I, he barked. I dare, because it is my responsibility to see to the winter's name and your very presence here threatens that noble family's reputation. Lily curled her hands so tight she nearly drew blood on her palms. He brushed an imaginary piece of lint from his immaculate, pale blue coat sleeve. How hideous that the man should prove correct about her worth. I do not need to know more of you than that you were hired by him. The Duke's man of affairs wrapped that word in icy derision, speaking volumes of his ill thoughts and low opinion of the current Duke. This perfunctory man should be so cruel, so condescending to his current employer when the man who'd come before him had been far more a monster than ever existed? Her thin thread of control snapped. Lily took a charged step toward him. You summon me like a naughty child and assess my worth on what? Nothing more than your supposition I'm warming the duke's bed? It is more than a supposition, he hissed. I saw you in his arms. Crimson color bathed the man's cheeks. He retreated a step and she delighted in the fact she'd unnerved the lout. All Flora's recent admissions about the man came rushing in and flooded her with a renewed rage and fueled her movements. And furthermore, what manner of man are you that you would go speaking as you do about your employer to his ward and his servants? He sputtered. I need not account for my actions or words to you, madam. No. She strode over to the seemingly bored servant and stopped so close the toes of their shoes brushed. You need to account for your actions and words to the man you so disparage with each vile, ugly, hurtful word you'd level at the gentleman. Of nearly a like height to the loathsome man, she locked her gaze with his. You have assessed my worth on nothing more than your swiftly drawn conclusions about my presence here and the Duke's judgment in offering me the post. But you, sir, you are the one who is lacking. For you are a bully who goes about scaring servants, disparaging your employer, and me.
and frightening the child who lives here. The solicitor flicked his hand. That is neither here nor there, Mrs., she flinched at his deliberate emphasis on that form of address, Benedict. The current duke, he shuddered, as though repulsed by even the mere mention of his new employer, has ordered me to see to you. Tendrils of fear wrapped about her. What? she asked dumbly. Why could I not close my blasted mouth and control my bloody desire? Her impulsivity, once again, would be her demise. She ran a panicked gaze over the perspiring man of affairs. Davies had assessed her worth and made up his mind to show her the door before she'd even spoken. Dread filled every corner of her being and spread up to her brain, momentarily freezing her thoughts so she could not process his words. Are you saying his grace is sending me away? she demanded. The man's mouth fell agape. Ah, so the decision had been all this foul, pompous bastards. She took a step forward. Or are you? You insolent chit, he thundered, shaking his fist. His face turned a mottled red and she'd wager the little she had, this was not a man to so easily lose control. The old man yanked his lapels. I speak for the duke. He gave me leave to do with you as I see fit and, so, madam, I am doing just that. Her stomach lurched, as with Mr. Davies' words he dragged her back. Only it wasn't a sneering servant, but a ruthless, heartless duke and his mother. Now, Derek would send her away. Just like them. Bitterness seeped in, numbing her fury, leaving her, empty. Then, you have always been the one to make more of a kiss than there is, just like before, there would be nowhere to go. She'd return to Holtzworth with no diamond and no future. Panic pounded away at her chest and filled her ears with the erratic beat of her heart. Clearly, the matter was at an end for the solicitor. Davies stepped around Lily. A desperate energy fueled her movements and she hurried to place herself in front of the Duke's man of affairs, blocking his retreat. That is all? Her words emerged as a high-pitched squawk. That is all you'd say to me? Mayhap the heartless servant was the true beast. In a show of tedium with the exchange, he pulled out his watch fob and consulted the timepiece. Mrs. Benedict, what would you have me say? She braced for his streaming line of insults. He did not disappoint. You preyed upon a monster of a man and hoard yourself to him. Such a person has no place in this household. Terror receded under the rapidly building outrage and she nurtured the safe sentiment that made her stronger against such attacks upon her person. How dare you? She speared him with a hard look. Despite the damning embrace he'd witnessed in the halls, she'd no intention of whoring herself again. I have done no such thing where his grace is concerned. Except, hadn't she come to prey upon Derek? Mayhap not in a sexual way but in the more loathsome, insidious way of slipping past his defenses to gain entry into his home. Guilt crept in. Mr. Davies peered at her through his lenses and she curled her toes hard under the force of his scrutiny. I do not know who you are, Mrs. Benedict. Wagging a finger, he took a step toward her. Not allowing him to intimidate her, she held her position. She'd braved far more abhorrent fiends than this one. I was not, however, born last evening. Respectable young women do not simply arrive on a gentleman's doorstep, seeking employment. As such, I have already ordered your belongings packed. Her heart missed a beat at the finality there. He packed? Did that faint inquiry belong to her? Ignoring her question, he tucked his lapels once more. Out of my dedication to the previous duke, I will not allow a common harlot to care for her ladyship. It did not escape her notice that he did not pledge his allegiance to the current Duke of Blackthorne and it spoke volumes of this man's poor judgment that George should have commanded this man's loyalty. Here, she looked on in abject confusion as he fished around the front of his jacket. He pulled out a purse and handed it over. Lily stared unblinkingly at the small sack. Another purse. Another person turning her out of this same household. Her chest rose and fell hard, 
and she alternated her gaze between the velvet bag and the scowling solicitor. In this moment, she was that young girl all over again, dependent on merciless men. She closed her eyes a moment to blot out the ping of rain echoing around the chambers of her mind, the stinging bite of wind lashing at her face. It is more than you deserve, he said, bringing her eyes open. He pressed the bag into her hand and then drew his fingers back, no doubt, repulsed by the slight touch of their fingers. He pulled out his handkerchief and brushed off the fabric of his gloves. Reflexively, Lily closed her hand tight around the bag of coin. Her fingers twitched from her need to toss the meager offering in his arrogant face, and her fury redoubled. Derek hovered outside the parlor, feeling much the way he had as a child listening at keyholes. Periodically, Lily Benedict's angry voice reached through the wood panel. You dare to condescend me? You, who speaks in such a vile way about your employer. He really should press the handle and cut into the volatile exchange between his governess and man of affairs and yet, something kept him still. The thick wood panel muffled the other man's stammering response. With your cruel words and cold heart, you are the monster, sir. Not he. Her defense froze him, and while the battling pair on that opposite side of the door barked charges and furious words at one another, he stared with his lone eye fixed on the panel. He'd accustomed himself to being the loathed, despised, hatefully whispered about Duke. People disparaged him. They did not defend him and, assuredly, not so staunchly as this mighty avenger in his parlor. The pompous prig who'd been loyal to Derek's brother and not much more, cut into his musings. I have already told you, madam. You are dismissed. Derek pressed the handle and shoved the door open. The quarreling pair started. As one, their gazes flew to the entrance of the room. He flicked a cold, disinterested stare over Davies and then shifted his sole focus to Mrs. Lily Benedict. Bright color splashed her cheeks and her chest rose and fell with the force of her breathing. As she held his stare, there was none of the horrified revulsion or sick fascination he'd come to know from others. His pulse pounded hard and loud in his ears at the power of that unexpected bravery on her part. Mrs. Benedict, he drawled. Lily dropped a hasty and belated curtsy. Your grace. She did not look away in disgust, however. Rather, she held his gaze with an unrepentant strength. Admiration for the delicate slip of a beauty slammed into him, unexpected and unwanted. He forced his focus to the other man. Is there a problem, Davies? he asked on a lethal whisper. The color seeped from Davies's face, leaving his skin a sick, ashen hue. And no problems, your grace. Heavy fear coated Davies's words so that they emerged garbled. That unease was certainly founded. In the years since Derek had ascended to the role of Duke, not once had he left his offices to meet the man, until now. Derek narrowed his eye. Davy shifted back and forth on his feet, periodically mopping at his damp brow with the handkerchief in his shaking fingers. Good, the man should be fearful. With the tip of his cane, he shoved the door closed behind him with a soft click. His man of affairs jumped. Derek delighted in that show of fear and, with the assistance of his cane, he limped toward the battling pair. Mrs. Benedict stood with her delicate but strong shoulders squared. His man of affairs scrambled backward, tripping over himself as Derek strode past him. He'd grown long accustomed to such horrified fear from his servants, strangers, his mother. There was only one person who'd looked upon him with the hint of anything different. The very same person responsible for Davy's presence here this day. Derek continued walking past the quaking man and stopped beside the heavy, brocade curtains. He rested his cane against the wall. Sunlight streamed through the slight crack in the curtains. That slight, deliberately gaping fabric that afforded him a view of the world, his only view. You were instructed to deal with Mrs. Benedict, he infused a deliberate lethal edge to his words. All his attempt at power was ruined as his leg buckled under his exertions in racing to the parlor. He silently cursed. 
Yes, your grace, the man squeaked. Th that is correct. Derek shifted his weight and borrowed the support of his crutch, hating himself for that weakness, despised that he should be so pathetic before this man and her. From the corner of his eye, he stole a peek at Lily. Except, there was no pity there. Instead, her aquamarine eyes radiated relief and gratitude. When was the last time he'd done anything or been anyone to inspire such a sentiment in another? St. Cyr's visage slipped in, the friend whose hide he'd saved on more scores than he could count. As with that, his mind sucked him back to the heart of battle and the echo of gunshots ricocheted around his mind until he ached to throw down his cane and blot his hands over his ears to tamp out the horrific cries. The rustle of Lily's soft, satin skirts cut across that hell of his past like a gentle, calming summer breeze. Your grace, she asked tentatively. He gave his head a shake. You were instructed to see to the woman I'd hired for the role of governess, he reminded the man, dragging his gaze reluctantly from the lady. Silence fell. And then, Davies cleared his throat. But I did. I, he stuttered to a stop as Derek jabbed his cane at the man. His brother's faithful servant mopped his brow once more. Did I instruct you to sack the young woman? No, but... Did I tell you to see to her responsibilities with Floor? He caught himself. The girl? Yes, but... And yet you deliberately went against my wishes. The white-haired man frowned. I was instructed to see to the girl's governess, and I did. Apparently, when one called his efforts as solicitor into question, Davies could find his courage. The older man stuffed his wrinkled kerchief into his front pocket and pushed his wire-rimmed spectacles back on his nose. There is something not right about you, Mrs. Benedict. Something I do not trust. Lily remained motionless through his perusal, a proud warrior princess, and the sight of her with her chin tipped up and fury glowing in her eyes, momentarily sucked the breath from Derek's lungs. Of all the women he'd known before he'd gone off to war, None had held the faintest flicker of a candle to her dauntless spirit. And now, with the man he was, a person all women fled in fear, she should fight for her post here. Davies looked to him. Your grace, governesses, do not simply present themselves on your doorstep, as this one did. The condescending servant peeled his lip back in a sneer. In a breathtaking display of spirit, she angled her chin up and glared back. I have no reservations about the young lady, he said quietly. Grateful as he was for the man's undeserved loyalty for the cursed Winter's family, he'd not allow him to disparage Lily. Derek himself had already been the gossiped about and whispered of figure. He'd not let this man transform her into the same. His man of affairs looked to him with an entreaty in his old eyes. Your grace, my friendship to your father went back to our days at Eton. This family is a noble one, with a lineage that goes to the conqueror. The old servant peered down his long nose at Lily in distaste. His grace would not have permitted an unknown woman from the street to care for his sole grandchild. He'd been subjected to society's contempt since his return from war. Even for that familial devotion this man felt for his late father, Derek would not allow Davies to break down the one person who'd been unfazed by the monster he was. You may leave, Mrs. Benedict. Lily jerked as though she'd been struck and then, with a juddering nod, she fled the room, nearly stumbling over herself in her haste. With the young lady gone, Derek wheeled around so quickly, Davies jumped. The color drained from the solicitor's cheeks, leading his pallor a ghastly white. Derek took a step toward the other man. I do not have a problem with the lady. Davies retreated. Be but your grace, she is no lady. The man's courage was to be commended, but then idiocy and bravery were often mistaken for each other. She arrived on your doorstep with. He stopped before him. Did I give you leave to speak? His solicitor wisely fell silent. The first wise thing the man had done all day. Derek dusted his palms together. I have named Mrs. Benedict as governess to the child. Do you have a problem with my decision, Davies? 
The other man rocked forward on the balls of his feet, as though prepared to launch his entire body into an argument against his employer's decision. Then he pursed his lips and made one last appeal. I, I am merely trying to. Derek limped over to the window and returned his attention to the streets below. We are done here for the day, he drawled in ducal tones even his father would have been hard-pressed to not admire. Of course, your grace, Davies said stiffly. He sketched a deep, deferential bow. Davies, he called out, when the other man had his fingers poised on the door handle. His man of affairs turned to face him once more. I do not care to debate my decisions with anyone. Except Lily. There was an odd pleasure to be had in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the determined governess. Something in the fiery-tempered, courageous young woman roused a reminder of the joy in feeling anything beyond the rage he'd known these past years. If it weren't for your years of devotion to my family, I would sack you without another thought. The servant gulped. Do not gainsay me again. Particularly where Mrs. Benedict is concerned. Is that clear? Indeed. Unless you have reasons I should not trust the lady? He gave him a long look. I do not, your grace, the man said through tight lips. Then this matter is concluded. Chapter 12 Lily stood in the corner of her rooms and peered down into the busy London streets. The Duke's man of affairs had gone. And yet, in the nearly twenty minutes since he'd walked stiffly from the townhouse, she'd not been summoned or tossed out. It was as though she'd been forgotten. A knock sounded at the door. Lily jumped. She slapped a hand to her heart. Of course you're not forgotten, she muttered to herself. That would be far too easy, to go on as though she'd not kissed her employer, and invaded his private halls, and gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with. Knock. Open your goddamn door, Lily. I am not of a mind to stand out here in the hall while you sulk in your chambers. She stared wide-eyed at the wood panel and then resumed a frantic blinking. What in thunderation! Never had she known a man, gentleman or town villager in the Duke's parish who'd speak with his coarseness. Lily took five long strides across the room and swiftly pulled the door open. Your grace, your language leaves, oh! My, Derek limped past her and the sheer punishing size of him stole her breath. This towering figure who'd surely terrified men in battle and earned countless ladies' hearts, limped into her bedroom. Butterflies danced wildly in her belly. With his scars, Derek, the Duke of Blackthorn, would never possess the unflawed beauty of the rogues and rakes of the world. And yet, there was a primitive rawness to him, a rough-hewn strength and rugged masculinity that captivated. Her breath caught hard in her chest as the same fierce glare he leveled on Davies, he now turned on her. And her skin tingled in remembrance of his touch and the burning feel of him. Warmth pooled in her belly. Unable to meet the intensity of his gaze, she dropped her stare. But snagging her notice were his shirt sleeves. Lily started. For with his absence of a jacket on his broad frame, something pulled at her heart. The fierce, snarling beast was a good deal more tempered when he stood before her only partially clad. I do not care to be kept waiting, he snapped and the gravelly quality of his baritone wrenched her head up. She winced as pain shot down her neck. Your grace, she greeted, gripping the edge of the door. She borrowed purchase from the panel. Derek spoke as casually as if he'd entered her parlor for tea and a bed even now did not sit at their backs. Well, he growled. She cocked her head. What did he expect of her? He came charging in here after Davy's vile, if true, accusations. And once more, guilt stabbed her for the plan she'd become embroiled in. Lily curled her toes into the soles of her slippers. Nay, the scheme she'd willingly agreed to take part in. Nothing to say, he continued, gruffly. It matters not. He shares the blood of the man who ruined me and the woman who turned me away. What guilt do I have for entering his home and taking from him, when everything that truly mattered was already taken from me? Yet why did it feel as though she lied to herself? 
I thought you felt I should not remain because of our kiss. His expression was inscrutable if you were to leave my employ because of my advances, I would pay your wages for the year. She choked. You would do that? I would, he said, simply. What nobleman would be so magnanimous and expect nothing more? Even that old, grandfatherly figure who'd taken her into his household as a maid for two years had ultimately expected her to warm his bed. Now, this man, whispered to be a ruthless beast, with his generous and unwitting promise, offered her freedom. As silence stretched on, Derek stared at her with an inscrutable expression. Take it. Take what he offers. An acceptance hovered on her lips. I cannot. Her heart dipped. Yet she could not lie to him. Not of this. I wanted your kiss, she said softly. For some reason, a reason she did not understand and couldn't muddle through, she needed him to know that. I would not leave for it. But rather, stay. He stitched his eyebrows into a single line. Unnerved by the talk of their embrace, Lily smoothed her palms down the front of her dress. Nor was I sulking, she managed as an ever-present remorse filled her. She'd wager all hint of future security this was not a man who defended anyone or anything and yet, he'd battled a loyal servant who'd been in his family's employ, for her. Derek folded his arms at his broad chest and her breath, caught once more under the heightened reminder of his power and strength. I expect a woman who'd go toe-to-toe -to -toe with old Davies would not cower in her rooms, he speculated in hushed, gravelly tones. You requested I leave, she returned. The parlor was certainly not an appropriate place for me to be, and I've been expressly forbidden from entering the opposite end of your home. There still remains the matter of whether you intend to. Her cheeks burned under her inane ramblings. Clearing her throat, she dropped her gaze once more. Given all that, I thought my chambers were the safest place. Lily stiffened as he brushed his knuckles along her jaw, forcing her gaze up. And this man, who'd roused terror but two days earlier, now elicited this maddening beat of her pulse. Did you believe Davies convinced me of your unsuitability and I agreed to turn you out, he whispered, and this was not the lethal, mocking tone she'd come to expect of him. This was the softly seductive one that washed over her with the potent warmth of a hot summer sun. Her eyes slid closed briefly. I did. You did defy my orders several times. And entered areas I'd expressly forbade you from entering. With his harsh urgings, did he seek to protect himself from hurt? He lowered his face so close to hers, his brandy-scented breath fanned her lips. Her lashes fluttered madly, and she ached to tip her head back and take his kiss. But I will not. She tried to untangle the meaning of his words through this haze of desire, clouding her senses. You will not what, she managed. Sack you. Derek drew back and by his smooth unaffectedness, she may as well have imagined the momentary haze of passion between them. She blinked several times. Your grace? Despite Davy's compunctions, I've need of you, Lily. A need of me, she repeated blankly, backing away from him. Disappointment settled like a stone in her belly. Having no choice was vastly different than deciding to give yourself to a man. Why you wish me to warm your bed? She retreated until the backs of her knees knocked against the bed and she tumbled into a seated position, Derek limped forward and she'd no doubt, even with the injury to his leg, he could easily overtake her if he so desired like one of those sleek, primal beasts. Except, as he stopped several feet from where she sat, she knew that this was not the manner of man Derek, the Duke of Blackthorn, was or ever had been. Snarling, surly, and harsh, he'd still never force his intentions upon a woman. Her brooding employer looked her up and down, startling her with his gentle tone. I have told you before, I will not take advantage of a servant in my employ. Then the mask of ruthless Duke descended as he lowered his lashes. What manner of household did you work in prior to this to turn you cautious? The hard edge to that inquiry hinted of a man who'd shred her previous employer should she issue the words. He would feel that rage because of a gentleman's treatment of me? 
she wetted her lips. I could not speak of it. For even as desperate as Derek was for a governess for Flora, even he was not so very desperate to turn that post over to his brother's whore. She gave her head a shake. I... Her words ended on a shuddery whisper as he brushed his knuckles in a sweeping movement from her cheek to her chin. Then back. The caress was rhythmic and soothing. I've need of you, Lily, he said again, allowing Lily her secret. That need does not require you to warm my bed. But what if I wish to? Lily squeezed her eyes shut a moment, shamed by her wanton desire for his strong, sure touch. I am not of a mind to run through cowering governess after cowering governess. You are, for reasons I do not understand, unafraid of me. Derek peered at her. With the intensity of his impenetrable gaze, there was the horrifying moment where she believed he could see into her thoughts to the sins of her past. Wordlessly, he let his arm fall to his side. Her skin went cold at the loss of his touch and snapped her from the desirous reverie he'd cast. She blinked slowly. Derek stomped his cane to the floor twice. You are to care for Flora. Flora, when all other times he'd called her by nothing other than the girl. She cocked her head at this unexpected softening in him. She managed a jerky nod. I, I can de-do that. She had to find that diamond. Needed to do Holtzworth's evil bidding. The sooner she found the bloody diamond, the sooner she could be free of this household and free of Derek's ever-strengthening hold upon her and her senses. But why, she blurted. Why should you dismiss the concerns of a servant who has been faithful to your family for countless years? For me? Why, when people had long ago stopped seeing good in her soul? He shifted his weight over the serpent-headed cane in his hands. Why, he repeated. White lines tightened the corners of his lips and his skin turned an ashen hue. A vice squeezed her heart at the evidence of his pain. A hard smile formed on his lips. The truth is, Lily, my staff fears me. And with good reason. With his scathing words and black glares, he'd roused terror in the unholiest beast. All of those servants failed to see the facade their employer had crafted to protect himself from further hurt. All fear me, he carried on in a silken whisper. My own mother and brother did, as well. Agony lanced her heart at that matter-of-fact deliverance. Having bore witness to the heartlessness of those two, she could imagine how they'd look upon their scarred son and brother, and Lily hated them all over again. Hated them for reasons that had nothing to do with her own suffering, but for this man's pain. Yet strangely, he continued. You do not. He shot his other arm out and ran the pad of his thumb over her lower lip. How can that be? Lily trembled at his slight touch and leaned into his caress. When I was a girl of fifteen, I met a gentleman. Derek stiffened. His expression curiously blank, he dropped his arm to his side. Mourning the loss of his caress, she forced herself to go on. He was riding in the countryside. I was walking in the hillside and our paths crossed. And she'd been paying for that meeting since. The memory slipped in, dragging her into her past. The late duke had stunk of brandy and spirits, his rumpled garments bespoke an evening of carousing, but as a girl, she'd been too foolish to see any of that. She curled her fingers so tight her nails dug vicious crescents onto the soft flesh of her palms. With his penetrating stare, Derek urged her on with her telling. She forced herself to unfurl her hands. The gentleman was magnificent, she said, emotionless. He had glorious golden tresses and a face the Archangel Gabriel would have envied. Even with that black-hearted scoundrel's beauty, George paled in his younger brother's more impressive, darker shadow. A muscle ticked at the corner of Derek's black patch. And, he gritted out. She gave her head a clearing shake. That gentleman's soul proved to be black and ugly and all things vile. Lily claimed Derek's left hand. She turned over the large, powerful palm and studied the scars that marred the, no doubt, once perfect flesh. 
both George and Sir Henry had worn fine gloves as though they were part of their skin. How very different Derek was from all others, so wholly real and raw. Lily pressed her hand to his and studied the joined palms. I came to learn a man's worth, honor, and beauty is about far more than the physical perfection one may have, by a matter of chance, been born with. His body jerked, as though she'd run him through with a jagged rapier. Where she'd once been the prey and he the hunter, with her telling, the roles were reversed. Derek stumbled away from her. His left leg buckled and he quickly caught himself with the use of his cane. Will you accept the position or not, Mrs. Benedict? He rasped, and so she was Mrs. Benedict again. She nodded once. I will. However, she called as he turned to leave. He froze and cast a glance over his shoulder. Lily shoved slowly to her feet and tried to regain her bearing in his tall, towering presence, a nigh-impossible feat with his six feet and five inches of unyielding masculine power. I will not deal with Davies. I will report to only you about Flora. His eye disappeared into a thin, narrow slit. She swallowed hard. No doubt, few presented ultimatums to a duke, particularly one of this commanding strength and power. I will need to visit your office and speak to you. She held her breath. For that request, if granted, would afford her entry to his most private room. Charged silence blanketed the room. They stood, gazes locked on one another in an unspoken battle. As the moments ticked by and he continued to assess her in that piercing way, trepidation built at a steady, relentless rate. A man such as this one could look into a person's eyes and glean their secrets and all the darkest, ugliest truths they carried. Her chest froze tight, until she reminded herself to breathe once more. For the lies she carried were the dark, ugly sins that he'd no doubt destroy her for when he ultimately discovered her duplicity. Except, he gave a curt nod. You will meet with me each Friday. You have an hour. Not a minute more. Not a minute less. Should you have requests to put to me, they will not come before those meetings. Derek turned and started for the door. An unexplainable disappointment filled her. For she well knew a man who shut himself away from society would never exit the protective walls of his office and, as such, she would never see him. Is that not for the best? Then I may have free reign of his home and not fear being under his watchful eye. Derek reached for the handle. Wait. He froze. Her mind sped quickly and abandoning all proper decorum, she raced after him. Meet but once a week, she asked. It was madness to issue any protestations to his demands. The fewer dealings she had with this man who roused equal amounts fear and desire, the better, nay safer, it was for her to escape, and scathed. So why did she protest? Derek eyed her dispassionately. You'll debate the merits of my terms? There was a hint of warning she'd be fooled to ignore. I will. Then, she'd proven herself a fool many times before this. You meet with Mr. Davies, but once a week, but I am overseeing the care of a child entrusted to you. We must meet more than once each week. Did she imagine the ghost of a smile on his lips at that last charge? Surely he'd already proven himself incapable of amusement. She shook her head. No, one meeting will not suffice. I will meet you in your office each Monday, prior to beginning Lady Flora's weekly lessons. And each Wednesday to go over the progress she is making and any questions I might have until our Friday meeting where I will provide a detailed reporting for the week. He stood at the door and, for a long moment, she thought he'd fling her demands in her face and be done with her once and for all. Very well, Lily. His words jerked her erect. What? You'll have your three meetings. Without another word, Derek turned, yanked the door open, and left. He shoved it closed, and the panel rattled in its frames. With Derek gone, her shoulders sagged. She folded her arms at her waist and squeezed tight. No matter how much she held herself, she could not drive back the self-loathing that churned in her belly and spread through her like a venomous poison. In coming here, 
she'd convinced herself of the right of deceiving the new Duke of Blackthorn. After all, blood will out. By the whispered rumors about the man called the Beast of Blackthorn, and the witness she herself had borne to his tirades and disdained for the child in his care, he fit with all heinous, ugly things she knew to be true about the now-dead George. Only, in three days' time, he'd upended her world and forced her to see a man who protected himself at all costs. A lonely gentleman who'd not go near his niece for fear of terrorizing the girl with his visage. Why should he believe otherwise when, by his own admission, his own mother could not bear to look upon him? Derek Winters, the Duke of Blackthorn, was a man who trusted none and closeted himself away in his office, hiding like a great, injured beast, nursing his wounds in a corner. And this is the man she would ultimately deceive. Tears smarted behind her eyes, useless, empty drops, as she found just one more reason to hate herself. She stilled and blinking back tears, then stared at the door Derek had just taken his leave of. Yes, she would take from the Duke of Blackthorn and be off like the thief in the night she was, but perhaps, before she left, there was some good she could do here that would atone for some of the evils she'd done in her life. As much as his old injury allowed, Derek walked briskly through the quiet corridors. Panic and fury warred for supremacy within, with neither proving triumphant. He'd allowed the lovely, vexing, and all things tempting Lily Benedict, her three meetings. Not only had he allowed her to remain, he'd granted the lady free reign of his household and agreed to her outrageous terms of three weekly meetings. He gave his head a disgusted shake. Now he knew how that fool Odysseus, spending years of his life a willing prisoner upon that island, felt. For instead of setting Lily from his thoughts, with each exchange, she strengthened whatever this maddening hold she had over him. He didn't want to care, about her, his sister's child, himself. He'd been content to live in the past, constructing defenses that would see him immune to society and his own family's loathing. Instead of caring, he'd fed his icy disdain for the world, for his mother, who'd rejected him. For his former friend Saint Seer, who'd destroyed him. And for every woman, man, and child that had turned from him in horrified revulsion. Revenge against Saint Seer had fueled him, a desire to see that man as miserable as he'd made Derek. In the end, his efforts to shatter that man's happiness and his marriage had proven futile. Derek turned at the end of the corridor and marched awkwardly down the hall. Yet, since Lily had entered his household, a woman of mystery and courage, he'd been consumed by her, the sweet taste of her, the fragrant hint of lavender that clung to her skin. Through her, he felt more alive than he had since to lose. His heart thundered hard and he lengthened his stride, damming his leg that slowed his retreat. For Christ in heaven, he didn't want to care there had been a gentleman with the face of the Archangel Gabriel who'd hurt her in ways that made Derek wish he was whole again so he could tear the bastard apart with his bare hands. Why should it matter she knew hurt or pain? Why, when his own suffering was so very great? Only, the anguish in her eyes dulled his own self-pain so that he wanted to drive back the memories that clearly haunted her. God damn you, Lily Benedict, he spat. Derek's heel scraped along the carpet. He stumbled and then pitched forward. Coming down hard, he caught himself on his palms as pain shot up his arms. His cane skidded across the carpet and then came to an abrupt stop at a pair of small, slippered feet. His breath coming hard and fast from his fall, he froze. Are you hurt? she called and her almost haunting child's voice carried down the hall. He growled. I am incapable of pain. The little girl took a step closer and then another. I don't think that is true. She motioned to his scarred face. That must have hurt a great deal. The scent of burned flesh seared his nostrils and his body went taut with the remembered agony of being stuck through over and over again in his thigh, like a lady's embroidery scrap, by a French soldier determined to end the man whose face had been set ablaze. Did it, she prodded. And then clarified. That is hurt. Did it hurt? Drawing forth years of the harsh ugliness he'd reserved for all people, Derek opened his mouth, but the words would not come. It did. He jerked and then cast a quick glance about to the person responsible for that admission. Me. 
by God, I was the man who uttered those words. His sister's child wandered ever closer. A tiny replica of Edeline when she'd been a girl of seven now hovered over his prone form. He braced for her horrified shock, but, instead, she peered long and silently at this face. Yes, she said at last. I expect it would have. She leaned closer. Does it still hurt? Derek shoved himself into a sitting position. Oh, how the ton would laugh and sneer should they see the fabled beast in his shirt sleeves and gloveless, collapsed upon the floor with a child putting inquiries to him. Only, you don't care what anyone truly thinks of you. Or, do you? He clenched and unclenched his jaw. It does not, he said gruffly, the lie slipped out with surprising ease. He was not so devoid of humanity that he'd fill this girl's ears with the agony of movement, that his entire body throbbed daily with pain. He started. For, hadn't he spent the better part of seven years, believing that very thing? Unnerved by the girl's silent stare, he came up on his knees and attempted to stand. His leg buckled in protest and a black curse slipped from his lips. The familiar self-hatred ran hot through him, burning him with the ever-deepening disgust for himself. His sister's child looked him over and then blessedly turned on her heel and skipped off as though she danced through the meadows of an English countryside and not the dark, lonely halls of the Beast of Blackthorn's home. Derek attempted to stand once more, but his exertions running about the blasted townhouse in search of Lily Benedict and then away from her just moments earlier, crippled his efforts now. He sank back on his haunches, shifted his body's weight onto his unaffected side and then narrowed his eyes. The girl stopped alongside his cane and with an ease he envied, bent, scooped it up, and raced back. You need your cane. Sweat dotted his brow and dripped into his eye, momentarily blinding him. He brushed it back and warily stared at the offering she held out. She shook it. Well? Reluctantly, Derek accepted it and, with the aid of the crutch, shoved himself to a stand. It is an ugly cane, you know. There was a chiding tone to the child's words that made him smile. He quickly smoothed his features. I dare say, if I required a cane, I would have a fairy or flower upon mine. Something happier than an ugly snake. He blinked. Undoubtedly. You did not allow Mr. Davies to sack Mrs. Benedict. Keeping up with this child's ramblings was like being set out at sea in a squall. Should you not be in the nursery? Once more, the wisdom in allowing Lily to remain on, despite the havoc she wrought upon his senses, proved true. Flora lifted her shoulders in a little shrug. Mrs. Benedict and I are going to the park for my lessons tomorrow. She cast a hopeful look up. Would you like to come with us? To smell the air. He closed his eye a moment. To feel the sun touch his face, like a whispery caress. Derek opened his eye on his now scarred, disfigured face. Run along to bed then. She dropped her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. I am glad you didn't sack her. She is nice to you. Mr. Davies is not. Most people were not. And with good reason. He was an ugly, miserable bugger. Mayhap, people are not so very nice, because you are not so very nice, Uncle Derek. Uncle Derek. His entire body jerked reflexively. He'd been nothing more than a beast for so long, that all parts of the man he'd been had died and his name ceased to exist. Now, this child should call it forth and with her small, lyrical voice, remind him that he was very much human, and did, in fact, feel. He dusted a hand over his chest, the place his heart apparently did still beat. He preferred a life when he'd felt nothing for anyone, than this. Wide, curious eyes stared at him. Derek cleared his throat of the emotion lodged there. No doubt you are right he said at last when he trusted himself to speak. A mischievous sparkle lit her eyes. Well, you are a little nice, she whispered loudly. For if you weren't, you wouldn't have cared about the mean things Mr. Davies said about Mrs. Benedict. You heard that? A dull flush burnt his neck. Christ. 
What other inappropriate utterances had the girl been secret witness to? Flora gave a pleased nod and then stopped abruptly. She twisted a curl about her finger. What is a whore? Derek choked and raked a hand through his hair. It. You. By God, what had his sister been thinking of entrusting an innocent child to his incapable hands? He cast a frantic gaze about. Where in hell was Lily? Or Harris? Or anyone? Wide, expectant eyes met his. Air, it is not an appropriate word, he settled for. She gave a slow nod. Yes, I thought as much. Like damn and goddamn and bloody hell. Then, a wide smile wreathed her face, revealing a gap where two of her teeth should be. That innocent, child's grin caused an odd tightening in his chest. Which is why you were very nice to not allow Mr. Davies to speak of Mrs. Benedict, so. I rather like her. Run along, he said harshly, disquieted by this child's artlessness and the clear reminder of innocence. Go to sleep for your outing tomorrow. And then he could be free of both of the young ladies. She hesitated and then sprinted away. With Flora gone, her words about Lily echoed about his mind. And terror stuck in his chest, with the realization that he, too, rather liked the bold-mouthed, courageous governess. Chapter 13 Oh, Mrs. Benedict, I have dearly missed the sun. In a flourishing manner that hinted at a talent for the theatrics, Flora slapped the back of her forearm to her brow the following day, Lily and Flora with their books and blankets for the day's lessons, marched through the crowded Hyde Park. Indeed, Lily said with a smile pulling at her lips. And there was, indeed, truth to her affirmation of the girl's words. For having been shut away for but a handful of days, she'd longed for the sun on her face. What hell it must be for Derek to be shut away with no visitors, no friends, and not even the sun's warm rays for company. Thrusting aside the dull ache, she gave her attention to Flora. The girl chatted on, pointing out everything from the passing ladies to the magnificent carriages and horses. Her charge stopped abruptly. Shall we sit here? She pointed a chubby finger toward the lake at Lily's back. I rather like this tree. What kind is it, Mrs. Benedict? Lily furrowed her brow and studied the towering tree. Having grown up in Carlisle, there had been an abundance of trees. Even so, she'd spent more time admiring the nature around her than studying it. The wind shook the branches overhead and set the green leaves to swaying. Sunlight filtered through the green canopy. I don't, it is an elm. Lily spun about to find the owner of that soft utterance. A young woman with warm, blue eyes looked at Flora. It is an elm, she repeated. She turned a smile on Lily and under that gentle warmth, Lily burrowed into the folds of her modest cloak. She took in the cut of her velvet cloak and the elegantly clad gentleman at the lady's side. My lady, she greeted and dropped a deferential curtsy. Would this woman even be speaking to her now if she were to glean the identity of the person under these very branches? She thought not. Flora skipped over and positioned herself between Lily and the smiling couple. Wind pulled at their skirts and plastered the cloak to the woman's frame, revealing a gently rounded belly. Was the woman expecting? Sharp pain stabbed Lily's heart, nearly crippling for the unexpectedness of it. Would the heartbreak of that lost dream ever ease? Of knowing she'd never know the gift of a child of her own. She was never more grateful for another person's presence than Flora's who commanded that happily wedded couple's notice. Do you know a good deal about trees? Today we were going to learn about the nature at Hyde Park, isn't that right, Mrs. Benedict? The trio's attention swung back to Lily, and she warmed. We were. Are, she amended lamely. Her inability to identify the tree they stood under even now, hardly recommend her. Lily took in the picnic basket in the arms of a servant hovering behind the couple. They were here for an outing. Regret tugged once more, to be on the arm of a loving husband who looked upon her with adoring eyes. 
all of that she'd thrown away on a girlish infatuation. Come along, Flora. She dipped a curtsy to the adoring pair. Curtsy to Lord and Lady St. Cyr, the young woman interjected. A lord and his lady. What an odd world she, a vicar's daughter, now moved within. And what she wouldn't give to trade back every vile, London moment and return to Carlisle, as it had been before one reckless decision. She cleared her throat. I am Mrs. Benedict, and this is Lady Flora Ross. Let us leave you to your picnic. Shocked recognition flared in the Marquis' eyes. He swung his attention to the little girl before him. With a frown, Lily moved closer to the girl. Come along, Flora, she said again. She'd learned long ago that no gentleman was safe. Powerful peers with arresting smiles oftentimes hid black hearts. Flora craned her head back and shot a frown at Lily. But I do not want to leave this spot. She gesticulated wildly about the landscape. It has a magnificent view of the lake ahead and there is that wonderful boulder I would dearly love to climb on and... As the girl prattled on, Lily fixed on the Marquis of St. Cyr and a flood of agonized emotions paraded across his face. Flora, she said softly. Make your curtsies and goodbyes to the Marquis and Marchioness. Oh, very well, her charge said on an exaggerated sigh. I knew your mother, the man said quietly. A laugh from some joyous lord echoed in the park. Flora stilled and looked up at the Marquis with an almost desperate glimmer in her eyes. That vice of agony squeezed at Lily's heart once more. You knew my mother, she whispered. He dropped to a knee beside her. I did, he said in solemn tones. A very, very long time ago. I am so very sorry she is. The man's throat worked. Lost, Flora supplied. She is not truly gone. Not forever. She is merely lost. Lily struggled to draw in a breath past the tightness in her chest. For all the ugliness Flora had known, she still retained hope with innocence only a child was capable of. Unable to meet the grief mirrored in the Marquis' eyes, Lily looked away, and her gaze collided with his kind-eyed wife. The woman met her stare with a gentle knowing. Flora tugged the Marquis' hand. How do you know my mother? Do you remember her from when she made her come out? My grandmother used to say there was no more magnificent diamond in all the waters than my mama. At the unwitting child's reminder of the dark deed that brought Lily here, she dropped her gaze to the tips of her boots. I did remember your mother's come out, he said quietly. A sad smile creased his lips but I remember her from long ago. I was. He coughed into his hand. I was a friend of your uncle. Flora gasped. You are friends with my uncle Derek. I did not know uncle Derek had any friends. He is quite miserable, you know. Flora, Lily chided, placing a gentle hand on the girl's shoulder. With her child's ears, Flora had very neatly missed the telltale word used by the Marquis. The desire to protect the Duke, Derek, from the world filled her with a staggering intensity. Mayhap he had the right of it? It was far too dangerous living outside, at least closeted away, one could insulate oneself from the peril that was life. I know your uncle Derek quite well. We used to make a good deal of mischief as children. The faint grin on the gentleman's lips gave Lily pause, as with those words he transformed Derek from this cold, terrifying stranger into a man who'd once been a child Flora's age with a troublesome grin and a penchant for mischief. The realness in that pulled at her heart. Her skin pricked with awareness and she looked up. Lady St. Cyr stared curiously at her. Surely a stranger could not see into her confounded thoughts. Unnerved, Lily cleared her throat. We should allow the Marquis and Marchioness to their picnic, Flora. Must we? You must stay, the Marchioness said quietly. Then, with the ease only a peer could manage, she looked to their servant and, with a slight nod, motioned for him to lay down a blanket he'd taken out of their picnic basket. Flora clapped her hands excitedly. 
Lily curled her toes within the soles of her serviceable boots. This world was not her world. She could not be farther from it than had she been set into orbit within another galaxy. Casting a desperate glance over the Marquis' shoulder into the lake, she wished herself far, far away. And I gather you are. She is my governess, Flora supplied, as the Marquis rose to his feet and helped his wife sit. Another powerful longing ran through Lily at the sign of that closeness between two people, she would have given her littlest finger to know a fraction of that genuine love. She bit the inside of her cheek. Instead, some women were born to lives of happiness, while others trudged along with the path and way winding less clear. She claimed a seat alongside Flora. Lily glanced at the bag of books she'd brought for the girls' studies, but the manner in which Flora was firing off questions at the Marquis, the day's lesson would, no doubt, prove a good deal less productive. And yet, even with that truth, she carefully attended the Marquis' words, hoping for further mention about the man Lily now called employer. He was a superior boxer. Was he? Flora asked excitedly. I do believe I can see that. He enjoys fighting with Harris and mean Mr. Davies. She cast a look at Lady St. Cyr. His man of affairs, she clarified, for the other woman's benefit. Ah, the young lady replied with a smile dimpling her cheek. The Marquis waggled his eyebrows. Mean Mr. Davies is still in the Duke's employ? Flora rolled her eyes in a dramatic fashion. Oh, yes. Then she scrambled forward. You know him, too? Davies? Oh, indeed. Lord St. Cyr winked and dropped his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Your uncle was never afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the man. Yes, well, Davies does deserve yelling at sometimes, Flora said ringing a chuckle from the young lord. She pointed to Lily. Uncle Derek fights with Mrs. Benedict, too. The trio's attention swung to Lily and heat flamed on her cheeks. She choked. Flora? The little girl gave a wave of her hand. They are friends of Uncle Derek. They know. Isn't that right, my lord? A spark of pain glinted in the man's eyes, gone so quick Lily wondered if she'd merely imagined it. Indeed, he said, his voice rough. Flora looked to the book clutched in Lady St. Cyr's hands. What is that? she asked with curiosity seeping from her wide, blue eyes. I enjoy sketching, the young woman murmured. Would you care to see? Oh, yes. Flora reached for the book with eager fingers and quickly set to turning the pages. Oh, my, she whispered. I'm really rather a deplorable artist, the woman said with a wry smile. But I do very much enjoy it. Oh, no, my lady, Flora said emphatically, not taking her gaze from the pages. You are wonderful. Your pictures are magnificent. And you are very kind, Flora, Lady St. Cyr, said with a wide smile that climbed all the way to her eyes. Odd, she'd never before known a lady could be capable of that unfettered expression. The Marquis collected his wife's hand and raised her fingertips to his lips. A look passed between them, the moment so poignant, so beautiful, that Lily carefully averted her gaze, feeling the worst sort of interloper on that intimate exchange and more hating herself for aching to know a sliver of the love shared between them. She fixed her attention on the book Flora held and squinting, she tried to make out the image that now commanded the girl's notice. It appeared to be, a, a. Oh, I do love this one, Flora whispered. Do you? Lady St. Cyr scooted closer to her. Yes, the girl breathed. She dropped her chin atop her hand and assessed the same drawing. Broad strokes and slashes filled the lower portion of the page with misshapen circles lining the top of the sheet. Lily peered at it, lost in the ambiguous images, and yes, one would never claim the lady was in any way an artist, and yet. She leaned closer, staring intently, and there was a mystery that forced a person to look at what they saw and truly see it, devoid of the perfection expected by society. What do you see? 
Lady St. Cyr urged gently. I see the ocean. There was a haunting timbre to the girl's words. Goose flesh dotted Lily's arms. It is a storm and there is a ship, lost. Another breeze stirred overhead and the leaves danced noisily. Oh, God. Pain stabbed at Lily's heart. This was the loss Flora had known. What blackness existed in Lily's soul that she'd cursed the entire Winter's family? Would you like it? The Martianess quietly spoken question brought Flora's attention up, away from the artwork. She blinked several times. Truly? Truly, Lady St. Cyr murmured. She leaned over and effortlessly tugged out the page. It is yours. Flora accepted the sheet, with eager hands and with a wide beaming smile, returned to her study of the squall she saw captured there. The Marquis pointed to the page and said something that roused a laugh from the girl. Lily stilled, lost in the poignancy of that exchange. This charming Marquis had once been friends with Derek. What would the Duke of Blackthorn have become had life not turned him bitter and he'd not removed himself from the world? Would he even now be the loving uncle pointing at obscure pictures and rousing laughter from a child's lips? You are a governess, Mrs. Benedict. Those words, more statement than anything else, snapped Lily's attention back to the Marchioness. Forgive me. She cleared her throat. I am. In a world where she'd known the ugliness of the late Duke of Blackthorn and his mother, who was this woman who spoke to governesses with such ease? Lily felt set adrift at sea in that storm upon the page Flora spoke of. Is that how Derek feels each day? Her throat went tight. My sister-in-law was a former governess, the young woman said gently. Lily angled her head. Beg pardon? Noblemen did not wood governesses. You've heard me correctly. A lively twinkle glimmered in the lady's eyes. She and my brother are very much in love. Unable to meet the probing stare, Lily shifted her gaze over to the lake. Yes, sometimes magical moments happen to people. A pink pelican dipped its head under the surface and fished about for its fare. He came up a moment later with his wide mouth empty. But most times, life was hard, and predictable, and predictably hard. The graceful creature dealt his head under the surface once more. To give her fingers something to do, Lily picked up the volume of moral tales for young people and found the pages. How very fortunate they are, she said softly. There was no bitterness in that. There was a peace in knowing that sometimes those mystical moments did come. Lady St. Cyr narrowed her eyes and opened her mouth, but Flora called the Martianess attention and left Lily to her thoughts once more. And just then, fate in its ultimate mockery placed a familiar, detestable figure on the riding path ahead. With his elegant, sapphire coat and fun-colored breeches, the gentleman may as well have been any other gentleman present. She fisted the book in her hands as their gazes collided. No, this was no meeting of chance. This was a carefully orchestrated reminder of her role, his presence, and, more importantly, his reach. Holdsworth gave a slight nod, a hard smile on his lips, and then shifted his attention away. As he continued riding past, panic swelled inside Lily's breast. In embroiling this little girl in that madman's machinations, she'd not allowed herself to consider the possible jeopardy she placed Flora in. You didn't think because all you'd cared about was your own future security. Guilt squeezed like a vice about her lungs. She jumped to her feet. We should go, she squeaked. Flora looked up, confusion and disappointment warring in her eyes. Mrs. Benedict? Unable to meet the Marquis and Marchioness eyes, Lily dropped a curtsy. I thank you for allowing us to join you under the elm. If you'll excuse me. Holdsworth shot a deliberate look over his shoulder, and with her free fingers, she grabbed for Flora's hand. Good day, she said quickly, and fled the park. For the truth was, there existed more nightmares than magical moments. Life had taught her that. Chapter 14
Later that evening, Lily paced the floor of her quiet chambers. The white coverlet and dove-white curtains stood as a silent mockery to the woman who now occupied these noble rooms. She wrung her hands together. In the dead of night, when the household slept, it was a good deal harder to escape one's guilt. She stopped abruptly and her night shift fluttered about her ankles. On numbed legs, she walked over to the dressing table and slid into the Trafalgar chair. From the bevel glass, the face of a woman who appeared far older, far more mature than Lily's three and twenty years, stared back. She tried to pull her gaze from the creature with wan cheeks and bloodshot eyes, but the moment was much like the day she'd arrived in London. The cacophony of shrieks and cries as a phaeton, driven by a reckless lord, tipped. Her life was that carriage accident. Forgone was the girl with blush-pinked cheeks and dreamy, optimistic eyes. That woman had been killed by the ruthlessness of one rake who'd taken her virtue. Tears smarted behind her eyes, and she blinked them back. Through her blurred vision, she examined the sterling silver cloth brush and comb, far grander than her own treasured pieces, pieces she'd been forced to leave behind. Lily glanced over at the locked door and then returned her attention to the dressing table. With trembling fingers, she slowly pulled open the narrow center drawer and revealed the neat pages clipped from the times. She shuffled through the pages she'd assembled, pages detailing the tragedies of one particular family. The Winters family who'd existed as nothing more than a conglomeration of individuals. She'd read through the scandal sheets about first the death of George, then the mother and sister as all but one remained of the Winters line with a detached interest. Their tragedies had not roused the expected glee or satisfaction, for with their passing, none of them could right the wrongs once done to her. Before, she'd been removed from who these people were. It had been far easier to hate anyone and everyone who shared George's blood when they were mere strangers, ducal kin gossiped about in scandal sheets. It was quite another when those same strangers became people, lonely, broken, fearful. Or, as Flora had indicated in the Duke's case, a hero who now cried when he thought no one else was watching. Her lips moved silently as she read. The seventh Duke of B dead in a carriage accident. With no heir or kin born to the couple, the line will pass to Lord Derrick. Accept him. The one Winters who'd lived, a figure who'd been mentioned as nothing more than an afterthought in the scandal sheets. He'd existed as another one of those who shared George's blood and nothing more. Lily placed the sheet down and smoothed her palms over the worn page. Such a detail about who replaced that treacherous Duke of Blackthorn hadn't mattered. Derek had merely been a name, a cold stranger who shared the blood of the man who ruined her and the mother who'd turned her away. Now, he was more real in ways that George and Sir Henry never had been. Her lips tingled with the remembrance of his powerful kiss and an odd fluttering danced in her belly. She slid her eyes closed and embraced those wanton, wicked thoughts of a man who'd roused a fierce desire within her, sentiments she'd never known with the men before and had never expected to know, ever. Lily drew in a shuddery breath and forced her eyes open. It had been a good deal easier to slip into this home to commit a theft when he'd been nothing more than a man who shared the blood of dark, ugly souls who'd turned her out. Now, nothing was certain. For he was real. And he was not the same man his brother had been. For if he'd been a lofty duke who thought of only himself, he'd not have left his office and stormed into her meeting with Mr. Davies. Knowing her as little as he did, nonetheless, he defended her anyway to his man of affairs. He trusted her. And she would repay that kindness and trust with the greatest lie and betrayal. Her hands tightened reflexively about the page and she hopelessly wrinkled the sheet. Forcing her fingers open, she then laid the page down, smoothing it with her palm. What did it say about the weak, pathetic woman she was that after only a few days of knowing Derek? she'd abandoned thoughts about her future and security. Lily scrubbed her hands over her face. For how could she steal from him? How could she break the trust of a man who trusted none and who kept the world out, but had somehow found her a person worth defending? Get control of yourself, Lily Louise. Wool gathering about the man whose kiss had curled her toes would not help keep her warm, fed, and safe years from now. 
Except, she could no sooner stop thinking of him than she could undo that mistake she'd made with George all those years ago. Only, in this instant, the demons that haunted her had nothing to do with the regrets of her past or the horrific memories of George's betrayal and Sir Henry's improper offer, and her own fall from proverbial grace. This time it was Derek. A man called Monster by society, who cried in privacy. Emotions swelled in her throat. Somehow, between the plan presented her by Holtsworth and a little girl's ramblings, Lily's role in this household had changed in a fundamental way. She shoved herself up. What alternative do I have? The hum of nighttime silence served as her only answer. I can go home and beg. As soon as the thought entered, she shoved it aside. After the Dowager Duchess of Blackthorne's passing, Lily had penned a letter to her father, pleading with him to allow her to return. To no avail. She would not humble herself before him again. Not when he'd been abundantly clear he considered his eldest daughter, Liliana Bennett, dead to him. That propelled her into movement. There really was no other choice. Staying here in this fabricated role of governess to an innocent child only complicated her plans and muddied her thoughts. Lily shoved herself up from the chair and stood. The thin carpet did little to prevent the cold from seeping into her toes. Perhaps this uncharacteristic cool had nothing to do with the early spring evening and everything to do with this house. And the cold, hurt man dwelling here with an equally hurt and lonely child. Lily hurried over to the vanity and collected her wrapper from the back of the chair. She shrugged into the modest piece and bit her lip hard. She grabbed the box from the table and with the piece clutched close to her chest, carried it to the door. If she managed to locate the diamond, she could simply tuck it into the box and be on her way, and slip away, to never again see Derek or Flora. A spasm contorted her heart. I cannot be weak. After all, that weakness had once cost her everything. A strand of hair fell across her brow and she tucked it back behind her ear. Before her courage deserted her, she pulled the door open and peeked her head out. Heaven ne'er helps the men who will not act. She looked left and then right down the empty stretch of hallway. She pulled the door closed behind her and started down the hall. As she walked at a brisk clip, her ragged breaths filled the corridors. When she'd received word that Sir Henry with his fat, sweaty hands had died in his clubs, she'd vowed to never, ever, ever find herself so desperate she'd spread her legs for any man. She increased her stride. The world, however, offered very few options for those unwed ladies. Not that heaven had taken much care after I helped myself, she muttered under her breath. What was that, Mrs. Benedict? A startled shriek burst from her lips and Lily spun about. A young maid stood eyeing her as though she were an exhibit on display at the Royal Museum. God in heaven, this thievery business was no easy task. Oh, forgive me. In an attempt to still her racing heart, Lily placed her free hand to her chest. We have not met. So, there was a maid, a butler, a footman, and cook. Hardly the empty household as it had been presented. I am Claudia, the girl said in a high sing-song voice. Not much older than Lily had been when she'd been forced off to London to carve out a life for herself. Claudia, she repeated back, softly. There were few options for vicars' daughters without references, on their own in the world. What would her empty existence have been had she found honorable work as this girl had? Is everything all right, Mrs. Benedict? Lily, she automatically corrected. Please, just Lily. She gave her head a clearing shake as she belatedly registered the girl's use of her name, how did you know my name? She deliberately avoided answering the girl's inquiry. She took to avoiding Ms. Truths where she could. And the reality of Claudia's question was that she had not been all right in nearly eight years. The young woman tiptoed over with the quiet footfalls of one who feared rousing a beast. We all know who you are, madam. That is, Harris and Thomas. The blush on the girl's cheeks hinted at more between the girl and the handsome footman. And there is also Cook. Yes, 
We know a good deal about you. What was that? A whore? A thief? A liar? Her skin pricked hot and then cold with shame. Oh, she said dumbly. Claudia lowered her voice to the faintest whisper. You went down the corridor. Lily cast a confused look left and then right. The beast's halls, the maid clarified, calling her attention back. A slight frown pulled at her lips over the young woman's description of her employer. It mattered not that Lily herself had the same thoughts about the bellowing lout. That unkindness, however, chafed for it hinted at why the duke bellowed and glowered. You should not call him beast. Claudia gave no indication that she heard the chastisement. No one goes down those halls, miss. Well, Harris does, but only because he has no choice. Of course, all the servants on the Duke's staff would have the sense God gave a goat to not violate his orders. Unlike me, she mumbled. Who had no other choice if she were to secure that blasted diamond? Claudia leaned close, her brow furrowed. What was that, miss? Er, nothing, she said quickly, her cheeks warm. A dearth of friendships through the years had resulted in the rather bothersome tendency to speak aloud to oneself. It was a rather embarrassing habit, when people were around to hear it, that was. But you did go down those halls, the maid carried on. She gesticulated wildly as she spoke. He yelled and you did not flee as all the other governesses. They all spoke of their employer as though he were a monster. What a sad way to go through life. She slid her gaze away. You are still here, the girl said excitedly. You knocked on his door, and I kissed him. Twice with wanton boldness. You made demands of him. If his grace knew he had servants glistening at the keyholes, he'd sack the lot of them. And he threatened to toss you out, but he did not. Well, for now. But there was time yet. How do you know all this? She at last managed to put a question to the girl. Claudia froze like a doe, caught in a hunter's snare. How do I know all this? The once garrulous girl went unexpectedly laconic. She shook her head. As in she would not answer the question? Or that she did not know? Regardless, Mrs. Ben. Lily, she put in. She'd not have the handful of servants here, treating her as something more than she was. There was nothing the least brave about her. She was a woman who'd sold her virtue and now her soul for freedom from fear. Bitterness tasted like acid on her tongue. How did you speak so bravely before him? I've been in his household a while now and cannot bring myself to approach his halls. He is just a man, Claudia, she said softly. Society expects us to see perfection in the human form as a thing of safety and beauty, but that isn't always the case, is it? George's rakish grin slid into her mind. His beautiful face could have made the angels weep with envy, yet such a man would have never taken a stranger from the street and defended her before his man of affairs. Claudia gave her a small smile. I like you very much, ma'am. At the young woman's kindness, gratitude lodged in Lily's throat. She struggled to swallow. For so many years, she'd been the recipient of such disdain she no longer knew what to do with kindness. I thought I would explore his grace's home, she put in, needing to remove herself from this woman and her undeserving praise. She pulled her box close, praying the woman failed to note the damning object in her hands. If you will excuse me? Of course, ma'am. Lily stepped around her when Claudia called out. Wait, ma'am. She turned back as the girl fished her hand about the front pocket of her apron. This arrived for you earlier this evening. It came to the servant's entrance. Color filled the maid's cheeks. I was given good coin if I saw it delivered to you. Lily stilled as the girl brandished a folded note. I slid along her spine. Of course he would send round word. A man of Holdsworth's determination would easily command such a feat fighting to calm her pounding heart, she accepted the page with fingers that shook. 
Unable to meet Claudia's curious stare, Lily kept her gaze trained on the page, torn between wanting to crumple the sheet in her hands and wanting to read it right there. She looked up. That will be all, Claudia. Thank you. The innocent maid dropped another curtsy. Good evening, Mrs. Benedict. With that she rushed off in the opposite direction. Lily stared after her until she disappeared and then, with the ivory page nearly singing her fingers, she slipped into the nearest doorway. Presenting her back to the hall, she broke the unfamiliar seal and skimmed the page. You are to meet me at Highgate, Tuesday, before the dawn breaks. She quickly folded the page and tucked it inside the clever pocket sewn inside her wrapper. She stole a frantic look up and down the hall to determine whether anyone had observed her. Only the hum of nighttime silence filled her ears. With the eeriness of this great labyrinth, lending an air of evil to the note in her pocket, Lily moved quietly down the hall and to the stairway. She hesitated at the top of the sweeping marble staircase that led to the foyer. With the Duke's warnings echoing in her mind, she took the steps slowly, and then stopped at the base of the stairs. The cold marble on her naked feet, oddly calming, she walked on to his office. Do you intend to gape at me all day? Get out. At the haunting remembrance of his snarled words, she captured her lower lip between her teeth. It was very easy to fear the Duke. With his wounded visage and black patch, he had the look of a ruthless warrior who'd slay anyone who so much as questioned him. What she'd begun to discover, however, is that for his gruff orders and barking commands, there was far more to the man than that angry beast. His sneers and snarls were nothing more than a cleverly crafted veneer that masked his gentle touch and a man who'd defend those in need of defending, a man who when he loved, would do so deeply and unwaveringly. A seething envy invaded every corner of her being for that fortunate woman who would one day heal his broken spirit and earn that love. She slowed her steps and took in the gold frames. His ancestors stared back at her in all their haughty, frozen arrogance and a chill stole down her spine. Even the inanimate canvases recognized the wrongness in her moving along these corridors. Lily continued on, past the bewigged, powdered figures, to the end of the hall. The intersecting hall that led to those forbidden rooms. Why would they be forbidden? Why, unless there was something of great wealth he intended to keep from servants and outsiders? She started for that forbidden door when, from the corner of her eye, a flash of crimson caught her attention and momentarily froze her. She wetted her lips and then glanced about. Her gaze, unbidden, returned to the portrait at the end of the hall. Your impulsivity will be your ruin. Yes, she'd already proven her father correct in that regard. Lily cast a glance over her shoulder at those forbidden rooms and walked slowly across the intersecting hall to the end of the corridor. She came to a stop before the portrait. Her heart kicked up a funny beat as she took in the uniformed soldier. Where the previous ancestors had been stern-faced, this man wore a bold half-grin that all but challenged life to erase that smile. Unable to draw her gaze away from the masterful picture he presented, Lily tipped her head to the side. The harsh, angular planes of his face bespoke power and regal strength. The blue of his eyes were pools that sucked at a person's rational thought and just held one silently captivated. She ran her stare over the frame, down to the strong, noble jaw, and then her heart missed a beat. Oh, God. Her grip loosened upon the box and she quickly righted her hold on it. All the while she kept her attention on him. This man. This smiling stranger. The Duke of Blackthorn. Emotion balled in her throat and she blinked back the crystal sheen that descended over her eyes. She cries. A single drop rolled down her cheek, followed by another, and another, until Derek's powerful figure from some years ago was blurred before her tears. Her tears were not ones of pity. They were ones mourning the loss, not of looks that would have rivaled the Archangel Gabriel, but rather the loss of that innocence he wore in the painting. She cried at the death of his happiness and the misery left in wake of whatever private hell he lived in. The irony was not lost on her. They were both people living in the now, who could never go home. 
not to the way home had been and would always be in those fond, distant memories. Life had aged them, battered them, and they'd emerged scathed and broken, but triumphant. She brushed the back of her free hand over her cheeks. Is this really triumphant, she spat. What manner of joyless existence was this, for either of them? She with dreams of a cottage in the countryside of England and Derek, with his lonely office, were not very much different. Lily scrubbed her cheeks all the harder. And yet, at the same time, she and Derek may as well move within two entirely different universes. For despite the loss and sorrow he'd known, he at least had what she would never have, a family. A little girl was dependent upon him for her happiness and security, and should he just allow himself the possibility of it, a freedom to step out of his lair, and into the world, and again, live. Lily hugged her arms close. The box in her arms bit painfully into her chest and she welcomed that slight sting of discomfort. She'd entered Derek's home, just four days ago, thinking to save herself through this act of thievery. But perhaps the reason she'd come here, nay the reason she'd been brought here, was not for her own selfish need to survive, but rather to forgive, herself, his family, and through that, at last no peace. Mayhap, she could just remain here as Flora's governess. She absently fingered the carved rose on the top of her box. How very foolish to believe Derek would want any help from her. The bellowing, angry duke he'd proven himself to be would sooner send her to the devil than acknowledge need of help from anyone. And yet. She wandered closer to that painting and met his once happy eyes. At some point, everyone needed help. Life had taught her that. The day Derek had lost his left eye, he'd come to appreciate his remaining senses. Sense became stronger and his hearing developed an acuity that would have been the envy of a buck avoiding being hunted. It was how, in the midnight hour, a faint sniveling penetrated his solitary thoughts. He glanced beyond the edge of the folded, still unread note in his hand, over at the closed door. A frown formed on his lips. Silence. Derek returned his attention to St. Cyr's neat scrawl. They'd met as boys when St. Cyr and Maxwell had discovered Derek with a crystal inkwell in hand, one movement away from dumping ink into the tea of their nasty instructor with a fondness for a birch rod. He'd stood frozen at being caught in the man's rooms. Wordlessly, St. Cyr had wandered in ahead of Maxwell, relieved Derek of the crystal jar, and dumped the ink. I rather think this means we must be friends forever. His mouth twisted with dry irony, and he absently massaged the sore muscles of his useless leg. That damned boy, along with Maxwell, had followed him from the notorious rooms of Eton, on to Oxford. In the greatest twist of irony, Derek had followed St. Cyr, but once, into the fields of battle. Maxwell had been with them on those battlefields, as well. He gave his head a regretful shake. At the time it had seemed the perfect grand adventure for three daring and fearless boys who believed themselves invincible. His fingers tightened reflexively upon the page, wrinkling the sheet. Following Toulouse when he'd at last awakened from a drug-induced slumber to find his eye gone and his face burned, he damned the day he'd ever met St. Cyr. Another faint whimper cut across his useless musings of the past. He stilled. In the shroud of midnight's dark loneliness, he could almost believe his mind rang with those dying, once brave fools weeping in pools of their blood. Do not be a bloody fool, he muttered. Setting aside the latest letter sent round by St. Cyr on the rosen-laid table next to his chair, Derek grabbed his cane. He used it to leverage himself to a standing position. People did not enter these corridors. The thump-thump-thump of his cane echoed loudly as he made his way across the office. He jerked open the door and peered into the hall. Silence. Then another faint sniffle pulled his attention toward that portrait of his once perfect self. The sight of the lady hovering beside that image weeping hit him like a well-delivered punch to the gut. Did she stand there with the same pity and regret for the loss of that beautiful, charming gentleman? He opened his mouth to bellow her into leaving, but stopped. Lily stretched a hand out and brushed her fingertips tenderly along the white-gloved hand, the same hand that now required the assistance of a cane to amble his way along through life. 
Derek's blustery tirade died swiftly and he remained rooted to the floor. His throat worked spasmodically. Why should she stand before an old, frozen likeness of him with anything other than contempt and disdain? He'd proven himself a foul, bellowing beast and yet, she should linger there and caress that canvas. What manner of woman was Lily Benedict, this woman of otherworld perfection? A willowy creature who stood before him in nothing but her night shift, with her braided black tresses flowing down her back. He shifted his weight and the floorboards creaked, revealing his presence. Lily drew her shoulders back, but she remained silent, with her back presented to him. Derek started forward. Lily Benedict, you continue to persist, he drawled. He hitched his leg to correct his awkward stride. She shuffled something in her arms and then with one hand, swatted at her face. Your grace, she said in steady, even tones as she turned to greet him. The sight of her sucked the breath from his lungs and he lost his footing. On a curse, Derek stumbled and caught himself hard against the wall. He grunted. God, how he despised the weak soul he'd become. Lily gasped and the box in her arms tumbled to the floor with a loud bang. Are you all right, your grace? Her long, slender legs ate away the distance between them and she rushed to a halt at his side. She wrapped her hands about his forearms, as though to steady him. Despite the misery he'd cloaked himself in, that protective angriness that kept him safe, a smile pulled at his lips. Did the narrow-waisted, gentle beauty think she could prevent a man of his size from falling? Derek, he corrected. As though she registered the impropriety of her touch, she jerked her hands back and let them fall to her side. Derek, she murmured. Are you all right, Derek? Her husky contralto wrapped around the harsh two-syllable word that was his name, sucking him into a vortex where he wished to lose himself in that soothing, seductive tone. Such a voice was the kind that healed and drove back previous pain. I am fine, he said, harshly. He took in the lady's reddened eyes. She'd been crying. A thousand questions sprung to his lips, but he quelled them. As a man who celebrated his privacy, he'd not press her with questions, he himself would not answer. She stiffened. Seven years of nothing but his miserable self for company had erased all remembrances of those social niceties. Such a detail shouldn't matter. So, why did it? In a bid to end the protracted silence, he bit out, Are you unable to sleep? Lily hesitated and, for a moment, he suspected she'd not answer. Then she inclined her head. I am. And are? I do not sleep, he interrupted. A small laugh escaped her. Of course you sleep. Everyone sleeps. He'd inspired nothing but fear in women since his return. This woman could laugh around him. Power headier than a potent aphrodisiac surged through him. You are mistaken. He stole moments of rest, when he closed his eyes and sought the peace to be had in the unconsciousness. Inevitably, the demons entered, the sharp report of gunfire, the blast of cannonballs, and the agonized screams of the dead and dying, himself. And tonight the demons had come and he was too much of a coward to face them alone. I've been alone for so long. Another long silence met his pronouncement. He shifted his gaze about and then his stare alighted on a crude box at the foot of the painting. She followed his stare and with high color on her cheeks, Lily sprinted over. She dropped to a knee in a flurry of cotton skirts. His gaze went to her trim ankles and the naked soles of her feet. His mouth went dry. He wanted to place his lips on the satiny soft flesh and trail his lips higher, upwards, Derek gave his head a brusque shake. God help him, he was worse than a green boy. He shuffled over and with a slight grimace, lowered himself to the floor beside her and took in the folded notes littering their feet. The muscles of his legs screamed in protest to the uneven pressure put upon his knee and thigh. Derek swallowed back a groan, but not before she heard that faint indication of his misery. Lily froze mid-movement and picked her gaze up. He braced for the pitying look. 
yet, the lady continually threw him off balance. I am surprised you have not scolded me yet, she murmured as she stacked her notes. To give his fingers something to do, Derek picked up several folded sheets. Would it do me any good? A smile pulled at the corners of her lips and the sigh of it roused lightness in his chest. No, I rather think not. She held her hand out and he eyed her outstretched fingers. Desire ran through him. A need to take her hand as she urged and twine it about his neck and... Lily cleared her throat and, bemused, he followed her gaze. Her notes. Of course. Derek made to hand them over, and then registered the pages, these links to who she was. Were they from a lover? It certainly would account for her tear-stained cheeks. A white-hot envy swirled in his belly. The bold, slashing strokes suggested they were in a man's hand. Your grace, she urged. Derek. Reluctantly, he turned them back over to her care. All the while, curiosity aided him to know the contents of those pages she filed away into her box. As he climbed to his feet with slow, precise movements, Lily quickly stood. Once he would have risen and effortlessly guided her. Bitterness twisted in his belly. Now he could barely properly limp down a hall. They stood there a long while, studying one another. I should return to my rooms. Perhaps it was the madness of the midnight hours, or perhaps it was years of solitariness thrust upon a man who'd once very much loved life, but he did not want her to go. Did not want to be alone with his demons. Surely you did not get what you've come all the way below stairs for, he asked when she turned. Lily stopped, her foot hung suspended. Crimson color flooded her cheeks. I came to read through my letters, she said quickly. And then she completed that step. There was the slightest imperceptible pause that hinted at more to her response. What secrets did she keep? Cane in hand, he spread his arms wide. Then, please do not allow me to stop you from your pleasures, madam. She eyed him with wariness that surely came from a lifetime learned of mistrust. Who had put that cynical glint in her expressive eyes? As brave as the day she arrived, Lily squared her shoulders and retreated several steps, and he mourned her departure which would thrust him back into the maudlin thoughts haunting him this evening and a familiar loneliness. She stopped then wheeled back around, that small container held like a pirate's treasure in her arms. His heart thumped with that growing desire to have her near. Will you join me, your, Derek? She didn't want to be alone any more than he himself wanted to be. He balled his hands at his side. He'd spent years erecting protective defenses about his deadened heart. Yet, each moment with Lily Benedict cracked those walls and reminded him of what it had felt like to laugh and love and be loved. It was safer to leave. Over the years, his office had been a sanctuary of sorts. He'd shut the world out of those heavy oak doors. But now, in the madness of night, he wanted her there in a place that had previously only existed for him. Will you come to my offices, instead? She started. Was it shock that as a duke he'd make a request and not a demand? Or was it that she, too, saw he was letting her inside his world? Then, she held her hand out and led the way. Wordlessly, he trailed behind her. Their footsteps fell in a quiet, harmonious rhythm. Lily entered his office and he followed, now knowing how those poor, doomed sailors felt at sea when thrashed against Siren's rocks. Derek hovered at the doorway as Lily moved deeper into the room as though she were, in fact, the rightful owner of this very space. Only a few days, earlier he would have bellowed until she fled. Now, something stirred deep within him at the connection to life she represented. Lily slid her gaze about the room, giving her the look of a one searching for something. Escape, perhaps? He carefully schooled his features as she turned about the room, taking it in, with an assessing manner. Far safer to focus on her distracted movements than the hungering for this slip of lady now raging through him, he followed her curious stare. Interesting, isn't it? His question brought her attention up from the mahogany piece that had commanded her notice. 
A fire still burned in the hearth, casting a faint glow about the room. Derek shoved the door closed and limped over to his sideboard. He poured himself a brandy and then swirled the contents in a small circle. An odd piece, is it not? With his snifter in one hand and cane in the other, Derek limped around his desk to the gilt metal revolving bookcase that had captured her notice. She gave it a slight nod, eyeing it through her endlessly long, dark lashes. What is it? she asked and, at the huskiness underscoring that hesitant inquiry, desire licked away rational thought. Derek forced himself to focus on his ragged breathing. Her hold was born of nothing more than the lust of a man who'd gone years without a woman. Liar. His hands trembled and he set his cane down. Here, he said gruffly and moved over to demonstrate the intricacy of the case. It was designed to contain books. It belonged to my brother. A rusty grin formed on his lips. My brother was not much of a reader. No, George had been a notorious rake more interested in betting beauties and collecting fine baubles than in enriching his mind. Registering Lily's absolute quiet, he glanced up. Her cheeks an ashen hue, she had the look of one close to casting the contents of her stomach. He took a step toward her. Lily? She waved her hand. Fine. He strained to make out that hushed whisper. She cleared her throat. You were saying? Lily set her box down on the edge of his desk and moved around, coming to a stop so that her slender leg brushed his. Charged awareness unfurled at their body's closeness. Heat singed his thigh from where their legs touched and blazed through him, and this was a fire he'd wholly welcome. Compartments, he managed to get out. There are compartments hidden within. He lowered his head and stopped with their lips a hair's breadth apart. He sprung the latch free and his pulse, pounding loudly in his ears, muffled the sharp click. Had he ever been so aware of a woman? In the past, it had been about those fleeting moments of pleasure and instant gratification. With Lily, it was a hungering that seared his soul and ached to know her in every way, forever. His fingers shook slightly as he drew forth the extravagant diamond. He'd never understood the fascination his family had possessed over such fripperies. Lily's breath caught on a gasp. It is beautiful, isn't it, he murmured, examining the forgotten piece. For his own carousing and roguish behaviors, he'd not craved those fine baubles the way his kin had. The coldness of the piece, even now, merely served as a highlight of the equally cold existence he now lived. There is a story that surrounds this stone. One Davies had insisted he know after his previous employer died. It was a story Derek hadn't cared a jot about. It once belonged to the King of France. Derek held it between them. As one, he and Lily dipped their heads, their gazes trained on the diamond worth more than most king's crowns together. The heart twisted on the long, gold chain. It spiraled back and forth, rotating in a half circle and then spinning back again and even in the dark, the opulent gem shimmered and shined. My brother had a taste for fine things. Extravagant things. Lily jerked up so quickly, they cracked heads. She stumbled away from him. He eyed her quizzically as she skirted the edge of his desk. With her long fingers, she brushed them over his desk, his belongings, nearing the handful of letters he did not burn but instead left out as a constant reminder of a friendship gone. He frowned, unnerved by the intimacy of her presence here in a room that had been his shelter and sanctuary for so long. What are you doing? His sharp command brought her up short and from where she stood over by his sideboard, she turned back. I... She wet her lips and his gaze, unbidden, went to her mouth, taking in that slight, seductive movement. The memory of their embrace sucked at his logical thought and desire slammed into him to know the taste of her once more. He suppressed a groan. I am sorry, she said quietly, the evenness of her tone indicated she'd not followed his desirous musings. I find myself wandering when I am nervous. How very interesting. That slight detail revealed made her more than a governess in his employ, but a woman with peculiar habits that made her, her. 
It is fine, he said gruffly, shocking the both of them with his concession. Her keen eyes followed his every movement as he turned the lock and sealed them effectively off from the handful of servants who'd not been run off by his horrifying features and surly bellows. The graceful column of her throat worked as she slid her gaze over to the doorway. Is there a reason you locked the door? There was a faint tremble to her voice. Did she fear him? She'd be mad not to. Are you afraid to be alone with me? He turned a question back at her. Annoyance stirred. Perhaps it was merely the midnight weakness, but he detested a world in which she feared him the same way all others did. Lily rested her palms on the edge of the sideboard. I have long ago learned to be wary of all men. The same warrior's bloodlust that had filled him in battle and made him able to slay men and fellow soldiers ran through him with a powerful force. Men. With that telling word, she spoke of more than her golden-haired Gabriel, an unknown-to-him figure who'd left a mark upon her happiness, and Derek needed to know all those secrets she held close. Nay, he wanted to. Wanted to, when he'd made it a point to not know or care about anyone these many years. Yet this woman had slipped into his household and in a matter of days, captivated him with her bravery. Was he a previous employer, he asked, silently loathing the bastard who'd put this wary hurt in her eyes. She hesitated, but then shook her head once. He was not. That three-word revelation roused a deep-seated, inexplicable jealousy. Derek clenched and unclenched his jaw. It spoke of a former love and a broken heart, and as such, a man he hated. A man whose notes now rested in the box on his desk, then. The urge to stride across the room, flip open that lid, and read about her past, consumed him. When it became clear she intended to say nothing more of it, he spoke. Ah, uh, so it was your Archangel Gabriel, with the face of perfection and magnificent golden tresses? That bloody paragon she'd spoken of, with regret in her eyes. A man he despised for being the perfect man, Derek himself once had been. Lily started. How? Yes, why should he remember such a thing? And his earlier resolve to allow Lily her privacy left him. Who was he? For ultimately, he wanted to know everything there was to know about the spirited, fearless woman who'd braved his lair. Chapter 15 Tell him, tell him, so that when he discovers the crime I've committed, he might at least know why. Tell him, because he deserves that truth. She curled her fingers tightly into her night rail. Derek stepped up to her and ran his knuckles down her jaw and warmth stirred to life within her. In all the ugly, vile couplings with Sir Henry, and even George's rushed, thoughtless attentions, never had she been touched with the tenderness Derek now showed. Her lashes fluttered and she turned into his butterfly-soft caress. How could one of his size and commanding power be capable of such gentleness? This man, called the Beast, who snapped and snarled, who'd also become her defender against his condescending man of affairs. Shane lapped at her conscience. A defender when she'd not deserved it. Not this time. Mayhap at some other point in her life when she'd been pure and unsullied and worthy of that protection. Lily, he prodded. The weight of her lies pressed down, threatening to drag her under with the crimes she'd commit against this man and his ward. For he was no longer a means to her security, he was a man of courage and valor who by the marks he bore had given of himself upon the fields of battle, who knew great hurt and, she would betray him. Lily took a step away and broke that mesmerizing, whisper-soft touch. She hugged her arms close, but her efforts proved futile at driving it back. Where did one begin when confessing the shameful, sinful person they'd become? Where, when it would ultimately mean her ruin, proving her a naive, stupid, chit, once more. A charged energy blanketed the room, as Derek fixed his intent, piercing stare upon her. I am not a lady. He stilled. I am, was, just a vicar's daughter. It was the first time she'd breathed that truth to anyone since she'd boarded that male coach. An aching poignancy filled her. That part of her story had died, when she'd been snipped from the fabric of her family like a bothersome thread at the edge of embroidery. 
unnerved by Derek's singular focus, she strode over to the hearth. I never dreamed of, of. She shot a look over her shoulder. Lofty titles and expensive baubles. Lily returned her attention to the fire. Self-loathing tightened her throat and she struggled for words. I was content to bake in the kitchens alongside the handful of servants and wander the hillside, collecting wildflowers. A grimace pulled at her lips. God, what a pathetic creature she'd been. I was quite fanciful, she said softly, staring down into the dancing flames. The hardwood floor groaned. Her body tingled with awareness as his broad frame brushed against her back. He said nothing, but through his quiet, reassuring presence she found the courage to continue. My father called me a dreamer, she said bemusedly. Among the uglier, more damning charges he'd leveled. Then, her father had always known the manner of person his eldest daughter was. And I was. Derek settled his powerful hands on her shoulders and she borrowed from his strength, another theft she committed. We all begin that way. His breath stirred against her cheek and a fluttering danced in her belly. We are hopeful and optimistic and naive and fail to see the perils of life until we are scarred by them. His words offered a window into what he'd been and she wanted to shove it open and know even more. She tried to imagine him as the young, grinning boy in his portrait. Derek limped over to the spot opposite her. He caressed her cheek. But the truth is we are capable of dark, ugly deeds, all to survive, aren't we? The unerring accuracy of those words raised goose flesh on her arms. For there was no darker act than having deceived a broken man and young child, all in the name of security. Lily mustered words. You speak of your experience on the battlefield, Derek. What I did to survive, a spasm racked her heart, threatening to crush her chest from the pain of it. There was no honor in it. I killed, he said, flatly. His words spoke of a man who knew. A man who'd done horrible, ugly things, all in the name of survival. Anyone who'd merely heard that detached utterance would have taken them as more proof of the Duke of Blackthorne's ruthlessness. It would have fueled the myths and whispers about a duke more monster than man. I killed men and boys. I turned wives into widows and made mothers childless. There was such a cool, emotionless thread to his words that raised the goose flesh on her arms once again. Surely what you did can never be worse than that. And she looked past his words and onto the tight lines at the corners of his mouth, one corner badly burned from the hell he'd lived and even now suffered through. His eye bled the same familiar agony that stared back at her each night in her vanity mirror. No, the Duke of Blackthorn was no monster. He was a very real, broken, man who had more honor than all the other men she'd had the misfortune of knowing in the course of her life. Sadness waited on her chest. The greatest tragedy is that he saw himself in the same, dark light as the other men of his world and not the gentleman of honor and courage and valor. One who, with his words in defense of her actions, continued to defend others. Tell me, Lily, he demanded. How did he know she needed to speak the words aloud? How did he know those secret pieces she'd not even known of herself? He touched his lips to the shell of her ear and her breath caught at the butterfly soft caress. The moment, however so slight, so fleeting, she might have very well imagined it. She gave a jerky nod. I met. I met. Lily layered her palms to the smooth, cool marble mantle, borrowing support. That slight shift broke the contact between their bodies and she welcomed the heat thrown by the blazing fire. Her throat worked. I met your brother. Why could it not have been you instead? Her body jerked. God, in heaven. That silent yearning was illogical and irrational. It was based on but a handful of meetings and exchanges and his kiss and his willingness to defend her in need, Anne. Who did you meet? The gravelly question rumbled up from his chest and she gave thanks as he yanked her back to the moment. Under his questioning, unease stirred within her belly. She'd been fooled by a lord once and proven herself the biggest, naive fool. 
time had aged her. Made her wary. She was not the same innocent she'd been then. She drew in a breath through her lips. I met a nobleman. A, duke. A powerful lord. I was nearly sixteen. Young and foolish and hopelessly optimistic. I believed myself in love and the promises made, and, she forced her inane ramblings to an abrupt cessation. He growled and in his seating, there appeared a quiet fury far more menacing than he'd been any other moment prior. What did he do? For his sharp inquiries earlier, these four words revealed so much more than a powerful duke expecting a glimpse into her past. What did he do? So vastly different than what did you do? For when she'd been discovered with George Rudding between her legs by the town gossip, not her mother, nor father, nor George's mother had seen her as blameless. Instead, she'd been found guilty as the wanton harlot who'd seduced a nobleman who'd never bind himself to a vicar's daughter. And in Derek's question, that slight, but very meaningful, difference set him apart from all others she'd ever known. He did not press her to continue but allowed her to find the words in her own time. How had she ever believed him to be a beast? He promised me marriage. Her lips pulled in the corners in a bitter smile. What a naive fool she'd been. I was fifteen, which is hardly an excuse, she said on a rush. And, I believed him when he promised to go off to Gretna Green with me. He left. She grimaced. Business to see to in London. While he was gone, what I'd done, we'd done, was discovered and my father turned me out. The old horrors of those long-ago days came rushing back with the same potent fear that had gripped her then. Her sister and brothers crying, blending with her pleading, as she'd been ushered out the front door and forever sent away. Desperate to have the telling done, she hastened to finish. Afterwards, I went to him. Her mind balked. For even with this fragile moment of intimacy shared between them, Lily could not drag forth the words to tell the darkest, most painful part of that night. The bite of rain as it stung her skin. The pain of being thrown onto the pavement like rubbish to be swept away, and then climbing into that stranger's carriage. For no respectable man or woman could ever be forgiving of a woman who'd gone from maid to mistress. Agony threatened to tear her apart and she struggled to breathe from the pain of that. In those series of irreversible mistakes, she'd lost all right to the only thing she'd ever wanted in life, a family of her own. Giggling children. A husband. Except, Derek would not allow her those secrets. He guided her slowly around and she braced for his harshly probing stare. Instead, the tenderness of his gaze threatened to shatter her. What happened when you went to him? Her heart trembled, at the gentle insistence in that question. Why could he not be the bellowing, jeering duke she'd first met? Or even the one from moments earlier who'd probed her, seeking the secrets of her past? With the sick shame of her greatest mistakes stabbing at her belly, Lily lowered her gaze to his snowy white cravat, wanting to be free of it. Nay, needing to be free of it. I discovered I was nothing more than a plaything. The shame of that day assaulted her with the same hot humiliation and agonized hurt as years ago. I arrived in London, at his doorstep. A little moan escaped her and she bit her lip hard to stifle any further telling weaknesses. The butler tried to send me round back for scraps. She spoke so quickly her words ran together. I had traveled for six days. I was hungry and scared and I barged inside. I knew if I saw him. She closed her eyes. The foolish hope of George had sustained her through fear. Derek settled his hands on her shoulders and gave a slight squeeze, an unspoken encouragement that brought her eyes open. He did not even remember me, she whispered into the quiet. He did not know my name or care that I'd given him my virginity. Oh, Lily, he said quietly, just that, two words. A tear slipped down her cheek and Derek brushed his thumb over the single drop. It was the night of his betrothal ball. A sound half-laugh, half-sob burst from her lips and she buried it in her fingers. Rotten timing. 
As such he was eager to have me gone. He and his mother, your mother, turned me away. They handed me a purse. As if she'd been a whore in the dials. Three pounds had been her value. I was instructed to never again darken their doorstep. And she hadn't. Until now. She expected a rush of all the oldest hurts and regrets and bitter anger at reliving those moments. Now, dwelling in these walls with Derek and knowing they'd spurned their own son and brother opened her eyes, George and his mother had been soulless. There had been a deficit of their character that was a thing to be pitted. The tension in her chest eased. For the pain of reliving those agonizing moments in her life, there was something freeing and cathartic in breathing the words aloud. Forgiveness, for herself. She slid her eyes closed briefly under this absolution she believed to never know. The Ormolu clock atop the fireplace mantel ticked away the passing of the moments. Derek's soft curse echoed from the walls and she flinched, braced for his icy disdain. This is why he'd inquired. To know, as he should, about the woman whom he'd turned the care of his niece over to. Then, the man whispered about as a cold, unfeeling monster, pulled her tenderly into his arms. Drawing in the deep, sandalwood scent that clung to him, she pressed her cheek against his chest, taking what he offered, selfishly. Taking for once in her life, because she deserved it. It was my own fault, she said, at last claiming ownership of those mistakes. How many years had she spent holding George to blame when, with her impulsivity, she'd proven equally to blame? He palmed her neck and guided her gaze up to his. It was not your fault. He was a heartless cad and you were, but a girl. The icy fury emanating from within his blue eye bespoke of revenge and the threat of retribution. Because of her? When was the last time anyone had believed her worthy? After all, she herself had long since ceased believing in her own value. A chill racked her spine. In a moment, when the ugly truths were told, that fury would be appropriately turned on her. Even knowing that and aching at the thought of his loathing, she owed him even more. Lily stepped out of his arms and when he made to reach for her, she held her palms up. She did not deserve Derek's defense. Then he asked the question that had been inevitable. The one he most deserved an answer to. Who was he? Lily looked down at her tightly clasped hands. That man was your brother, she strained herself to hear those faintly whispered words. Chapter 16 The moments ticked by and those five words danced in the air. For their potency, they may as well have been the distant cannon fire from long ago that still haunted him. Derek stared dumbly at Lily, not processing that whispered admission. She rubbed her hands over her arms back and forth, as though chilled. He let his arms fall to his sides, a hollow emptiness in his belly. The man who deceived her, despoiled her, and ruined her had been, he was my. His voice emerged raspy to his own ears. Brother, she said, her words stronger. She spun away from him and danced like a fake creature avoiding discovery. George, she added, as though he needed the name, as though there was another brother. George. The man she'd loved and given her heart and virtue to had been, George. Perfect, flawless, and charming while living, George had been very much the sought after nobleman. A cold numbness went through him as he sought to work through the complexities of that very truth. He took a step away. And then another. Then another. Until he found himself at the edge of the stone hearth. Numbed by her revelation, Derek stared down into the fire and this time, did not think of the lick of flames on his skin. His breath came hard and fast imagining Lily, a girl of sixteen, alone, at the mercy of his merciless family, and they'd turned her away. He gripped the edge of the mantle and welcomed the sharp bite of wood into the soft flesh of his palms. How she must have hated every member of the Winter's family, and deservedly so. I was young, she whispered misinterpreting the reason for his silence. Dazed, he turned slowly back. Though that is no excuse. Not meeting his eyes, Lily clasped her hands together and studied the interlocked digits. I believed he'd marry me. 
color slapped her cheeks. Did she love George? Did she love his dead, caddish brother, even now? His insides twisted. It was never about being a duchess, it was foolishly about. Her words trailed off and she slid her gaze away. What had it been about? The question screamed around his turbulent mind. With wooden footsteps, Derek returned to her side. It was about what, he urged, harshly, tipping her chin up and forcing her eyes to his. She winced and agony stabbed him. Did she believe he'd condemn her in this moment? Then why should she not? Everyone else before, including her own parents, who should have protected her, had instead turned her out. I thought I loved him. Did you? That gravelly question ripped from somewhere deep inside his chest, where jealousy dwelled for the brother who'd possessed her heart, that blinding emotion lived with a rage for the man who'd stolen her virtue. I was in love with the dream of a man who did not exist. A bitter, broken laugh escaped her. Isn't that the greatest irony? I gave up all for him. A man I hardly knew. Outside, like the cheapest of whores. Her speaking made what they'd shared real, in a way that knifed at him. George had known her smile. The taste of her lips. Except, some of the agonizing pressure waiting his chest eased. George had not known the depth of her soul. Not the way Derek did. Lily glanced down at her hands and spoke, drawing him back from his jumbled musings. I built those moments into something they had never been. And something they could never have been. Not with George who'd taken his pleasure where he wished and then moved on to the next. Women had been no different. Derek thought of Lily, as she would have been, a girl of fifteen, meeting his older brother. With his ducal arrogance and charm, she would have been helpless against George's seduction. What if I had seen her first? What if all those years earlier, he'd actually seen the world in front of him? Lily would have been a bright-eyed girl with a riot of midnight curls, unbroken by life. She would have been a reason to remain in England. A vice-like pressure squeezed at his chest. Then, he'd been too blinded by his pursuit of greatness and fleeting moments with skilled courtesans to notice the vicar's daughter. And through that folly of his youth, George had been there all the while, noticing her, and then, ultimately robbing Lily of her innocence. A heavy curtain of rage descended over his vision, momentarily and completely blinding him to his earlier jealousy and shock. He'd always known there was blackness to his soul, standing here with his mother and brother dead, wishing them to the devil, was now proof of that. A black curse escaped his lips. Lily recoiled. F forgive me. She made to rush around him. Stop, he barked. She immediately complied, her shoulders proudly straightened, even as she avoided his gaze. He studied her through hooded lids. Did she truly know him so little that he'd condemn her for her crimes the way others had? This woman who'd seen beyond the beast and scars to the man? Did she believe him incapable of that same gift she'd given him? What happened after my family turned you out? She wetted her lips and skittered her gaze about. What happened? Her wide-eyed stare put him in mind of a fragile deer trapped in the hunter's snare. Tell me. Coward that he was, he didn't want to hear the truth. Yet he needed it, anyway. Lily threw her arms up. What would you have me say? She spoke in pleading tones and stalked forward in a soft swish of her night rail, emotion burning deep inside her expressive eyes. Would you have me tell you all the vilest, most horrible details? Her lower lip trembled. Would you have me tell you that I was found outside this very townhouse on the street by a powerful gentleman who offered me employment as a maid? The muscles of his stomach spasmed. She hugged her arms to her chest and he ached to take her in his arms. The clock ticked loudly in the corner as Lily stood there, her body so tightly held, a strong wind would likely shatter her. And he knew before she even uttered the words. She drew in a shuddery breath. Would you have me tell you how after two years, the old, kindly gentleman required altogether different services of me? Her words emerged as a faint, broken whisper. Oh, 
God. Even expecting it as he'd been, the words gutted him. Lily, he rasped. How he threatened to turn me out without references and, instead, offered me a place in his bed or nothing at all. She panted. Agony tightened in his belly and he wanted to clamp his hands over his ears to blot out the flood of those gut-wrenching words. She was relentless as she advanced, coming toward him, ravaging him with every word she uttered. Do you want to know the woman you hired to care for your sister's child has been nothing but a whore for the past six years? Her words caught on a sob. Yes, he'd known the words were coming. The self-hatred she wore that could only rival the same he cloaked himself in, stood as testament to her belief she was the whore she spoke of. Even expecting them, however, could not dull the blade of shock that ripped through him. Unable to face her in light of what his brother had visited upon her, Derek slid his gaze away. An ugly slithering of green envy snaked about him. Equal parts jealousy at the man who'd laid claim to her body and burning hatred for the same bastard who'd taken advantage of a young girl sent out alone in the streets, melded into a vicious blend of madness. Then she stumbled back. Her eyes formed round moons as she slapped a hand over her gaping mouth. I w will leave, she said quickly, jerking his attention back. She staggered further away from him, all but sprinting to the door. He'd wager his other eye she'd been running since she was fifteen and, yet, trapped all at the same time. What will you do? His quietly spoken words halted her once more. Lily lifted her shoulders in a little shrug. I will survive, she said in a flat, emotionless tone that sent a chill running through him. She would survive. Just as she'd done for years. When surviving meant sacrificing her body and laying herself open before a base lord who'd take his pleasures with her, for the fleeting security. The maddening bloodlust pounding through his ears was the powerful beat that had pulsed through him in the thick of battle with enemies bearing down on him. He stood stiffly, willing her with his silence to continue. When it became apparent there was nothing more she intended to say on the matter, he took a step toward her, craving the stinging fury and indignation she'd displayed when she'd stormed his household. Why did you not tell me before? A sad laugh escaped her. You would have had me come to you, asking for a position on your staff, after such a confession? Yes, he said plainly and she flinched. I would have you tell me the truth. Come, Derek. She gently chided. You'd have never granted me a position. Would he have? He looked over the top of her head. Would the man he'd been a week ago, the same man who'd sought to destroy his former friend's happiness, have done anything but mock Lily and call her a schemer and a grasper? Shane tightened his belly. He didn't much like the man he'd been. He liked even less the haunting truth of her words. Very well, then. He fixed a probing stare on her, searching? For what? Answers he did not want? Questions he did not know? Why did you come to me? I had no choice. She spoke in such emotionless tones that I skidded along his spine. So tired of serving a base lord's pleasures, she'd come here, to the household no person cared to be, trusting he'd grant her a position. What of your family? He was grateful when she broke across the tense, guilt, gripping him. My father was. She grimaced, is the vicar at your family's estate in Carlisle. A wry, mirthless smile formed on her lips. One can hardly maintain a level of dignity within the parish if the daughter who was discovered by the village gossip remains on as an indelible memory of that day. Oh, God. His gut clenched. Even now, the man who'd turned her out had been, and was in fact, still the vicar on his properties? Her father had turned her away and she'd come to his family. He scrubbed a hand over his face, thinking about the reception she'd received from his mother who'd protected that coveted title of duke for her son like she guarded the gates of a kingdom. Lily would never have received his family's support. And in the end, she'd little recourse but to open herself to some lecherous nobleman who'd taken advantage of a desperate girl. With all the wrongs his family had committed, she'd still shown Derek more kindness than any other person since Toulouse. 
That bastard, he said quietly. Lily gave him a sad smile. No, she said softly. It was not his fault, Derek. She'd defend the coward who'd sired her, even so? There was my sister and my brothers, and what livelihood exists for a vicar whose daughter gave herself to his employer's son, in that public way? He winced, hating that she should defend the man even now. Who'd defended her? Payne threatened to cleave his heart in two. With the truth echoing between them, Derek slid his eye closed. By God, if his brother was not dead, he'd kill him all over again. He'd use his scarred and marred hands to take his limbs apart and then choke him for what he'd done. How you must despise me, he whispered. Lily moved toward him. His body, attuned to her every nuance felt her beyond his shoulder and he faced her. She stood before him pale and uncertain when she'd only been bold and proud. Another spasm racked his heart. What had the winters done to her? I did, she said at last. I hated anyone and everyone who shared his blood. And yet she'd come here anyway. She'd come for employment to be free of her post as mistress, when she deserved far more repayment, of which no amount could ever right the injustices done. Lily took his hands in hers. But then I realized something as I was here. There is Flora. His niece. The sole person of any goodness who shared his blood. And there is you. And there is only good in the both of you. His chest moved hard with the force of his rapidly drawn breaths. For there wasn't good in him. He'd been the same indulgent Lord George had been. Though careful to not litter London with his bastards, Derek had been driven by his own pleasures. If he'd returned and found Lily Benedict on his doorstep, pleading, would he have been the callous bastard his mother and brother had been? Or would he have been the person she deserved? Part of him didn't know the answer to that and it made him hate the whole of himself for it. His throat constricted painfully, making it difficult to swallow. He took a step toward her, wanting to be the one person who'd been there when others had not. How many years had she spent hating herself? As one who'd spent the past seven despising himself so, he recognized that self-loathing in another. It was not your fault, he said quietly. You survived. She stilled like a doe, tracked by hunters. But it was my fault, she shot back, her eyes stricken. I threw away my virtue. That was my decision. I gave myself to Sir. She bit her lip hard and looked away. Because you were young and scared, he said quietly. How could she not see that a vicar's daughter in the ruthless streets of London could not be condemned for the feelings she'd carried? Grief contorted her face. Derek closed the distance between them. He took Lily in his arms and drew her against his chest. She stiffened. What? Asichuch, he whispered against the top of her head. He rubbed his unscarred cheek over the crown of black curls. I did not want to like you, she said, her voice wary with the years of hardship she spoke of. I hated you, she said into the fabric of his shirt the words muffled, but no less powerful. I hated you without even knowing you not because of who you were, but because of who he was. A sob ripped from her throat and then she collapsed against him, weeping. Her body shook like a slender willow in a mighty storm. She cried until her tears soaked the front of his shirt and seeped through the fabric, hot and agonizing. Drops of her despair, guilt, loneliness, and fear. Derek rubbed small circles over the small of her back, allowing her the cathartic healing of her tears. It was a healing she greatly deserved, after the ways in which she'd healed him. When her body stilled and nothing more than a shuddery hiccup escaped her, he reluctantly set her away. Her eyes swollen red to match her flushed, tear-stained cheeks, met his. Derek reached inside his jacket and withdrew his handkerchief. Wordlessly, he turned it over to her. Lily hesitated and then took it. She blew her nose noisily and there was an innocence to that action that filled his heart with lightness, when everything in this Walden garden had previously been dark. So that is the truth. She stared down at the fabric. 
that is who I am. Derek stared at her with her head bent like a repentant sinner. That certainly was how the lady saw herself. You define yourself by the actions of a girl who was but fifteen. And yet, didn't I define Christian by his actions as a boy of eighteen? He started as that staggering realization slammed into him, momentarily sucking the breath from his lungs. Why should Lily have confided in him when he'd proven unbending where his former friends were concerned? Lily spoke and her soft, husky contralto righted his unsteady world. That was who I was, though, Derek. I was impulsive and rash. And desperate. She fiddled with the edges of the soiled fabric in her hands. I'm still that person. There is nothing noble in such a figure. He imagined her more girl than woman alone in London with nothing but her shame and fear, and was stunned by the hungering to drive back the sadness from her eyes. Why should he care about her, this stranger he'd known for a handful of days? Why should he care when the world had ceased caring for him? Because she was different than all the others. She saw him as a man and that shattered the safe walls he'd resurrected about his heart. You expect I'd judge you? She turned her palms up. You are a duke. What a low opinion she carried of the nobility. Given her treatment at those unnamed gentlemen's hands, however, entirely warranted. And she saw him as belonging to their ranks. Only, he'd been cast out of that cold fold long ago and did not want back in. Derek strolled over to his sideboard and fetched a bottle of brandy. I am a beast, he corrected. He held up a glass and she waved a hand dismissively. You are a duke, she corrected once more, with the scolding adamancy befitting her station as governess. As such, these things matter. He poured a snifter full of brandy and the tinkling chime of crystal touching crystal filled the space. If I did not know better, Lily, I would suspect you are seeking to be dismissed from your post? He paused mid-pour and looked up. Is that it? Derek winged an eyebrow upward. Are you looking to be discharged from your responsibilities? An odd pressure settled in his chest. For when she left, there would be no others to speak with him as though he was any other man. No. Her exclamation bounced off the walls the urgency in her tone serving as testament to the truth. She wanted to remain here. The tightness in his chest eased and with it went the hatred he'd carried these years, sentiments, which had sustained him, but not comforted. He poured another glass of brandy and held one out. I do not drink spirits. He paused. I was a vicar's daughter. How innocent she'd been. How trusting. She could never have known the black vileness that was the soul of a gentleman. Men who took their pleasures where they would. Women who desired wealth and power, and craved nothing more than the glossy surface of perfection. Hopeful and trusting, she'd have been no match for a polished rake intent on stealing her virtue. Spirits are occasionally good for you. He urged her with his eyes to accept the liquid fortitude. Darting her tongue out, Lily trailed it over the seam of her lips. She crossed over and then stopped with a foot of space between them. Do you think because I'm a whore, I should drink spirits and, and? Patches of red blazed across her cheeks. And do scandalous things. Derek snapped his eyebrows together. You are no whore, he bit out, abhorring her self-flagellation. How could she not see the strength of her spirit and her will to survive was what defined her and not the action she'd been forced to take. She dropped her gaze to the tips of her bare feet. But I am, she whispered. And you insisting I not speak the words and not speaking them yourself does not make them less true. The blazing hearth cast shadows about the room and danced upon her modest night shift, rendering it nearly see-through. The sight of her froze him. She stood before him with an ethereal beauty that drew him, that made him forget the monster he'd become. We all have done things we wished we'd not in order to survive. It was a lie. Most lords and ladies of the ton lived for their pleasures. The realness of life, and the ugliness of it, escaped most of them who dwelled in a fabricated world of glittering perfection. 
take the drink, he urged and pressed it into her hand. Lily gripped it with such intensity, her knuckles went white. She looked into the amber contents. Why are you being so nice to me? Her whispered words reached his ears and into the soul he'd thought long dead. Why will you not turn me out, when I'm not fit to care for a child? Do you see a beast when you look at me? Lily yanked her head up. No. The denial exploded from her lips and lit her eyes with fiery emotion you are no beast. Why, he said with dry humor. Half of my face has been burned off, ladies turn in disgust. Even my own mother could not stomach the sight of me. How is that not a beast? You were the marks of honor for battles you fought. Her passionate defense lent her words a tremor. That is what I see. Ah, she saw a hero, just as so many were wont to do. Yet, even when the papers had honored those fallen soldiers and the men who'd rushed off to battle Boney's forces, they'd been less forgiving when those men had returned maimed. Derek swirled the contents of his glass. You fought your own battles, too, did you not? Her frown deepened. Then said, it is different. Ah, uh, but is it? He spread his arms wide. This is how the world sees me, and this is how I see myself, and yet you should see differently? Why is that? Lily pursed her lips. Because there is more to a person than their physical perfection. It is the goodness of their soul. So she thought her soul dark and long past redemption? A familiar vice tightened once more. You do not see the beast. You see the man. He held her gaze with his. Just as I do not see a whore, he said quietly. The long, graceful column of her throat moved. I see a woman and a survivor. And perhaps that is why we two can move along in some harmonious rhythm when I despise all who cross my path, because we are not unlike. Her chest rose and fell with the force of her deeply drawn breaths and then, for the first time since he'd stumbled upon her this evening, her bow-shaped lips tipped up, ever so slowly at the corners, with an allure Eve herself could not have rivaled. Thank you. He snorted and waved his drink. I do not want your thanks. I want you. I want to possess your body and soul, binding mine with yours until we heal one another's brokenness. His hand shook so badly, liquid splashed over the rim and stained his fingers. He quickly set the snifter down on a nearby table. Lily held out his handkerchief and the ghost of a smile pulled at his lips. It is yours, he murmured. Of course, she said quickly and balled the white cloth in her hand. She stood before him uncertain and doubting. Doubting him and her self-worth and it made him hate his brother all over again. Oh, Lily. Derek scrubbed a hand over his face. I hate that my brother knew you in ways that only I want to, he said quietly. She stilled, looking like a skittish colt, one wrong word from bolting. To give his hands something to do, he grabbed his cane and thumped it upon the floor. And I detest that another used your fear and desperation to take from you as he did. And I despise even more that both of those men knew your lips and the feel of your skin and the lavender scent that belongs to only you. Her lower lip quivered and a single teardrop slipped down her cheek. Followed by another. And another. She made to turn, but he shot a hand out, folding his larger fingers about her delicate wrist. Emotion wadded his throat, making it nearly impossible to draw forth words. But they did not know you. They didn't truly know you in the ways I do. They knew your body, but they didn't know the strength of your character or the beauty in your soul. They didn't touch you in the ways that matter. In that, you belong to only me and I'd have it remain that way. He braced for the terror of that admission, but instead, there was a freeness that buoyed him, lifted him at last from the darkness he'd been mired in for so long. Chapter 17 in the following days, Lily and Derek had settled into a natural, harmonious rhythm. During the day, she was governess to Flora, meeting with him, now, daily, about the girl. He would both listen and ask questions, and in his questioning he revealed a deeper and deeper regard for the child. During the nights, 
they sat in a companionable silence within his office, reading and talking. And in those moments, she could make herself believe that this was real. That they could be more. But how many times had she been prey to rash, impulsive emotion? Twice before, she'd trusted gentlemen who'd promised her security and had ultimately taken everything from her. That recklessness had found her nothing but despair. Wanting Derek as she did, she could not be blinded by this need of him, for him. Lily stared blankly at her door handle and before her courage flagged, she opened the door and stepped outside. An eerie darkness served as her only companion this night. In the dead of night, the devil comes to play. Lily crept down the halls of Derek's silent townhouse, that haunting warning given her and her siblings by their stern father seemed never more true. The lit sconces cast eerie shadows upon the wall and a shiver worked down her spine. Lily, however, had found the devil came in all shapes and forms, but was invariably a role filled by men. And never were her father's words truer than they were on this day. Quickening her stride, she hurried down the hall and paused briefly at the servant's stairs, before continuing on. Her bare feet padded silently down the stairs, noiseless. This was the house she'd imagined entering. Quiet. Devoid of life. No servants underfoot. That was the home she'd imagined, but one that this impressive space had proven altogether untrue. For there was life in Derek and Flora, and servants, loyal and good to the lonely little girl who dwelled in this cheerless home. And she'd betray them all. Even after she bared her soul to him and he'd understood, she would commit this crime against him. Yet the truth remained. With his unquestioning support and forgiveness for her shameful actions all those years ago, he could never forgive what had brought her into this house. Not truly. His friendship with the Marquess of St. Cyr, a man he'd known for years and years, only to sever him from his life, was testament of that. Lily adjusted the box in her arms, the one containing letters of her past and bitter shame stung her throat. She carried about this box with the letters she'd written, as nothing more than a ruse to hide the item she'd steal. She reached the base of the stairs and shifted her burden. The chill of the hardwood floor stung her feet. Holdsworth's promise of security and Derek's visage warred for supremacy. Lily stood with her gaze trained on the door. If she did not do this thing, her life was forfeit. Lily shoved the door open and stepped out into the corridor. Soundless as the grave, she made her way through the halls. The eyes of his ancestors, memorialized in paintings, followed her with their accusatory, haughty stares. She cast periodic glances up at those bewigged, bejeweled former dukes and duchesses. How long she'd spent despising everyone who'd ever shared the blood of that late duke. Only to find that Derek and Flora were nothing like the two who'd tossed a bag of coin at her feet, without a worry about whether she'd live or die. Lily came to a stop outside a familiar door, one that had once roused terror. This time, a breathless anticipation ran through her, a hungering to see him. She rapped softly. Please be in there. Please be here when I need you to be more than ever. For if he was not, then her being in his private office was a violation of a place he sheltered himself away from hurt. Silence reigned. She knocked once more. Be there. Please. Except, there was no answer. It was as though the fates taunted her, mocked her with the equal part promise, equal part threat. Lily bit down hard on her lower lip. My brother had a taste for fine things. Her body jerked reflexively as Derek's whispered words called forth the vile remembrance of the man who'd set her on a path of ruin. Fingers shaking, Lily reached for the door and pressed the handle. Before her courage deserted her, she stepped inside. She quietly closed the door behind her. Lily blinked several times, giving her eyes a moment to adjust to the hauntingly dark space. She looked to the leather-winged back chair and the now-empty hearth. Her heart slipped at finding those folds empty of the man who so often occupied them. Setting her box down on the smooth surface of Derek's desk, Lily cast a glance back at the closed door. 
Her heart thundered hard in her breast, as she braced for Derek to leap from the shadows with the word thief on his lips. Silence served as her only company. With a deep breath, Lily approached the intricate, revolving case. I do not have to go forward with this. I could disappear and Derek will likely never remember I was ever here. A spasm of pain struck her heart. He will remember. He will remember because he let you inside, when he'd shut the whole world out. And you would betray that gift. She flinched. His opinions were formed of sugar with nothing more than a cold, London rain to take down that fabricated world. Lily gave her head a disgusted shake. Before her courage deserted her, she fiddled with the hidden compartments revealed by Derek. Her fingers trembled so badly, she couldn't free the inner latch. Then a faint click resonated about the room. The slight sound should have filled her with a sense of gratification. Instead, as she withdrew, the magnificent bobble men had fought over, nothing but a hollow emptiness settled in her chest. Lily turned the piece over in her hands. So, this is what she'd sell her honor for, worth far more than those thirty pieces of silver earned by another shameful sinner. Even in the dark, the massive diamond glittered and shimmered. Lily closed her eyes a moment and then with swift movements, she closed the compartment and deposited the heirloom into her box, where it settled with a noisy thump atop those unread letters. She stared emptily down at the notes and diamond. With a soft curse, she snapped the case closed. It was done. And yet. Lily lifted the lid once more. And yet, at the same time, nothing was certain. She didn't know which man she served, Holdsworth, who'd ruin her for failing to help him or the Duke, who'd proven himself to be one who'd not judge her for the mistakes she'd made. A man who'd kissed her with tenderness as though he found her special, when the marks on her soul proved she was anything but. With lines of right and wrong blurred and melded, she no longer knew what was truly of importance. For so long, she'd been sustained by revenge and survival. In all that time, she'd imagined nothing mattered more than survival. She'd muddled through the mess that was her life with the hope of escaping this cold, emotionless world where she was nothing more than a willing body to a powerful peer. But what life was worth living without honor? I will not do this. Lily reached for the diamond tucked inside her case, but froze. The neat stack of notes beside that box gave her pause. Diamond momentarily forgotten, she picked up an ivory note, and turned the thick, folded sheet over in her hands. She lingered a moment on the unfamiliar crest that hinted a powerful peer was the owner of those words. She'd really no place reading Derek's private notes and, yet, a part deep inside craved information about the solitary man who'd shut himself away from the world. Lily ran her fingertips over the name marked in black ink, the strong, bold strokes, belonging to a man. She stole another glance at the door and then shoving aside guilt, opened the note. Derek. I can owe you nothing more than my deepest regret for my inadequacy that resulted in the scars you carry. You were a friend to me, closer than a brother, and for all the times and ways you saved my worthless life in battle, you gave one of the greatest sacrifices. I would take all that pain if I could. Instead. Heart thundering, she hurriedly skimmed her gaze over the note, mouthing the words written by the Marquess of St. Cyr. So that is what happened, she whispered into the quiet. Society whispered about the person he'd become, but failed to honor what he'd done to be so transformed. For his protestations of the contrary, he was, in fact, a hero. A woman who'd show up on my doorstep and demand the post of governess would take to snooping through my notes and not ask those questions herself? The sound of a harsh, furious voice sounded from the doorway, snapping her attention up. Lily gasped. The note slipped from her fingers and sailed silently to the stack. She spun about. Her heart picked up a frantic beat. Derek stood framed in the doorway. He shifted, leaning over his cane, and glared at her with such dark ferocity that an unwitting terror stirred in her breast. This was not the gentle, caring man she'd come to care for, but rather a savage, fierce beast. The kind who'd take apart any person who'd wronged him. 
Her gaze flew to the damning case, open on his desk. With hasty movements, she snapped the lid, closed. Oh, God. You, she breathed and backed away from that box, foolishly hoping he'd take chase and fail to note the piece that bore evidence of her thievery. He stood there, coolly unaffected, assessing her from under thick, dark lashes. D. Derek, she managed to force out that whisper. For in this moment, with austere fury emanating from his frame, this coldly aloof stranger bore no hint of the gentleman who gently claimed her lips and caressed her shoulders as she'd told him some of the darkest pieces of her story. In this moment, he was the feared, fabled beast of Blackthorn and never more did she want to flee than she did just then. She eyed the open door contemplating escape, but with his broad, powerful frame between them, she'd never make it past. Nor could she leave that damning box behind. As though he'd followed the cowardly direction of her thoughts, never removing his gaze from her, Derek shoved the door, closed with the bottom of his cane. She jumped at the soft click and backed up a step. Why you are awake. As soon as the words escaped her lips, she flinched at the damning quality of that statement. I told you, Lily, I never sleep. She bit down on her inner cheek hard, unable to make anything of his eerily quiet tone. Yes, he had said as much, but she'd still known from her time in his household that in the early morn hours, when the black night sky reigned, he sought out his own chambers. She just failed to know he actually returned to his offices. Lily cursed her folly in entering these rooms. I, I find myself as struggling to sleep as well. Those were the truest words she'd given him since he'd discovered her this night. Though with him here, she couldn't dredge forth a thought of Holtworth's plan or that cursed diamond, but rather Derek. Even terrifying as he was, she desired him, still. She grimaced. What hold did he have over her? His cane thumped a terrifying rhythm as he limped purposefully forward. And so you thought you would come into my office and go through my personal notes. Lily gripped the fabric of her night rail hard. His was no question. It was a lethal-edged statement that dried her mouth with terror. This was a man who'd never pardon one who'd lied to him, deceived him, even if her reasons for being here were driven by the need to survive. No, he was not a man who took to interlopers in his world and she'd invaded his refuge yet again, and this time, in the dead of night, like a thief from the dials. You've nothing to say? he asked, closing the space between them. Her body thrummed with an awareness of the heat pouring off his powerful frame. He came around the desk and unnerved by her response to him, she retreated, too late. Her back knocked against the wall. I did not know there was a question there. She wetted her lips. Furthermore, I expected if they were of a deeply personal nature, which they clearly were from the pieces revealed on that page, you would keep them tucked away as she did her own notes. God, the chit was brave. What other man, woman, or child could be caught snooping through those intimate pages, and then stand so proudly before him with her shoulders back and her chin tipped at a mutinous angle? Panicky tension thrummed inside him, a sense of being exposed and wanting to run. Of wanting to retreat and roar all at the same time. In reading those notes sent round by St. Cyr and Maxwell, She'd uncovered a piece of him he'd never shared with others, pieces he'd never intended to share with anyone. Instead, through her own curiosity, she'd stolen that and he didn't know what to do with that truth. He was torn between tossing her out on her arse and taking her lips under his in a fiery explosion of passion and he hated that she should rouse feelings of anything in his deadened chest. Derek lowered his head. Do you think I am amused by your presence here? He stretched that inquiry out on a steely whisper. Her breath caught loudly, and the faint puffs of nervous air caressed the scarred portion of his face. And no. His neck went hot at those secret parts she now knew of him. The men he'd called friends whom he'd gone off to fight Boney's forces, with were men he'd consigned to the grave that was the battlefield of Toulouse. He did not speak of them and they'd ceased to exist. Now, her knowing of them and that day, made it impossible to forever bury that. Do you think I care to have my personal notes read? He felt exposed. Splayed open in ways he despised. And no, I did not, M. 
What do you want? he demanded. Wanting her answer to be. You, she said quietly. He shot his eyebrows up, as with her quiet admission, the fury went out of him. Lily, he began, his voice garbled. And Lily leaned up on tiptoe and kissed him. He stiffened. The cane slipped from his fingers and he shot his arms out, not knowing what to do with the malleable, pliant body pressed to his. She moved her mouth over his with the hunger and desire of a woman who wanted him in all his flawed ugliness. She twined her fingers into his hair and drew his head closer, making love to his mouth in a way that no one had even before the war. As though she wanted to taste him and lose herself forever in his kiss and this explosive exchange of want. It was the homecoming he'd been denied years earlier, found now in her arms. With a groan of surrender, he met her kiss with the same hungry intensity that had dogged him from the moment she'd stuck her foot inside his office door and refused to be turned away. He thrust his tongue deep in her mouth and she boldly met it. Their tongues danced and twisted in an erotic rhythm that sent heat rushing to his shaft and it throbbed to life. It had been so long since he'd had a warm, desirous woman in his arms. But this passion between them was about more than two bodies meeting and it was all the more terrifying for it. Derek drew his lips away and she cried out in protest. We should not do this, he rasped. You are a member of my staff. I will die if you stop. Her breath came in gasping pants. She twisted her fingers in his hair and dragged his mouth back to hers. Then abruptly, he pulled away and she cried out, but he shifted his attention down to the soft skin of her neck, sucking at the flesh until her legs buckled. Effortlessly, Derek caught her to him and then guided her to the edge of his desk. Whimpering, Lily braced her palms on his chest. You are a siren, Lily Benedict, he whispered against her mouth. In one fluid movement, he stretched her arms over her head and guided her down atop the surface. She looked at him through thick, black lashes. Passion clouded her aquamarine eyes, momentarily freezing him with the evidence of her wanting. I... His chest tightened. Want you, Derek, she whispered. What was to account for this inexplicable rush of disappointment? Tamping down the fool, irrational sentiment. Did he think she would speak words of love? Derek dragged his mouth down the long curve of her neck, lower. He loosened the ties of her wrap and cursed the tremble to his fingers that made a muck of his efforts. Here, she whispered. Lily reached between them and easily freed the neat tie. She shrugged out of the modest garment. Derek drew back, wanting to worship the view of her in this way as he'd longed to since she'd first proven herself unafraid of the monster and desirous of the man. The generous swell of her breasts pressed against the white fabric and the cool night air pebbled the tips of those perfect mounds. Mouth dry, he palmed one of those generous swells. Her lashes fluttered wildly as he cupped and caressed her right breast. He toyed with the peak. A shuddery moan slipped past Lily's lips and desire coursed through him once more. Driven by the breathy sounds of her longing, Derek shoved the fabric down her frame, bearing her naked breasts, to his gaze. The engorged pink tips beckoned and on a groan, he lowered his head and claimed that top bud between his lips. He drew it deep and sucked. Lily cried out and clenched and unclenched her fingers in his hair, anchoring him close. Do not stop, she pleaded. He could not if the earth's movement depended upon him stopping. Never, he pledged. There was an added thrill of masculine satisfaction in knowing that his scars did not matter and that he could bring her to a keening woman, aflame for him. He shoved her night rail further down her body until she lay bare before him. Their chests rose in tandem as they assessed one another. Never before had he damned his lost vision more than he did just now. Even with the veil of night and one missing eye, the resplendent beauty of Lily in her naked form sucked at him. Derek cupped her breast once more and then continued his quest, downward, skimming her flat, smooth belly, and then he palmed the thatch of black curls that shielded her femininity. Lily cried out and she lifted her hips to meet his touch. You are perfection, he whispered, his tone ragged, when everything in her words and body and tone were soft and gentle. 
I, I am not, she rasped, as he slid a finger into her wet channel, her skin the smooth cream white that men wrote sonnets over and worshipped with words. Had he been that man from long ago, he would have had all those words to give her. He was a shell of the man he'd been, and yet, with her, for the first time in years, he felt alive, because of her. Lily pushed herself upright. I want to see you, she whispered, running her fingers along his jaw and then gripping the lapels of his jacket. Derek swiftly wrapped his hands about her wrists, wringing a gasp from her. He gave his head a terse shake. Even in the heat of passion, with his body aching to claim her, he could not. I am. His throat constricted. She shook her head. Confusion, mixed with desire clouded her eyes, as she urged him to speak. I am a monster, he said through stiff lips. I am scarred. The fire lit by St. Cyr's misfired volley had badly burned the upper portion of his chest and singed the hair from his ruined body. Oh, Derek, she whispered. She leaned up once more and took his lips in such a fleeting, gentle kiss, that emotion stirred in a heart she, in her short time here, had proven was very much alive. How can you still not see? You are beautiful for the sacrifices you made. She shoved his coat off and touched her lips to the skin exposed above the fabric of his white shirt. You are beautiful for the courage to survive such pain and despair. She slid his shirt up and the cool night air slapped his skin. Shame licked at him. With his disfigured body and missing eye, he was the beast society whispered of and she deserved more than to lie with a monster. He made to pull back, but she pressed her lips to his chest and the fight went out of him on a sharp exhalation. Lily stretched her arms up to divest him of his shirt. She tossed it to the floor and then froze. The clock ticked away the moments. Seconds stretched on to minutes, which may as well have been hours. Never before had he been so exposed before another and, now with her eyes trained on the red and white puckered flesh, he was open to this slip of a woman in ways that left him shaking. Oh, Derek, she whispered. His body went taut as she moved, braced for her flight. He'd not blame her. He understood the horror, the fear, and yet, he'd mourn her loss, the way he mourned the loss of that very flesh. Except. A hiss slipped from his teeth. What are you doing? He rasped. S-H-H. Lily touched her lips to the scarred and marred skin. His body convulsed at that tender caress. I am a monster. You are a man and a beautiful one, she said quietly, trailing kisses over the burns that had nearly ended him and the ones he'd spent so many years wishing had finished him for good. Better to die on that field than to return to this cold, lonely world where all feared him and most whispered of him. Only, she did not. She touched him and spoke to him in ways that reminded him of all the wondrous reasons that life was worth living. Derek closed his eye and raised trembling hands. He cupped her neck as she continued to move her lips over his body. Men are not beautiful, he whispered. Lily paused in her ministrations and looked up. He wanted to cry out in protest and plead with the last vestige of his pride for her to continue. No. Most are not. She placed her mouth against the flat disc of his nipple. But you are. He'd thought her a siren or a temptress, but the truth was she was something more. She was an angel who'd come to heal. A rusty smile turned his lips up, unrestrained and painful for the lack of use. And this from a man who'd embraced the dark and commiserated with the devil all these years. Lily froze and with a question in her expressive eyes, met his stare, what is it? It is, everything. You are everything. You are hope and happiness, and the taste of living, and I am a man long starved, aching to feast on that offering. For the first time, I feel alive, he said quietly. Chapter 18 How were their thoughts a mirror harmony of one another's? This was the first he'd felt alive? Being here in his home and in his arms, this was the first she'd ever felt alive, as well. Because of him. 
She'd lain with two men and neither of them with their hurried, thoughtless touches had caused this liquid heat to pool between her thighs and fueled her with desperation to know, more. Lily lay back upon the smooth surface of his desk and held her arms up. Unhesitantly, Derek covered her in one fluid motion. His lips were everywhere, working over her neck, her breasts. The drag of his mouth teased with the promise of more, and she bit her lip to keep from crying out. Then he laid the sensitive tip of her breast and she screamed, her voice echoing off the high ceiling. As he worshipped that tender bud, heat spiraled through her and the throbbing grew to an incessant, inexplicable ache. One she did not understand, one that left her oddly empty and desperate and frantic for surcease. He made to pull away and she wrapped her arms tight about him. Don't, she rasped. Derek offered her the first taste of passion, a passion she'd never imagined herself capable of and she selfishly wanted it to go on forever. Don't stop. How many entreaties had she made in her life? This, however, was the most meaningful. This was the pleading that had led Adam and Eve to that fabled fruit. It was driven not of despair and fear but of a pulsating rapture and bliss that threatened to consume her and one she desperately craved. You are perfection. Derek's breath stirred against the swollen nipple. You are all things beautiful. He layered his cheek against her breasts. Your beauty reaches to your soul. His voice, gravelly and tender words, rolled together, raised tears. She'd spent so long hating herself that she'd begun to believe herself ugly in all the ways that mattered. Uttered in that gruff tone, she could almost believe he saw perfect in her imperfect soul. Would he still see my soul as beautiful if he knew what brought me into his life? Lily jerked. What is it? He picked his head up and probed her with his eye. She gave her head a shake. I, I want to know all of your touch. Despite the others to come before him, this was the first time she'd spoken those words in truth. With the one bumbling time she'd known George, there had been pain and awkwardness. With her protector, she'd simply been a receptacle for his lust. He'd not cared of, or about, her pleasure. Unlike Derek. Love suffused her heart. I love him. My God, I love him. Later, there would be time for the proper terror. For now, this moment was all that mattered. And you shall, love. Her heart caught at that endearment. A slow, seductive grin curved his lips, hinting at the man he would have been years earlier, a rogue, a charmer, who could capture hearts and bodies and leave a lady quivering with the force of her desire. And irrationally, even with her own sordid past, she hated every single one of those women for having known pleasure at his hands, wanting this exchange to be just as special to him as it was to her. He returned his attention to her body. He swirled his tongue around her navel and her hips shot off the desk. Derek. How could such an innocuous movement have this maddening effect on her senses? The softness of his mouth on her belly like satin dipped in sunshine with a power to burn her from the inside out. He continued on. His mouth hovered above the apex of her thighs. Lily pushed herself up on her elbows as he rubbed his cheek over the curls shielding her from his attentions. W. H. Watt. S. H. H., he whispered. And then a keening cry ripped from somewhere deep inside her as he buried his face between her legs and thrust his tongue into the hot, wet heat created by his mastery. He moved his expert mouth, like a skilled swordsman with a rapier. Desire drained the energy from her limbs and her arms went out from under her, and she gave thanks for the hard surface at her back. She laid there, a bundle of thrumming nerves as her pressure built in her belly and spread lower to that place he now worshipped, capable of nothing but feeling. She was burning from the inside out and that blaze had driven back anything but that deliberate thrust and parry of his tongue. Derek thrust his tongue once more in a masterful invasion and an agonized groan spilled from her lips. Lily tangled her hands in his hair, holding him close. She'd served as a vessel for other men's lust, but never had a single one of them taken the time to awaken her body as Derek did now. She wanted him to both stop and go on forever. 
She wanted him to continue nibbling at the nub of her womanhood and thought she might die from a blissful explosion if he did. Passion swamped her senses as a thick cloud of desire darkened her vision, and then her body was climbing higher and higher in a way it had never soared before, and if he stopped, she would shatter into a million shards of nothingness. And then he drew back. No, she cried out, thrusting her hips wantonly, pleading with her eyes to bring her whatever gentle gift he dangled before her. Esajic, he whispered, dragging his mouth up the inner seam of her thigh, trailing his lips in a shameless promise up to her breast. Trust me? Her eyes slid closed. I, Lily's words ended on a shocked gasp as he stood and shoved his breeches down. The protest died on her lips as he kicked them aside and then captured her in his arms. Cradling her against his chest, he limped across the room and then sat in that leather-winged back chair he'd occupied a week, a lifetime ago? Upon her arrival here. He adjusted her so that her legs straddled his hips. A strand of sweat-dampened hair tumbled across his brow. Lily brushed it back. How had she ever been afraid of him? How had she seen a monster and beast when he possessed a tenderness that made mere men heroes? He cupped her neck and pulled her forward to avail himself to her mouth. They thrust their tongues in a matched rhythm and in a desperate bid to be closer to him, Lily pressed herself to his chest. He slipped his hand between her legs and she moaned into his mouth. Derek only deepened their kiss, swallowing that sound. His fingers continued their delicious dance within her so that she was rising higher once more, so near to attaining something she'd never known before, but she wanted more of him. She wanted more than the explosion of passion but rather wanted to know that explosion with him buried inside her. She parted her legs and came up on her knees over him. Lily, he rasped drawing back. Esichuch, she whispered as she took control of their loving. She slid forward and he shot his hands out. Clasping her hips he guided her down on his long, thick length. She slid her eyes closed at the absolute fulfillment as he stretched her, sliding inside until he was buried so deep she no longer knew where he began and she ended. Lily leaned close, savoring the pulsing of his shaft as it throbbed against the walls of her womanhood. A dark lock fell over his damp brow and she brushed it back, taking a moment to study him. His chest rose and fell rapidly and he clenched his eye tight as though he suffered the greatest pain. Her heart hitched. And yet, it was that very greatest pain, the kind where ecstasy and agony melded so reality ceased to be and only inexplicable feeling remained. She layered her palm to his cheek and he opened his eye. Her own passion and aching desire reflected in the sapphire depths. Then, with their gazes locked and no words between them, Lily began to move. She undulated over his rigid shaft, lifting her hips in a slow, deliberate rhythm that wrenched a groan from his throat. He clenched his eye tight, as though in blissful agony, and she knew because it was the most delicious kind of hurt and she wanted to forever know it with this man. Lily increased her speed, rising and falling over him. In and out. She bit her lip, wanting that elusive gift he'd held out, wanting it desperately. Then he raised her breast to his lips and suckled the engorged bud. A scream spilled from her as he worshipped the sensitive, swollen tip. He was relentless, sucking, drawing it between his teeth, and then he shifted his attentions to her previously neglected nipple. He rolled it between his thumb and forefinger, gently tugged at it, and with those movements, her pleasure spiked. He brought her up higher and higher, once more, so that all she wanted was to explode and then collapse into the promise of his touch. It fueled her movements, and she ground against him with a franticness born of desire for him and his skilled ministrations. That is it, he groaned and claimed her lips again in a hard kiss. Come for me, he demanded. I never knew this. For this magical meeting of their bodies, uttering those words slapped her with the reminder of who she'd been. He held her gaze. You never what? The eye that held hers belonged to an unrelenting military man who'd not have his questions or wishes, Gaines said. He was possessed of a strength and power that liquefied her to the core, all the more. I never knew it could be like this, she whispered. 
A flare of masculine satisfaction lit that eye and then, caressing her buttocks with his strong hands, he rammed himself upward and he slid even deeper into her. She matched his movements. Sweat fell into her eye, stinging and blinding and she blinked it back needing to see him as her heart raced and her body raced ever onward, onto that elusive light. And then her body exploded about him and she was coming in long, rippling waves of white ecstasy so her body was reduced to a fire of pleasure that spread throughout her being. She was screaming and on a long, guttural groan he spilled himself, flooding her with his hot seed, and the pulsating length of him rang another blissful cry from her lips. Lily collapsed against him. Her breath came in quick, gasping spurts. Tears dotted her eyes as she buried her cheek against the hard wall of his chest matted with springy black curls. No man had ever cared whether she knew pleasure. For she hadn't mattered. And in this, Derek had given her a gift. The gift of passion. When they'd come together, she'd convinced herself that theirs was just a meeting of bodies, a man and woman coming together of desire, wanting nothing more than the pleasure to be had in that intimate joining. Tears popped behind her lids and she pressed her eyes closed. Only she'd been wrong. A single tear escaped, lost against his skin, as reality intruded. For though he'd given her the gift of passion, she wanted something far more from this man, she wanted his heart. God help her. I love him. Chapter 19 She is crying. Her tears trickled through the hair matting his chest. Derek fluttered a hand about her back. He'd been so alone in the world, he'd long ago ceased to believe there was another soul who could bear to be in the same room as him, let alone press their flawless body to a scarred one in this most intimate of ways. In his youth, he'd known how to soothe, cajole, and tempt. He was not that man. Using his body to bring a woman pleasure was a skill he possessed. Being anything more eluded him. For the simple reason he'd not had to be more, until Lily. Until she'd stormed into his life just a week earlier and made him yearn, for life and a kindred connection to another soul, and her. With Lily, he wanted to know the words to soothe her hurts. He wanted more than her body. He wanted to know the reason for those tears and how to drive them back. His chest rose and fell and he concentrated on his breathing and searched deep within himself to be more, for her when he'd been nothing for anyone, in so very long. Derek settled his hands upon her back. Using one palm to hold her close, the other he ran up and down her spine in a smooth, rhythmic motion. Her tears came all the more, soaking him while her small, narrow shoulders shook from the depth of her emotion. And yet, not a sound left her lips and there was something gut-wrenching in her silent misery. How long had she been alone in her feelings? She brought her hands between them and curled them against her face. Lily, he whispered, wanting to take away her hurt, but not wanting to silence the deserved, cathartic cleansing of her tears. Her slender body shook like a fragile tree in a violent storm. And through it, he held her. She continued crying and the moments ticked by. Then on a shuddery sob, she stopped and curled on his lap the way a stray cat in search of affection might. Derek folded an arm about her shoulders and scooped her under the knees, bringing her close. Th thank you, she whispered. He stilled. I, I did not believe it could be like this. I know I am a wh. A strangled sound escaped him and he touched his fingertips to her lips, staying the remainder of those words. It was a sin that for the courage of her spirit that she'd only seen the darkest act she'd committed, an act of survival. And yet it should be, to her, as the most important part of who she was. But it is true, she whispered. It is what I am. Agony knifed at his gut. Those words uttered once more, in a decisive way where she played judge and executioner to herself for those acts. The same as he'd done to himself. How long had he spent hiding himself away from the world and living in these very walls, perpetuating society's worst expectations of him? He looked a beast, therefore, he must be one. It had taken Lily and Flora to show him there were some who could see past the marks he wore upon his person and into the man he'd been and, more, the man he wanted to be. 
Derek continued rubbing small circles over her silken skin. What you did to survive can never be undone, he said at last. Just as I cannot change what I did to, his gut tightened. He'd not allowed himself to think of Christian, the Marquess of St. Cyr and Lord Maxwell in those lights anymore since he'd been carried off the battlefield. Lily angled her head and looked up at him. You're what, she prodded with a gentleness that clogged his throat with pained emotion. My friend, the words came out gruff and harsh. Words he'd not uttered. His friend. Christian had been his friend, and hating so much what he'd been transformed into from that one unwitting accident, Derek had been unable to stomach the sight of either of the men he'd called friends. She cast a glance over at his desk. The gentleman who wrote those letters. He gave a curt nod. Before Lily, he'd have roared the townhouse down had anyone read those intimate missives. This, her knowing, had a sense of rightness. She belonged in his world and he ached to belong to hers. Tell me, she urged and just as though he'd known when she needed to weep, she knew he needed to share his life with someone. And God, he wanted it to be her. Derek drew in a shaky breath and searched his mind for a place to start. We were young and foolish, he began. Then, weren't the two inextricably the same? In a man's youth, he believed himself undefeatable and capable of nothing but greatness. One didn't see their own mortality at the young age they'd been. Nay, man tempted fate with his recklessness, until fate ultimately proved the lie. She slipped her hand into his and gave an encouraging squeeze. Taking that silent support, he continued. Christian and Tristan and I were closer than brothers. Even his own brother, George, now dead and gone, had been more of an aloof stranger since he'd stepped from the nursery into his father's fold, to learn his responsibilities as a future duke. We were sought after and full of our own self-worth. How many years had he spent carousing and womanizing? He'd been no different than the nobleman who'd seen a beautiful woman, a desperate woman, and thought of nothing but his own desires. He'd brought those women to heights of great pleasure, but beyond that, he'd never spared them a thought. He'd never considered what had brought them to a place where they'd forsake marriage and a respectable future for his enjoyments. What is it, she prodded. He cleared his throat. We were bored noblemen. Just like that bastard who'd identified a girl alone, a younger, equally beautiful version of this woman before him. All second sons at the time. A wry grin turned his lips. And, of course, all ladies desire a strappingly attired soldier, don't they? He gave his head a shake, disgusted at the initial thoughts that had first held a tantalizing appeal to his pair of friends. Lily forced him to unclench a fist he didn't recall making. She brushed her fingers over his palm and that butterfly-soft caress filled his chest with warmth. You were young. Yes. He dropped a kiss atop her black curls. And idiotic. We all are at that age. Her and her first love. Derek tightened his grip reflexively about her. God how he despised the man who'd robbed her of her innocence and right to a joyous future. But then, I'd never know her. And he was just that selfish of a bastard that he could not imagine never knowing her. Unnerved by that staggering truth, he continued with what were suddenly safer talks of his past. We went off to fight Boney's forces. Cannon fire echoed through his mind and the piercing screams of men as they died alone on a field of chaos. Lily unfolded herself on his lap and he made to gather her back, but she only wrapped her arms about his waist. With strength radiating from her delicate frame, she hung on tight, and he took that unspoken offering. It eased the tension in his shoulders, and the battlefield cries faded to a distant hum. Christian was an unskilled soldier. Where he and Maxwell took to battle as though that had been the purpose they'd been born to, Christian had been too human to be what Derek had too easily transformed himself into, a ruthless warrior. Maxwell and I made a pledge to keep him alive. In the end, Christian had returned and scathed and Derek had been carried off in shame. Then, was anyone really unscathed by life? The tortured Marquis he'd visited some months ago had given no evidence of being unscathed. 
You are both blessed to have one another as friends. He didn't have friends. By hell, he didn't even have family. Derek pressed his eye closed. No. That was not altogether true. There was still Flora, his sister's daughter. We are no longer friends. He'd severed any possibility of that former relationship when he'd sought to destroy St. Cyr's reputation and marriage. Of course you are, Lily said with a matter-of-factness that brought his eye open. You don't understand, he said, his voice thick. I blamed Christian. She shifted in his lap and he wrapped his arms about her. Don't you see? We always blame someone. Some blame themselves and some blame others. Who was Lily Benedict? Was she one of those latter individuals? Did her hatred belong to the cad who'd ruined her and thrust her into an uncertain future, reliant on the whims of bored nobles? Or did she take on guilt she should not feel for the circumstances presented women in an uncertain world? Her gaze fell to his chest and when she spoke, her words were so faint he strained to hear. It is easier to take the hatred we carry for ourselves and turn that sentiment on someone else. Then, she gave her head a hard shake and looked up once again, with a firmed jaw. Your friend, the Marquis, he understands. I tried to destroy his marriage, he said bluntly, hating the way she stiffened. Remorse twisted inside, having nothing to do with this humbling moment and everything to do with the shameful actions in the cold of winter. My friend found love and I was, am, alone. With no one and nothing. Or so he'd believed. Except. He skimmed his gaze over the room, to where the pile of St. Cyr and Maxwell's notes littered the floor. He'd not truly been alone. Not in the ways he believed, but in other, deeper, more isolating ones for the self-imposition of that solitary state. What of Lily, however? Who had she had? He continued in quiet tones. I read the papers of his and Maxwell's triumphs. They returned the conquering heroes, sought after by all. A dull flush burned his neck. And you were shunned by all, Lily correctly finished for him. She trailed the tip of her index finger over the puckered flesh of his chest. Derek flinched. He'd never grow accustomed to any person looking upon him and touching him as she was. Even in knowing she did not so revile him, he made to pull away, but she persisted. I had Harris, his too loyal butler, find out about Christian's circumstances. He was in need of a fortune and a wife, but he found something more than that. And how Derek had sat cloaked in the shadows of this very room hating him for that happiness. Why should his friend know light when he knew dark? Why should Christian know love when Derek knew loneliness? Lily looked questioningly up at him. What did he find? Not what. The shame grew and continued its cancer-like spread through his being. A woman. He found a lady with a fat dowry and that lady was, is, despite my best efforts, madly in love with him. Memories flitted in of Derek's first foray into the living. And where had he gone? To taunt and goad the newly wedded Marquess and Marchioness of St. Cyr. He spoke, his voice made hollow. I crafted lies that made Christian out as a ruthless fortune hunter. And though the newly minted Marquess had, indeed, been a fortune hunter, he'd possessed the same honor marrying where his heart willed it. And out of his own jealousy and self-hatred, Derek had tried to rob the other man of that gift. I shared secrets of St. Cyr's past with his wife. He winced. Moments in his past that St. Cyr, no doubt, flagellated himself for. Lily threaded her fingers through his hair and tenderly played with those tresses. Oh, Derek. Bitterness ate at his tongue like acid. That is the man I am. The monster. A beast for not the marks he wore upon his person, but the crimes against his friends, and sister. Lily pulled him back from the abyss of guilt threatening to swallow him. She clasped his face between her hands and looked him in the eye. He wanted to turn away but she tightened her hold upon him, not allowing him to pull free. Oftentimes it is easier to feed that hatred and anger. 
because the alternative is allowing life to destroy you, and for the struggles that go with living, there is something very grand and beautiful in life, anyway. The dark glint in her eyes sucked at him so that he wanted to delve deeper into the story of Lily Benedict. That regretful glimmer in her aquamarine gaze spoke of someone who knew and this connection between them grew all the more, terrifying him with the intensity in this needing her. It does not undo what I did. There was no atonement. He clenched and unclenched his jaw. Especially not when one's plan nearly resulted in that former friend's death. It does not. I know that better than anyone. But he is still your friend, she said. She touched her lips to his and she tasted a forgiveness and hope and new beginnings. He wanted those new beginnings, with her. How could she not know that as she spoke, he'd lost his heart to her? There was no fear in that. Just an absolute rightness, a sense of being whole, when he'd been empty for so long. You were blessed to have those friendships. Yes. He had been. Derek winced. In the end, he'd gone and made a muck of everything with those men. Guilt sliced away at his conscience, even as something in her words gave him pause. And what of you, what of your friends? Please say there was someone you had all these years. Please say you were not alone in the ways I have been. She gave him a sad, pitying smile as though he spoke with a child's naivete. Women who are mistresses, to noblemen, do not have friends. His chest tightened painfully as with that handful of words, she confirmed what he'd already known. His exile had been self-imposed. Yes, he'd been shut away and scorned by society, but had he given the words, St. Cyr and Maxwell would have taken down the Tower of London with their hands, for their strength of friendship. Even his sister had not been deterred by the ugliness of his soul and continued to come day after day, with her young daughter in tow. And how had he embraced those kindnesses? By shutting out the only people who cared. And in his sister's case, he was too late. Who were the people important to Lily? Surely there was a friend for her somewhere in this world. Someone who knew the strength of her courage and beauty of her spirit. A desperate need to know all he could about her filled him. Who are your letters to, he asked, wanting those notes to be from a friend who cared for her and not some man who'd mattered to her. Lily paused and, for a moment, he thought she'd withhold that knowledge he craved. Then she pulled away from him and he mourned that loss as she took the distance she now clearly required. She climbed to her feet, leading him cold for reasons that had more to do with the loss of her body's heat. Except, unashamed of her nudity, she strode over to the forgotten box she carried about his house in the earliest morning hours. She ran her palm over the top. Her lower lip quivered and she caught the trembling flesh between her teeth. They are to my family. To. Not from. Silence echoed through the room as this revelation made her more real and her loss all the greater for that realness. It had been easier when they'd been notes to amorphous strangers and he'd been left to speculate as to the person's identity. In this case, it was a number of persons. I have two brothers and a sister, she murmured. The person who should have protected her above all others had turned her out. Lily sucked in a jagged breath. They were but children when I left Carlisle, she said, her tone stronger, for that breath. Derek sat and stared through his lashes at her. And do you still write them? The muscles of her throat moved. No. Did they ever write back? He held his breath, but her silence served as her answer. A black curse slipped out on a hiss at the cold-hearted man who'd sired her who deny her family. A man who'd left his child at the mercy of a merciless world. Then, was his own mother's defection any different? Blood did not kindness or love make. He did not have a choice, Derek, Lily said quietly, correctly interpreting the path his thoughts had traveled. Your mother threatened to have the bishop strip him of his vicarship. The air left him on a swift exhale. God, his mother and brother had been the same kind of ruthless to rival the devil himself. Guilt twisted his insides into vicious knots. I am so sorry, he whispered. 
how empty. How very meaningless those words were. Words that could never right George's and his mother's wrongs. It is not your fault, she said, so simply, it ravaged him all the more. Just as it was not my father's. He had his other children to consider. You are a child. And she'd been cast out on her own. Insidious thoughts slid in, of a young, scared Lily, forced into the role of mistress, by an old, lecherous gentleman. Rage descended over his eye momentarily blinding him so that he wanted to choke the life from that bastard's body. But so, too, were they, she said pulling him to the moment. They aren't any longer, he gritted out and came to his feet. He strode across the room and scooped up his previously discarded garments. With a growl, he tugged his shirt overhead. You make excuses for them. Her family had failed her in the worst possible ways. Nay, his family had failed her and her life had been one of hell for that cruelty. Grief contorted the scarred muscles of his face. To keep from descending into madness, he collected his trousers and struggled into them, when the stricken look in her eyes froze him. Sometimes excuses are necessary, she said, as she set her box down and came over to collect her own garments. Derek retrieved her night rail and drew it over her head. It slid in a soft rustle over her slim body, shielding her resplendent nudity from his gaze. What a tragedy to cover up such beauty. He brushed his knuckles along her jaw. But not always. Just as some crimes cannot be forgiven. The color leached from her cheeks and she took a staggering step backward. I should go, she said. Averting her gaze, she quickly gathered her box. He opened his mouth, but before he managed any words, Lily raced across the room, pulled the door open, and fled. Derek furrowed his brow and stared at the entrance of the room. With the speed with which she'd taken flight, she may as well have been a fake creature of fantasies, equally elusive and imagined. He stood there a long while after she'd gone. In this past hour he'd learned more than he'd ever known about Lily Benedict. And yet, oddly it felt as though he knew nothing about the lady, all the same. Chapter 20 The morning sun just peeked over the horizon. At the early hour, Lily appreciated the quiet that blanketed London's streets. From where she stood by her bedroom window, she shot her gaze across to the gilt bronze mantel clock. The golden pan cheerily fluted for a menagerie of animals alongside a golden tree and that bucolic simplicity momentarily froze her. When Sir Henry had visited her chambers and slaked his base needs with her body, nothing more than a vessel for that lust, she'd lie abed staring up at the whitewashed ceilings. In those dark, lonely moments she'd hunger to return to the obscurity of that graceful, peaceful English countryside, where no one knew the crimes of her past, or present. The golden moment captured a pan conjured memories of the simplistic country life she'd left. The one she'd dreamed seven years of returning to. The one she'd not thought of in days. The clock ticked away the passing moments and she continued to stare. How could a week come to matter so? How could her hatred for a family who sustained her now throw her into this upheaval where she no longer knew up from down? She buried her fists into the fabric of her taffeta cloak and it wrinkled noisily in the early morning quiet. With every day she came to know Derek, that emotionless land she planned on running away to was nothing more than a hollow, empty place that would never heal her hurts or right the wrong she was guilty of. It is not enough, she whispered. The Duke of Blackthorne had crumbled away at her defenses and in so doing, had proved her the same weak fool without a care for her future or safety or security. She squared her shoulders. Did she truly believe Derek would see her as an honorable woman of strength if he discovered the truth she deliberately withheld? A wry, humorless smile formed painfully on her lips. No. What man would feel anything but contempt and disdain for a woman who'd spread her legs for his brother and who'd then entered his own household with the most dubious of intentions, and now did the same for him? Cloak pulled close about her person, Lily walked stiffly to the entrance of her room and braced for her upcoming meeting. Before her courage deserted her, she pulled the door open. The hinges creaked noisily in the quiet and she froze, her breath held. 
When no accusers came forward with their fingers outstretched, Lily slipped from her bedchamber. Drawing the door slowly closed behind her, she glanced back and forth down the hall. Of course, at this early hour, the handful of servants on Derek's staff would be thoroughly occupied with the preparations for the day. Remorse twisted around in her belly as she padded softly down the carpeted halls through the townhouse. She made her way below stairs and as she approached the marble foyer, she braced for discovery. Heart pounding for the fear of discovery, she drew open the broad, heavy door and stepped outside. The unseasonable chill of the early spring morn yanked at the hem of her cloak and, ignoring the early morning cold that penetrated the fabric, she all but sprinted down the steps. Her stomach twisted. These same steps she'd climbed years earlier and been thrown unceremoniously down, during a vicious rainstorm. With the street still echoing with her remembered cries and weeping, Lily now cast her gaze up and down the quiet streets in search of a hired hackney. Biting her lower lip, she continued down the empty cobbled streets. Of course, hired hackneys had no place outside the lavish townhouses of these Mayfair residents. Each step she took away from Derek's home, the tension and guilt weighting her shoulders lifted, so that she was left with nothing but the invigorating cleanliness of the crisp air. Each step carried her away, drew her farther away from the web of deception she wove upon that broken, lonely home inhabited by a very much hurting man and sad little girl. Only, when she returned, she'd resume her lying and scheming. Her throat worked. No, there was no escaping who she truly was and what evil she did. There was this temporary reprieve. Lily drew to a stop, as her gaze settled upon a hackney. The wind continued to whip about her and she burrowed deeper into her cloak. She cast a glance back down the path she'd traveled. For the sliver of a heartbeat, she considered boarding that carriage and disappearing from Derek's life and Holtworth's vile scheme and even darker threat. The ugliest memories of her days on the mail coach and approaching George crept to the surface. The cloying fear. The pain of an empty belly. Her breath grew ragged in her own ears. She could not go back to that. This time, it would ruin her in ways she'd not already been thoroughly destroyed. She returned her gaze forward. Drawing in a deep breath, she rushed across the empty street and approached the coarse stranger. The pockmarked driver lounged against his black, numbered carriage, with a cap tipped low over his eyes. From where he stood, the man ran an assessing eye over the fabric of her garments. No doubt, unchaperoned as she was, he took her for some scandalous miss. He would only be one part right on that score. She fished coins from her reticule and held them out. Highgate. His eyes flared with a faint surprise, but wordlessly he collected the coins and pocketed them. He helped her into the hack. Moments later, the carriage sprang forward and he sent the conveyance rattling through the empty streets. Lily sat stiffly on the uncomfortable bench. Her fingers curled reflexively about the purse in her hands. Derek had thrown her world into upheaval, so she questioned her selfish efforts for survival. With his gruff whisper echoing around the chambers of her mind, she pressed her eyes, closed, and willed his voice away. But then there was still the remembrance of his passionate loving and his gentle caress, and his impassioned defense. She was never more grateful than when the hack drew to an abrupt, jarring halt outside the high, metal gates of Highgate. The carriage dipped as the driver left his perch and pulled the door open. He reached a hand inside. Ma'am? Lily placed her fingertips in his and accepted his assistance. She fished out more coin. There will be more when I return, she pledged. Greed lit his dark eyes, and he touched the brim of his hat. Very well, ma'am. She moved briskly, her gaze trained forward. Then, wasn't that the way of their world? All people could be bought. Servants, lords, hackney drivers, and whores. She bit down so hard on her lower lip. The metallic taste of blood filled her mouth. For ultimately, she'd entered a man's house, under the guise of caring for his ward, a girl who'd been so cruelly robbed of both parents, all to save herself. 
She picked her way through the cobbled streets and pulled the hood of her cloak down further over her eyes, even as she knew the action unnecessary. Respectable lords and ladies did not arise at this godforsaken hour and those who might, would certainly never be paying a visit to Highgate. I do not see a whore. I see a woman and a survivor. And perhaps that is why we two can move along in some harmonious rhythm when I despise all who cross my path, because we are not unlike. Guilt unfurled in her belly, gripping her with a vicious ferocity. Except Derek. Derek didn't see a whore when others did. Did he not make love to you too, with no offer of anything more? She squared her jaw. He was different, unlike all the others before. Forcibly tamping down the whispering doubt, she came to an abrupt stop outside Highgate Cemetery. The overhanging elm trees cast an almost park-like quality upon the space. Lily drew the fabric of her cloak closer about her person and huddled within herself. Morning birds chirped their cheerful song, at odds with the consecrated ground that marked the end of a person's life. She wandered through the gates. Her purposeful steps ground up dirt and gravel. She moved past the countless crosses and towering stone angels until she came to a stop. She stared frozen at the well-tended headstone of a child. The weeping stone angels bespoke the wealth of parents who loved that child. Emotion wadded in her throat. Lily stole a glance about and finding the grounds empty, she dropped to a knee beside the headstone. The wind stirred the leaves overhead and they rustled in the quiet. Silently, she dusted her palm over the traces of dirt and mud spattered on the carved name and date. November 16, 1813. Her heart stuttered at that date. A day of agony and grief all around. For these parents who'd buried their babe and for Lily who had climbed inside Sir Henry's carriage and buried the dreams in her heart and the hope of a child and husband. Tears clogged her throat. I want to do it again. I want to start where there is only me and Derek and none of the ugly past between us. Lily drew in a shaky breath. Methodically, she moved on to the handful of weeds that had sprung from the ground at the foot of the headstone. She tugged them out, finding a soothing balm as the tenacious weeds gave way and relinquished their hold. Efforts completed, she sank back on her haunches and dusted her palms together. I promised I would one day have my retribution, she said into the quiet. The birds chirped in reply. I was so very close. Lily settled onto the ground and drew her knees close to her chest. And now I have never been farther away from it. She dropped her chin atop her knees. For swearing revenge and carrying out shameful acts of theft were entirely different scores when one knew a person, and foolishly she'd allowed the duke and his ward inside. She'd not let herself see them as the means to the end she so very desperately needed, but rather as a hurting man and child. They were human to her in a way that made her intentions nigh impossible. Last night, with only the two of them and the quiet of the night, Derek, a man feared by all, had let her into his world in a way she'd wager he'd not let any other person. Racked with guilt and shame over that gift, Lily swallowed hard. The Duke of Blackthorn was a man who did not trust and when he should choose to bestow that gift, he erroneously turned it over to her undeserving hands. She rubbed her chin back and forth over the rough, wool fabric. After George's betrayal and deception, she'd lived her life without honor, all in the name of survival so bitter and hurt and angry that she'd convinced herself all that mattered was survival. For, in the absence of her family or anyone who truly cared for her, what else had there been? In granting her the post in his household, in not turning her out even knowing what she was, Derek had proven he cared. He was not the beast they claimed he was. So it begged the question, how could she turn that sought-after heirloom over to Holtsworth and betray Derek, in this cruel, unforgivable way? Lily stared out into the distance at the tall graves of unknown strangers. If she did this thing, what good was left of her soul? What good was there in living that secure life, tucked away in a far-flung corner of England if every day she arose hating herself for betraying the one man who was good? I cannot. She braced for the staggering panic and a screaming protest to resonate about her mind. 
Instead, an unexpected calm stole through her, leaving her with an odd peace. The branches shifted overhead once more, and the leaves noisily shook, as though in agreement and support. The loud crunch of boots crushing gravel brought her head up. Her heart jumped into her throat and she rushed to stand. For one horrific moment, the fear that Derek had followed her here slammed into her with such force it sucked the air from her chest. She spun about and then quickly staggered back a step. Holdsworth stood several feet away, a mocking grin on his cruel lips. Were you expecting another? Then, as though they were in the middle of a ballroom and not in the midst of an empty graveyard, he doffed his hat and sketched a deep bow. Knots twisted at her insides. Indeed not. She despised herself for the quaking tremor to her words. His mocking smile widened and he flicked his gaze over at the headstone, and then to another. Well? He waggled his eyebrows. What have you learned? A chill raked her spine. How casual he could be about his grasping attempts at that magnificent bauble while standing among the lost souls here. Hatred for this man and his kind blazed stronger than ever. A healthy anger sent her chin notching up. I have changed my mind. Holdsworth blinked. She may as well have declared herself Bonnie Prince Charlie, back from the grave, for the shock in his wide eyes. You changed your mind in what way, Miss Bennett, he asked, slowly. Smoothing her features into a contrite mask, Lily held her palms up. I thought I could help you, but I cannot. She drew in a steadying breath. I cannot steal from, Derek, the Duke. Perhaps before, when she'd seen him as a cruel extension of the other winter's mail. Not any longer. Not when he'd proven himself to be a man who did not condemn her for the mistakes she'd made and the acts she'd committed. Holdsworth doffed his hat and beat it noisily against his leg. Beg pardon? The incredulity underscoring those two words indicated his was more a statement than anything else. I cannot help you, she said into the quiet. It would be wrong. It would be wrong, he parroted back, the high timbre of his tone hinting at his thin grasp on control. She backed up a step and put the poor, long dead babe stone between her and the monster before her. Yes, wrong. He froze and tossed his head back. The ugly, cynical amusement spilling past his lips echoed about the grounds. He laughed until tears seeped from the corner of his eyes and then seeped down his cheeks. Holdsworth yanked out a white handkerchief and dusted the moisture from his cheeks. This is rich, indeed, my dear. I gather by your whispered lamentations and regrets, you've made yourself a whore for the beast of Blackthorn now, too? Through his vile charges, Lily stood stonily erect, refusing to be the mouse prey to yet another man who toyed with her like a cat. Nausea churned in her belly. With those flippant words, he'd make what she and Derek had done together last evening the shameful, cold acts carried out between her and his now-dead father. I am not his whore, she said in smooth, even tones. What she and Derek had shared was beautiful and good, and this man would debase that special union. Yes, Derek's touch roused a passion inside she'd not believed herself capable of and she would give herself to him to know more of his alluring caress but she'd not sold her body to him for that right. Holdsworth peered at her a moment as though examining a new, confounding species. Then, he tossed his head back and bellowed with laughter once more. Ah, that blush on your cheeks proves you a liar. He flicked his finger at her cheek and Lily winced. She clenched and unclenched her hands at her sides, her fingers twitching with the need to slap his smug face. How had she ever agreed to the demands of one such as him? Because I was desperate and desperate people are driven to do desperate things. He took a step forward, and she forced her feet to remain rooted to the earth so as to not give him the advantage of knowing his presence unnerved her. She concentrated on the steady, even draws of her breathing. A gasp escaped her as Holdsworth brushed his gloved fingertips down her cheek. A whore who blushes, he murmured as though he puzzled through a complex word riddle. Lily slapped at his hand, tired of his taunts. And a gentleman who commits theft. A mottled flush colored the man's cheeks. 
He opened and closed his mouth, sputtering like a fish plucked out of water. A thrill of triumph reared once more. How long had she been the meek, biddable creature dependent on these men who could crush a woman as easily as they mashed a spider under the heel of their expensive boots? Well, no more. She may have been a whore and she might now be a thief, but with his plans to obtain that expensive bauble, he was just as much a thief as she. I cannot help you. Nor will I help you. As such, there is nothing left for us to say. Lily expected another flare of fury from his angry eyes. Instead, he lowered his ginger lashes, the desire that filled his leering gaze brought bile rushing to the back of her throat. My, you are spirited, he whispered, running his gloved palm down her cheek once more. She slapped at his fingers again and her protestation ended on a gasp as he captured her slim wrist in his powerful grip. I can think of more creative activities for your fingers, Lily, than slapping my person. Lust lent his words a husky undertone and the nausea churned all the greater. He'd attempt to seduce her here, amongst the dead? Perhaps you would consider the benefit of coming to my bed, instead? I assure you, it will be a good deal more pleasurable than bedding that monster. Would you like that? He whispered, dipping his head. Of its own volition, her hand shot out. Holdsworth's head recoiled under the ferocity of her blow. The cemetery echoed with the sharp crack of flesh meeting flesh. She hurried away from the babe's gravestone and placed another stranger's stone between them. The Duke of Blackthorn is more honorable and good than you'll ever be or ever hope to be. And I would choose death and hunger in the streets than give any part of myself to you. The passion lifted from his eyes, replaced with that familiar disdain. Very well, he said, coolly composed, once more. You've made your decision, my dear. At the ominous threat to those words, unease tripped inside her belly. Not allowing him to witness her anxiety, Lily jabbed a finger at him. I am not your dear. I am a woman who your father made promises to and broke. A man who'd also preyed on a naive girl. And you. She jerked her chin. You, sir, are a thief who'd take advantage of a person who is desperate. She gave her head a shake. I am not that person. Not anymore. She had been. Scared and angry and hopeless. I will not help you steal from the Duke of Blackthorn. He deserved far more of life than her betrayal. Fury leapt in his eyes and threatened to burn her with the angry fire radiating in their brown depths. He took a lurching step forward and she stumbled over herself in her haste to back away. Detesting the way her heart hammered in her ears, Lily smoothed her trembling palms over her skirts. Holdsworth tightened his mouth and then tugged his gloves off in an infuriatingly nonchalant manner. He dusted them together and dropped his voice to a low, lethal whisper. One word from me and you would be carted off to Newgate. No one would believe the word of a whore over a gentleman. His words iced her veins. He can say nothing. I'll return the diamond. Finding strength in that truth, she pasted on a mocking smile. Ah, uh, yes, but one word from you would reveal your complicity, wouldn't it? She lifted one eyebrow. What would the ton say to a gentleman who employed the assistance of a whore to steal from a respected member of the peerage? She braced for his continued threats, only. He passed a look over her face. Did he search for signs of weakness? He need but look at her trembling hands hidden in the folds of her skirt to see that telling gesture. Then, some of the tension eased from his broad shoulders. Come, Miss Benedict. It did not escape her notice he no longer commandeered her given name. Surely you'll not throw away your life for a man you've known, but a week? Not again. Those words echoed, unspoken between them. For after but a short time, what did she know of Derek? He continued, relentless. You'd not sacrifice yourself. Not for a man whose family is responsible for what you've become. How long had she hated all those linked to the late Duke of Blackthorn? That rage and need for revenge had sustained her. What was she without it? 
As though sensing her weakening, he took a small step closer, shrinking the distance. Your future will be secure, he cajoled with the same soft, silken promise Lucifer himself must have used when he dangled that crimson apple. No more fear. No more whoring yourself. You will disappear and can craft a life as a widow. She closed her eyes on that tantalizing promise that had sustained her for six years. So how in a week's time had that dream become unraveled? Because, what was time, in the significance of knowing a person? Her father had given her life and had snipped her from his life the way he might have removed a dangling thread from an embroidery frame. He'd not stood by her, when Derek, a man she'd known for a handful of days, had defended her against his man of affairs and lent her his support. Time, it would seem, meant different things to different people. I cannot. Those words emerged with far more strength than she imagined herself possible of in that moment. Holdsworth looked at her for a long while, his expression veiled. Then, he brushed a speck of imagined dust from his sleeve. When he again looked at her, there was a cold, stony resolve etched in his features. You will regret this, and then there will be nothing. No security, no property. You will, once more, find yourself a whore on your back, only this time for the guards at Newgate. Lily folded her arms close to her chest in a bid for warmth. What a cold, ruthless world she dwelled in, where a diamond meant more than a life and not even a graveyard was an honored sanctuary amongst them. Well, I will give you but one more chance, he stated, cutting across her dark musings. She managed a terse nod. I have made my choice. An ugly smile formed on his hard lips. Indeed, you have. As he at last took his leave, she stared after him. Why, if she'd done something right, did it suddenly seem like the very worst decision? Chapter 21 Derek limped down the corridor toward that smiling portrait at the end of the hall. Sweat dripped from his brow as he stretched out his long-legged strides. The pressure placed on his thigh shot pain down his knee and radiated down his calf. But for the heavy rasping of his breath from his exertions, silence filled these corridors. Which was as it should be after several years of prolonged silence. And yet, that is not how they'd been since Lily Benedict had laid claim to his household. A grin rose unbidden to Derek's lips as he limped to a stop before the portrait of himself long ago. He mopped his damp brow with the back of his sleeve and recalled the gift she'd given him last night. His easy smile faded. For what Lily had given him moved beyond merely her body, a still cherished, precious offering. As governess in his employ, she'd flouted every rule he'd laid before her and laid siege to every aspect of his home, these halls included. Rather, she'd allowed him to see past the monster he'd been. She'd forced him to see there was a reason for living and smiling. I want her. I want her in every way. All the ways that are honorable and good, ways she believes herself undeserving of. A hiss escaped his lips and he stumbled, toppling over hard onto his buttocks. Pain shot up his back and he welcomed the sting of discomfort. Your grace. His doctor came charging over from the opposite end of the hall with an alacrity and ease that would have made him grit his teeth not even a week ago. He dropped his head into his hands. And now he lay upon his backside, wool gathering about a woman. Nay, not just any woman. Lily. I am fine, he mumbled as the other man came down on a knee beside him. Your movements were more precise, but still too quick. It was not the pace or the pain that had brought Derek to his proverbial knees, or in this case his arse. It was her. Why did that truth not terrify him as it ought? Dr. Carlson leaned out and inspected the throbbing muscles of Derek's thigh. He gave his head a shake, his expression contemplative. They are no tighter than they usually are. The young doctor furrowed his brow. Perhaps we might be best served retiring for the remainder of the day. No, Derek growled. He shoved himself to his feet and cursed as his leg went out from under him. Dr. Carlson took him by the arm and steadied him. A dull flush heated his neck. 
no matter how many days or years passed, he'd never grow accustomed to having become this man, unable to use his own body in the simplest of ways. I am fine, he gritted out. The doctor hesitated and then with a slow nod, strode briskly down the hall, to his previous spot. You've made great strides, your grace, he called with an ease, no one had demonstrated through the years. Except Lily. He gave a non-committal grunt. Though, in truth, the doctor did not merely issue false praise. Nor was that the type of Dr. Carlson was. The day he'd returned from Toulouse, Derek had been confined to first a bed and then an invalid chair, and then resolved to either end his own life before forever remaining in that godforsaken piece of furniture or he'd climbed out. And promptly fallen. Ultimately, he'd found Carlson. No, this progress was real. They both knew the truth of that. Yet today, Derek was not trained on his painful efforts or even his own failings. From where he stood at the opposite end of the hall, Dr. Carlson called out. Are you all right, your grace? Fine. Derek gritted his teeth through the pain of using ligaments that no longer wished to be used. No matter how many times he stretched the muscles of his thighs and conditioned his body, the pain would not go away. Perhaps it would always be there. At one time, that truth had crippled him in ways that moved beyond the pain of old battlefield injuries. Now, there was a calm acceptance in knowing this was who he was. Beast to some. But not to all. Not to those who mattered. The dimple-cheeked flora and spirited governess who saw to that girl's care slipped in and he found himself smiling once more. Derek stopped. Are you smiling, your grace? No, he muttered. For the acceptance he'd developed these past days, in who he was and what he'd become, he didn't think he'd ever return to the easygoing, charming gentleman he'd once been. And that was all right, too. Time changed them all. Lily had proven that. The familiar silence reigned once more as Derek strode with his painfully uneven gait down the length of the corridor. In the past, where the quiet had been a balm to his broken soul, now he craved the peal of laughter and tart-mouthed replies from tempting lips. Yes, in the past, each of these agonizing steps would have consumed him in a bitter fury. Now, she consumed him. Thoughts of her. A wave of desire slammed into him, a hungering that came from more than that beautiful gift of her body last night, but rather was born of her. He cast a glance past Dr. Carlson's shoulder. Where was she even now? Her responsibilities, no doubt, had her in the nursery. You are shouting a good deal less since I last saw you, his doctor called from his position under the portrait of Derek in his youth. Yes. Yes he had been. Or perhaps she was exploring the household corridors, as she'd been wont to do since her arrival. Nor are you thundering for me to quit my questioning, Dr. Carlson added. I bloody well should be, he muttered, ringing a booming laugh from the other man. Carlson folded his arms at his chest and never took his gaze off Derek's purposeful movements. It is my opinion that such a transformation can be attributed to but one thing. He would prefer the other man keep his personal opinions to nothing more than the professional sphere of Derek's recovery and therapy regimen. Days ago, he would have hurled those very words to divert him away from his inquiries. This time, he remained silent. It is invariably a lady who muddies the waters of our lives, the doctor mused aloud. Perhaps it was years without friendship and dialogue, but Derek who would have normally sent the man to the devil for such musings, shot back. What do you know of it? More than you perhaps think, the doctor said with a half grin. But enough to know this change to your disposition could most likely be explained by the appearance of a certain. He quirked an eyebrow. Governess. Derek shot his eyebrows up. What in blazes did the man know of Lily Benedict's role here? Lady Flora was quite enlightening. He inclined his head. A silent curse stuck in his throat. His knees chattered worse than a magpie. Footsteps sounded down the hall and Derek looked away grateful for the sudden interruption. His butler, Harris, stood at the end, 
his cheeks their familiar ashen hue as he shuffled back and forth on his feet. Derek withdrew a handkerchief and dusted his sweat-dampened brow. Harris, he called out. Even with the space between them and one useless socket where his left eye had been, the other man's flash of shock registered. You called me Harris again, the man blurted. From the corner of his eye, he detected the doctor's knowing look. Derek resisted the urge to yank at his loosened cravat. It is your name, he mumbled. A name he'd resisted, speaking to maintain that carefully crafted facade of indifference and coldness. Lily Benedict was capable of the kind of magic fake creatures were possessed of, and God help him, she'd woven a spell that had brought him back to life. A small smile formed on the other man's face. Indeed it is, your grace. Then clearing his throat, he said, Mr. Davies has arrived. I, I know why your feelings on unexpected meetings and as such have told him you are not receiving visitors, the man's words ran together. He, however, I insisted. Should I? He sighed. Show him to my office shortly. Oh, of course. The man sketched a bow and then backed from the hallway. Derek stalked over to his jacket and shrugged into it. I say we are finished here, Carlson. Ignoring the knowing glint in the young doctor's eyes, Derek, with the use of the serpent-headed piece, fetched his discarded garments. I am not thinking about Lil, Mrs. Benedict. His skin heated, like he was a boy just out of the schoolroom. His insolent doctor spread his hands before him. Ah, uh, but I didn't say that you were. Gritting his teeth through the difficulty of his movements, Derek stomped past the grinning man and set out in search of the lady who'd forced him out into the living, once more. With the aid of his walking stick, he limped through the winding corridors and reached his office. Where are you going? Derek stumbled and he caught himself against the wall to keep from falling. His sister's daughter stood in the middle of the hall. Curiosity set her eyes a glitter. His world had been infiltrated, there was nothing else for it, a spirited siren, a tenacious man of affairs, an insolent doctor, and this mischievous child. Odd, there was none of the age-old fury at that truth. He strode into his room and found his chair. Shouldn't you be with, Lily, your governess? The mere utterance of her name sent an explosion of heat unfurling inside his chest, a lightness that freed him in ways he'd been chained to for so very long. Flora picked her way, tentatively toward him. She feared him. It read in the pale hue of her skin and the slight tremble to her fingertips. Her reaction hit him like a punch to the gut. Even as hers was the common and expected reaction. Yet, afraid of him, as she was, she'd still brave his company. Instead of taunting her with the evidence of his disfigurement as he'd done in the past, Derek angled his face in a way to shield her from the scarred portion of his visage. Mrs. Benedict is gone. His heart stilled and forgetting his previous resolve to keep his face averted, he swung his attention to the girl. What do you mean, gone? Did that raspy, panicked inquiry belong to him? Fear wreathed her cheeks. She went out early this morning. Flora went still and her lower lip trembled ever so slightly. Do you believe she'll not come back? Gone? Unease settled like a stone in his belly. Where in blazes would Lily go? It is not Sunday, Flora confirmed with a nod. And you've only given Mrs. Benedict Sundays free, so she should be here. I, Derek furrowed his brow. How in hell do you know such a thing? A twinkle replaced the prior fear radiating from her blue eyes. I heard it when you spoke with her. He swallowed a curse. Christ. The girl was better suited for the home office than any nursery. His cravat suddenly grew tight and he scoured his mind, trying to figure just what in the hell else the girl had overheard. She hefted herself into the leather-winged back chair opposite his desk and began pumping her legs furiously. I, I am certain she will return shortly. His panicked heartbeat made a mockery of that empty assurance he issued for both his and Flora's benefit. He cleared his throat. Aren't there other? 
She cocked her head, looking at him expectantly. Children's things you should be doing? What was it children did? He no longer recalled those most innocent of times. I am alone. The servants are busy. Flora shrugged. And so you choose to keep me company? She grinned. And so I chose to keep you company. As she glanced about his office, her smile dipped. With her gaze, she took in the cane that had so displeased her and the hearth crackling in the fireplace. Flora settled her stare on the bronze and iron ormolu inkwell and frowned. Lions, she sighed. He followed her gaze to the gold lion lid atop that gold and black base. Do you have problems with lions and snakes? he drawled, sitting back in his chair. The girl abruptly stopped her distracted, swinging movement and furrowed her brow contemplatively. I prefer happier things. He no longer knew what such things were. Except, Lily's beguiling smile slid into his thoughts. No, that was not true. Not anymore. He felt adrift at sea, with these emotions he no longer knew which way was up and which was down. Uncomfortable with the tumultuous sentiments, he glanced over at the door, never longing for Davy's presence more than he did this moment. This child forced him to acknowledge things within himself that he'd not allowed himself to in almost eight years. Surely Lily would return soon and he'd be spared from delving any further into the interests that made up this child. What if she doesn't return? Panic cloyed at his throat. Books and flowers. He whipped his head back, just as his niece hopped to her feet. I like books and flowers. Of course. The urns filled with various blooms in his otherwise dark, dreary house. The servants had gathered the girl's love of those flowers and filled his house with them. And truth be told, he'd not protested because there had been something purifying and hopeful in them. Something he'd never admit to a soul, not even this child. My mother would read to me every morning amidst the gardens. She likes flowers, Flora said, pulling him to the moment. She dragged the tip of her toes back and forth over the floor. Or rather, she liked flowers. With those words, memories of running through the hills of Carlisle with Edeline slipped to the surface. His sister's exuberant laugh trilled through his mind. A swell of pained emotion ran through him at the unnecessary reminder of her loss. The man he'd once been would have had all host of appropriate soothing responses, even for a child. Now, the man who'd dwelled too long in the shadows sat in silence. That is why I'm named Flora, you know. God, the girl was tenacious. She required no one's assistance to keep a discourse flowing. In fact, she would have impressed any society matron with her effortless skill. Disappointment lined her chubby face and his chest tightened. She wished him to respond. He'd been too long without words. He hardly knew the proper ones to assemble to raise a smile and erase hurt. Hell, he couldn't even dull his own pain. Yet again, evidence of his humanity assaulted him. Is it, he asked. Her eyes went wide. Then, a slow, wide smile dimpled her cheeks. Yes. Flora means flowers, she instructed the way a governess delivering an important science lecture might. She came around the desk and stopped beside the arm of his chair. Do you know what I believe, Uncle Derek? Ah, God. There it was again. The vice squeezed all the harder, cutting off airflow. What is it, he asked, his tone gruffer than intended. Flora rested her palms on the edge of his desk, alongside those stacks of notes, connecting him to his past. I believe that is why Mrs. Benedict is meant to be here. Mama knew I would need someone to help. Such innocent hope flared in her eyes that it sucked the remainder of the breath from his lungs. And Mama knew you needed someone, too. And so she sent us a flower. A flower. Lily Benedict. Lily Benedict, Flora said, in echo of his unspoken thoughts. The words were nothing more than the inane ramblings of a child who'd see hope when there was only darkness around them. Yet. He returned his gaze to her, 
still smiling and innocent in the face of great loss. Perhaps there was more reason to hope and be happy, after all. Perhaps you might take me to a bookshop one day, she asked tentatively. With Mrs. Benedict. She promised we would go this week. He cleared his throat, making a noncommittal sound. Perhaps. How to explain to this child that he, the man who bellowed and thundered to bring the townhouse down, turned numb with terror at the prospect of exiting these walls? His niece tapped her hand on the pile of notes sent round by Maxwell and Christian, bringing his attention to the surface of his desk. Anxiety leapt in his chest, at this tiny little interloper not only slipping past his defenses, but at having this world he'd hidden within invaded by another. She suddenly stopped her grating drumming. What are these? She curiously eyed the notes. Derek leaned over and swiped the pile. Nothing. They are nothing, he bit out. Nothing but reminders of the men he'd joined in a grand adventure to nowhere but sin and destruction. They don't look like nothing, Flora continued, with a child's relentlessness. They look like letters. He yanked open his desk drawer and tossed them inside. Who wrote you letters? Was it your friend, the Marquis? The girl was going to give him a bloody megram. Derek dug his fingertips into his temple to blot out the girl's incessant questioning, when her last words penetrated his thoughts. He snapped his eyebrows into a single line. Who? The Marquis of St. Cyr? A dull humming filled his ears. How did she know about? Mrs. Benedict and I met him at the park one day with his wife. A taut energy pulsed through him. That man whose happiness he'd sought to end had met his charge in Hyde Park and knowing the good, always charming person Christian had been and the one papers purported him still to be, he would have been kind to the girl. He gripped the edge of his desk. When he'd been nothing but monstrous to that same couple who'd extended her that kindness. She gave me a picture. The Martianess, Flora, clarified. Did she, he asked, his voice rough. Uncaring that she invaded the space of one of the most feared peers in the realm, Flora came closer and all, but climbed on his lap in a bid to read those notes. With a growl, he thrust the drawer, closed with a loud click. They are not your business. Where in thunderation was Lily? By God, he'd triple her wages and her pension if she pledged to never take another damn day off. Displeasure turned her lips down. I think Mrs. Benedict is right. He shook his head, not meaning to feed her curious statement, that he'd really rather not have her finish. You are a good deal like pup. That blasted dog she'd likened him to. Mrs. Benedict would be wise to focus on your studies and not on her damned comparisons, he growled. Though, in truth, it would hardly matter. He'd sooner carve out his other eye than turn her out and the glimmer in his niece's eyes indicated for her tender years, she knew as much, too. Disregarding his diatribe, Flora leaned up on tiptoe and peered closely at his disfigured face. You're always snarling and snapping and barking but the Marquis said you were once good fun. His throat worked. He had been. Once upon a lifetime ago, he'd been charming and capable of easy laughter. I can still be that man. He pressed his eye closed, hungering for the slip of a dream dancing before him. He'd not believed so, until her. Derek forced his eye open and found Flora closely examining him. His stomach turned at this close scrutiny, so that he wanted to bound from his seat and tear from the room away from her bold study and seek out a new, undiscovered sanctuary. He'd never find peace with the monster that met him each morn. Derek forced himself to remain still. Then, she gave a little nod. Yes. You are just like Pup, but do you know what, Uncle Derek? She didn't give him an opportunity to respond, which was good because this slip of a child had him at an absolute loss. You pretend you hate everyone, but you really do care. He didn't care about a bloody person. Derek opened his mouth to disabuse her of that notion, but the lie withered on his lips. For he did care. He cared deeply for the sister he'd lost and this child who was her image in every way, and Lily Benedict. 
he cared about the young woman who'd arrived on his doorstep, pleading for a post, all in a bid to be free from the hell she'd been thrust into because of his treacherous, deceitful brother. And it was that very woman who'd forced him to acknowledge that for the pretense he'd put on all these years, he did care, very much. He was saved from answering by a sudden knock at the door. Derek looked to the front of the room. Enter. Please. You did not yell, Flora whispered at his side. Derek started. He glanced down as Harris shoved the door open. Why, she was correct. He hadn't cursed down the office walls for the unwanted interruption. His butler, ashen-faced as usual, sketched a bow. Mr. Davies to see you, your grace. The uncharacteristically somber set to Davies' features belied his usual fear around Derek. You should take your afternoon meal. So he might try and pick up the pieces of his ordered world and reassemble them into something that made sense. A smile lit Flora's face, staggering him once again with the innocence unveiled. Very well, but it would be a good deal better if you were to join me. The muscles of his throat worked. When was the last time anyone had felt that way about him? Yes, well. Derek patted her awkwardly on the head and watched as she skipped off past Davies, carefully skirting the man, and then taking her leave. The door closed with a loud click. Davies. He gestured to the winged back chairs. Visits on Tuesdays, now? Your visits are either a sign of your dedication or stupid. It was brought to my attention that Mrs. Benedict received a suspicious missive. A missive. He furrowed his brow. How? With an unexpected boldness, the older man strode forward. I make it my place to assure that your household staff is loyal. As such, it was brought to my intention. A memory slid in of Lily bearing that mysterious box of letters in her arms, supposed notes, to her parents as she'd wandered his halls. Guilt pebbled in his belly. With all the ways in which Lily had trusted him in everything she'd shared, he'd doubt her? Doubt her when she'd been the only one to see him as a man and not a beast. Say what it is you'd say and be done with it, he bit out. Of course, Davy said, giving his throat a clear. Out of respect to your late father and brother, I took it upon myself to have the young woman you've recently employed investigated. A growl rumbled in his chest and he sought the indignant fury that this man had dared question his judgment. Except, the stoic calm of this usually quaking man froze the scathing diatribe on his tongue. I have received news on your Mrs. Benedict. I rather think you would care to know the information, immediately. Derek's heart missed a beat. His man of affairs removed his spectacles and dusted them off with his kerchief. I am afraid not everything is as it seems with the young woman. Fishing around his jacket, he extracted a folded ivory note and handed it over. Derek stared at it for a long moment and then, with wooden movements, accepted the page. He unfolded it and scanned the black scrawl. His heart thumped to a slow stop. I write you to warn you. The woman you've accepted into your home as governess intends to commit a theft. Mrs. Benedict, really Liliana Bennett, spoke often of obtaining the Tavenier diamond and... Oh, God. Bile burned like fire in his throat. He couldn't read any more. Impossible. I do not believe it. Did that raspy denial belong to him? Had Davies been condescending or triumphant, it would have been easier than this unexpected sadness. Can you verify the presence of the necklace, your grace? My brother had a taste for fine things. Extravagant things. Nausea burned in his belly. It cinched his throat until the harsh rise and fall of his ragged breathing distracted him so he didn't cast the contents of his stomach upon the floor. That will be all, Davies, he said quietly. The man gave a slight nod and came to his feet. He hesitated a moment, appearing as though he wished to say more. And then he did. I made a pledge to your father when he lay dying that I would see I looked after his sons. I've not liked you, even feared you, since the moment you returned from war, 
Davies said with a directness Derek found himself respecting him for in that moment. I failed your brother and cannot fail your father once again. The old man gave him a look full of such pity that Derek would have gladly traded his remaining eye to be spared the horror of that sentiment. But I would not see you hurt in this way. A dull flush mottled his cheeks and he yanked at the lapels of his jacket. Giving his throat another clear, he sketched a bow. Your grace. Derek stared at the old servant as he treaded silently across the floor. Davies pulled the door closed behind him and that faint click propelled him into movement. With his heart climbing into his throat, he jumped to his feet, clasping the edge of the desk to steady himself. He lurched toward that magnificent case and fiddled with the latch. It gave with a satisfying click and he reached a trembling hand inside, and his body went cold. Hope flickered out like the just-extinguished flame of a candle as the remnants of the heart he'd recently assembled cracked and split into the millions of shards they'd once been. No. Chapter 22 With an eerie similarity to a moment last night, Lily crept through the empty corridors, moving purposefully to Derek's office. Her fingers trembled around the box in her hands and she gripped it harder in a bid to calm some of the turbulent unease. Derek's ancestors stared down their hawk-like noses, recriminating with their fierce gazes this woman who now carried the revered heirloom in her hands. Do not be silly, she mumbled under her breath. She picked up her pace, desperate to be free of the burden that had brought her into this home. She turned the corridor and came to an abrupt halt. Her heart thumped madly. The duke stood with his shoulder propped against the wall and a hand braced upon his cane. The towering dark perfection of him brought her to a sudden jerky halt so that she forgot the evidence of her crime she now carried in her hands. He was a portrait of midnight and masculinity that spoke of satiny warmth to the lady fortunate to hold his heart. I want that woman to be me. The breath froze in her chest and the filigree box in her hand trembled. She adjusted her grip on it and stared boldly back at him. The air crackled with remembered passion and sexuality and warmth. Hello, Lily. The satiny edge to his greeting cut across her turbulent thoughts. From the space between them, he eyed her through those magnificent black lashes. He spoke as though they met in a ballroom and not here in the middle of his corridors in the dead of night. Derek, she said softly, drifting closer to him. He thumped his cane twice in a way that had once menaced back in a time when she'd heard the whispers and heard nothing beyond the snarls. She came to a stop before him. His fierce blue-black eye dipped to the box in her hands. You come bearing your box, once more. His emotionless tone gave little indication of his thoughts. Blinking, Lily followed his gaze and a shamed heat burned through her body as she recalled what had sent her roaming the halls of his home this evening. And you prove that you do not sleep, once more she returned with a soft smile. He reached past her and her breath caught as his powerful arm grazed her shoulder. But he merely shoved the door open. Join me. That old, familiar icy steel underscored those words, more command than anything else, and unease turned in her belly. The recently dulled instinct of wariness learned these past years reared once more. Lily cast a glance over her shoulder. I, I should return to my chambers, she murmured and turned to leave. I, I insist. He shot his cane out, blocking her retreat. Unbidden, her gaze went to the yellow-eyed serpent etched into his cane. An ominous chill spread slowly in her veins, icing her. Do not be silly. You do not fear this man. Not any longer. With that false bravado, she shifted her burden and slipped inside the room. Derek entered behind her, shutting the door with a soft click. He moved past her, striding so close, his broad biceps brushed her arm. He continued walking and came to a stop on the other side of his desk, alongside that intricate revolving bookcase. Unbidden, her gaze wandered to that object and tendrils of foreboding plucked at the corner of her conscience. Come, Lily. Never tell me you've joined me on so many other evenings and now you will hover at the doorway like a thief in the night about to make off with my family's jewels? 
The tendrils stirred all the wilder, blinding in their power. She blinked several times and gave a slow shake of her head. And no. Derek winged a black eyebrow up. No, he drawled. A pit formed in her belly. Did she imagine the contempt of that single word utterance? Do not be a fool, Lily. It was nothing more than her own sense of guilt that caused this rapid staccato beat of her heart. She cast a hesitant glance back at the doorway, contemplating retreat. This cold, icy version of the man she'd come to love. Her thoughts skidded to a jarring halt and her breath caught painfully. Lily? His harsh inquiry jarred her from the panicky thoughts. Please, he swung the tip of his cane to the winged back chair opposite his immaculate desk. Sit. She wet her lips and glided hesitantly forward. With each step, he eyed her through a thick lid, the way a predator honed in on its prey. In a bid to protect herself from the frostiness in that once warm stare, she drew her arms close. The wood box of her youth bit sharply into her chest and she welcomed the distraction of that slight sting of discomfort. Derek sat, then leaned back in his chair, the perfect master of his lair, and sitting stiffly before him as she was, there was an icy dread she'd never before known from him, even on that first, fearful day in this very room. Silence stretched on with her pulse pounding in her ears, deafening, punctuated by the tick-tock of his long case clock so that she thought she was one more beat from that grand piece away from madness. He sprawled back in his chair, elegant in repose and continued to assess her. Open the lid, he said without preamble. She blinked once. Twice. And then a third time. Open. Then all icy indifference gone, he lunged forward in his chair and she jumped. I said, open the lid, he thundered. Fire snapped within the endless blue orb of his eye. Her mind screamed a protest to the frigid disdain that threatened to freeze her from the inside out. Oh, God. Her heart climbed into her throat and she slowly shook her head back and forth. She silently pleaded with a lord who'd proven himself unreal too many times before. For there could be no forgiveness in this. Please no. Yes, madam. Madam? She'd spoken aloud. Derek, she said hoarsely. Her hands of their own volition scrabbled at her throat. You do not understand. Because you did not tell him all. Open it, he thundered. Lily jumped and, with shaking digits, lifted the lid. The click filled the room like a shot in the night. The silence damning. A tear slid down her cheek, then another, and another. How very close she'd been to having all she'd ever dreamed of. Him. A family with him and Flora. Foolish, foolish, woman. The room echoed the still of quiet and their rapidly drawn breaths. Slowly, he climbed to his feet. Derek, she tried again past a thick throat. But there were no words. There was no explaining. There was just Lily, the harlot, now thief, and the situation so very damning in ways she, nay they, could never recover from. Wordlessly, she lifted the bauble that had brought her into his life and forever doomed their love. The air left his lips on a hiss as he peered at the evidence clenched in her fingers. She dropped her gaze. The magnificent piece shifted in and out of focus, blurred by her tears. She let it drop to his desk. Derek stood as immobile as the stone lions that flanked the front steps of his townhouse, and for one long, horrific moment she believed he would not let her speak, that he'd turn her away just as everyone before him. She slid her eyes closed and another tear rolled down her cheek. Only he had more reason to cut her from the fabric of his life than any of the others, before him. He sat down once more and spoke, bringing her eyes open. Who was Sir Henry Holdsworth to you? The rough, guttural evidence bore so much pain and despair that it cleaved her heart in two. Derek continued, not allowing her to respond. And Lucas Holdsworth? Who are they? Her stomach churned with nausea. There was something vile in hearing this man who held her heart utter the name of her late protector. Unable to meet the fury in his eye, 
she looked down at her bare feet. Mr. Lucas Holtworth, he is the son of Sir Henry, and my former protector, she said softly. She curled her hands into tight fists with such force her nails dug into the palms of her hands. It was important Derek at least knew that. He asked me to come into your home, to take from you, and I had such hatred for all who shared George's blood, I convinced myself I could do that. Tears welled in her eyes and she blinked them back, despising the mementos of weakness. But after knowing you, I could not betray you. Her voice shook with an entreaty as she willed him to see. Willed him to see that her soul was inextricably tied to his. The evening she'd abandoned her efforts to help Holdsworth, she'd convinced herself this part she could withhold. She'd deceived herself into believing that in disassociating herself from him, she could be free of the crime that had driven her into this household. What a horrible moment to realize how foolish she'd been with such a hope. At his silence, she raised her head. A muscle jumped at the corner of his eye patch, in that telltale sign of the tension in his tightly leashed frame. Please do not shut me out. She wetted her lips. My protector pledged to see me cared for, so I'd never have to warm another man's bed. Shame turned her neck hot. And it was a pledge he broke. Just as all men gave those broken promises. A spasm of agony racked her heart. Except Derek. He'd never been anything but honorable, believing in her when no one else had. And in the end, she'd betrayed him. Why did you come here? he asked, harshly. Mr. Holdsworth, I, I was never his lover. Her teeth clattered loudly and her body shook with the force of her trembling. As surely you see that I could not betray you. Her words shook with an entreaty as she willed him to see. When in his silence it became apparent that he'd say nothing else, Lily continued to shake. There is no excuse to pardon what brought me here, she said, not knowing where she found the courage to speak the words spilling forth. There is no justification, Derek, she managed hoarsely, pressing her eyes closed. Don't you see? I could not do it. A tear slid down her cheek, then another, and another. I could not do it, she whispered. He is everything I've ever wanted and I'm going to lose him. The inevitability of that truth knifed at her slowly breaking heart. He leveled her with such a frigid black stare, all warmth left her so she thought she'd be cold forever. And yet, it would seem you already have, madam. Her legs trembled under the force of loathing in his eyes. She could not lose him. He was everything she'd never known she needed. He completed her in ways she'd not known her life had been incomplete. Don't you see, I am still here? I'd already resolved to not go through with the theft when you came upon me. A wry, mirthless grin formed on his hard lips. So that is why you were so quick to defy my orders and explore my corridors. A black curse slipped from his lips and she flinched. That was true, but only at first. He surged to his feet once more. When did everything change, Lily? Did you see the poor, scarred, lonely monster and realize you could warm my bed and easily have whatever jewels your heart desired? His words speared her. No, the raspy word tore from her lungs. He was deserving of that ill opinion and, yet, his words had the same effect as if he knifed her heart with a dull blade. I only saw you, she whispered. That is why I could not do what he wished me to do. Lily folded her hands and stared at the interlocked digits. I convinced myself I could do this horrible thing. I was here but a handful of days before I realized I could not. He stood silent, unmoving for so long, that hope fanned in her breast. But then, his expression grew shuddered and, with wooden steps, he crossed the room and poured himself a brandy. He was at sea, amidst a different battlefield, no less horrifying and painful than the ones of Toulouse. Unable to look at Lily, Derek fixed his gaze on the satin wallpaper. He could not stare at the face of the woman who'd made him love and laugh and believe again, only to yank his world apart with her deception. In one quick movement, he finished his drink in a single swallow, welcoming the fiery trail it blazed down his throat. 
He reached for the crystal decanter when she spoke, freezing him mid-movement. Please, do not send me away. Not like the others. The words were as true as if she'd roared them into existence. I love you. Ah, God. The hope she'd stirred to life, fanned once more, powerful under her seductive pull. With every shred of the person he was, Derek wanted to cling to her words as truth. Nausea turned in his belly. She'd been the only person since his return who'd truly looked at him. One utterance away from becoming the snapping, snarling beast he'd been accused of being these years, Derek grabbed the nearest decanter and poured himself another glass. The muscles of his stomach clenched. Why would a beautiful, spirited woman like Lily Benedict come into his home? Why would she take him in her arms, the scarred ogre he was, if it hadn't been born of another reason? The floorboards creaked and the flutter of fabric filled the room, indicating Lily had moved. Will you not say something? He closed his eye, destroyed in ways the fire that had scarred him hadn't been able to. Derek gripped his cane reflexively, his mother's words slamming into him like a kick to the gut. You came back this monster. Surely you do not expect you can go about society looking so. It was all a lie, he whispered. He gripped the snifter so hard, the blood drained from his knuckles. No, Lily positioned herself between him and the sideboard so close her breasts brushed his chest. She took his face in her delicate and perfect hands. It is not true. He flinched as the satiny smoothness of her touch upon his bumped and raised flesh highlighted the absolute lie to her protestations. Derek shook his head, wishing to be the cold, heartless man he'd been before her so that her betrayal didn't even now rouse this agonizing pressure in his chest. That is enough, Derek said, his words hoarse and weak. The muscles of her throat bobbed. I need you to understand. My reasons for being here changed. He gave his head a sad shake, dislodging her touch, and only feeling all the colder for that loss. All along I believed you were here for freedom from the position you'd had as a mistress and I did not condemn you for the life you lived. Her lower lip trembled and he shifted his focus away from that telltale sign of her misery or else risk becoming further lost in this deceptive masquerade she'd sucked him into, where reality was nothing more than a dressed-up falsity. But you were not here for anything other than revenge against my brother and a thirst for a diamond. No, she whispered. I never wanted it. Her eyes, windows into her soul, bled with regret and pain. Then, with a guilty glimmer in the endless depths, she slid her gaze away from his. At last, it all made sense, the ease with which she'd defied his orders and wandered the halls of his house. All the times he'd found her in his empty office. It had never been about him. No. She'd been here for no other reason than to steal from him. The pain of that lanced his heart and he wanted to toss his head back and howl like a true, savage beast. Get out, he said in hushed tones. Lily jerked as though she'd been struck, but, with a hasty curtsy, grabbed her box and bolted for the door. Of course. Her barely their whisper came so faint he strained to hear. She stumbled over herself in her haste to back away from him. She reached the front of the room and paused with her fingers on the handle. It was not a lie, she said, not taking her gaze from the wood panel. I have been a whore and a liar and dd. Her voice cracked and he squeezed his eyes shut, pain ripping at his insides, shredding him. And done a number of things I wish I could undo, but I cannot. Those are sins I will always carry with me. I came here intending to steal from you. She drew in a shuddering sigh and the aching sadness of that sound brought his eye open. She faced him once more. The muscles of his stomach contracted, and he gripped the edge of his sideboard. Do not let her deceive you, do not let her have you play the fool once again. I never wanted to be another man's whore, Derek. I wanted so desperately to disappear and carve out a new life where no one knew who I was. She sucked in a slow breath. What I was, she amended. I didn't believe there could be more for me. She held his gaze squarely. Until I met you, and you made me feel, 
made me see there was more. There was you, and Flora. The muscles of his throat worked. Ah, uh, stop, or I will be completely and irrevocably lost. I came here intending to steal from you, but you were the one who stole something. You stole my heart, and whether you wish it or not, it will always belong, to you. She turned to go, when her gaze lingered upon his well-worn leather-winged back seat, and then she looked about the room. This office had been the first place he'd seen her. How very fitting that this should also be the last. Lily, he said quietly, when she again made to leave. Was any of it real? Everything. She said, her voice cracking. More lies. He cursed roundly and her cheeks flushed red. I will have my belongings packed, she said quietly and made to leave once more. That was it? She would leave so easily, so effortlessly without any further compunction? Did you expect anything else? She'd only been here for one thing, after all. Derek growled. Halt. She turned back. Your grace? Something about that grating use of his title set his teeth on edge. By God, he was the beast and his grace, to all. With her, she'd been different. Or I wanted her to be. Pain squeezed so hard at his heart, how was there not a mark of blood upon his chest? She was no different, but she was still no less useful. Her purpose still no less necessary. You are not leaving. She tipped her head at an endearing angle. A black curl slipped from her artful arrangement and tumbled down her shoulder. Which only put him with reminders of her as she'd been with those luxuriant tresses, draped about them. Lust slammed into him and he focused on that safe, empty desiring for her body, that was safer than the stirrings inside his chest. He folded his arms and passed a glance over her. That up and down scrutiny brought her shoulders back. God, she was magnificent in her indignation, a regality to rival the proudest of queens. I still have not decided what I am to do with you. For when she was gone, the last glimmer of light in his otherwise dark world would be forever extinguished. He rolled his shoulders. Lily pursed her lips and, for a long moment, he expected her to launch into a familiar scolding. You would keep me a prisoner here, then? Derek propped his hip on the sideboard. Would you find Newgate preferable? The color leached from her cheeks. She sucked in her breath and agony sluiced through him. Even with her lies and deception, God help him, he loved her so. Madness. His judgment was as faulty as his vision. For he could no sooner send the lady off to Newgate than he could carve out his remaining eye. We are through here for now, Miss Benedict. Now and forever. Tears filled her eyes. Derek, she whispered, pulling that damning box closer to her chest. I. Swallowing a curse, he shoved away from her. You are dismissed. Lily hesitated and, for one sliver of a broken heartbeat, he thought she would issue protestations thought she would bow her love and explain away the damning evidence in that bloody box she carried so close. Instead, she dropped her gaze to the floor and walked from the room, leading him as he'd been for a long time before her, alone. Chapter 23 Early the next morning, Lily lay Abed staring up at that imperfect ceiling. By Derek's discovery last night and his very clear threats of Newgate, she should be filled with suitable terror over her fate. She rolled onto her side and looked to the floor-length window. The crimson and burnt orange rays of the early morning sun penetrated the thin crack in the curtains, spilling into the room with a fiery glow. Yet, where self-preservation and security had driven her into this very household, now there was nothing but a hollow emptiness. For so many years, she'd lived for no one but herself and thoughts of her own future. But what was a future with no one in it? What were security or safety and fine cottages tucked on the edge of the world if there was no one to share that world with? Her lips twisted. How ironic to realize as much, too late. With a frustrated sigh, she sprawled backward on her bed and it groaned in protest. A faint knock sounded once at the door. 
Lily looked across the room at the Ormolu clock atop the mantel. She squinted in the dimly lit space to bring those numbers into focus. Five o'clock. She looked to the door once more. No doubt she'd merely imagined. Rap. Another muffled knock split the morning quiet. Who would have need of her at this hour? Who, other than? Her breath caught on a sharp gasp. She swung her legs over the side of the bed and jumped to her feet. Fluttering a hand about her heart, she stared at that wooden panel. Movements fueled by hope, Lily raced across the room. She yanked the door open with such force the figure on the other side of that door toppled into the room. Forgive me, ma'am, the young maid said breathlessly, writing herself. Lily shot a hand out to help steady the girl. Claudia, she said, regret tinging her words. Ma'am, the girl repeated. She cleared her throat. A blush stained her cheeks and she averted her gaze. I've been sent to assist you. Lily hovered at the doorway and then pushed the door closed as Claudia advanced further into the room. Quite early. She hummed to herself. Quite early, indeed, she paused mid-song to repeat. With precise movements, she made her way to the armoire, positioned at the center of the room. Assist me? Lily stared at her blankly as a pit settled in her belly. He is going to send me away. Surely not. Surely not in this remote manner. Surely there would be a goodbye, and, something. Something more than this. She gripped the edge of the hardwood panel with such force her nails bit into the wood. Feeling adrift on the water without any oars, Lily continued to stand and watch as Claudia tossed open the armoire doors and drew out a serviceable day dress. Wordlessly, the young woman helped her through her morning ablutions and then, instead of taking her leave, returned to the armoire and proceeded to fill her arms with Lily's handful of satin dresses. What are you doing? she asked, those words so faintly spoken, she barely heard them herself. Through that inquiry, Claudia continued rushing back and forth, from armoire, to bed. What are you doing? she repeated, this time unable to keep the frantic note of desperation from her question. Claudia looked up from her task. Regret lined her face. Oh, ma'am, she whispered. She froze mid-step and drew the blue satin gown with black overlay close to her chest. You do not know? Lily clenched and unclenched the fabric of her dress. Do not know what, she asked, not even requiring an answer. She knew precisely what the young woman would say. His grace has ordered you gone. Oh, God. Even expecting it as she'd been, her legs buckled and she shot her hands out searching for purchase. He would so easily turn her out. An eerie reminiscence to another moment much like this flooded in. Only she'd been a girl of sixteen, crying and pleading, while her belongings were hastily thrown into the same valise in a similar manner. You are a whore. There is no place for you here. An agonized moan ripped from her throat. Claudia relinquished the gowns in her hands and raced across the room. No, no, ma'am, she said softly, chewing at her lower lip. She flung an arm about Lily's shoulders and guided her across the room. It is not a statement of your work. She pursed her lips and a hard glint lit her eyes, giving the innocent young woman a hardened edge that belied the innocent she'd first met a week ago. It is a testament to the beast he truly is. He is no beast, Lily forced out past a thickened throat and gratefully claimed a seat upon the mattress. For even with his callous removal of her from his life, Derek was still a man who loved deeply and defended those deserving of it. She'd merely been one who'd duped him and then stolen those gifts as though she had a right to them. Tisk, TSK. Rushing you out in this manner? The young woman gave her head a shake. Not at all good of him, ma'am, and for all you've done for his grace and the girl. For all she'd done? She'd come here with the most dishonest of intentions, garnered his trust, and then ultimately betrayed him with her presence here. No, Claudia did not know all those pieces. 
she only knew the impossibly cool facade Derek presented to the world. Lily, however, had seen past that to the man he was, the one who longed to be loved and know that sentiment in return, a man who'd given up on the hope of it. He is a good man, she said quietly. A man who was wholly deserving of a good woman's heart. A lady. Not the whore who'd lain with his brother. Claudia made a noncommittal noise and rushed to continue packing Lily's belongings. As each garment disappeared within that worn and tattered valise, panic grew inside her breast, with past and present melding into one horrifyingly ambiguity she could not sort out. A peculiar numbness took away all hurt, all pain, all feeling so she felt nothing but a hollow emptiness. Lily's throat worked. Once, not too long ago, she would have been focused on nothing but her own uncertain future and security. Now, it mattered not. Nothing did, beyond losing him and the life they might have lived together. Tears filled her eyes. How very neatly and effortlessly Derek had cut her from the fabric of his life. With his harsh ducal command yesterday, he'd relegated her to more prisoner than servant, and now, not even that. The sunlight filtered through the drawn curtains, mockingly cheerful, with its false brightness. And when the last article was packed and she was scuttled off, the only joy she'd ever truly known would exist as nothing more than a painful memory. Of Derek. Of Flora. Oh, God. Lily climbed to her feet. This loss was greater than any other she'd known. George, she'd never loved him. She'd been infatuated with him the way any naive girl might be of a lofty lord. Not this love she had for Derek, a sentiment that had the power to cut her open and heal her all at the same time. The maid clicked the valise, closed, and looked questioningly up. Ma'am? Lily dimly registered the tears staining her cheeks and she turned away, discreetly brushing her hands over those useless mementos. I am ready. She'd leave as Derek ordered, but she would at least see Flora one more time. To leave without so much as a parting would only fuel the idea the girl had never been anything more than her charge. I would make my goodbyes to Lady Flora. Her voice cracked, and she turned to go. The floorboards creaked as Claudia raced across the room. She shot a hand about Lily's forearm and gave her a look that was both regretful and determined. No, ma'am. He will not allow it. But. He has a footman waiting outside your room to escort you to the carriage. It has been readied. A half-laugh, half-sob lodged in her throat. The sea carriage, she managed. He truly did see her as nothing more than a thief in his home. The carriage that would bring her, where? She slid her eyes closed, as that age-old panic crept in. The same terror of being alone, reliant upon only herself to survive in a cold and grasping world. Lily forced her eyes open and managed a jerky nod. Very well, she said tightly. But I will speak to Der, his grace, she amended, before I go. For what? What is there to say? I've given him my love and apologies. Neither is strong enough to erase his mistrust and my own crimes. I'm sorry, Claudia said gently. He'll not allow it. Lily folded her arms close and squeezed tight. How coldly impersonal this departure was, her sacking. Dictatorial, more than anything. He could not even bring himself to speak to her. The agony of that sucked the breath from her lungs. Claudia added Lily's box to her valise and snapped it closed with a decisive click that rang a finality. It is over. Never again would she see Derek. Touch him. Talk to him and with him. His life would continue as it had been before her, as though she'd never existed. She sucked in a shuddering breath. The young maid picked up the bag, jolting her to the moment. Numbed, Lily held out trembling fingers. I will see to my belongings. Of course, ma'am. Claudia handed it over and started for the door when she suddenly stopped and looked back. You deserved better than this place and this end, ma'am. Her eyes misted. We both did. 
The world is not a kind place, is it? And yet, with her sunny disposition and ever-present smile one such as her knew nothing of the blackness that existed. Not in the way Lily did. They stepped into the hall where a burly footman stood in wait. The muscles of his forearms strained the crimson fabric of his liveried uniform. He reached for her bag and she waved him off with a murmured thanks. With a slight nod, he waited for her to move and then he fell into step alongside her and Claudia. How very easily Claudia could have gone on and see to her morning duties and, yet, she remained with Lily until she should leave. That gentle support tugged at her heart and she blinked to see past the tears clouding her vision. In this house, she'd known more kindness and love than she'd known since she'd been cast out. She shot one more glance over her shoulder at her rooms and then beyond to Flora's. How could a person come to mean so very much to her in such a short time? A sob stuck in her throat and she buried it with her hand. Tisk, tsk, none of that, Claudia chided. As she silently followed the maid from the halls, she cast another last look back at her chambers and Flora's rooms. Quiet, devoid of life, there was something both eerie and peaceful in the Duke's corridors all at the same time. Lily reached the end of the corridor and made to go right down the hall toward the main foyer when Claudia held a hand up. She gave a sheepish look. His grace would have you use the servant's entrance. She jerked. The servant's entrance. Of course, that was the only role she'd served here, to him. To Lily, the fragile relationship they'd built as two broken souls who'd for a too brief moment had stolen happiness in one another had been something so much more. Of course, she managed to rasp out. She tightened her grip reflexively about the handle of her valise, curling her fingers so tight they went numb from her hold. With her shoulders squared, she started down the corridor, past those now, coldly triumphant, ducal ancestors. They descended the narrow set of stairs. She blinked in an attempt to adjust her eyes to the darkened space. Claudia stole a quick look about. Did she avoid Lily's eyes? Then their gazes collided and there was a fleeting flash of guilt, gone as quickly as it had come. Thomas will show you to the carriage, Miss Bennett. She angled to face the girl. Pinpricks of unease dotted her skin as Claudia made to step around her. You called me Miss Bennett. The girl froze. Ma'am? She cocked her head. Such a mistake could have been any accidental, coincidental slip-up, and yet. Lily's heart kicked up a funny beat. Claudia looked beyond her shoulder to the footman and a look passed between them. Then the servant lunged. Oh, God. Lily took a breath to scream when he slapped a hand over her mouth muffling that sound. The valise tumbled from her fingers and she kicked and flailed, catching Claudia in the stomach for her efforts. The girl cried out and she reveled in that warning cry. That moment too fleeting as the footman at her back cursed. Get out of here, you bloody fool. Claudia's gaze reflected an apology and regret all at once. Lily implored her with her eyes. Why? Why would she do this? The answer to that would never come. Thomas dragged her flailing figure through the hall. Her heart thundered hard and fast as she struggled to draw in panicked breaths, bucking and twisting against the hold of her captor. You shouldn't have fought me, bitch, the footman whispered harshly against her ear. He didn't want you hurt. Lily bit down hard on the flesh of the man's palm. He quietly cursed and cuffed her in the temple. Silver flecks danced before her eyes and she struggled to blink back the ringing echoing in her ears. She let loose a scream from deep within her throat that sound muffled by the humming of her ears and the coarseness of his hand. Thomas cursed once more and punched her in the side of the head. Her eyes slid closed and the world went black. A loud humming filled Lily's ears and she struggled to see through the thick curtain clouding her vision. With a pounding at her temples, she forced her eyes open. A splash of sunlight slapped her face and she groaned, closing her eyes against the pain of that blinding brightness. Bile climbed her throat at the agony clamoring around her brain. 
In a bid to escape the agony of her body's pain, she rolled onto her side, but her body jerked with resistance. That slight tug sent pain shooting up her numbed arms. What in blazes? With effort, Lily forced her eyes open once more, and, this time, the world came back into focus. Horror crept in with an agonizing slowness, and then when it reached the surface, it unfurled, Derek sending her off, Claudia and Thomas's treachery. Lily gave a frantic tug and tingling pain shot down her arms at the tight knots binding her wrists. She wrestled, struggling back and forth. Faint weeping penetrated her own panic and Lily froze mid-movement. Her breath came hard and fast as she scanned her frantic gaze over the familiar room. And then her belly churned with nausea all over again, for reasons that had nothing to do with pain. She took in the cheerful cottage, the modest chintz curtains, the matching floral upholstered sofa, and then she pressed her eyes closed to keep from casting the contents of her stomach upon the floor of this hated home, one she'd wished to never see again. And now she was here, as some kind of living hell with that very familiar little figure trussed up like a Christmas goose on the sofa opposite her. Mrs. B. Benedict, Flora whispered, her face white. I am scared. Chapter 24 You don't welcome changes to your schedule. The analytical observation from down the corridor brought a rush of heat up Derek's neck. I also don't welcome inane ramblings. He infused a harsh edge to those words to deter further probing on Dr. Carlson's part. What madness had compelled him to send round for the doctor this morning? Why, when it was just as the other man said and Derek preferred his well-ordered life without deviations or interruptions? Because I am a friendless bugger, in need of a friend. And yet, you've requested my presence here this day. The other man was too bloody clever for his own good. Or rather for Derek's own good. Derek stomped down the hall, moving with a single-minded purpose. He concentrated on each bloody, agonizing step and stretch of his long-ago, torn muscles. For how long had he believed there was no other greater pain than these weekly sessions with his doctor, sessions that were as hopeless as they were helpless? You do not need to move at that brisk pace, your grace, Carlson called into the distance between them. Derek made a crude gesture and continued marching on with the doctor's laughter trailing behind him. Yes, there had been no greater pain than the misery of his own existence. There was nothing more agonizing than his circumstances. He reached the end of the hall and came to a stop before that portrait of a stranger. Gasping from his exertions, he brushed the back of his sleeve over his damp brow and stared up at the young man there. That man was dead. He had died long ago and he was never, ever coming back. He braced for the familiar ache of regret. That didn't come. With the loss of his friends and the death of his sister, Derek had discovered the true meaning of loss. It was not the once perfect flesh upon his face. It was those who'd craved his friendship and caring even when he'd shut them out with his every vile utterance, action, and, worse, inaction. The truth slammed into him like a fist to the gut. And he damned Lily Benedict for having made him feel, when it was vastly easier to feel nothing. I gather by your usual surliness, there have been difficulties with a lady. Dr. Carlson's unerringly accurate charge brought him around so quickly, he tripped and stumbled against the wall. Derek cursed and quickly righted himself. The angry words he'd have once uttered died on his lips. For, he'd been so very long without a friend, a prisoner in his own home, his mind with nothing but these grating walls and his tortured thoughts. She was a bloody liar, Carlson, he hissed. The sure-footed doctor strode down the hall. Oh. In what ways? The shame of her deception and his own desperate need to believe she could have ever felt anything for him humbled him into temporary silence. Dr. Carlson stopped before him. Theirs was a relationship that moved beyond even the closest friendship Derek had known in his youth. This was a man who'd brought him back to the living when he'd been pleading to be left with the dead. He was a man who'd taken the broken man confined to a chair, closed in his rooms, and forced him to put his legs into some semblance of use. The young woman showed up on my doorstep and demanded the post of governess. 
and I fell hopelessly and helplessly in love with her. The muscles of his face contorted in a spasm of pain and he turned away to conceal that telling show. I fell for the bloody governess, he said, tiredly. The doctor drummed his fingertips together and contemplated him in that manner of a man of science studying a puzzling challenge. And you find it to be a problem you fell for Lady Flora's governess. He scoffed. Come, look at me, Carlson. Do I appear a man who'd pass judgment on a person for their station? The other man arched an eyebrow in return. Why, because you are scarred? Derek cursed. Yes, because I'm scarred. These things matter, he said, slashing the air with his hand. The abrupt movement sent his weight pushing over his thigh and pain gripped him, momentarily sucking his ability to think. He drew in several deep, calming breaths. Because I'm a man who can't walk, he said, at last. Because I'm a man who would rather be thrust into the middle of a battlefield than step outside the walls of my townhouse. Because I am incapable of the warmth my sister rightfully deserved and the care my niece still does deserve. The other man gave him a long look. And you believe that matters to your Mrs. Benedict? She's not my Mrs. Benedict, he gritted out. She'd never been his. Or had she? Surely soulful eyes and passionate lips could have not lied with such finesse. Derek leaned against the wall, still unable to meet the other man's eyes. Would you have the truth? He didn't wait for a response. The lady was here for nothing more than to steal from me. She found the prized diamond she sought and all along she was only here. His mind shied away from revealing the most intimate piece of what she'd shared, his brother and the man she'd taken as her lover. Those belonged to nobody but her, and now him. She was only here? Dr. Carlson prodded. On a matter of revenge, he settled for. Against my family. And I was so desperate to know love and the feel of a woman that I allowed myself to believe the lies she fed me were truths. Silence descended on his revelation. Carlson was calmly stoic and logical as he always was, in all matters. Well, how do you know they weren't truths? Derek blinked. Did the lady make off with the diamond? She discovered it. He allowed the agony of that discovery to wash over him again with the same vicious pain. Dr. Carlson adjusted his wire lenses. She discovered it, committed the theft, and then left? I love you, I could not go through with it. Derek furrowed his brow. She had discovered the diamond and had it on her person, and yet, she'd remained. Why would she do that? Why if that had been the only reason she'd been here? I love you, I could not go through with it. He made a sound of impatience and at his doctor's, prodding stare, then he limped off. You don't understand, he mumbled. Oh. The amused drawl. You've hated yourself for years, your grace. You've tried to run people off and have proven largely successful. Thank you. His sister's visage flashed to mind. Then Maxwell and St. Cyr. All of them, he'd effectively cut off from his life. It wasn't a compliment, the doctor returned. I was being sarcastic, he muttered. Long ago he'd lost all traces of his humor. A wry grin formed on the other man's lips. I know. Oh. Dr. Carlson gestured to him. Horrible things happen to you, your grace. I will not deny that. Suffering no person should ever have to know, and yet you knew that pain, and still do. You'd spend the whole of your life shut away believing yourself undeserving of any warmth, believing no one can see good in you when it is you who cannot see the good in you. Those words speared Derek with shock. It ran through him with a potent accuracy that left him speechless. After the horror of looking upon himself and seeing the world's disdain, he'd spent years shaping himself into that unfeeling monster. How long had he spent believing himself unworthy? Until Lily came along. Unafraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, she'd dragged him by his proverbial heels from the shadows. She'd not fled. 
he recalled her as she'd been yesterday with agony etched in the delicate planes of her face and her whispered words. No, those were not the actions or words of a deceiver. Why would she have entered his office with that diamond? The air left him on a slow exhale. She wouldn't. There had been no reason for her to return to his office with that damning piece in her possession, no place for her to be in the precise halls he'd forbade her from entering with the diamond in her hands. My God, he whispered. She was returning it. There was no other accounting. But he'd not allowed her to speak. She'd begged to be heard out and instead, he'd spat and hissed and snarled like the beast he'd been accused of being because it was the only protection he'd known, and because it was easier than letting her in. Only it hadn't been easier. It had left him hollow and empty, aching for her. Footsteps sounded at the end of the hall and he looked up, grateful for the distraction. His heart lifted on the hope that the same woman he'd ordered to her chambers had defied him yet again. Disappointment sank that hope as Harris called out, Your Grace. The high-pitched tenor, steeped in panic, as it always was. Derek narrowed his eye, as the man rushed forward with, he squinted, with, Lily's valise? He stared blankly at it. She was leaving. What reason did I give her to stay? What is it, Harris, he interrupted when the man drew to a panting stop before him. This was discovered in the corridors of the servants' hall, the other man blurted out. He shook his head. What was the man on about? Mrs. Benedict is gone, the man whispered. A loud humming filled his ears like a thousand swarming bees, and Derek dug his fingers into them to turn sounds into words. Gone? Did that, sharp, desperate question belong to him? For her departure could only signal. He looked to the valise. Her bag. She'd left her bag. The niggling trace of dread worked its way around his belly. He looked to Dr. Carlson, the man of logic and reason, and found the lines of his face etched in concern. And Lady Flora is missing, as well. Harris's frantic words jerked his attention back. He stumbled forward and caught the man by the lapels of his jacket. What do you mean, Lady Flora as well, he demanded sharply, giving the man a shake. The butler swallowed hard and reached between them to fish a note from his pocket. This just arrived, Your Grace. Derek swiftly released the man and yanked the sheet from his fingers. He opened the ivory vellum and quickly scanned the contents of the note. His body went cold. He jerked his head up. When did this arrive? he rasped. Be but a few moments ago. Derek dropped his stare to the sheet once more, the chilling foreboding worked through his being like a venomous serpent slowly spreading his poison to his entire being. You have something I require. If you would see the restoration of two things of great importance to you, make for Lawton. You will find a cottage at the edge of River Rodig, halfway between the marsh and the forest. If you value the safety of that which is in my care, you are to arrive alone. Oh, God. The earth dipped and swayed, and he closed his eye, sucking in great, gasping breaths. He believed his life empty before, but he'd been so, so wrong. If there was no Lily and Flora, there was nothing for him. His heart would cease to function. Your grace? Dr. Carlson prodded. He folded the page and stuffed it into the front of his jacket. His skin burned with the intensity of the men's stares. Carlson, we are finished here for the day. Harris, he said quietly. Will you have a mount readied? The man hesitated. He exchanged a look with the doctor and then returned his attention to Derek. Your mount, sir, he whispered. Sweat beaded on his brow the perspiration having nothing to do with his earlier exertions and everything to do with the terror churning through him. He'd not climbed astride a horse since Toulouse. Were the muscles of his legs even capable of those old movements? You are strong enough, Carlson murmured, correctly interpreting the path his thoughts had traveled. He managed a nod. I also require something from my office. The servant with full use of his legs could accomplish both tasks far quicker than Derek could ever hope to. 
God, how he hated those old battle wounds more than ever. As Derek instructed him where to find the cursed diamond, Harris furrowed his brow. Go, Harris, he urged. The man raced off. His footsteps echoed from the walls of the silent corridors. With a fast-building dread, Derek limped across the room and retrieved his jacket and cane. He shrugged into the garment and then, with his doctor at his side, he made his way through his house to the foyer. His breath came hard and fast, though he no longer knew if it was the fear pounding at his chest or the exertions of the pace he'd set. How in blazes was he, an invalid, without use of his leg, a man who'd exited his home but a handful of times in the past seven years, capable of going out and saving anyone? The days of his battlefield heroics had died a quick, fiery death, and yet. He narrowed his eye into a hard slit, focused on the end of the corridor. Yet the same warrior's bloodlust that had raged in the thick of battle filled his mouth so all he saw, tasted, or heard was the death of the man who dared touch Lily and Flora. As Derek's cane clacked noisily upon the hardwood floor, silence otherwise reigned throughout his household. A household devoid of cheer and sound in life, not even two weeks prior. And yet, it now felt more a home than the one he'd known even as a boy, unscarred and unmarked by life. He and Carlson reached the foyer when the other man suddenly stopped. He held a hand up. Your Grace, you do know I am the soul of discretion. If there is anything you require? He managed a jerky nod. Thank you, he said, his tone gruff. For the miserable bugger he'd been to Carlson through the years, the man had shown him a loyalty and friendship he'd never been deserving of. Carlson sketched a bow. Derek paused at the threshold of the corridor and eyed the marble foyer. More specifically, the door. The door outside. The door that led out into peering eyes, and rabid stares, and disgusted looks. The door that would thrust him back into a world where all remembered the man he'd once been and the beast he now was. Through the fabric of his gloves, his palms moistened and fear sucked the moisture from his mouth. He did not leave these doors. He'd not done so since he'd destroyed another man's life. Or attempted to. Ultimately, love prevailed. Love was also the reason Derek even now stood prepared to exit those doors and re-enter the living. Drawing forth a steadying breath, he limped forward. His butler stood patiently in wait, with Derek's cloak and hat in his hands. He took the hat from the servant and then allowed him to assist him into his cloak. You have? Here, your grace. Harris reached into the front of his jacket and withdrew the weighty diamond. Derek stared at the jewel fought over by so many families. An empty, cold, lifeless stone. As he accepted it and stuffed it inside his jacket, Derek's throat seized. Lily and Flora's life hung in the balance for this meaningless bauble. By God, he'd see that bastard in hell before he let him harm either of the people he loved. He looked briefly to his butler a man who'd been more patient than Derek had ever deserved. Thank you, Harris, he said, his voice hoarsened by emotion. You are quite welcome, your grace. Please bring both young ladies back, he said as he pulled open the front door. Derek swallowed hard. How loyal his servants were to her. Because they'd seen what Derek, blinded by his own hurt, had failed to note. She was all that was good and honorable who'd been reduced to desperate acts in order to survive. Never again. When he brought her back, she would be his duchess and never know struggle or suffering again. He made to take a step forward and then froze. After years of being shut away, stepping out into the world riddled him with a mind-numbing terror of the like he'd not even known upon the fields of battle. I cannot do this. He'd been closeted away so long, a recluse, for so many years. His one foray into the light had only brought more darkness. Dusting his trembling hand against the side of his leg, he tried to make his limbs move. For them, I can do anything. You are ready. He blinked. Did those words belong to him? It is time. Derek turned back to where Dr. Carlson stood. The other man gave him a slight smile and then notched his chin at the entrance. 
and Derek stepped outside into the light. Chapter 25 Were anyone to enter the cozy, modestly decorated cottage, the persons assembled could have been taken as a bucolic family amidst a country setting. Having cajoled him into untying their bindings earlier, Lily sat beside Flora on the chintz sofa, the girl curled against her side, while the gentleman at the window stood with his back presented to them. Hands clasped loosely behind him, he stared out, as he had been staring for the better part of the morning. Another tremor shook the girl's frame and Lily made a soothing noise, patting the top of her brown curls. It is going to be all right, she whispered close to her ear, unsure of whether she sought to reassure the child or herself. For the reality was, after being closeted away all morning in this miserable cottage she'd called home for six years, Lily knew not what twisted purpose her late protector's son had with her. Bait, I am the fat bait, no different than the fish I hooked as a girl. Flora cast wide, fearful eyes up at her. I miss Uncle Derek. Her chest tightened painfully. I do, too, pop it. To provide a useless distraction, Lily grabbed for the book resting on the side table and popped it open. What if I read to you a bit more, would you care for that? Flora managed a nod and as Lily shuffled through the pages of the book, Holdsworth whistled an eerie tune that in its cheer belied the thick tension blanketing this room. You know, you really should have just given me what I required, Miss Bennett. Lily paused mid-movement and looked up from the small, leather volume. The little girl at her side shook like a leaf in the midst of a violent storm and Lily forced her next words into a semblance of calm. You want the diamond, Mr. Holtzworth, and it is not mine to give. The man pursed his lips like a frowning society matron. It was my diamond, Miss Bennett, and I'll not explain my need of it. She flared her eyes and took in those details she'd previously missed about the man, his threadbare clothes, the condition of this aged little cottage. Why, the man was in Dunn territory and saw that diamond as the answer to his financial salvation. Do you expect you might simply take the Duke of Blackthorne's niece and not be held accountable for it? His mouth tightened all the more and as fury snapped to life in his cruel eyes, Lily jumped to her feet and moved away from the girl deliberately putting distance between herself and this tiny target he'd absconded with. I expect he'll exchange something that I care very deeply for, in return for two somethings he cares very deeply for. A shudder ran along her spine at the emotionless delivery of his plans. Why, this man had abducted her and Derek's niece all with the intentions of forcing the return of that coveted diamond. Madness. The man was utterly mad. You think I am mad, do you? Lily stitched her eyebrows together. You spoke aloud, miss, Flora whispered at her back. Holdsworth relinquished his place at the window and strode over. As he approached, Lily retreated until she collided with the opposite wall. You think you are so different than me, do you? Hmm, he needled. You would call me a madman because I would have retribution for the theft committed against my family. Tell me, Miss Bennett. He folded his arms. How was your or Claudia's willingness to enter the Duke's home any different than my own? Claudia? Her mind turned slowly. Claudia, she asked, fishing about for an answer as to how a trusted maid in Derek's small but loyal contingent of servants had so deceived. Holdsworth chuckled. Come, surely you don't believe you are the only young woman wronged by the late powerful Duke of Blackthorn. The world is not a kind place, is it, ma'am? Claudia's words filtered around her memory. She'd looked upon the young woman and seen a figure of innocence, devoid of Lily's own inner ugliness. How quick they all were to see the facade they so desperately needed, an honorable protector, a trustworthy governess, a loyal, innocent maid. Yes, you are no different than me, Holdsworth taunted. You are as easily a thief. He flicked a hard gaze over her. The only difference, Miss Bennett, is that my family was the rightful owner of that piece, where you, well, your actions against Blackthorn were driven by nothing more than a matter of revenge. Naza turned in her belly. The fact Holdsworth wasn't entirely wrong shamed her and she looked over to the girl, seated on the sofa, taking in the entire exchange with wide eyes. 
Would any innocence remain if, nay when, Flora escaped Holtworth's clutches? Or would she at last see the world through lenses jaded by life? I did this. I visited this evil upon Flora and Derek. Unable to meet the girl's eyes, she looked away. As though bored, Holdsworth tugged out his watch fob and consulted the time. Let her go. Lily tried once more as he stuffed the piece back into the front of his jacket. In a flurry of skirts, she rushed over to him. Your actions against the ward of a duke and the daughter of a former marquis will never be forgiven, but your actions against me, a vicar's daughter, turned mistress, they can be explained away. Her words gave him pause. Fear danced in his eyes. The man was not entirely stupid. He knew he played with a hangman's noose by his actions here. Lily grasped at that fear and twisted it. What good will a diamond or wealth be when you are discovered? She paused. Which you will be. She let that truth sink in and then continued. But if you release her now, no one will know. No one except the equally black souls, Claudia, her, Thomas. Holdsworth cursed. You are a fool if you believe that. Even now, I've had him summoned. Her heart started. Him? Blackthorn. Lily smoothed her features to not allow this monster a glimpse of the tumult raging within. He had summoned Derek here. He would expect the Duke, in all his terror of venturing out, to come to the edge of London and retrieve his ward and her, a woman he'd rather see to the devil than anything else. A knock split the quiet and she looked to the door, blinking slowly as Holtworth strode over. He peered around the curtain and then pulled the door open. The man who'd clout her had since divested himself of his too tight livery. He didn't spare a look for the other occupants of the room. He should arrive any moment. Her heart stuttered. Let it be another he. Let some other man be even now awaiting. Holdsworth gave a pleased nod. And the note instructed him to arrive alone? It did. An ugly smile twisted his lips that chilled Lily from the inside out. And staring at the greedy man with the glint of madness in his eyes, the truth struck hard in her chest, none of them would survive. He intended to kill them all for his material gain. No, she whispered, staring on in horror as the two men casually spoke, periodically nodding to one another. It was why he did not worry about discovery at Derek's hands. She slid her gaze over to Flora who sat huddled on the sofa, her chubby cheeks pale, and then, cautiously Lily slipped across the room, not taking her gaze from the two men engrossed in discussion. She reached the side of the sofa and leaned down. I need you to come with me, she whispered. Lily held a hand out and helped Flora up. Leaning down, she put her lips close to her ear. You are to make your way down the hall. To those hated chambers she'd called her own for too many years. There is a latched window. You are to go out it. Do not wait for me. You are to run and continue running. While she issued the directives, she kept her gaze trained on the two men at the front of the room. When you find someone, you need to tell them you are the Duke of Blackthorn's charge and they will help you. Do you understand? I'm... She pressed her fingertip to the girl's lips, muffling that sound. Go, she mouthed as Holdsworth and his lackey concluded their discussion. They turned back to her, just as Flora disappeared down the hall. Tie them? Holdsworth looked about. He flared his eyes in panic. Lily gave a triumphant smile and strolled to the opposite end of the parlor, guiding their attention away from that fleet-footed child. Is something the matter, she jeered, placing a sofa between them. Holdsworth roared and flipped a nearby side table. Find the bloody girl, he thundered to Thomas, who set off in search. She raced to put herself between the lumbering brute and Flora, momentarily halting his search. He growled and hurled her out of the way as though she were nothing more than a child's toy. Lily slammed hard into the plaster wall, wincing as pain shot down her shoulder. She cried out as Holdsworth grabbed her by the forearms and dragged her up so their noses touched. 
Her skin throbbed under the viciousness of his grip. Where in blazes is she, he shouted, shaking her so hard, her teeth rattled. Lily grinned through the pain. She is gone, Mr. Holtsworth, and you have nothing left to barter his grace for other than me. Agony carved away at her heart. And I am afraid for you, you've the one person he'd rather never again see. He cursed roundly and then punched her in the head. She crumpled to the floor. The metallic taste of blood flooded her senses, sickening and sweet, nearly choking her. She blinked past the stars dotting her vision and raised a trembling hand to her nose. Warmth coated her fingers and she looked down at her crimson-stained fingers. You had better hope for your benefit that when he arrives that is not the case, he hissed. Because your life is forfeit, then. And yet, as he made quick work of tying her limp body and tossing her to the floor, Lily sat staring at the empty hearth rather suspecting her life already was. Derek stared through the thick cops, straining with his eye to bring the modest, thatched-roof cottage into focus. Tucked away as it was, the stone-front home with its cheerful, if overgrown, garden settled in the woods, may as well have been a fey creature's castle. He strode closer and with each step, his leg buckled and groaned in protest. Before this moment, he despised himself for that imperfection for reasons of his own bruised ego. Now he wanted to be whole again, the man he'd been on the battlefield who'd earned commendations and inspired awe so he could be the person Lily and Flora deserved. Derek grimaced and came to a stop beside a towering elm. Shielding himself behind the massive trunk, he rubbed the stiff muscles of his leg and stared at the cottage. What if they were now dead? What if? He shoved aside the torturous musings and drew forth the years of battlefield experience that had turned him into a ruthless killer of soldiers. It mattered not whether this man had harmed Lily. His life was forfeit. He fueled himself with that safe truth and when a young, very familiar-looking man stepped out of the cottage, his mind went numb as he recognized him as one of the servants in his employ. He'd allowed this man into his home and any number of others who'd set out to destroy him and those he loved. This is what comes from separating myself from the living. Where are ye, girl, the man's quietly spoken words filtered through the quiet. If ye don't come back ere, I'll kill the lady. You want me to kill her? Off to the man's right, a thatch of trees rustled and the brood of a fellow spun back. Derek's heart stilled at that faint whimpering from within. A slow, evil grin twisted the man's lips as he walked slowly toward the piteously crying bushes. That's a girl. I'll not arm her, as long as. Derek drew forth the gun in his boot, straightened his arm, and then as effortlessly as he'd done upon the fields of Europe, pulled the trigger. The countryside echoed with the thunderous shot, the man's final cry, and then silence. The whimpering bushes went silent and Derek would have given up everything he possessed as Duke to have Flora in his arms. As he abandoned his weapon and relieved the dead brood of his, Derek touched his fingers to his lips, willing her to silence. She gave a slight nod and he skirted the trees, keeping his gaze fixed on the front door of the cottage. When at last, that door opened again. Derek tightened his grip on the weapon, as the nauseating acrid scent of fire wafted about his senses. It stole his logic, froze his movements, and kept him captive to the horror of long ago. The gun trembled in his fingers and then fell quietly into a pile of aged leaves. Through the fog of horror, he registered the man stepping outside and looking about. Swallowing hard, Derek forced back the bile stinging his throat. Memories threatened to transport him back to that terrifying battlefield horror when fire had burned his skin and hands as he'd slapped at the flames in a bid to tamp out the blaze. I was expecting your call. The casual greeting filled the cops and pulled Derek back from the brink of madness. Derek swiftly retrieved the gun and pocketed it. The man spoke with the words of a gentleman, however, the tattered fabric of his garments and the weapon he now waved about spoke an altogether different story. Then the stranger looked through the thick of the trees and Derek stilled. Could the man see him even now? As quietly as his imperfect limbs allowed, he continued forward. Come along, your grace. 
surely you'll not keep me waiting, not with Miss Bennett waiting so patiently for you. And with that, all the battlefield logic and calm deserted him. Derek stepped out of the copse. The red-haired stranger swung about, waving the gun in his hands. Do not move, he cried, shaking that unsteady weapon in his direction. Do not move unless I say. Derek came to an immediate halt. Tufts of smoke spilled from the fireplace and he focused in on this man who'd sought to steal the only happiness he had found. What do you want? he asked quietly. In war, he learned there were all manner of fighters. There was the ruthless, proficient soldier who could kill on command, without any compunction in the moment. There were fearful, desperate men like his friend Saint Cyr had been in his youth. And then there were the skittish fellows with beady eyes searching all about. Those were the men who inevitably were the first to fall. This man before him now, his eyes aglow with panic, was one of the latter. It was why Derek knew he would survive and this man would inevitably die. You know what I want, the man snapped. Your family stole something belonging to me and I want it back. The weight of the diamond burned heavy in the front of his pocket. What an evil artifact, craved by black-hearted souls like this man and his brother. If Miss Bennett had simply turned it over as she pledged then it would have never come to this. Tendrils of fear licked at the edge of his thoughts and he forced his breathing into a semblance of calm. Where is Miss Bennett? In her innocence, Lily had been no match for this merciless, ruthless bastard. Alone, dependent upon no one but herself, she would have been easy prey for a man such as Holtzworth. Derek swallowed hard, damning himself for not having been more for her, when everyone else had failed her. The man waved his gun. We are discussing the diamond. Derek leveled the man with a ducal glare that properly cowed him. Where is she? Holdsworth audibly swallowed. S.H.E. is inside and you should be quick. I've set a fire. A ringing filled his ears and his nose picked up that acrid scent of fire once more. Oh, God in heaven. He swung a horror-filled gaze to the front door of that thatched roof cottage. He imagined her as the flames licked at her skin and the air rent with her cries. She would perish in there. Derek fought through the panic that threatened to pull him into an empty vortex. I love you, you spirited minx. Don't you dare die. Is this what you wish to exchange? He reached into the front of his pocket. Stop, the man cried. He pointed his gun at Derek and he stilled with one hand tucked inside his pocket. Calm, he said as though soothing a fractious mare. I have something I think you would care to see. In one fluid movement he drew forth that diamond then tossed it to the ground. Holdsworth gasped and let his arms drop to his sides. He staggered forward. His greed was his undoing. With a smoothness better suited to the youth he'd been in battle, Derek shot the man through the heart. The man's mouth went slack and then he crumpled to the earth in a noiseless heap. Heart racing, Derek lurched forward, racing through the remaining distance, to the small cottage. He stepped into the entrance and a wall of smoke clouded his vision, blinding him as he searched about frantically. Lily, he cried. He limped deeper inside and terror warred with determination. Lily, he called again. A muffled whimper cut through the snapping and hissing of the fire licking away at the mahogany furniture at the front of the parlor. Derek lunged toward that sound, his chest burning from the thick smoke blanketing the room. He staggered to a halt. Lily lay upon a floral sofa with her hands tied before her and her face bloodied and bruised. Oh, God. The sight of her suffering was greater than any flame to have touched his skin. He grabbed for her and catching his breath, swung her into his arms. He grimaced at the exertion of each step as he walked through the room rapidly being engulfed in flames. He closed his eye a moment, savoring the solid, reassuring weight of her in his arms. When he had her away from here and safe, he was never letting her go. He would beg her forgiveness, and make her his duchess, and give her everything she'd ever deserved of life. Miss Bennett, he said hoarsely. 
You have always had a flair for the dramatics. Her head lolled limp, hanging over his arm, giving her the look of a rag doll. Oh, God. Do not be dead. Do not be dead. You are happiness and light, and I've been a bloody stubborn fool, too blind to see that which was truly before me. Derek broke through the entrance and sucked in great gasping breaths of air. As the fire raged within the cottage, he limped faster over the cobbled path lined with flowers, away, further away, and then he collapsed to his knees. He dimly registered a tall, slender gentleman, breaking through the brush. Shock slammed into him as Harris raced forward. The servant skidded to a halt before him, kicking up gravel and dirt. Harris, he rasped. What in blazes? Surely you did not believe I would not come to help you. His butler reached for the burden in Derek's arms. At that undeserved devotion, Derek's throat worked spasmodically. See to Flora. Lowering Lily to the earth, he allowed himself to finally look at her. The air escaped him on a slow hiss. The sight of her blackened eyes and bloodied nose gutted him and he leaned over her prone form. You are not to die, Lily, he begged, his tone hoarse from the smoke and the desperation clawing at him. I am nothing without you. And I'll not have you die because of that blasted diamond. He tapped her pale, white cheek with his hand once. Twice. And a third time. Damn it, Lily, open your eyes. She is dead? A dull humming filled his ears as agony dragged the breath from his lungs and threatened to suffocate him. It took a moment for him to register that those words belonged to another. He jerked his head about. Flora hovered and her tear-filled eyes remained fixed on Lily. Derek gave his head a brusque shake. No. The hoarse denial exploded from his lips. I forbid. It, he bit out. He returned his efforts to Lily. Damn you, open your bloody eyes. Do you hear that Lily Bennett? You must stay here with me and Flora. We both need you and I'll not have you selfishly leave us to our own devices. He laid his head to her chest. Please? The entreaty burst forth as a broken sob. I cannot exist in a world in which you are not here. If she left him, all the light would be gone and he'd be plunged into a forever darkness. I love you. A fluttering hand brushed his hair and he jerked his head up. His heart tripped a beat. Lily, he demanded, hoarsely. Her lashes fluttered. The ghost of a smile trembled on her full mouth as she ran her shaking fingers over his cheek. Derek, she whispered. He leaned into that butterfly soft caress. What, love, he begged. Whatever she sought, was hers. He would lay the world at her feet if she but let him. Why you are H hopelessly commanding, her voice emerged strained. Do you know that? A strangled laugh escaped him as he gathered her close. I have one more command to issue. Love me, forever. Chapter 26 Lily stood in the corner of the chambers she'd occupied at Derek's home. She stared out the window into the crowded streets below. She traced her fingertip over the window pane. Lords and ladies moved arm in arm down the fashionable Mayfair Street, while dandies rushed by in their extravagant phaetons. Odd, how all those pillars of the peerage should go about with such an absolute simplicity, when she, Flora, and Derek had been thrust into a hell of Mr. Lucas Holtworth's making. It had been a week since her and Flora's abduction and in that time, Derek had been perfectly polite and proper and attentive. Yet there had been no further words of love. Lily's heart caught. She'd begun to believe that command he'd issued outside the blazing cottage had been nothing more than a conjuring she'd dreamed up. The door opened and her heart started at the precious little child who noisily closed the door behind her. Are you never coming out, Mrs. Benedict? She asked without preamble, skipping over to Lily. So wholly innocent, with no mention or talk of the danger they'd faced at Holtworth's hands. Oh, at just shy of eight, how much more courageous she was than Lily. 
Hello, Flora, she began. I. I asked Uncle Derek and he just grumbled MPH PMPH. Furrowing her brow, Lily stared back questioningly. Her former charge lifted her shoulders in a little shrug. You, no Uncle Derek. Despite the misery that had dogged her since that fateful day, a smile tugged at her lips. Oh, how she was going to miss this child. I do know him, she said softly. She knew his heart and soul were equally good. She knew he was honorable when most men were not. And she knew when she walked out of this townhouse, her heart would never, ever be healed. Flora took another bold step closer and leaning up on tiptoe, peered at Lily. You are not going to L leave, are you? And for all the courage in this child, the faint tremor hinted at the little girl who'd known too much loss. Oh, sweet. Her voice cracked and she folded her arms around the child who, with her uncle, had helped put Lily's broken heart together. I say you must stay. She buried her face into Lily's dress, muffling her words. My uncle loves you and you should stay and be his wife, and we shall be a family, Anne. Tears welled in her eyes and she was never more grateful than for the quick rap at the door. Enter, she called out. She could not bear this. Dr. Carlson stepped inside. His face wreathed, as usual, in warm smile. Hello, Lady Flora, he greeted, carrying his doctor's bag over. Turning, the girl looked over at him. Hello, Dr. Carlson. Lily drew back and gave the little girl's shoulders a slight squeeze. Dr. Carlson is here to visit with me. I will not be long. For this home, this life. Any of it. Her heart contracted with grief. Oh, very well, Flora said on an exaggerated sigh and then with the same ease she'd popped in and out since Lily had arrived, she slipped out of the room, closing the door in her wake. Tears clogging her throat, she looked back to the window. You are quiet this day, Miss Bennett. Miss Bennett. Yes, there was no such pretense for false names anymore, was there? Lily angled her head and looked at the young doctor as he placed his instruments back inside his black bag after examining her. As his words were an observation more than anything, she remained silent. How are you feeling? Like my heart is dying. Like I will never smile again. Blinking back the sheen misting her eyes, she turned. I am well, she said softly. A wry grin curved the man's lips. Miss Bennett, as your doctor, I informed his grace of that truth more than four days ago and he still insists I attend you. She chewed her lower lip. Why had Derek not turned her out? Held her responsible for Flora's abduction? She was just as guilty as the maid, Claudia, who disappeared after her role in Holtworth's plan, only to be discovered, and sent to a penal colony for her complicity. Surely he saw Lily in the same light. The Duke is stubborn. The window pane reflected her rapidly blinking visage. He has spent years shutting the world from his life. The doctor pulled on his gloves. And with his mother's disdain and society's cruelty, well, it is with understandable reasons. She wet her lips. Why are you telling me this? Lily well knew what had shaped Derek into the man he'd become. He was a hard man who'd not forgive easily. He let you in, the doctor said at last. He held her stare. And I hope you allow him to stay there. Unable to meet his piercing gaze, she looked at her slippers. I have made mistakes. Unpardonable ones. Crimes that had nearly cost a little girl her life and, as it was, had irrevocably changed her. Lily curled her toes so tight her feet ached. The doctor gave her a gentle smile. None of us are without mistakes. A knock sounded at the door and Dr. Carlson inclined his head. If you will excuse me. She turned. Derek stood framed in the entrance impossibly elegant and magnificent in his black breeches, black coat, and stark white cravat. Their gazes locked and a wave of hot, indecipherable emotions passed in his eye. He moved his attention to Dr. Carlson. 
She is well, your grace, the doctor said with a smile. Derek inclined his head. He did not speak until Dr. Carlson had taken his leave. Lily, he greeted. What was she to make of that curiously empty inflection? Did he intend to send her off, in truth? Did he wish to have her remain in the role of governess? Did he want more with her? She smoothed her palms down her skirts, Derek, she said softly. And because she was too afraid to know that he'd come to his senses and realized the absolute truth, that a whore had no place in his household, but unable to hear him utter those words, Lily cleared her throat. I have sent a missive to my family. He stilled. Lily ran her palms together and studied them intently. Everyone must go home sometime, she clarified. I thought perhaps that time might be now. And what if they'll not accept you back? That gravelly question emerged as though forcibly dragged from him and Lily shot her head up. She'd not heard his approach. What then? She shrugged. It is not your responsibility. I'm not your responsibility. Derek shot a hand out, folding hers in a hold that was both gentle and, at the same time, powerful. I am sorry you were exposed to that ugliness. So at last, after all these days, they would speak on it and not carefully skirt it for safer talks of the weather or no talks at all. She gave her head a shake. You needn't apologize. It is I who, through my connection with Holtzworth, brought that danger into your household. She winced as guilt clawed at her. Oh, Lily, this was not your fault, he said simply, as though in stating it, he made it fact. But then, wasn't that the way of a duke? A man just a handful of steps removed from royalty could easily command and control. But Derek had never been that way. Even in his blustering shows of temper, he'd not treated her as a mere governess, but rather, as an equal. Marry me, he said quietly. Her heart missed a beat and she swiftly yanked her gaze up to his. What? Marry me. Marry me, he repeated, raising her knuckles to his lips and brushing his mouth over the skin, sending warmth spreading from that point. She slid her eyes closed as he dangled before her everything she'd never dreamed she could have, him. The tantalizing promise of forever in his arms was so close, and yet. She forced her eyes open. And yet it could never be farther away. This was not how this was to go. Derek cupped her cheek in his hard palm and she started. How was it to go, he asked quietly, running the pad of his thumb over her lower lip. You were to hate me. Lily managed to shake her head. Following Holtworth's machinations, Derek was to have reacted with disgust and shock and snarl like the beast he'd been professed to be. He'd have sent her off, just as he'd done with everyone else. Because magical moments didn't happen to ordinary, flawed people. Life was hard and oftentimes impossible and those glimmers of light were so few, and so rare, that she long ago realized she dwelled in the shadows. Derek brushed his lips against her temple in a fleeting kiss. Oh, Lily, how could I ever hate you when my soul and heart are so inextricably intertwined with yours? Marry me, he repeated with a ducal insistence in his gravelly tone. Now he'd tempt her with the promise of light. Of their own volition, her eyes slid closed. Whores did not marry dukes. Why you cannot marry me? The agonized words contained regret that came from deep inside her soul. You cannot marry a woman who gave her innocence to your brother and who was mistress, for six years, to another man. He dropped his brow to hers. I am a duke. I can do whatever I bloody well wish. And you are that wish. Derek touched his lips to hers in a gentle meeting. That delicate, soft caress was proof this was truly real and, on occasion, magical moments did happen to those ordinary, flawed people such as her. Lily tangled her hands about his neck and angled her head to receive his kiss. He parted her mouth with his and she allowed him entry, their tongues coming together in a joining born of more than mere desire and hungering, but of love and healing. Then reality intruded its ugly head and she jerked her head back, pulling away from his kiss. I cannot, 
she rasped, stumbling from him. He frowned and blinked several times. Of course you can. You? Stop, she cried, holding her palms up to ward him off. For the part she'd allowed herself to believe did not truly matter hovered between them as it had since she'd stepped foot inside his household. The memory of Holtworth would not go away. And her association with that man would forever be between her and Derek, even as she'd spent the past week thinking it didn't matter. It did and always would. I love you, she whispered, but I cannot marry you. Not with all that came to pass. His body went still. What are you saying? The confusion in his gaze ravaged her and she hated she could not have him as hers, forever. Lily palmed his beloved, scarred cheek. Derek, you are not a man who forgives. Lord St. Cyr is proof of that. She let her hand fall to her side. Someday, if not today, you would eventually come to resent me for the loss of that diamond. I did not want that bloody diamond, he bit out. I turned it over to the king's advisors. It was never about the diamond, he said with an incessant edge to his words. No, she said sadly. But Flora will have nightmares of what happened to her and who will you blame? Or having had to kill those two men? What happens when the guilt of that haunts you? Lily clasped her fingers tight at her sides. No, I could not bear it when that time comes. I have killed too many men in my life, but those two who harmed you and Flora, I would gladly kill all over again, without compunction. White lines of fury formed at the corners of his mouth and he gripped her by the shoulders. Is that the manner of man you think I am? Shock and hurt laced his words, tugging at her heart. A punishing sort? No. I think you are a man who loves deeply, she said simply. And that is why you will someday hate me for the pain I brought to you and Flora. Yes, eventually her association with Holdsworth would kill all love he'd had for her. Agony pulled at her heart. I love you, with all I am, and all I will ever be, and you are all I have ever wanted in life, Derek. Hope flared in his eye and she forced her gaze away. But sometimes love is not enough. Lily turned on wooden legs and strode over to her packed valise. You are leaving. There was a hollow emptiness to those words that chilled her. Lily nodded once. I have to. The gossip columns, they have already spoken of you. And me. And for Flora's benefit, you cannot keep me here. She fiddled with the latches of her worn case. The floorboards groaned as Derek strode forward. He stopped before her and, with his knuckles, tipped her chin up. My family has wronged you in ways I can never make right. She stiffened. Is that what drove his offer of marriage? Some silly sense of atonement? She'd thrown away her virtue. It had not been stolen in an act of violence, but with a glib tongue she'd fallen prey to. That belonged to her. She'd accepted it. Derek must now, too. You needn't offer for me because of mistakes that were mine and your brother's, she said between tight lips. Is that what you think? he asked, his low, gravelly baritone giving no hint to his thoughts. Do you think I would wed you because of that? Lily captured her lower lip between her teeth. Poor, Lily, he whispered and brushed his lips over her cheek in a fleeting caress. You've spent so many years betrayed by those who were to have cared for you that you convinced yourself you're not a person to be loved. But you are, he murmured. He drew her back against his chest and then put his lips to her ear. His breath, the scent of coffee and chocolate, wrapped about her senses, making him real in ways she did not want him to be in this moment. I love you. She caught the inside of her cheek hard as he skimmed his knuckles over her jaw. I love you because you are everything that is strong and courageous. His hoarse voice washed over her. You have survived despite the ugliness of the world and with your spirit, restored happiness to mine in a way that no one and nothing could. He dropped his brow to hers. Why would you run from me? How have you not realized I am not like the others? I will never leave you. 
Her throat worked spasmodically as she allowed him to angle her head up. He ran his thumb over her trembling lower lip. I love you, he whispered. Let go. Give yourself to him. Trust. Marry me, he urged. How long had she believed herself undeserving of goodness and kindness and love? Only Derek had ever seen her worth, opened her eyes to it. He made her see something more than the acts that had defined her for seven years and now he offered her the world she'd thought long ago close to her, one with a loving husband and, someday, babes. If she but took it. Lily fluttered her eyes open and this man, who looked at her with love shining from the depths of his fathomless eye, bore no hint of the angry stranger she'd met more than a fortnight ago. In his gaze, she saw reflected back all her deepest yearnings to love, and be loved, and to celebrate life. I want that with him. Only him. Forever. All these years, she'd mourned the loss of her family, only to find it now, here with Derek. Mayhap later there would be peace with her parents and siblings, but even if there never was forgiveness, she had a new family. One who loved her without reservation and judgment. The sins of her past slipped away, freeing her from guilt and fear and pain. Because of him. Nay, because of them, together. She leaned up on tiptoe and claimed his lips in a gentle kiss. Derek drew back. Is that a yes, love? Emotion roughened his words. She smiled softly. That is a yes. Epilogue. London, England. Two months later. The rhythmic clip of Derek's footfalls and Lily's slippered steps echoed softly off the carpeted halls, the sound punctuated by the muffled thump of his cane upon the floor. With Lily's guidance and gentle encouragement and Flora's cheerful presence, he'd re-entered the living. Nay, he'd done that the moment Lily had entered his life and shown him how to laugh and smile and love. They had also drawn him outside, into the world, braving stares and whispers, to feel the warmth of the sun on his skin. Gaze trained forward on the butler, leading them to the parlor, Derek's mouth went dry. For this was no visit to Hyde Park or trip to Gunter's with Lily and Flora. This household was a place he had no right being. I should not be here. His wife slid her gloved fingertips into his and cast upward an encouraging smile. It will be all right, she mouthed. Under her quiet assurance, his throat worked. How very different his smiling, bright-eyed wife was from the wary lady who'd first entered his home. In a way, they'd healed each other. He'd gone from an empty, cold shell of a person to a man who reveled in love and laughter, and who also brought two other people joy. The butler drew them to a stop beside a not unfamiliar parlor. His palms moistened inside his gloves. For even having been healed, there was still regret that moved beyond his own past sufferings. The Duke and Duchess of Blackthorn. The butler stepped aside and backed from the room. The flawlessly golden Marquess and Marchioness of St. Cyr stared back. At one time, their united perfection would have grated. It would have served as a reminder of the marks upon his person and his aloneness in the world. No longer. A small smile pulled at his lips. Christian stood, stoically silent, then his wife, Lady St. Cyr, smiled back. It is so, so lovely to see you again, your grace, she said with a warmth that met her eyes. Why would she be so kind? To him? Why, when he brought her family nothing but pain? Sketching a rusty bow, Derek spoke in hushed tones. It is an honor, my lady. The pall of silence descended and he returned his attention to an immobile Christian. The other man's face set in a mask gave no hint of his thoughts or emotions. There are so many words I owe him. So many apologies he's deserving of, useless words that can never right the wrongs I've done. Christian, his voice emerged garbled. Unable to meet the directness of the other man's gaze, he glanced down a moment at the head of his new cane, the gold-filled handle, stamped with lilies at his niece's insistence, represented everything light. Gone was the serpent meant to represent darkness. This new one served a functionality, a sturdiness, that represented his and Lily's future, 
a joyous one with Flora in it. His throat worked as he looked to his wife's still flat tummy. A family that would see additional life added to their fold in seven months' time. He searched for words. Lily gave the fingers of his other hand a slight squeeze, an assurance that she was here, that she would always be there, and he found strength in her. In them. Warmth filled his heart and shoving aside his reservations, Derek drew back his hand and limped over to his friend. He held a palm up. I am so very sorry, Christian. For everything, for their shattered innocence, for the horrors that would always be with them, for shutting him out, and lamenting his deserved happiness. I do not say another word, Christian said, his voice hoarse and Derek's palm wavered. The mask slipped and a spasm of emotion contorted Christian's face. He placed his hand in Derek's. There is nothing to forgive. There never was. The muscles of his throat bobbed. Oh, how I have missed you, friend. And I you, Derek said, his voice hoarse. A calming peace filled him. There would never be a full freedom from the hell that would forever haunt his nightmares, but there was forgiveness. There was a healing found in Flora's effervescent spirit, his friend's forgiveness, and in his wife's love. Derek closed his eye. After eight long years, he was at last, home. The End